if you just do it, it'll turn out okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's Vendilla1988 here, and we're back for more Talking Time with Caffeine, Season 8. My guest today is, well, I'll let him introduce himself. All right. Uh, hello. My name is Walker. I have a YouTube channel called Just Walking Fish, um, which I unfortunately haven't been able to upload on in like the past month or so. But I do have plans, so don't worry. Um, yeah, so that's... So what's the purpose of your channel? Okay. Um, well, basically, I am an evolutionary biology major. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff that interests me. And it's something that I, I can't really talk about too often openly, I guess, just because I, I'm from rural Alabama and with the whole like coronavirus and school shut down and stuff, I'm back living with my parents. Um, and so, you know, I, I just thought, hey, you know, it might be fun to, to get involved with this community because it's been something I've been sort of watching for a bit and, uh, might as well put myself out there, I guess. So, are you a doctor fish yet, or a master fish, or just a bachelor? Fish? <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm an undergraduate fish right now. Oh, associate fish. Yeah, <laughs> not even that yet, but yeah, that's all right. Yeah, yeah, I gotta respect people who can finish college. Uh, I went to college and I failed miserably at it. <laughs> really? Well, I mean, it's not for everybody, but like, hey. It's all right. I, I think honestly, the the biggest point of getting a degree is getting a piece of paper that says you got a degree. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, mean, I don't think you really need to go to college to learn stuff at this point. It's just so that like, for like job stuff. You know what I it, mean? Yeah. Well, I wanted to be a, a history teacher at the time, so really? <laughs> kind of need. I think you, I think I need a college degree for that. Mm -hmm. so I'm just saying, like, if you're interested in it, like altruistically, you don't need a degree. Yeah, in my opinion, yeah. At least. yeah. Most of the time, most of the time, I, I I've learned is I learn I learned via books and YouTube now. But still, yeah. I, I, at the time, I wanted to be a history I, I got a teacher, but I think you need I think you, I think you need a degree for that. Still, I'm not positive, but <laughs> but pop, pop, I kind of wanted somebody coming off the street like, hey, I want to be a teacher. Like, okay, you're a teacher now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, like. Some people like 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 say Kent off the street like say I'll, I'll be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pat Patriot University or whatever is that? Isn't that the yeah? The thing? Uh, hello, my name is Kent Hoven. That's <laughs> oh oh yeah. Me, in, in the third season, me and my guest a few a few episodes we went we went over his thesis, <laughs> <laughs> his doctoral thesis. Like you read it out loud. Yeah, a few That's episodes. You, you, you can go check out season three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All uh, right, so, so what made you interest have an interest in uh, biology? Um, well, biology specifically, I don't, I don't really know. I, it's just something that, like, you know how people just have interests. But, um, yeah, I, I sort of grew up creationist-ish. Like, I was definitely I, – I, I'm from a pretty evangelical Methodist household, um, and – I never necessarily learned that like evolution is false, but I was definitely taught things like biblical literalism and like, you know, creationism and that kind of stuff as a kid. I was just never really introduced to the apologetic side of it. Yeah. Um, and then I sort of started looking more into it, I guess. Um, and I got really into interested in like Pleistocene megafauna. Um, and really the Cenozoic as a whole, I think that's a really cool time period. Um, and now I'm just sort of interested in like phylogeny, phylogenetics, um, evolutionary biology, and like evolutionary that that kind of stuff. You know, it's just I don't know. I I don't really know. Huh. Oh, yeah. Cool. Oh, that's you. Oh, that's you. Anyways, all right. So so let's talk. Let's, let's go back. Talk, talk about the thing. I don't know if your slideshow or not, but. We go there. Let's start about the beginning. So, how did our rivalry with the Rafin Acap the Rafin fish start? How did our rivalry start? <laughs> yeah, with, with our, um, our 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 Rafin cousins. Um. Well, uh, do you do you want me to pull up the slideshow presentation that I started? Sure. I know that's, that's part of it or not. But... Um. Let me. Oh crap. <laughs> Sorry. Because I know that that was 
from, from our thing that I can't pronounce it. Sark, Sark, Sarcopterygii. Yeah, and you know when we when we were, we used to be all bony fish, and then we we split. Uh, then that thing that, I think that was the first split I with our cousins. The ray we split with the ray fin. Like what? Well, probably back in what the I know was it the Devonian or the one before that? Uh, it was in the middle to late Silurian. Yeah. Uh, um, I I put the you'll have to accept the slideshow okay. for this thing. Yeah. So I have a uh, Sarcopterygii. <laughs> We're all just walking fish, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, Osteichthys contains all bony fish, and our sister group would be like Chondrichthys, and um, Actinopterygii would be the the rayfin fish, whereas Sarcopterygii is the bony fish, or the uh, limb. What is it? The lobe limb, lobe limbed fish. That's what it is. Um. So. It's really interesting because Sarcopterygii used to be much more prevalent in the water back in like the Devonian, um, Carboniferous, up until really the Triassic, and then Actinopterygii started taking over. Well, we were that by that point we were most of the Sark the Sarcopterygii were on land, like they're like whatever. Yeah, yeah. Something interesting about that is um, Sarcopterygii is. I mean, I, I consider us fish, right? The, sort of the whole, that's the joke behind my name, I guess. Yeah. Um, but there's actually only eight species within Sarcopterygii that are still like fish. You know, you have two species of coelacanths and, and uh, six species of lungfish. Yeah. And then all other 30 thousand are, uh, are land animals. Except, except the, except, except for the, except for the, except for the, I guess not really, except for the, the, the brief time, the amphibians are are, t are like the, yeah. the states. Yeah, you have like sirenians and axolotls, but they're still like descended from uh, land, like terrestrial yeah. vertebrates. But yeah, so that that's something kind of funny. Um, and something kind of interesting about this split is a uh, like the lung, which I feel like is one of the most characteristic things of us land vertebrates. It actually probably predates this split. Um, yeah, like I, I think I say about uh, a swim, there used to be a swim bladder or something. Yeah, well, um, so what scientist, what Darwin wrote in Origin of Species is that the lung probably evolved from the swim bladder, but recent studies have sort of flipped that around and they're thinking that swim, swim bladders, bladder from the lung. Origins, yeah, evolved ah. from lungs. So we actually know that um, primitive actinopterygians, such as bee shears, have you ever heard of bee shears? Nope, but I have today. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, well, bee shears actually have a very primitive lung. And um, they can survive outside of water as long as they stay humid. And it's thought that uh, the lung started as like a multifunctional organ that was partially used for respiration and partially used for like buoyancy control. Right. So that's kind of a cool thing. And then it just sort of like specialized in different lineages. So. Sweet. Uh, so. So okay, so we're like we split. Okay, first, first, first we split from the sharks, you know, the the cards. Then we, now we split from the rape and fist, and we're and we're and we're battling and we're, and we're battling for the ocean. We're, at this time, I guess we're all still. I guess at this point, we're all still all hiding from the Dunkleosia still. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the placoderms were still uh, the big boys in town. Yeah, you know, they were the ones we were hiding from. Um, but then after we split from Actinopterygii and the late Silurian, the earliest, I have a picture. This is one of the earliest uh, lobefin fish that we know of. It's Gui, gu gu I, I really don't know how to pronounce this one. I'm kind of stuck on this one. But um, yeah, it's one of the earliest lobefin fish um, from about 420 million years ago. Um, and you know, looking at that, you definitely don't see much of a resemblance. It how, looks more like a tuna or like a grouper than. How big? How big was this guy? Was he big enough to eat us, or is he still in the small, small share time? Oh gosh, I, I didn't. I don't remember how big we was. I, if I remember correctly, it was about a meter. Most of the early, um, or we. Oh wait, no, no, no. It was very small. Actually, it was about thirty centimeters. Okay. Yeah. But by, by the way, I, I wasn't, 
I, I don't know how this works in the ocean. I know how natural natural borders here, but so how 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 did we stop? Do you know the speciation of do we know the, like the speciation event that helped that stopped us from breeding with our raven cousins? So, so we had different gene pools and stuff. I I have no idea. I mean, I know um, a lot of at least like modern um, and potent. Well, okay, so so modern lobefin fish such as coelacanths are primarily deep sea creatures. Yeah. So it could have had to do with like uh, differences in depth, but I really don't know. I was, yeah, I was wondering. A, I was just wondering how how things when and how things speciate because you know, you yeah. know, on land you know rivers can happen or mountains can pop up or you know obviously just the different languages pop up you know different like oh I don't like I don't like that song he's singing I'm not gonna I'm not gonna breed with him. <laughs> yeah, well, there, there's still natural barriers in the water even if it's like harder to uh, to distinguish. You know, like if you have a shallow water creature, it's not going to be able to get across a continent. You know. Yeah. Or like, you know, shall, the shallow water animals that live like, say, over in the Mediterranean are very different from the ones we have in the Gulf. Or like say, like say there's like a big lake and it private dries up and there's the two fish are on different different waters things like, like they hit Rio de Janeiro. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so here I have the, the coelacanths in Actinistia. Right, so, so yeah, uh, yeah, there's other, other different things for the people living that says, People are like, oh, like, how did they disappear for sixty-five million years? <laughs> yeah, that that's something is pretty funny. Um, they're a pretty commonly cited example of something known as like a Lazarus taxa, which is where you expect something to be dead, and you found fossils of it, um, and then it just appears one day, you know, and you you have no idea how they got there. And the reason that Latimeria, the uh, the genus of currently living coelacanths probably didn't leave many fossils or at least we haven't found many fossils is because like i said they live in the deep sea is, so are, is the is the two on the bottom are our living things or the yeah well actually just the the one on the very bottom latimeria all the rest of them are extinct oh uh, i said that so so so, so there's two so the, the same genius or species i thought they're two different 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 parts of the ocean different species um, well, yeah, so we have two living species within Latimeria. Okay. Um, so something I, well, the reason I had this up here is because, I mean, I know it's not like the point of my conversation, I guess, yeah. but a lot of creationists always talk about, oh, well, it's a living fossil, therefore evolution is false. And it's just a really, <laughs> it, it doesn't work because obviously, you know, you can see by these they morphologically, they're very different. Yeah. They, they within like the same, I don't know, some huge Linnaean rank, but th within that rank, they're extremely different. Um, and here are the two living ones, right? So you have the West Indian coelacanth and the Indonesian coelacanth. They look pretty, they they're pretty big. Yeah. They're, they're over a meter. I think they can grow up to about a meter and a half. Um, and, you know, even going further, I think with the whole creationism thing, I think it's kind of funny because I think uh, coelacanths are a pretty argument, pretty good argument against creationism, and I guess Linnaean taxonomy for that matter, um, because they're considered part of the same genus, um, but genetically they're they're super super different. These two species are, despite being in the same genus, are separated by about forty million years, so that's about as divergent as we are from like New World monkeys, so capuchins and spider monkeys. Yeah, one of them looks like more camouflage. The blue one looks more like more like like I don't know, it's dark. It looks like it should be more camouflagey than the other one would be. Yeah, well, it might just be the lighting. Actually, I, I really don't know. I, I I don't. If I saw them in the wild, I would be like, oh, it's a coelac. I I'd probably recognize it as a coelacanth, but I don't think I could actually tell what the difference was. You know. So where did we where did we split from our our coelacanth cousins? Oh well. Uh, we we split from them about 400 million years ago, right? Yeah. Um, because the next most basal group would be Ripidista, Rip, Ripidistia. <laughs> um, and Dipnoi is lungfish, but Ripidistia includes lungfish and us, right? Yeah. And that's what's sister to Act, uh, Actinistia. That, that, uh, that means, like, if I remember correctly from uh, when I was watching the, the that series, uh, we had, like, by it, similar, like 
two lungs or like symmetry, symmetry lungs and like that? Uh, I don't actually, I don't know what um, it stands for. But, uh, but apparently these guys, at, they lost, these guys here, uh, they lost their little, they lost their, their bony li limbs. Most of them look like, like. Yeah, they, they kind of have like the little, little wormy thing going on. Um, yeah, you, yeah, you'd think they'd be with the raven fish if the genetic, genetic didn't say otherwise. Yeah, well, they, they do have some pretty interesting morphological characteristics that group them with us, right? So they yeah. have snapomorphies, like uh, their upper jaw is attached to their skull, which obviously, you know, if you feel it, our upper jaw is attached to our skull. Um, and that's something not found anywhere outside of Ripidistia. So that's why some fish, you can see them, like they protrude their jaw outward whenever they're biting another fish or like sucking something up. Um, so that, that's a little interesting thing. They also, I mean, some of them are even like obligate air breathers. So they have pretty good lungs. Um, they, all of them, except for the Australian lungfish, would actually drown if you held them underwater. <laughs> so that's kind of funny. Um, yeah. The, yeah, so they have to go up in the air. The thing, kind of, it's, it's almost kind of like whales and dolphins in that that sense, almost. Yeah, yeah. Well, but uh, that that was probably secondarily lost because we have pretty good evidence that Tiktaalik had gills. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it, it's just kind of interesting, and it's helped them, you know, survive in poor oxygenated water and like oh, swampy environments and stuff. Aust they from Australia, Africa. South America, and yeah. and then the bottom one's just a picture of like a Devonian uh, lungfish. So back, you know, when they first arrived, like three hundred fifty-ish million years ago. So, so only these three then are the current living species. Then, that well, three? there's there's actually six species. So you have the Australian lungfish, which are in their own family, and I think even their own order. Um, and then you have African and South American lungfish, which are grouped more closely together because you know Gondwana. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the Australian lungfish are actually very different from the other two, but like the Australian lungfish only have one lung, whereas the other two have two lungs like us. Um, so that's just an interesting thing. Um, and then after Ripidistia, we start to get to Tetrapodomorpha, which, uh, something a little fishy going on with these guys, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, the, these are obviously more closely related to us than lungfish, uh, but they, they still look pretty fish-like. But yeah. if you notice, I uh, megalichthys actually had the beginnings of nostrils on it, right? Ah. So we're looking at a fish with nostrils and bony limbs. Um, but its nostrils were only used for, like, olfactory purposes. Um, it, it couldn't actually breathe through its nose yet. Well, I guess it didn't have a nose, but... It can breathe through its nostrils yet. It could just use it as like a, a sense. They, it could pick up sense in the water. Um, and another middle-ish derived uh, tetrapodomorph is Rhizodus, which is actually the biggest um, freshwater species of all time. So that's a that's a pretty cool one. It could grow up to about seven meters, which would have made it dwarf a great white. <laughs> so they, they they could probably if we, they probably could eat this if they want to. Oh, easily. Yeah, I, I don't have a picture of it like with a diver, but I mean, the, the scale that's under Rhizodus is one meter. So, you know, two of those would be a person and that barely takes up half of its... I mean, that... that Honestly, the real Rhizodus would be even larger than that scale because, like I said, they could be up to seven meters and that one looks about like five. So, they these were very, very large fish. I think the only fish that are bigger than it that currently live would be like whale sharks. Um, and they lived in freshwater. They lived in like large lakes and uh, that kind of stuff. So <laughs> it's a little scary. Um, and then here, here we have eotetrapodiforms. That's our next split. Yeah, that would be the, the next split. Well, so the problem is with Linnaean taxonomy is that we don't really characterize every single split. You know, sometimes we just have like crown and stem lineages. Yeah, I thought, don't, don't, we, do, don't we have cladistics cl 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 now for that kind of thing? Yeah, but still, you 
a lot of times you don't name every single split. You just name like the big splits uh, or like the big breakthroughs in evolution. Yeah, and then the little ones like very the the, the big ones don't get counted. Like yeah, we're, like we're not important. <laughs> so like uh, Tinerau, Eusinopteron, and Pandarichthys, all of these would be Eo uh, Eo tetrapodiforms. But you know, Pandarichthys is closer related to us than Tinerau or Eusinopteron would be. So so are we are we that too or not? Yes, we are. We're we're in this as well. I'm what I'm doing is I'm going down the line towards okay. tetrapods. So I didn't know if, we, if if that's our cousin group or our, our own group. Yeah, well, tet Eo tetrapodiforms is our own group, but all of the the ones pictured are cousins for sure. Okay. Um, but like, but they're like, like you said, that some of them are more closer closer to us than other ones. Yeah, yeah. So, um. Out of all three of these, Pandaric, these would be the most closely related to us. Um, you can see this flat head shape coming out on that, that one. Yeah, you're starting to see, um, a, what is it called, like a lateral flattening of it. And then we're also starting to see certain bones appearing in the uh, the limbs. You can kind of see in Tinerau. I have at the end of the slideshow um, like a, a list of transitions of the arm bones and stuff. But this is where we're starting to find things like the fibia and the tibia and the fibula. Um, those were all present in Tinerau and, uh, well, there, it was present in all three of them. And then Eusinopteron would have had the beginnings of digits as well. It would have had the bones that are at least analogous to digits. Okay. Um, and then uh, we're, we're seeing like a, a transitional pelvic girdle in all of these as well. Like they couldn't bear weight, but they were beginning to have the modern ratios for like limbs and pelvic structure. All right. So they're, they're like almost, were they walking on, on the bottom of the river yet? yet? Or... Pandarichthys probably, the other two probably would have been like open swimming. Um. But yeah, so Pandarichthys actually has primitive wrists, um, which is an interesting thing. It also has primitive elbows and reduction of fin rays, which you can kind of see. Um, uh, one, one trend that we're going to see as we go down the line is that the fin rays are going to get smaller and smaller, and the digits are going to become more prominent. Yeah, yeah it looks like the, the, the back tail... It's getting smaller and smaller too. Yeah, that's another thing. I didn't really mention that too much, but yeah, that's definitely a, a thing that we see as we get closer to tetrapods because you know they're going from fish tails to like salamander tails. Um, so the, I guess the next big thing would be stegocephalia, which you know th these are the ones that everyone's heard of for the most part. Right, we got like Tiktaalik, uh, Acanthostega, and Ichthyostega. Um, and interestingly, th so in the previous fish, you know, in these guys, um, we there's something known as the intracranial joint, um, yeah. which we're starting to see a fusion of the intracranial joint. And by the time we get to Pandarichthys, the intracranial joint exists on the inside of the cranium, but not the outside of the cranium. So it could have like a little bit more flexion but not entirely. And by the time we get to um, stegocephalians, the intracranial joint has completely closed up. And also we see that the um, pectoral girdle has separated from the back of the skull, which means that these fish have necks now. So now we're looking at fish with necks, digits, wrists, elbows, nostrils. You know, it, it's, it's honestly kind of hard to draw the line where it becomes not a fish. That's why these are sometimes also known as fishopods. I heard that word from before. So, which one is, which one, who do we, split, who, who do we kind of uh, say split from first? So, Tiktaalik would be the most basal out of all of these, right? Tiktaalik is generally considered the most basal megacephalian. Um, <coughs> it definitely wasn't a direct ancestor, um, and it still would have spent time in the water. We have evidence to believe that it had gills and probably didn't ever leave the water. Um, but this is definitely one of the fish that was holding on to the bottom in fast moving streams, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And probably honestly lived a little bit like a, an alligator or something. Like and an also animal. we know that Tiktaalik wasn't 
a direct ancestor because we have tracks uh, from probably something more morphologically similar to ich uh, Ichthyostega from around the time that Tiktaalik was found. But it's still a very important transitional fossil, right? Yeah. Yeah, too bad we too bad we can't get DNA from fossil saddle to the right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that would be so cool if we could, but unfortunately stupid DNA for, for so long. <laughs> um yeah, and then Acanthostega is slightly more closely related to us than like Tiktaalik would be. Yeah, you can see, um, you can start to see the little bit the little finger starting to show a little bit there. Yeah, well, okay, so Tiktaalik was, as far as we know, the last one to have the, the rays. So the rays on the fins are actually not analogous to the bones that we have. If I remember correctly, they're more similar to, like, our fingernail structure or something. But don't quote me on that. I think I've heard it somewhere else. Um, and that's obviously what gives the ray fin fish their names, right? They yeah. use those rays to swim, whereas in most of these low finned fish, you see a reduction of the rays and more prominence of bones. Um, and you see Acanthostega has completely gotten rid of the rays and now only has bones, um, which pretty much look like digits at this point. It has eight of them. It has eight digits. Um, has a very flexible neck. And it probably could go out of the water, but it wouldn't be very good at it. <laughs> um, because it, its pectoral and pelvic uh, girdles just couldn't support any weight, really. It could probably flop around, but it, you know, wouldn't have gone out of water for like extended amounts of time <laughs> or like to hunt. So not, no, so not like the things shows when they first came out. They say, like, "Oh, it's gonna can move on land." But... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it obviously created a pretty strong selective pressure to like get all of these because honestly, the transition between the earliest um, Sarcopterygian fish and the, the late-ish Silurian to the earliest tetrapods happened in something like 60 million years or 70 million years. Because we have two, we have true tetrapods from like the mid to late Devonian, right? Most of these guys came out about 375, 380 million years ago. So that's a pretty fast transition in my opinion to get from fish to legs and lungs and breathing and stuff. Um, and something interesting about Ichthyostega, you start to see a reduction in the number of digits. So Acanthostega had eight digits, whereas Ichthyostega has seven. Or does it have, yeah, it has seven. Um, and also Ichthyostega, we know for a fact it could get out of the water. And it probably hopped around like a seal or like a, a mudskipper would. Ah. Because its, pel or its uh, pectoral muscles would have been strong enough to easily support its weight, but its range of motion was too small to actually walk around in the twisting amphibian style. Um, so, you know, it, it was kind of, it was flopping. It was just good at flopping. <laughs> Sweet. And then finally we got the, okay, so we're from Tiktaalik, the, the ek, ek stega to Ithia stega. Yep. Um, so that's like that's pretty much the last and, of the fishopods. Oh, what? And 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 sorry, it, it was it the the one that had the eight fingers or the nine fingers? Um, Acanthostega had eight fingers. Ichthyostega okay. had seven. Okay. So, so we're starting to see a di uh, decrease in finger or digit number to the point where five is becoming standardized. And I, I, I was sure not, but I heard like the fingers that merged together became, became the, the future our future thumb. Or big toe, or big toe, whatever. What did you say? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. I, I'm not pot as but I, I heard, I heard that the, the the ones that disappeared or used to get out became our thumb or our big toe eventually. Yeah, I'm pretty sure some of them were just lost because there was like a some sort of mutation in the Hox gene that you okay. know, it, if it changes the gradient. But I think some of them also did fuse to have like thickening. Yeah, I, I also I also heard in the positive. I also heard that. That more fingers is actually more do uh, the more dominant gene. That <laughs> yeah, that is true. Uh, polydactyly is dominant. So if someone has six fingers, it's more than likely that their kid's going to have six fingers. Um, it's just a very rare mutation, but it's definitely not. Um, it's not recessive at, at all. <laughs> so that that is an interesting thing. Um, 
Though I don't think that mutation can be traced back to these guys. I think that's okay. an independent mutation okay. that's arisen recently-ish. Okay. Yeah. And so pretty much that more or less ends the, the fishopods and takes us to tetrapods. So here I have you know pictures of the different transitions. The the one on the left would be the change in skull morphology from that of like a fish to you know what we have now. Um, it has like the pictures of the different ones as well. And then the right would be evolution of a hand from you know the the teleos or not teleos but like the osteichthyes like base. So, you know, you see certain bones like the, the radius and the ulna starting to appear and you see the wrist becoming its own individual thing, whereas the digits are migrating up and becoming their own separate thing as well. Yeah. See, yeah. A, little, a little hard to see uh, right here on the tiny screen. Yeah. On the words, but yeah, it looks like at least on the the wrist thing, our closest relative is the, is the tiktaalik one. Mm -hmm. uh, the the closest one, I think tiktaalik is the one uh, second to left, or second yeah. to right, and the one all the way on the right is acanthostega. So I don't have ichthyostega up here, but ichthyostega is similar to acanthostega. At that point, they had almost had the like tetrapod foot plan, they just didn't have the correct number of digits or the correct length of the bones, that kind of stuff. All right. Yeah. And then, let me see. And then I have one more slide. So here we have things that are so similar to tetrapods, it's almost like hard to tell. You know, we don't have a super, super complete record of all the transitions that happen. But we do have enough to where it's confusing as to where draw uh, where to draw the line, right? Yeah. So you know we have things like Tulerpaton, um, which would have had six digits, unlike us. Um, but it definitely could have left the water. It, it was probably an obligate air breather because it didn't have gills, right? So it had to breathe air. Um, so was that the first one that had no gills, or was that was it going to like was it going to stay? The Ichthyosaurus one still have gills, or was it still was it all one by that point? If I remember correctly, Ichthyostega and Acanthostega did not have gills. Okay. Um, whereas Tiktaalik did, but I might be wrong on that. But um, you can still do gas exchange and stuff like and this one was definitely out. pure. But lung. yeah, this one definitely had to breathe air, um, and it probably had a lifestyle similar to something like a crocodile. Um, where it still was adapted primarily to the water, um, but it could leave the water. And then you have Anthracosaurus, right? Which would be Seymouria, I have on the right. Which is, um, you can basically see it can stand up, it can stand up pretty, pretty well on land. Yeah, um, so as soon as you get to the clade tetrapo uh, Tetrapoda, you have a split between Lysamphibia and like Tim Timnospondyla, which is basically amphibians. And then reptilomorphs, which would be, us. yeah, that would, I think if I remember correctly, they're the ones reptilomorphs. They 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 have the skin that can they they have the skin that can survive on land more dryly, but they still have to wither. They still have to lay their eggs in the water to get the amniotes. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure the the nodal quote unquote definition for um, reptilomorph is just anything more closely related to us than amphibians. But, I, I, I think it'd be more more things that doesn't have waterproof, like not like like skin as you don't need to keep the skin moisturized. That's yeah, well, you, you do see that as a general trend as you go forward within uh, reptilomorphs, because you know obviously we're adapted to land now. <laughs> yeah. um, so you start to see pe uh, the animals eventually. You get to amniota where they don't need the water other than to drink anymore. It, it's too bad. There's it's too bad. There's no uh, non. Too bad. There's no. At least that. As far as I know, there's there's no rep, there's no non amniote repti reptilomorphs that survived. Yeah, well, I mean, they probably, if I had to guess, would have been something similar to like a toad in lifestyle, where they don't necessarily need water except to reproduce. Like that's how Seymouria most likely was. We yeah. have pretty good evidence that Seymouria only had to return to the water to lay its eggs, right? And most of its life was spent on land. 
Um, and at this point, we're in like the early Carboniferous. So, were, they, were the were the, 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 the giant insects and amphibians ruled, ruled the world? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I I find it funny that I mean I guess they're going to uh, onto the land to escape things like you know Dunkleosteus and uh, Rhodopis. Little did we know that little did we know that, that their time was about to end. <laughs> yeah, they, they come on land and they find a spider that's like one meter and. Um, What's that one? It's a myriapod that's like six or seven meters long. Uh, yeah. But I, I, I mean, post like, I, I mean, as a, as a, I don't know if it be good or not, but like, like sometimes like, oh, a lot, of, a lot of oxygen. That'd be good for, that'd be good for some people who have breathing problems. There's some oxygen for you. Eighty percent oxygen. No. <laughs> <Was that Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, that's. I, I wonder if we had higher oxygen levels, if insects would still come back to be huge. Because obviously gas exchange is probably a big problem that they face um, when the gas is lower. But like, also they now have, you know, predators and competition on land. No, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, 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 it's funny though. The oxygen level was pretty high back then, but I, but the, the carbon level had to be pretty high too. Otherwise it, it, because it looks seems pretty, it seems like a pretty trop tropical environment. So you think that the carbon, the carbon would have to be high too for it to be, be that warm. I, I don't actually know. I don't, I don't know the the geology behind it. I guess that would make sense. Although I do know things like water vapor are an even better um, insulator than carbon dioxide. So if you okay. could have an atmosphere with more water, and that might be affected by the oxygen. I have no idea. Of um, course. Personally, and I, I heard, uh, the, I don't know if it was true or not, but the documentary I saw that the higher oxygen also made more the environment more flammable too. Really? Yeah, I, that actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, that <laughs> Honestly, the Carboniferous has done nothing but been burned for the past uh, yeah. few million years. If it's not fires from the actual Carboniferous to what, now what just lighting everything on fire. I asked in, my, uh, in the past, like, what's your opinion on the Amer on um, America dividing the carbon, kill the killing the Carboniferous and making it in the Mississippi and then and the Pennsylvanian? Ooh, I, I I really don't have too much of an opinion. I yeah, I don't know much about those periods. I know some stuff about like the fauna that lived in them, but I don't yeah. necessarily. I, I, so I, yeah, I talked about with corporate corporate Aon, like 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 apparently America kills the. Turns the Carboniferous into two periods instead of making them two like little small your epochs and two their own two periods and like like always confused me. So anyway, yep. Yeah. I I mean, I think it's really all subjective where you end up drawing yeah. the lines. True. Like, we have the the Cenozoic lasting like you know as as you get closer to modern day the periods get so much getting, shorter. You know, they, or they start getting. We, we start going to epochs and or like eras, and you know, smaller divide in smaller area areas. Yeah. And, well, I mean, <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead. Like in the beginning, we were, we were just like everything was the eon before before the Carboniferous, before the Cambrian, like the the the, the Hadrian eon, the Achaean eon, the whatever mm -hmm. eon that was next. You know, then I let's just start dividing up in the periods, and then e and then epochs and whatever. Yeah, well, it, I think it's also sort of like a human bias thing because, you know, you have the Paleozoic, which lasted like 300 million years, and then you have the Mesozoic, which lasted like 200-ish, and then you have the Cenozoic, which has been going on for like 50 or 60 million years, you know? So yeah. as you get closer to present day, the, the general trend is for the time periods to get smaller, you know? True. Yeah. Uh. Is that the end of your slideshow? Yeah, well, I mean, pretty much. I had another slide with just some sources that I was using. Okay. Um, like, uh, I think I talked about all of them except for the 13 million year divergence. Um, <laughs> hey, Speed. Um, the, the, so basically, within the one species of Indonesian coelacanths, um, there's two separate populations which have a divergence time of 13 million years, which means it's more genetically distinct than we are from like gorillas, but they're the same species. So 
that's another thing I think is a bit of a human bias there. And it's also, you know, when yeah. taxonomy doesn't really matter that much, I guess. It's mostly just convention. But yeah, that's that's the end of my slideshow. Sweet. Uh, so if that if that were your majors, the focus of of your 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 of your degree is that right now, or you study more things? Um. Well, I haven't really started specializing into like specific like subfields right now. Um. So technically, I'm a bio major, and I'm on the evolutionary and ecology track with a focus in evolutionary. So I just say I'm an evolutionary biology major. Uh, um, I don't think I'll start specializing into like specific time periods like that, unless like I go to grad school or something. Um, but honestly, my, my biggest interest I would say would be like Pleistocene still. And just like the Cenozoic. I do think the sea to land transition is a very interesting transition because it's a, a huge macro evolutionary change but if you break it up stepwise it, it it's very linear and it actually makes a lot of sense you know so is that is that why you came up with your is that why you came up with your youtube name yeah well um I, i'm pretty proud of my youtube name personally i i came up with it because yes there, there's certain things about phylogenetics that have just sort of stuck in my mind my whole life so the idea that like birds are dinosaurs or that humans are fish, you know, because if you're going to accept things like fish as a, a taxonomic, like a true taxonomic clade, then you have to be a fish or else, you know, a coelacanth isn't a fish and neither is a shark. Um, and so th that was one part of my name. Another part of my name is just my name is Walker. So, ah. yeah. And then lastly, I uh, I have like the human legs on the coelacanth because it's sort of a, a pun on the creationist interpretations of what they think the coelacanth land transition looked like. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. So I, it's it's a couple of different puns. It has has layers. <laughs> like oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's funny. I I watched a video on on YouTube talking about how. It was a video about about worm about worms, you know. Mm -hmm. They said that that more that that we are more closely related to fish than than some worms are, are to other worms. Yeah, annelida. So I mean, annelids first diversified back in the Cambrian, right? Like we have yeah. true annelids. We have polychaetes from I think like Cambrian stage two or something, which is five hundred million years ago, um, yeah. and that means. You know, obviously there was the major split between all annelids at that point, whereas we don't have the osteichthys split until about 424 to 30 million years ago. Um, so we're about 100 million years closer to fish than worms are to each other. <laughs> and there's certain worms that are even more divided, like nemat. Like it depends how you define worms. If you're specifically yeah. looking at like crown group worms, like annelids. Then yeah, yeah. five hundred yeah. million years. Yeah, the, the years that there's like there's there's like there's twelve different phylums of worms almost. Yeah, there's so many w worms. Worms rule the world, honestly, because I mean, if you count nematodes or um, platyhelminths, I think is what they're called, which is like flatworms. If you count both of those as worms, then like it, the, the split goes all the way back to the bilateralian split, right? It goes all the way back to Urbilateralia, which would have been Ediacaran at least, you know. Maybe and, even like cryogenian, like we, that's we, how we, old that split is. And we and Fitch are in, are in the same coordinate for phylum, coordinate phylum. Yeah, yeah, and we're honestly relatively closely related. I, I think it's that's another thing I find kind of cool. Like one, how closely related we are to every other essentially animal that we see every day. You know, the, the difference between us and dogs is pretty minimal. But it also, like, how weird certain things are, like arthropods and trees. Yeah. You know, those are almost aliens. Yeah, science is weird sometimes. Like, I, I tell you, my, my, I take to my niece, like, that, that, like, say, like, goldfish and tuna are more related to us than they are, they, they are the sharks. Yeah. Well, I, you know, there's so many different layers to that as well. Like, you have, we're more closely related to lungfish than we are to coelacanths. And we're more closely related to coelacanths than we are to like a tuna and then we're more closely related to tuna than sharks. And so, you know, there's and, 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 and vice versa. They're, they're more closely related to us than, than they are the sharks. 
What'd you say? Tuna are more close, like tuna. They look similar, but tuna are more closer to us than they are the sharks. Even they look, they look yeah. similar. Yeah, and, and then it even you know it keeps going back. Like we're and more then, closely related to them than like hagfish. And then then like then like like fungus are more like fungus are more closely related to us than they are the the regular plants. Yeah, fungus fungus are almost sessile animals. That's how a lot of people refer to them. Um, because they're they're like a little bit more basal than sponges. There's a couple of uh, like protist bacteria that are in between us and fungus, but for the most part, we're pretty close. And plants are literally on the other side of eukaryota. Yeah, the only the only, the only thing that this this more distant is the archaea and the bacteria. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. That's another like crazy thing because we're more closely related to archaea than we are to bacteria, and there's certain like types of bacteria that we're more closely related to than those bacteria are to other bacteria. Yeah, because of the endosymbiosis thing. Well, yeah. Well, endosymbiosis, that, that confuses where you draw the line at life, in my opinion. But, I mean, just even phylogenetic with uh, nuclear DNA, right? Their bacteria is huge, and we evolved out of bacteria, but that means that there are still strains that are more closely related to us than there are to like, like E. coli is on the other end, right? They're pretty primitive bacteria. Yeah. Whereas like there's more derived bacteria that are pretty close to us comparatively. And, and then there's also, you know, where you draw the line of viruses and stuff or where they come from. Are, oh, they, like, are they like a offshoot brand? Did we, did we, did we like, when, when like when RNA came, did we divide from them then? One side became DNA and, and cells, the other side became viruses or they split between somewhere in the middle or, or both or whatever, you know, it's all crazy. Yeah, that's such an interesting. Uh, that's an, a very interesting debate for me. Like, are viruses alive? Because they they fill almost everything other than like homeostasis. And I don't, know, I don't the the line even you know, even with viruses. You know, you have pretty complex viruses to pretty simple viruses to like protoviruses, which are pretty much just circles of RNA. And at that point, you know. <laughs> Speaking of viruses, I, I heard, I heard that they're thinking about taking some like phage bacteria viruses to kill, to replace to replace some antibacterial antibacterial stuff. Since some, some, since the bacteria can be like some, some bacteria can evolve to be uh, what's the word like uh, immune to antibacterial stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually did some research on uh, like phages and phage therapy um, first semester. So, nice. yeah, that's, a, that's another pretty interesting thing. Uh, so, I, 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 so I, I would have to ask this, but I, I, I guess I already know the answer. But you, you're not, so you're definitely not like, like an anti-vaxxer person, then. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, yeah, that that's. I mean. So my channel right now has pretty much been exclusively evolutionary biology and like counter creation. Yeah. Um, but I do have plans in the future to like branch out a bit more to just pseudoscience in general, because I think it's all kind of interesting and I, I don't know if entertaining is the right word, Yeah, but you know what I mean? Like, you know what? I said this before thing, this is, I understand, I understand creationists more than I understand flat earthers because creationists have only like 100, 200 years to give the, get, get with the program. Flat earthers had a lot, had a lot, had a lot longer to get with get... <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you. There's some people that think they're equally ridiculous. I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that sentiment. Um, but I do think creationism is equally wrong. So. Yeah. <laughs> equally wrong, like today. They, 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 the, they, they, they had a hundred years. Most people get for young. They had a hundred years, two hundred years. Flat Earth, like what well, had like two thousand years to get get with like Earth Earth's round, two thousand years ago. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. I I almost I feel bad almost for flat earthers because that's something I feel like creationists in a lot of ways. There, some of them are conspiratorial for sure. Uh. But I, I think the conspiratorial mindset of flat earthers where it's like everyone's lying to you, you know, the government's lying to you, NASA's lying to you, everyone you know on the street's lying to you, that's just a really bad mindset to have. 
you know, that, that could be like a damaging mindset if you're afraid to go outside because you think the person at your local grocery store is lying to you. Well, that's pretty much what the same mindset that the, the vaxxers have, you know? Yeah, I, I think anti-vax movement, I, I, I wouldn't call it a movement, but that idea, I guess, is probably the most dangerous pseudoscience. At least damaging as in like immediate responses, right? They are, I think I think probably they don't understand that they know how evolution works too, because they don't understand why they, they get a flu shot every year, you know? Yeah, well, the, I think the, the interesting thing about um, anti-vaxxers is they sort of cross partisan lines. So you have people like the hippie-ish type people who are against anti-vax, and you also have like the super far-right uh, evangelical people who are anti-vax. Together they unite on <laughs> this crazy pseudoscience. It's probably, probably for different reasons though. Like one is, one is like, oh, we can have like, we can use our mushrooms or one side is probably more homo, 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 homeopathy and stuff. Yeah, like I'll just use this plant to cure my polio or measles. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah, homeopathy is also insane. Although I think, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I'm not from a very religious place. I've ne or, No, I'm from a very religious place. I'm not from a very like liberal place. I've never met someone who's like like new age pseudoscience, you know, like hippie-ish pseudoscience. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I see these arguments on, the face, on Facebook all the time. They're like, I never got sick before, but then I got my then I got my vaccine and I got sick for the first time ever. I got the, I got I got, I got sick because I got the vaccine. So like, because they cause I also don't know how vaccines work. I, I don't know how that completely, but but basically, vaccines give you like a, a little weakened or dead version of the virus. So you, so if the, the real thing ever attacks you, you miss it. I'm like, hey, I know this guy. Let's let's kill it before it hurts. Yeah. You. My favorite thing is whenever, I mean, coronavirus first, like, started becoming, you know, a big thing. And, like, I was seeing, I was actually seeing people saying, like, viruses aren't real. And to me, that was such a crazy, crazy thing. Because I have pictures of viruses that I have taken myself. You know what I mean? Like, I have, I have, like, electromicroscope viruses from bacteriophages. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend whose mom had has polio, you know, because it, it was she had it before the vaccine happened. Mm -hmm. She's like, she's like, she definitely was a the vaccine back then for polio. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really sad, but yeah, yeah, I I missed the chickenpox vaccine by a few years because I, I I had it when I was when I was four or five, so I and it came out a few years later. The vaccine did, so I met, so I so I got chickenpox as a mm. kid. I don't think I've ever. I honestly, I've never been like super, super sick. I've had the flu once or twice before. I remember when like H1N1 came around back in 2009, 2010. I remember I got sick from that, um, but everyone did. <laughs> you know, everyone who was in school at the time. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember that. that, that uh, they talked about years ago, but I remember that that one being that, that big of a deal 10, 10 years ago. Is I remember that well. I don't think it was that big of a pandemic as this one. This one came out to be. Well, I think more people were infected by H one N one, but the problem is the virulity of the you know SARS CoV two is much much worse. You know, like something like one ish percent, maybe a little bit less than one percent of all people who contracted die, which that's a very very large number, especially considering this is a very foreign virus. You know, yeah. there's people who might have had some immunity or like ability to fight off H one N one just because we've been around influenza since the beginning of time. Oh, yeah. And that's another thing. People on Facebook are like, oh, only, people are saying only, only, only 1% people die from this thing. Like, well, that's still a lot of people. It's, it's 7 billion people. 1% yeah. of people. Yeah, there's, there's people who are like, oh, well, 60 million people, or not 60 million, jeez. Uh, 60,000 people die of the flu every year. And it's like, okay, great. We don't need another 300,000 people to die from coronavirus. Yeah, because, you know, like at this point, we're used to the flu's been 100 years. So, so flu's been, flu's been around for like 100 years plus years. So, it's pe sure people are going to die from it than the, the, new, the new thing. Yeah. And, and I mean, not even just like more people, like, you know, we, we shouldn't have like just more people dying and just be fine with it. You know, just because a certain amount of people die from the flu every year doesn't mean it's fine to just have more people die. Like, <laughs> such a bad argument. Oh uh, yeah. 
Oh, God. Oh, so, oh, yeah, speaking of viruses and stuff, we, do you know a lot about ERVs? Um, I am, I'm pretty familiar with them. I, I'm very well informed about like the concept of them. I don't know like specifics about like which ERVs we have and stuff, but I'm pretty familiar with like retroviruses and stuff. So, yeah, I, I all I know basically about them is the viruses decide, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do a normal cell. I'm going to go after the sperm or egg generating cell. And, like, and, and then all of a sudden all the kids have the same virus, <laughs> all the cells. <laughs> Yeah, well, pretty much. A lot of the uh, endogenous retroviruses we have have been, you know, shut off. Most of them due to, like, things like methylation. Some of them due to mutations. Um, and that that's a big reason why, you know, you can construct phylogenies based on retroviruses. Because, you know, the insertion point for a retrovirus that we have is the same insertion point that a chimpanzee has, but not the same one that a gorilla has. So, you know, you can tell, okay, well, that virus infected our last common ancestor with chimpanzees. Um, and then that virus has stayed shut off, obviously, because, you know, sometimes if you demethylate um, the, the regions of, like, ERVs, then sometimes they can become viruses again and attack your cells. So. I was thinking, I was this thing where apparently... ERVs is, is are the reason we have placentals now. Placentas now. Yeah, I, I. Okay, so that's another thing I'm not super super well informed on. But if I remember correctly, the ERV used a promoter. Well, it's happened like multiple times. But the yeah. ERV used a promoter from like an adjacent gene, and what it does is it suppresses your immune system when you're pregnant because that's what viruses do. They suppress your immune system. Um, and so that's what helped us. It's what helped like mothers not attack their children while they're in the womb. Like, they, like I'm used to, Oh, a parasite. Let's kill it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's actually something kind of interesting. Cause you know, obviously they, the child has foreign DNA. So your body's probably going to recognize it like a parasite. That's probably, probably why things like, uh, marsupial branches get birth really fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a pretty big evolutionary leap for us. But another thing is that's interesting is uh, what's the word? Vi viva parity of you know live birth. It it's actually not super super exclusive to mammals. There's plenty yeah. of fish and plenty of reptiles that give live birth. Yes, a few snakes, a few fish, yeah. and, and amphibians. I think I think only one that doesn't give live births are the are the right now the are, are the dinosaurs birds. Yeah, I can't think of any like bird species that. But I wouldn't be surprised if we found a bird species that, you know, gave live birth either. So, yeah, that's just something I think is kind of interesting. And it, to me, it's even funnier how, like, clear the transition was from, you know, monotremes with the still having their shells to, to marsupials, which have very, very premature births to, you know, us. Um, yeah. yeah you, you, the thing I, I thought my, geez, that, that mammal, some mammals do lay eggs. Because yeah. marsup marsup not marsupials. I mean, monotremes are still mammals technically. There's still. Yeah. Well. Yeah, that's a, a cladistic thing. Um, but I, I I think that's really interesting, and that's another thing. I think a lot of creationists don't listen to their arguments um, because they're like, "Look, it's a mammal that lays eggs. You know, therefore evolution is false." And it's like, "Yeah, that's predicted. <laughs> that that's great example. Thank you for bringing that up." Um, <laughs> like, I honestly think, you know, obviously evolution would still be true, even if monotremes were extinct, but monotremes are a great strengthening, they, they, they strengthen the argument in favor of evolution quite a bit, just because we still have a mammal that lays eggs. Oh, yeah, I, I, I also talked about this. That how some D, D, the DNA stuff is is either either strict thing or morphology thing or totally blowing out of the water. Like, like apparently, I, I talked to with Jackson and Tony before. Like how we used to think that bats to be close to the primates or something like that. Big bats to be close to primates. All of a sudden, mm. you know, all of a sudden, pff, they way on the other side of the thing now. <laughs> yeah, um, there were some actually really interesting theories because bats are kind of morphologically similar to primates, like the the mega bats are. 
Yeah. So like the giant fruit bats and stuff, they thought those were uh, primates, whereas the other bats, the other chiropterans, I think, um, or the micro bats were about where they are. Like, um, like, like, for some reason, like, I don't know why that was a theory because to me it makes sense. For because they look like more like because they look like uh, what's, what's that thing? The colugos. Yeah, probably, probably yeah. The, but then they're like they came out they're like. Me. Yeah. I think it, I would be more surprised. I mean, maybe I'm just you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. But I feel like I would be more surprised if bats were completely unrelated groups. You know. Yeah. And then, then I think the the fun one is the the hippo whale comparison. Yeah, yeah. Whales are artiodactyls, right? Like nested within the uh, ungulates. You know, that that that's something that's interesting to me. Whales are more closely related to cows than cows are to horses. You know, phylogeny is weird. So, like, so was it hard for? Uh, I just learned about this recently, so. So I, I had the transfer from the the old text, the old text taxidermic thing, the cladistics recently. You know, like not recently, but you know, transition, like so, oh, from the old seven layers to like the, the now like the 80, 80 layers we have now. Yeah, yeah. I, the Linnaean system is, uh, I, I'm kind of torn on it, right? Because I think the Linnaean system is very bad, but I think it's also very useful. You know, because yeah. if you mention a Linnaean rank, it gives people a general idea of what we're talking it, about. Yeah, it's it's more. I think it's probably for like basic, maybe basic, simple understanding, probably. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, like I was talking about, you know, there's the, there's two species of coelacanths in the same genus that are more different than we are from New World monkeys, and there's one species of coelacanth that has two populations with more divergence than us in gorillas, right? Yeah, it's. Uh also, see, look, see, look at that and stuff like that. Like, they're probably more close to us, but you ever know when we split up? Like some, or like some, like some animals more lead to us than other animals than are each other. Like, like say, you know what I mean? Like, like seal cans. All, probably all see, right now. Probably now all seal cans are more, more closely related to each other than they are, are they are to us. Probably right. Yeah. Well. Yeah. They're still. They're, they've separated after the KPG extinction. So they're actually more closely related to each other than any fossil we've ever found of the coelacanth still. Um, but, you know, uh, they're more closely related to each other than we are be just because we separated from them like 40 million years or 400 million years ago, roughly. Uh, I talked earlier about our, ri our rivalry with the, the raven fish, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> they had a joke, was joking. The joke, and evolution-wise, I, I think other I joked before other our other rivalry would be with the with the the protostones. <laughs> the protostone deuterostone rivalry. Yeah, because they got the land they got the land for we did, right? Yeah. And they got. I, the, I would definitely say we're losing the protostones. And they got the, and they also they also, they also beat us the air too. The, 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 probably the first insects were in the flying insects were probably in the carboniferous. That's way before the pterodactyls and birds and, and bats, you know, so they, they do the land and the air. Yeah. I honestly, and also, you know, like ants way more than humans and ants are just a sub, like a subclass of hyman, uh, hymenoptera. You know, we are very, very much like, if you're going by biomass, we are being destroyed by like arthropods alone. And, you know, you still have like mollusks and everything else. that's a protostome. Um, how many fossils do we have in this lineage from Sarcopterygii? Well, what do you mean by that? Do you mean that, like, I mean, I had a, a slideshow with, like, you know, just a few. Honestly, I just sort of scratched the surface of, well, like... technically, human fossils are, are, are in this lineage, too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. If, you're, if we're going back from, like, humans all the way to uh, the first lobefin fish... Gosh, that would be quite a few fossils. Um, uh, also, do you think you think we eat, you think we eat chickens and turkeys now via dinosaurs to, as revenge for the, when they used to eat us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that that was started. I'm pretty sure there was a mammal in like the late Jurassic or something that was known to eat small dinosaurs. 
Yeah. So that that's where it started. I'm assuming. Uh, then that, um, that was the the beginning of our revenge. He was the, uh, you know, the oh. nighttime vigilante. Oh yeah, that reminds me of the uh, the the biapsid uh, synapsis rivalry in the Permian. The synapsis pretty much ruled the Earth, and then we lost. And then the Mesozoic, the, the Diapsid took it took over, and, and then they died. We, we took it, we took it over again, and at at this at the creation period, <laughs> like Valley of the Earth, like 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 how, we're in charge now. Like like we'll, like, yeah. we'll, we'll wait. Well, I, I I don't know if that's too uh, too fortunate for us because you know maybe we'll get re maybe the Diapsids will reclaim their position on top sure. in the future. Overtaken by my crusted gecko right here. Yeah, and I, oh yeah, I also, I also joked with, with er, I, mean, I also joked with Erica you know, about this, you know, about how the new, the simi, the monkeys, you know, simians were like the new ones were like the old world monkeys were like, hey, I bet you guys can't jump over to the other kind of over there, like like oh yeah, I bet we can. <laughs> 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 and then, that's how the new world monkeys got over to South America. <laughs> A little bet between primates. <laughs> Probably not. But what's the weirdest thing? What's the weirdest thing about science that that that, that you that you know of? Oh, um, like within phylogeny specifically. What, what? I guess that, but really anything, really. Well, with regards to phylogeny specifically, I think honestly, just the the fact that we're fish and like birds or dinosaurs, yeah. like. You know, just how many crazy things, because, you know, or like birds are more closely related to crocodiles and crocodiles are to lizards. And, you know, the, oh, yeah. phylogeny is a really weird thing when you zoom out and you're not looking at it from like this very small time scale that we have right now. Um, yeah. I think, I think for me, it would be the chemistry, like chemistry thing, I mean, not chemistry, but like, 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 for example, like, like both oxygen and hydrogen are flammable gases, right? Uh huh. You put them together. You have water, out. yeah, Ooh. and and like, and also both sodium and chlor and chlorine are poisonous to us, right? Mm -hmm. Put them together, you get salt. You got table salt, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess we're zooming out to like chemistry, and I guess uh, physics, quantum mechanics is crazy. Just the idea that like you know something, an electron. I think we the buckyballs are like 60 carbon atoms and we've still gotten wave behavior out of them. And that's, you know, that's crazy to me. And to me, the weirdest thing about it is it only changes its um, attributes if you measure it. Right. So, you know, does that mean it's one of those things like if a tree falls in the forest, will anyone hear it? If a tree falls in the forest, is it a wave or a particle because no one's there to observe it? Like <laughs> that, that's brain breaking to me. Also, also, uh, about observing things, well, telescope, your natural eyes, you know, you think about up the, in the stars, like like how many stars up there you see in the sky sky at night are still there technically in, in real time. Uh, they, they, they really exploded. They, they died years ago, and we don't know it yet because it takes forever to let get to us. Yeah. Well, don't you know that all the stars were put there 6,000 years ago and supernovas are just fireworks for us to gaze upon? <laughs> yeah no it's like i said deep time just really big numbers our our tiny brains are terrible at dealing with big numbers um you know humans really only evolved to count anything between like zero and a thousand and once you get to like a million a billion you know these are big numbers who cares but the difference between a million years ago and a billion years ago is insane you know a million years ago you almost you have like homo erectus so you almost have us and if you go back a billion years ago i think that's in the middle of the boring billion so it's we're, like we're still, we're still at that point we're still, I, I don't know, at that point i don't even know if multi multi cellular creatures have, have, have arrived yet at that point no a billion years ago there definitely weren't multicellularity there may have been eukaryotes maybe you know like we're, we're still in like the early like cyanobacteria and stuff like um, that it's just big numbers. Big numbers are weird. Yes, yeah, like a thousand, like even 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 close time a thousand years ago. Um, 
that the Europe was still forming it together, and, and two thousand years ago, it was the Roman 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 time. Yeah. Well, okay. So um, Jesus is closer in age to the opening of the first Arby's, I think it is, than Jesus is to the opening or to like the building of the pyramids in Egypt. Yeah, I, I, I've heard that. Yeah, and like while the pyramids were being built, there were still mammoths living in Wrangell Island. <laughs> Um, yeah, so anything that's like outside of our lifetime, it's hard to deal with other than adjusting like math and numbers, in my opinion, at least. Because it, cause it, cause it doesn't it never happen because because were you were you there? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't observe the pyramids, therefore, I don't know if they they exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen your, I, I, I haven't seen your, yeah, I haven't seen your one. Of, your one video is, 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 so it doesn't exist either. So I, so I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> exist. No, it, no. <laughs> well, I'm actually, I'm very surprised that I got so many views from it. Like, I think I have 100-ish subs, um, and I have two views. Both of them have, like, over 250 views, which to me is, like, mind-blowing. I thought, like, maybe 30 people would see it. <laughs> it it's, always good. it's always good when you have more views and you have subscribers. <laughs> yeah, well... We'll see. I, I think that is good because, like I said, it, it kind of takes a bit of pressure off, I guess, as far as, like, having to appease subs. I, I feel like I wouldn't have as much of an obligation to make content if I had, you know, 300 subs like uh, I do on one of my videos. Yeah. I, a long time ago, I decided, you know, to post videos that even though, even though posting certain videos would probably make them more popular – I I post videos that I want that I want to post, not 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 to gain popularity, just because I like I like the subject. Yeah, that, that's something I kind of want to implement. Like I was talking with Speed of Sound earlier today about this, and I I think for me, I want to post things that I'm interested in instead of posting things that I feel like people would enjoy, just so that like. And you know, at the end of the day, I really don't care that much about like subs, and I don't, I don't think I'm ever gonna get like a Patreon or anything like that because I just don't want to be like held accountable to a group of people. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just want to like post about what I enjoy. At the I time. do like, I, I would like my my subs get, getting a little bit because you know there's a thing on YouTube, but you know, but there are probably some I play some games on YouTube too. There are probably some games that are more popular that, that I, if I play. That I probably get more more views and stuff, but I don't like those games. <laughs> I'm more yeah. interested in those games. Mm -hmm. Speaking of games, you ever you play any video games or anything like that? Okay, so it's been a, it's been a bit. Um, I used to play more video games in high school, and I got rid of my desktop computer um, whenever I went off to college, so I don't really have anything to play. I, I have a Switch, so I've been playing like games on my Switch pretty frequently, but not like any, uh, any PC Switch. games. I have a Switch too. After this, maybe, after the, after this, maybe we can we can exchange Switch Power ideas. Codes. Yeah. All right. All right. Um. Yeah. I I mostly just like play it socially, I guess. Like if I'm with friends or if I'm like talking to friends, I'll play it with them. But I don't play too many games by myself anymore. Yeah. I'm mainly right now. I, I I've always liked RPG game. I I always liked RPGs and stuff. And mm -hmm. not, right now I'm in, I, I'm pl I'm into visual visual novels. Really, I have a friend who's right now like just got in like super into JRPGs, and he's playing Xenoblade for like the third time. <laughs> yeah, and uh, played all the Fire Emblems recently. Yeah, my favorite game series right now is still Kingdom the Kingdom Hearts series. Really, I'm, I I remember playing Kingdom Hearts. I don't remember if it was one or two. Whenever I was pretty little, it was on like the Wii. Yeah, um, technically, yeah, technically, I uh, technically I own all. Th I own Kingdom Hearts one for the PS two, PS three, and PS four. So that's how <laughs> that's how intimate I was. Oh, the game came out. Gotta get the new system. Gotta get the new system. <laughs> yeah. No, the yeah. only games I don't own are the are the Game Boy game ones. <laughs> um, are, are there Kingdom Hearts Game Boy exclusives? Well, technically, yes. Kind of. There's, there's, there's the. See, there's, uh, uh, day, 358 days, and. And recoded for the for the DS, right? Mm -hmm. And they technically, but when they put it, when they made the 
the big uh, bundle thing for the PS4, PS3 and PS4 systems. For those two games, they only put the cutscenes on the, on the system, not the game. So you, uh-huh. so, if you, if you, so you want to. So you can watch what happened in that they're like, like cutscene versions, but you can't actually play the game on the PS4 version. So you still gotta get either get get the, the original games or you gotta get off the of emulators. Huh. So yeah. It's like it's, it's, it's terrible. It's, yeah. Really, the only single player game that I've ever been super into is like the Pokemon series. Oh yeah, I don't. I really. I don't. Besides Go for a while, I haven't played Poke. Last time I played a Pokemon game. Realistically, my emulator was 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 gold and silver. That's why I st- that's why I stopped playing it. Really, the like hard gold and silver, silver or like gold and silver, R- original gold and silver. Wow. Okay, so like Gen two. That's yeah. Been a while. I I, I never I, I I never even got got, got crystal the, the the like the the re- reboot version of that. So yeah. So yeah. So so uh, because after that because it was a Game Boy. The Game Boy Advance was the last Game Boy I, I I owned. When did Gold and Silver even come out? About two thousand, I think two thousand one. Nine uh, November twenty first, nineteen ninety nine. Wow. I I've played every generation that I've been alive for, um, and then I played like Gen one and Gen two back on emulators. Yeah, um, I was. Yeah, I was uh, right out of high school when the original games came out. So. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was I was born in two thousand, so I uh, I've played Gen three, Gen four, Gen five, Gen six, Gen seven, and Gen eight. Yeah, I, I grew up I grew up on the original t- Nintendo and Atari. Really? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I was I was Game Boy Advanced first, and then I got a Wii, and then I didn't get a Wii U, but now I have a Switch. So yeah, oh, and I had a DSi at some point. Yeah, I I had a a Game Boy, a Game Boy Pocket, a Game Boy Color, and a Game Boy Advance. Yeah, <laughs> but then never got the DS because at that by that point I had transferred over to the the PlayStation. <laughs> mm. Is that like PSP and stuff? Well, yeah, I n- never got no, I never got the PSP, but the PlayStation, PlayStation Two, PlayStation Three, PlayStation Four. Oh, okay. No, never got the never got the portable PlayStation games like the Vita or the PSP. Mm-hmm. I've I've never had. I've never had like a a console. I, my brother has a PlayStation Four somewhere, but um, the only consoles I've ever had have been Nintendo consoles. So the Wii and the Switch, and the Switch is even like arguably, you know, like a it's arguably handheld. It, it's um, more of a hybrid, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mostly played PC like throughout middle school and high school. Well, the problem is in high school, middle school, high school when I was PC, you know, games I could. Pl- it, it, was, it was when I was in high school. PCs were more primitive, still not not yeah. not, 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 not not I mean not as like like uh, with with the word um uh how size primitive primitive but you know the, the floppy floppy disk you know and the uh-huh. five and five gigabyte hard drives on your on your computer was like was a big a big deal like oh my god my computer's whole five gigabyte hard drive space that's awesome that's a lot of space. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I'm about as old as you can be and have grown up with like the age of modern computing, you know? Because I've sort of like grown up with computers my whole life, and they've been getting more advanced as I've been getting more. Still, so I I think I, I think I got in the beginning of it, like like I said, like I said with the five inch floppy disks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I just mean like I, I feel like computers have been almost the same since I was a kid. Like I, I remember like Windows Vista. Oh, I, I I hated Vista. Yeah, because there's that's, a, that's like the earliest uh, operating yeah. system that I remember. Yeah, my uh, my earliest Windows was ninety five. Windows ninety five. Mm-hmm. <laughs> actually, no, it's actually it was three point one. But yeah, I hate I, but Vista. I hate Vista. Every time I every time I, every time I want to delete something, the program or something or file, it was like, are you sure you want to delete this? Like, yes. Are you positive? Like, <laughs> yeah, like three times. Like, yes, I want to delete this damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't even, I, I mean, I mostly used like Windows 7 up until Windows 10 came out pretty much. So yeah. like from the time Windows 7 came out to the time Windows 10 came out, it was pretty much all I used. So yeah. what, like 10-ish years at least? Yeah, I, yeah, I skipped, I skipped over eight completely. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think I ever had eight. If I did, it wasn't by choice. 
<laughs> it was by like an accidental software update or something. Oh, and then I, I briefly went. I my actually my very first computer would have to. I, I had a my very first computer was an Apple II computer. Mm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't. My family had a desktop. It was probably just some generic HP. But yeah. Oh, then uh, did you get? Did you ever? Uh, did you ever have to have? Do you ever do the dial-up call? Well, I, I know how to do like rotary dial-up and stuff like that. Um, I've never had to do it for like internet. You said that you had dial-up internet. I've never had that. Yeah, it's very it's very bad. I, I used to play an online game FF FF eleven Final Fantasy eleven mm -hmm. via dial-up. So I had to I had to. To, to download patches, I had to stay, keep my computer on all night long <laughs> to, to do it because I couldn't. So I couldn't do it in the daytime because people enter the call, call or people pick the phone up and then text and terminated. <laughs> all that. Oh my gosh! So yeah, it was it was very thing. Of course, of course, that was pre pre YouTube too. So just playing games was bad enough. But I don't. But once one video started happening, it, like like okay. Buffer for, for five minutes. Okay, two, two seconds of video. Okay, another five minutes of buffering. Two more seconds of video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, te technology. Uh, all right, so I, I guess I guess we're at this point with just, just talking. So anything before we go, anything you want to advertise on your about coming up on your channel or anything? Um, I have. I I, I guess I, I still do have future plans. Um. I should have a video coming out about Proboscidean phylogeny soon, and then um, Proboscideans on the Ark pretty soon, um, because that's an interesting problem that I've sort of found. I think it's pretty funny. Um, and then also, I want to watch a Flat Earth video with one of my friends who's studying astrophysics. <laughs> I want to see what uh, he thinks of all that. <laughs> so, cool. well, I, well, I hope you come. I hope you can come on my channel again in the future. Maybe we, we, maybe we can talk about another animal group or something. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like anytime you want to talk about phylogeny, just let me know. I'm pretty sure everyone else is either sick of hearing about it or just doesn't uh, want to in general. Well, I, uh, I, well, my audience probably hasn't heard, heard about heard, heard about it yet. So I, I'm always into learning new things. Yeah. Oh no, that that's that's great. I I, I also uh, love learning new stuff. So. In fact, that's my that's my closing catch. That's that's my probably my closing catchphrase. All right, so, all right. See you guys. Never stop learning. Enjoy the randomness. <laughs> I'll see you next time. Bye. All right. If you just do it, it'll turn out okay. Hey everyone, day night night here. Talking time with caffeine. I figured t today would be a gr great opportunity to talk with someone who wrote a book about the subject. Oh, yes. It's right behind my shoulder there. Mm. Uh, Evolution slam dunk. <laughs> like somewhere on that shelf there. Yeah. Oh. All about the therapsids, a.k.a. synapsids, words that everybody is going to go, what? <laughs> and that's why well, I, uh, I went, yeah, go ahead. Do, 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 do the intros. I, I got to say, before we get to that, though, I, I figured we could, uh, so we, I did the, a similar, not something, but a subject with uh, Walker about our the about the about the uh sarcoptrii sar sar yeah to to tetrapod yeah. translation yeah. so i figured we start i said i figured before we get the synapses we go we, we left off and start talk about the three forms before synapses uh, oh, wow, yeah, because, uh, well, the synapsids actually are starting to come in during the Carboniferous, which I think is just after the Devonian when the early tetrapods are occurring. And so what yeah. you got, you basically got the origin of amphibians uh, before you get to the reptiles. And the amphibians have the living on land thing down, but they're still very much 
uh, mating in water and watery eggs and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. the great innovation, which I'm not a super expert on, you should probably try to pin down somebody who can fill in that little thing, the origin of the amniotic hard-shelled egg. That's, the, that's one of the great innovations that land animals developed to where now they weren't restricted to living by water. They could boink yeah. and reproduce just about anywhere. And they did exactly that. Yeah. From what I remember, the first the first three stages, first is the tetrapods, four limbs, which we have. Yeah. We have four, we have four limbs. I, I think I think we all have four limbs. Do you have four limbs? I the last time I looked, yes. Uh, then I think it was next one was reptilomorph, was it called? Yeah, the reason why those come in is because, and I, I pointed this out in uh, uh, Evolution Slam Dunk, technically speaking, reptiles, which means your nice basic lizards and your squamate snakes and your crocodiles and, and your... your uh, um, um, Birds? Gila, Gila monsters, anything that you felt like in this area. Um, these are all groups that are actually occurring later than the synapsids are in the diversion thing. So what we've got is that class reptilia um, refers to just that bunch. And so even though the synapsids are called the reptile like mammals, um, they always, you almost want to put like quotation marks around that. Even though uh, I brought my show and tell of the probably the most instantly memorable Dimetrodon, which almost oh, yeah. everybody has seen from dinosaur kid sets. And that's a synapsid reptile, which will go into all the fiddly bit details on that. But yeah. um, they look reptile-y to start with. And so we then go back to what exactly is the characteristics of that? Um, they still have relatively splayed posture. Uh, they're uh, uh, land vertebrates. They have kind of gotten rid of the multiple digits that the early tetrapods had. Six, seven, yeah. eight really is clumsy for a land animal. And they get stuck in a pentadactyl mode, which almost all vertebrates have stuck with, with minor modifications over time, usually, well, not usually, always involving loss of digits, which you find particularly so in dinosaurs and that bunch, they drop digits like nobody's business, whereas the mammals uh, tend to be relatively uh, straightforward on that. Uh, so uh, bearing in mind that when I say reptile mammal transition, um, I'm, I'm not using that in that precise systematic way that I'm looking at it. That even Robert Prothero, uh, which if you don't, it, while you're buying my book, also buy Robert Prothero's wonderful books on fossils. They're absolutely magnificent, beautifully illustrated. Um, uh, uh, Jackson uh, has drawn on that one as well because that's his field. He's a mammal paleontologist and he goes into a ton of material and wonderful things that is critical of, of creationism. They go and explain why the fossils are what they are. Even he says that, you know, if you had one of these critters next to you and a, and a standard run of the mill reptile, uh, it'd be hard to tell them apart <laughs> and you'd have to look closely at the yeah. structure of what's going on in the jaws and detail limbs yeah. and suture patterns. Well, at, at that, at that time we had just, we, we had, in geological terms, we had only recently split up, split from our cousins then. Uh, well, at, at the, um, here we'll get into the, the, we'll define more about what the synapsids means, but in many respects, the synapsids are the first big kids off the block when it comes to dominating the landscape that way. So the reptile group, which we will be more precisely the diapsids, um, uh, they are um, the ones that are emerging later on and eventually become very dominant, but they weren't to start out with. So let's start right yeah. at the basics. Oh, which I, I, fast, I, I made a joke about that one time. Like after the amniote split up into the, the mm -hmm. diapsids and the synapsids, give or take, or whatever they were called yeah. for the diapsids, like like it was like a civil war. In the Permian, the synap the, the synapsid side ruled. And then all of a sudden, the, the diapsids won the war for a few, for a few. For yeah, few I don't years. I don't like to quite use the the warfare analogy. What I, I know, did it was a joke. That and then then we took back we got we got back after after the the asteroid hit. Yeah, we we won. Probably we, should we, for everybody we, that um, is coming into this kind of cold. And by the way, almost every creationist you bump into will have problems with map of time issues. So it's always good to have a clear sense of this in your own framework. 
I will trade down your nice big Mesozoic period, 150 million years. You got Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Pretty much those are buzzwords which a lot of people will know, although we all we bumped into creationists. <laughs> you bumped into a, a, a creationist and others that, that don't really understand those terms. But that big block of 150 million years, uh, the, the middle period, meso means middle, the middle age, uh, like middle earth, was the time that separated from the really early stuff that was like trilobites and all that, and then the modern period, which is the age of mammals. That was the kind of the, the frame that I was growing up with. Well, almost all of the mammal stuff that on origins of mammals is before the Mesozoic. By the time we get down to the late Triassic, when the first dinosaurs are appearing, um, the early mammals are on the scene. And so we have to look at what had happened earlier. The Permian period, which had the big mass extinction at 250, uh, and that spread into the Triassic, and that was the marking of the new Mesozoic age. That was the, 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 the great heyday of uh, the, the therapsids and synapsids. And they had, in fact, been dominating the show. It wasn't as though there weren't any reptiles around. The reptilia were starting to emerge around the same later on, but during the time when the synapsids were, were controlling things so yeah. well. Uh, and it's, it's, it, it's hard to get an it's hard to get a leg up in a new niche. There's part of the issues that you go. If you're the yeah. earliest kids on the block, newcomers have trouble invading your niches. And yeah. so for a, a long time, the the the, the uh, synapsids were so diverse and successful that everybody else was kind of scampering in the corner until uh, a mass extinction upsets our, everybody's our, apple cart. Our good old friend extinction. Yeah, yeah. And and don't remember, don't forget that in that Permian mass extinction, this is in the tail end of the story that we're going to be telling. Uh, only one little order of therapsids squeaked through the the Permian this, mass extinction. This, the cyanots. Uh, the L Lystrosaurus, I think, uh, oh, I when the pigs the ruled the earth, there was an old sh uh, show on there. But yeah, the, the synodonts, in fact, I think are even a little bit later in the, oh. the Triassic period. There's, there, Were they and, the synodonts? Uh, well, there's there's a whole bunch of terminology there that oh. can just bog you down because there's so many. Okay. The dot part, by the way, refers to teeth. And yeah. that's telling you something really important about what's going on in those yeah. Uh, synodonts and that uh, that makes it so distinctive and there's uh, a reason why um, uh, the the synapsids are are uh, doing okay. things that yeah. you're not seeing happening over in the reptile side. Yeah, but okay, we're we're getting, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. That's way yeah. in the future. It's easy to do. Yeah. So so what makes us synapsids? Okay, uh, it's that we have one skull hole in our skull. Now, if you look at the typical uh, dinosaur, you're going to see a bunch of openings was one for the nose, the nares, and there's another for the orbit, for the eyeball. But there's also skull openings behind, and those are muscle attachments. And the arc, uh, dinosaurs, archosaurs, and others are characteristic diapsid, two, two skull openings. So on the skull, it's as if you've got, well, it's hard to turn around here in such a way that, I mean, um, uh, that yeah, I'm on this side. Okay. There'd be a hole here and a hole here, well back on the skull. The original uh, organisms didn't have muscle attachment holes. They just the muscles were just attaching directly onto the bone. And what these skull openings allow is for a little bit more grabbiness around the edge to act as more of a lever. And it's no coincidence that the diapsids, with their two skull opening muscle attachments, uh, had kind of extra snappy jaws, and that probably gave them an advantage as time wore on. But they weren't on the scene initially. What was on the scene were the single opening synapsids. They should call it monapsid or something that would have been better sense. But, you know, that damn Greek and Latin crap that everybody was fiddling off of. So they got stuck with it. S-Y-N synapsid. Uh, and what that single skull opening eventually turns into, when we look at a skull, a Halloween skull, we don't see something back in the skull because everything is morphed around. That skull opening has shifted forward, and it is what we call the zygomatic arch. This part right here in our cheekbone, that's the old synapsid thing morphed around to be kind of flat, and the jaw structure has come up into it. So that's a little bit of the basic anatomy. And, and one thing that makes them so distinctive, 
That's why if you go into a museum and you know the difference between um, a mammal form and a uh, um, diapsid, you can spot it. You'd go for that damn zygomatic arch. If it's got one of those little openings that come across like that, you go, uh oh, that's a mammal. <laughs> then the other thing is the damn teeth. And that's where we'll, we'll be getting into that in the course of the storyline. <laughs> so after uh, the synapsids, what was our, what was our next big thing? What was our... Well, the, the whole issue involves, uh, uh, and I won't go into all the, the, the grisly terminology because it's better to remember what's happening rather than to remember which name refers to what. Because there, there's a, they True. covered a hundred million years. It's a bewildering, elaborate thing, and and a, since a lot of them look a lot alike, um, it's not as easy as you are with dinosaurs, where you go, oh, yeah. there's a Triceratops and there's a Stegosaur, where they've got so many little surface details that make them very easy. Most of your of your synapsids minus the frill. Uh, yeah. look a lot like this for a very long time until they look a little less like that, until they realize that they've got fur and they're yeah. now in early mammal status. So, okay, so, so the but, thing... Sorry. Yeah. I was going to ask you, yeah. so after after the synapses, is this where we split, is this where we split off from the... the the metrodons at this point or further oh, down? Uh, well, they're, they're, in a, they're in an early group of, there were both uh, predators and herbivores. And there's actually a, a huge number of lineages. In their own way, the synapsids are just as diverse as the dinosaurs were. They, they don't get as big. Uh, the dimetrodon's about, oh, 12 feet long, something like that. And that's, you know, it's, it's a, 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 and that's including the tail. Uh, they're not ridiculously large by dinosaur standards. And when I was a kid growing up, I was I was kind of poo-pooing those little synapsids because they just look like reptiles. They're not nearly as yeah. neat as my dinosaurs. I know. I had I used to have, I used to have a, I had a book about dinosaurs, and unfortunately, I know the time I do now, but. They had, I think they had the metrodons within that group of dinosaur book. Oh, they're, they're routinely put in dinosaur kits because they're prehistoric beasts. Uh, and a lot of them, my particular case, because I'm an old fart, so I'm growing up in the 1960s. And there was a dinosaur set, and I still have them. And you still see the molds that are used for them for relatively cheap kids' dinosaur sets today because they're not on the same scale. But they're based on the Yale University mural. A uh, pageant of life, or something like that, that was done. I don't know, 1930s or so. And and almost all of the designs that they used for these were drawn lock, stock, and barrel, including the color. So there was a white tyrannosaur and a brown brontosaurus, and there was a dimetrodon, and there was a sphenacodon, and moss chops, and these various critters. They're all in that bloody mural. And so they were basically making little kids' models of them but they weren't to scale. And I knew they weren't dinosaurs and they looked kind of normal reptile-y. They weren't up on their hind legs and doing neat things uh, or gigantic like the way brontosaurs were. Uh, so all the critters that we're seeing, they diversify, but they diversify in a subtle way. And, and it's all about the bloody head because unlike um, the dinosaurs where there's so much variation in the number of neck vertebrae and these side frills and spikes and all that, Apart from the occasional fin back, um, most of them are trimmed down critters with about the same back anatomy, uh, the same pelvic structure. There's very little modification to that. Where the thing changes is in the head and it involves the jaw and what happens with the jaw and the teeth. Because here's where we get to the slam dunk of why the reptile mammal transition is so cool and why I didn't need to put a PowerPoint because I li we literally carry the evidence around in us. Your standard vertebrate jaw has a dentary bone right up in the front, and then there's a bunch of other bones behind it, and the one in the back is the articular bone, which articulates, duh, with the uh, quadrate bone up in the skull. That's the standard layout, fish and amphibians, and uh, all the reptiles and all the dinosaurs, all of that stuff, same, monotonous, boring, duh. Except us. Mammals uniquely don't have that arrangement. And it was figuring out how that happened is what the whole reptile mammal transition is about. Because what we start seeing, uh, these fossils also, and let me give a little time frame, not only for the period of what we're talking about, Carboniferous, which is like, uh, oh, uh, yipes, 300 million years ago or more, uh, yeah. down into the Permian period, down to 250. That's the big heyday of what we're talking about in this uh, bit. Um, so, 
quick question real fast. Yeah. Uh, did the did the synapses split off from the amniotes and the, the whatever the other group was co called uh, during the Carboniferous still, or was this during the, in the Permian now? Um, well, the, the early synapsids are, are starting to develop in the Carboniferous period, very as late, if memory serves me. So most of their big activity of diversifying uh, is occurring later. It's in by the time the synapsids have come along, a little bit later on, as they're diversifying, that's when you start seeing the first absolute crown reptiles. And again, they remain very, very trivial. They have little niches. Uh, there's probably a good paleoecological reason why they're doing what they're doing and why they're going into other areas. But an interesting bunch that led off in new directions, an awful lot of the group, their gorgonopsids and others that are in the early synapsid line that eventually just fizzle out, they go extinct. Now, we're talking 100 million years, 50 million years that these things will have run, but nonetheless, they're not the group that eventually led into mammals. The ones that led into mammals are relatively small, way smaller than Dimetrodon. These are, are getting now to be mouse-sized critters. But what's really curious about them is what's happening with their jaw. And the jaw, the dentary bone that holds those teeth is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That diaps, uh, that synapsid skull opening is morphing around more. Oh, I see Ian Chen uh, is in the live chat. I got the live chat. There. Hi, Ian. I've been giving uh, hey. Ian some pointers He's uh, been uh, considering having some debates uh, with Standing for Truth and Nephilim Free, and I was giving him some source material uh, on that so that he could deal with that stuff. It's it's fun. Anyway, we're, we're, we're in the exciting world of synapses. Um, so that dentary bone is getting bigger and bigger. And something else is kind of interesting is that if you look at a, a standard dinosaur, um, and in fact, reptiles in general, their teeth are pretty much all the same. Whatever kind of teeth they have, they got a bunch of them along that dentary bone. And that dentary bone can get quite large, but it's always got those little extra bones at the end. Whereas what's starting to happen as well with mammals or the synapsid line is there are teeth with varying shapes in the same jaw structure. That's the thing that eventually become all the Dimetrodon style teeth are pretty much the same thing, although even they've got a bit of a fang structure for some of the long versions. But eventually this becomes much more dominant. And even though uh, in diapsids, in dinosaurs, you have uh, teeth shapes that can form like leaf forms and there's like cheese grater things that you find in the ceratopsids and the hadrosaurs uh, that uh, make for complex structures. Mammals are very specialized in having those front canines and then the molars in the back and the molars have complex cusps that allow them to do occlude. And so they can grind up stuff. Uh, uh, meat, uh, they're, they're herbivores. They can grind up stuff in very, very uh, the meat slicing carnassials for uh, um, uh, predator types and all that. That slowly but surely starts developing and eventually develops in the varying lineages that pop down the line. And, and there's, in fact, a whole subcategory of the various teeth shapes that have occurred in those synapses and into the mammals. And there was an analysis that was done a few years ago. I can't think, Yernval or, or, um, uh, or somebody was starting with a key, I've, a K, I've referenced it in the book. But they have found the genes that govern those little cusps on the teeth. And they've been able to retro engineer different teeth forms based upon flipping around the gene regulations, including extinct ones that are only known in those therapsids that aren't known in any further version. So that's that's paleoengineering again. Anyway, so, so what you got, yeah, jump in. I was gonna say, the so, so what makes us therapsids then? That, I think that's the next Okay, major, all, all the terminology is, the synapsid is the, is the single jaw bit, the rhapsids they start using later on in the field that these are the groups that are getting more and more mammalian in structure. Then finally, you've got these synodonts that are a subset of those that are just getting really close to mammalness. And by mammalness, then what are we talking about? We're talking about the jaw structure. We're talking about tooth forms. We're talking about a uh, fur. Uh, we're talking about all the hair and lactation and all that and eventually live birth. Uh, there's a whole bunch of elements that we normally would tag mammal. And as they started to accumulate the data, it was clear that these did all happen all at once. But yeah. this was a long-term process. I, so 
question, another question. Was the Rapsits around the time that we maybe s switched from uh, endothermic to echo, echo, what was that? I can't, yeah, I think that would be a fair thing. Uh, I can't pronounce the, the problem actual with the, term for it. Yeah, endothermy versus ectothermy, warm-blooded versus cold-blooded. Yeah, uh, that's occurring during the therapsids. And it's highly likely that the thermostat is developing. And the same thing is happening over in dinosaurs, by the way, which is actually now starting to be contemporary when you start getting into the Mesozoic. Um, that um, th there's an issue about just high a thermostat did dinosaurs have, and did all of them have the same high thermostat? And remember, birds are warm-blooded and have a higher temperature than mammals. They their thermostat's a couple degrees higher than ours. It'll, they just burn it like never. Um, never mind. Um, so yes, that that thermal regulatory issue. There's a development of the specialized mammalian four-chamber heart, which again has popped up. Um, the crocodiles developed a four-chambered heart and were doing that, but then kind of lost it as unnecessary when the crocodiles moved into what we now have, which have a relatively limited range. They're not as nearly as diverse as they were during the dinosaur period. Yeah, so yeah I know. Yeah, off the topic, of the egg, I, I had some crocodiles were on hooves and everywhere else. They were on land, some land crocodiles and sea, ocean crocodiles. They were all over the yeah. place. Yeah. In uh, in one of the, my, uh, I think, tip 1.4, I went into some information on that. And I, and I think we I allude to it somewhat in um, Evolution Slam Dunk. And I think we bring it up as well in the rocks were there. Uh, the crocodiles are really interesting. And it really pisses off crocodile experts when people say, oh, they're like living fossils. No, they're not. Have you any idea how diverse the crocodilia formes are? No, 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 no. And that's another thing when you mention the mammalia formes. Um, and you've got reptilia formes, and you've got dinosaur formes, and you've got uh, uh, avia formes, and uh, uh, mammalia formes. In other words, when you're before you see the first definites of anything, there's in the fossil record already the almosts, the nearlies, the boy that's close to's, <laughs> and that's yeah. exactly what you'd expect from. Yeah, an Erica talked about that on the last episode. The difference between a primate and a primate, primate morph. Yeah. And uh, um, there again, you're talking about critters that start out uh, about the size of a, of a you, know, you can hold them in your hand, little itty bitty critters. And uh, only later on do we start seeing larger forms and adapting into different environments and shifting biogeographically. And there's all that kind of stuff, which is why paleontology is so absolutely delightful and why creationists are so bad at it, because there's so much information that they need to deal with. So back to our synapsids and, and this jaw teeth thing okay. is that What's interesting is uh, one of the things that Michael Denton, the anti-evolutionist with the Discovery Institute, was uh, bringing up is what was supposedly the adaptive reason why a jaw would shift over to the mammal form. And he just avoided thinking about all the evidence. And part of the thing was, uh, I got to kind of turn around here and use a kind of little graphic here with my little hand here, uh, that we've got the upper jaw and the lower jaw, right? And they are standard reptile layout to start out with, with all those little extra bones, but the dentary bone has got the teeth in there. And what we see is expansion of the dentary bone with all of its teeth along with it. But not only that, it's what they're eating. And one of the things that apparently played quite a role in the group that eventually leads off into mammals is what they ate. Because it turns out they eat insects, insectivores. Omnivorous, they can probably eat other things than that, but they were definitely bug eaters. And it turns out to be a good bug eater doesn't need a strong jaw. It only needs a long, thin jaw with a bunch of backward facing teeth in it. And that's what's going on in a lot of these little groups that are dominating so many of these little small niches of critters that are roughly mouse size that are insectivores, because it means that they don't have to bother about the jaw attachment being strong. They only need to worry about what happens when they bite on a bug, because what happens is their weak little jaws go boop and boop, 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 and the backward teeth pull the thing back, and they go smush, mush, mush, and there you got bug dinner. Yeah. Real, so real easy. So definitely not the uh, gornopsis the jaws. Yeah, yeah. Those monsters, those big... Uh, some of them were uh, um, uh, predators because the, the Dimetrodon back in its era was one of the big predators of the time. Another reason probably why 
um, the diapsids were starting to make their headway is because I, I'm not thinking of a great many notable predators in the therapsid lineage as we move on through time, that they become increasingly herbivorous and they dominate their herbivore niche. And some of them get quite relatively large. They're bigger than the critter that's attacking them. Uh, we're talking about small lizard sized uh, diapsids. I think that's part of the, the dynamic that's going on. Another thing that's happening in as we move uh, into the Mesozoic with the Triassic is uh, um, the supercontinent has initially formed, which was very arid in the inner area. An awful lot of the um, um, therapsid fossils are known from the Karoo down in South Africa, uh, uh, North America, and all the spots being smushed together. There was a lot of desert and, and bleak, not a hell of a lot living there. Things were living along the coasts. And the, the climate was relatively, it, it was temperate, but also dry and uh, in a lot of spots. And as the place began to break up, it was eventually forming a much uh, a more tropical climate globally. And that probably worked against the whole therapsid lineage with their increasingly mammalian metabolism, that you have to maintain that high battery uh, power, uh, whereas your um, reptiles didn't. They just go out and sun in the warm world and go out and eat. So that was another dynamic that was playing a role. Anyway, the yeah. big, the big thing. Yeah, you have a question. I was, I heard that mammal as as a, as a ma mammals get to eat more often than the the, the diapsid reptiles side does. Yeah, yeah, because you you have that high body temperature to maintain. That if you if you're getting all of your heat from your environment. You sit there like a torpid lizard in the morning and it's cold and then you're warm in the sun. There you go. And now you've got enough to be able to move around. You don't have to waste the amount of time to eat enough to maintain the fuel stocks. In the same way that if you have the energy for it, a bicycle is real easy because it doesn't contain any power source. You just start pedaling, but it's dependent on you. And if you can only rev up when you get warm, mm, bees do the same thing. They have to warm themselves up and all that thing. Uh, whereas mammals with their high thermostats and birds with their high thermostats, the extreme case is a hummingbird that functionally has to eat continuously because in order to do what it does, it's burning up energy so bloody fast that it has to constantly refuel. And uh, there, so there's upsides and downsides. You have the advantage. Uh, it's, it's arguable that um, it's difficult to be a flyer, if uh, a mammal, a, ver a vertebrate flyer, if you don't have a pretty high thermostat. And we're still uncertain what the uh, pterosaurs were doing, but we know the birds and mammals, uh, the bats, uh, both have uh, high rates of metabolism. And so it's very possible that to be a heavier than air flyer of that type, if you're not a bug, uh, you have to be able to do that. Yeah, kind of thing. stupid, stupid, stupid protos, protostone insects that they beat us on the land and the air. Yeah, and and are most of the organisms. Uh, we 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 get all hoity-toity, and we look about. Wow, we've got like like a couple thousand species of mammal. Well, blip. Uh, the reptiles have way more than that, and the and the insects will sit over there and go. Excuse me, we got five hundred thousand species of just beetles. Suck it, you vertebrates. And when you look at the phyla, that that uh, we have a chart in um, uh, the rocks were there, which lists off the various animal phyla. And what immediately jumps out, and I had in fact make a, a double set of charts to file it that way. So you see the basic chart in terms of the chronology, and then you look at it in another variable. Almost all the animal phyla are protostomes. <laughs> There's only like three animal phyla that are deuterostomes like us. And, and it's we're we're off in the corner. And if you look at the whole total number of species, probably all the most of the body mass of organisms on the planet are the protostomes. So we're just like pimples on the back ass of all of those in, in, and enormously successful because the insects are almost extinction proof. Yeah. Other than the other than the Permian mass extinction that gave them a bit of a speed bump, uh, they basically go through mass extinctions. They're going, what? What did something happen? Where did all the dinosaurs go? What? <laughs> yeah. Of course, of course. Then again, as eukaryotes were, were even a smaller group than the, the, the other. Yeah. 
the anyway, back to our back to our delightful synapsids. Um, uh, yeah. The interesting uh, thing uh, about this jaw transition is that it's the thing that really turned me into an evolutionist. It's the smoking gun, the slam dunk, the duh bit. Because when they were looking at this in the late 19th century, you have here's the nature of the problem. Mammals have a gigantic dentary bone and no other bone in our jaw. All of our dentary bone, that's all of our teeth with its complicated things. And it hinges on the squamosal bone up in the skull, not the quadrate. It's a completely different bone. And you go, where the hell is the articular quadrate? Oh, wait a minute. There it is. It's in our ears. We literally know, and this was discovered in the 1830s, that in development, the jaw is laid out in the reptile fashion in our embryos until the dentary bone expands and bumps into the squamosal. And then that little articular quadrate that was still there is pulled up just into the middle ear. So they knew that developmentally. But the question is, how did that happen in the bones? And in the by the 1890s, they were spotting to see those reptile-like mammals with their enlarged dentary bone, their shrinking skull form, and that opening up zygomatic arch. And they go, boy, that's starting to look awfully mammal. Wow. You think this is where the mammals might have come from? because nothing like this is going on over in the diapsids. They were getting more and more dinosaur bones and all these other ones, they all have that standard reptile layout. But this group, these synapsids alone were doing that. And that's where Robert Broom enters the picture. Um, he lived down in South Africa. And later on in the 1920s, he became really more famous for dealing with Australopithecines. He was digging up stuff in there. So he's usually associated with human evolution story. But before he was on that, gig. He was just a mammal paleontologist down in South Africa. And so he was seeing this stuff coming in. And in 1912, he wrote a little paper where he said, you know, in order to get from a reptile jaw layout to a mammal jaw layout, there's only one way this is going to work. Only one. You're going to have to have a double jaw organism. You're going to have to have one with an articular quadrate and then a second jaw hinge with the dentary squamosal. And by the way, the articular quadrate in these organisms is on the outside, whereas the dentary squamosal connections on the inside of the jaw. Okay. So you could have them, they won't conflict, but they gotta be in the same place. So the, the, the skull has to morph around so that the edge of the dentary bone is right next to where the articular is. And the squamosal and the quadrate have warped down so that they're right next to it. So the new muscle hinge can form and they all pull the same way so that you don't have a problem. And then uh, eventually that dentary squamosal jaw hinge starts taking over and eventually becomes the only one. That's the model he put out. Now, there were no animals like that. No living organism is laid out like that. There is no double jawed organism like that. And no fossils were known for it either. He was predicting that in order for that to happen, there had to have been a transition that is the unique transition from the single jaw to a double jaw to back to a single jaw where it's now the mammal layout. So, la di da, in speaking 1930. Of, yeah. So, so, uh, 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 sorry. Speaking of jaws and stuff, well, when I, th I don't know if it's all mammals or just us, but like, I, I don't think reptiles have. I don't know if reptiles do or not. Like, like mam. I think mammals a reptile. I think it's maybe it's just mammals that have a limited number of teeth in their jaw. Oh well, it, it's not merely the number of teeth because some some animals can become toothless. Uh, the dinosaurs eventually went toothless. Okay. Uh, some might have just vestigial teeth. But the neat thing about mammals is that they developed, and we can see this in the same thing as while this jaw is shifting, that we see the formation of the mammalian tooth battery, where you have a canine teeth up front, and then you have a, a molar teeth in the back that are highly specialized uh, for plant eating. And now by that time, you're getting into critters that are no longer into insect eating. And it also opens up new niches that they can deal with something else. And th because there's something else that that jaw hinge allows us to do. By having the muscles laid out the way we do, we can do this easily. We can shift the jaw to one side in a way that's really difficult for reptiles. And so jaw strength, if you're a predator, you need to have a relatively strong, uh, a strong jaw, but omnivorous, 
you don't necessarily need a terribly strong jaw, but that maneuverability is really important. And that's a part of the reason why mammals go off in particular directions in eating things. And mammals just proliferate a staggering number of tooth cusps, the little nubs on the top of the teeth. If, if you've ever looked at a, a woolly mammoth skull, you'll see in elephants in any of those groups, the proboscideans have these monstrous batteries of teeth and they're all these little ribbles and wriggles because what happens is you want the tooth on the top to match up and nesh to make a grinding surface with the thing down below. That's the occlusion issue. And so you get a, a selection pressure for those teeth matching like that. You don't have to worry about that if you're a tyrannosaur, it's a, 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 a rip and gulp uh, thing. You rip the stuff off and that's as far as you go. But if you have to eat plants or specialized food, uh, bone breaking, for example, hyenas uh, have to have enormously strong jaws, tyrannosaurs and others. If you have things where you have to break through bone, uh, that's a different kettle of fish. And that doesn't involve tooth shape. Tooth shape, uh, serrated teeth, that shows up whether or not you're carnivores or not. You've got sh teeth that are particularly backward curved teeth indicate that it eats fish because that's really handy if you're trying to snip onto something that can slip away from you in the water. So all of these things are, are the dynamics of tooth diagnostics. But do we know if, I, I know we don't, when we got, we were, when we, the mammals came around, we were still egg laying at the time, but do we know if in, in the past, if they were like leathery eggs or solid or hard eggs? They probably would have been not unlike what happens with monotremes. And I don't think a monotreme has a super hard shelled egg. Remember that, that with our own mammals, we've got the egg laying monotremes, of which there's only two groups left, uh, the echidnas and the platypuses. Uh, but they would have been the standard model. All of those monotremes would have been the earliest of the mammals. Then, they de then an offshoot eventually develops the marsupial mode which figures out how to give live birth and then development a little bit afterwards. So you're, you're now finishing up a lot of the development out of the birthing process. And then the full-blown placental mammals that keep you in that little placental bag until you're all done and then spit you out as functionally an a organism that maybe has to go through a little bit of growth, but basically can do what it does right off the bat. Except for, and, except for, uh, except for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which is quite another little kettle of fish. And so that that uh, uh, probably the most difficult thing, especially for creationists to wrap their heads around, is that all of these layers of things that we call mammal aren't all happening in one big lump, that they're occurring in stages and sometimes even convergently. So this jaw shifting thing was going on in several lineages because there was presumably a selection pressure for uh, that particular jaw shape, and it was occurring in multiple lineages, not just the one. You mean that uh, we didn't all happen in, in the fifth and sixth days? Yeah, yeah. And remember, all of that stuff from the very first synapsids back in, in the Carboniferous period, all the way down to the late Triassic, when we definitely have full-blown placental mammals and marsupials and monotremes, is about 100 million years. That's a long time. This is not a blindingly fast process that's going on. It involves... The main, and the reason why we have such a good evidence for it is one, because the damn teeth are so bloody durable. So that gives us a track of a lot of that. And the other fact is that um, up until the Triassic, uh, the synapsids were the dominant land animals, herbivores and, and predators. And yeah. so we get, we have a bigger chance of capturing them than the little piddly ass little diapsids that were like doing nothing until that late Triassic period. And and in Until that period that, now, as the yeah, climate the, is shifting. The one, two punch of not only the Permian extinction, but right after, or it's a Triassic extinction, right at, right at, pretty much right after. Yeah, we don't mm -hmm. yet know enough about the metabolisms involved, but we know that, boy, that Permian extinction changed the climate for a while. It really dropped oxygen levels enormously. Uh, to where uh, for a while in the Triassic, um, uh, it was like, I think only about 15% oxygen or something like that in the atmosphere. And so anything that operated off of a really high oxygen metabolism is at a disadvantage. That may have been part of the factors. We do know um, the, the, the rise of the teeter-totters 
Uh, in the late Triassic, you get a whole slew of these increasingly bipedal diapsids, not just the dinosaurs, but the Lagosuchids that are the racing crocodiles and all that stuff uh, going on. And, and the, the mammals by now are just appearing on the scene. The same deposits, the Ishwagalosto in Argentina and the uh, uh, um, uh, basins yeah. in South Africa and that, the, 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 the same yeah. places where we're getting these one, early dinosaurs, we're also getting the late, the, the very earliest. Mammals. I know, once again, they beat us. <coughs> Not just the kangaroos and the and the primates that two legs, the the diapsis beats on two legs too. Yeah, yeah. Well, di bipedality is a very specialized feature. Back here, here we'll go a little walk down memory lane, uh, back to the 1980s when I was just starting to research uh, in more great depth about dinosaurs and the like. And to me, I was very attracted to the bird dinosaur model because of the fact that birds are unlike a bat. The moment the bat lands on the ground, it reveals it's a quadruped. It clambers around on all fours. But birds are the only ones that are not just a big obligatory bipeds. They're just graceful at it. They don't even need their little wings. They can just tuck themselves in and just prance around and they can pick with their beaks and that with They're using that. They don't need to use arms. And uh, that that suggested that the most logical organism that that evolved from was something that was already bipedal. And for that, it just screamed dinosaurs because those are the group that, that were uh, habitual bipeds from the start and remain a great many lineages that were bipeds, whereas bipedality is very rare in mammals. Uh, you mentioned kangaroos and us. There was also a little, uh, if you're familiar with the Messel formation, are you from the um, uh, Germany? Does no, it ring a bell? I am that. I am. I am it's, now. it's one of those famous logger state. we're going to, we're going to talk a little about logger state in here. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a super duper. It's M E S E L Messel, And it's really famous. It's about 55 million years ago in Germany. And it's basically a toxic waste dump of organisms because it's got all sorts of oxygen deprivation and stuff. So organisms that die in it got preserved really well. So we've got the, some of the earliest bats are known from the mesal formation. And on, on top of which, a funky little critter about the size of a rabbit that is, as far as we found so far, unique in being that teeter-totter approach of a balanced body with a long tail that balances on its hind legs. Apparently, it, it wasn't a really good model because it didn't lead anywhere. Speaking of, of walking, I, it's true not, not, I heard it. Somewhere in the Permian time, I, I think, I think, maybe, I think is we started walking differently than the reptile brands did. We start well, like like the dinosaurs, we start developing upright gait, but it's built a bit differently because it's quadrupedal, and it produces a dynamic uh, for of uh, uh, for run, foreground running. In fact, that I'm I, as I think about it. Right offhand, I can't think of a single rapid four-legged dinosaur. They're all pretty slow. Whereas, look, think of all of the fast quadrupedal runners we have in the mammals. Cheetahs, lions, tigers, uh, dogs, uh, a gazelle. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that, um, but that also puts a constraint on the dynamics because it limits the uh, range of um, vertebrates you can shift, the vertebrae along the body, that you, if you accidentally, by mutation, add too many, it becomes awkward. So there's a huge, there's been dynamic studies, and I think I may have cited them either in Slam Dunk or uh, uh, Rocks were there, uh, that there is, is kind of a selection pressure that restricts that vertebral dynamic uh, with mammals. Uh, dinosaurs are in a completely different kettle of fish. When you get to be a big bipedal critter, now you can run. And all you need to do is to be able to balance your body. And so you have that long tail that allows you to turn in a dime because you can shift the body around in very complex ways. And they're now also doing computer modeling and that even of how the, uh, the things operate. So when you get into that much specialization, you're partly opening up niches that you wouldn't be able to do before. At the same time, you're also constrained because there's things you can't do as well because you're stuck with the four legs or two legs. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'll talk to dinosaurs again. It's 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 it's, it's, it's like whales and stuff. How 
like whales went from sea from the land sea to land back to sea again, and di- some dinosaurs went from four legs to two legs back to four legs again. Yeah, well, there's var- variations on the thing. In fact, um, uh, probably a good example of a uh, of a leg switch would be the bipedal cetacosaurs uh, that eventually developed into the little quadrupedal protoceratopsids, and then from there into the fully bigger uh, jumbo version triceratops type uh, ceratopsids. And by that time, you're you're sufficiently massive that you've just basically given up that bipedal bit and you're entirely quadrupedal. Other of the dinosaurs had it both ways, uh, ambifoidal, I suppose you could argue, the hadrosaurs, where they, they can balance uh, myosaurs and parasaurolophus and all the rest are still able to balance nicely on their hind legs, probably using their front legs for a lot of locomotion, but they can also balance on that and rear up higher and all of that. And so they have a little bit different dynamic than the fully quadrupedal stegosaurids and uh, and uh, triceratopsids. Whereas the mammals, boop, almost entirely restricted to that quadrupedal base. Anyway, back to our little jaw thingy that's going on. So we've got the, the once you've got that new jaw structure operating, there's a whole cascading network of things. One thing because we jaws can move differently because it's now the dentary squamosal format. Um, and also we've got those specialized teeth modes so they can go separate selection pressure so you can get into more and more niches. You can uh, go after uh, um, um, by uh, establishing certain kind of giant overhanging fangs, that saber tooth model that pops up over and over again in uh, uh, various mammal groups that's highly specialized to attack a particular prey, which again is getting yourself down a road that if the prey goes extinct, you go extinct because you're too specialized. That's all you eat. Uh, that's another factor. Then the hearing. It's probably no coincidence that bats developed as tiny insectivorous critters that were nocturnal that could hear better because they co-opted those extra he- ear bones and echolocation and all the things that come with it that can develop in that that you won't be able to find. There's a tiny bit of echolocation characteristics that occur in some ba- uh, birds, by the way. And I alluded, to, we alluded to that in, um, I think in um, uh, the rocks were there uh, because that had just come along recently. And there's even a case of a parrot that has developed a secondary jaw muscle in a way that's very similar to the, what happened uh, in the synapsids. So that gives you some clues about the developmental mechanisms that, that were going on even in that. It, it's, it's, it's an oddity that's popped up um, in a species of parrot. <laughs> Speaking of, of jaws and ears, mm-hmm. I, I don't know, just, is, is the, is the, is the, 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 like the, our, the mammal ears, different from reptile ears, right? That's a, right. Hearing is a, hearing is a funky thing. Yeah. Uh, the the basal system is that stapes bone that goes way back into um, late fish. And uh, that is the standard one that everybody is built off of. But the other issue involves how many parts of the bone system you can use to sense vibrations with. And it turns out the sensory awareness of like things that your jaw can pick up. uh, That's something that even the, uh, uh, um, uh, the cetaceans make use of to this day is they make use of of clicks that they put up in some cases in a big of a bag of, of, of goo uh, in some of the uh, whales. In others, they're making clicks with their jaw and, and they can feel that coming back in through the thing. So there's a, a, there's a, a huge gradation of how organisms hear. And okay. uh, when you look into see how v- much variety there is, it, yeah. it clarifies the kind of things, almost the same genes will be involved because they're involving signaling systems and the way to process acoustic information. Um, um, You have various convergence on the shape of that little eardrum structure because it produces, it it settles in in a little hair assembled sack that will be able to tell orientation. You can feel when your head goes from one side to another. And so the shape of that and, and the curvature of that can attenuate as to how much hearing you have and, and whether or not that they've discussed because there's variations with the Neanderthals, what kind of hearing they would have had compared to Homo sapiens. Yeah, but 
like but like the mammal brands compared to the the synaptic brands compared to the we have i think we have the more external ears than, than the other than the diapsis do uh pretty much yeah and and we have a whole bunch of things uh, uh lips that's very mammal um, there's, uh, there's the, the skins that you find around, um, um, these extra features, but we definitely have a specialized ear and all you have to do is to look at something like an elephant to think about just how spectacular hearing can go. You find, uh, animals with very precise hearing, little foxes and stuff that's got gigantic ears that can just very carefully locate the tiniest little rustle of sound. Uh, not that... Um, uh, the dinosaurs wouldn't have, many of them would have had quite good hearing because you can tell how much processing power is devoted to it by brain endocasts. This is another area that you probably won't find many creationists talking about because there's an awful lot of brains available and they can do tomography analyses and because you know which parts of the brain do what we know that, that uh, tyrannosaurs had fairly good hearing but they had definitely good smell Wow, they got all a factory boy, and and that brings up the argument as to how much tyrannosaurs were like uh, 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 carrion predators, you know, waiting for something to get killed by something else, and then come in and chase all the other animals away because you're bigger, uh, and uh, that that probably played a role in that. So you get so many different adaptations going on, uh, and we can see the dynamics of what's happening with the mammals is they're slamming into a world that's changing climate in the Triassic that's increasingly being dominated by very proliferating early dinosaurs that can just run really fast because they're quick bipeds that are fully erect, that probably have a better bang for the buck out of their metabolism, that even if oxygen levels are slightly lower for a while, um, that they probably were able to process that better in their internal metabolism. And that may have given them a leg up. And uh, so the mammals don't disappear because the dinosaurs, not exclusively necessarily, but are probably primarily daytime animals, and they sleep and hunker down at night. And the mammals can get out and have good night vision and good night hearing, and they're really tiny. And although by the time you get down to the late dinosaur period, you're starting to get bigger mammals. You're getting mammals that are large enough that they could wrestle a small dinosaur to the ground. Yeah. And they're like wombat have, size. Hmm? Do we still have our night? Do we still have night vision now as us, or have we lost that? Uh, well, uh, well, it depends on the person. And again, there's enormous variation on there. Uh, in some respects, all the vertebrates, the diapsids, have us beaten in so many ways. Birds, for example, can see into the ultraviolet. We can't. Although once in a while you can find a human being who has a variation that they can kind of see a wider range than what we're used to. Uh, most mammals don't focus on color vision particularly, uh, or they see in semi-color, whereas um, primates and especially us have full color vision. And that, again, they've worked out the mutations and things that can happen on that. And, and you have to wonder what kind of selection pressure was involved. It's, it's great for seeing ripe fruit and so organisms that can see things in color, uh, if you're, what you're eating is colorful, uh, has a different dynamic to it. Um, uh, the, the, the range of stuff, we're, we're hampered in part with the dinosaurs because they're all extinct. So we have to look at everything well, secondarily okay. from what birds can do. Well, when you say all dinosaurs are extinct, you mean the, the not bird ones, of course. The non-avian ones, yeah. 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 And, and therefore, everything we want to know about dinosaurs, you have to look at birds but birds are a specialized niche. And, and uh, uh, even though probably a lot can be revealed and is revealed about it, uh, it's telling you a bit less about what might be going on in a sauropod or in an ornithischian dinosaur that's so far removed in terms of that common ancestry with the theropods. There's so much time frame involved. The early differentiation of these major groups is, again, back in the Triassic, uh, that um, one should always be careful about extrapolation from one taxa that far removed than the other. And in the same way that knowing what's going on in monotremes doesn't necessarily constrain what might have been going on in gorgonopsids a hundred million years earlier that may have had a very different enough of a kit bag that you can't make those inferences now from it. Mm -hmm. 
And you said earlier that our earlier were were less of a, of a, of a niche thing and more special, not, not specialized. We're like we're, we're herbiv maybe herbivores, not herbivores, uh, in, insectivores, and we could. Get in them. general, uh, um, and somebody can scream at me in the live chat or in um, uh, comments in that later. But if I'm just going by my experience with the vertebrates in general and the history of the evolutionary process, uh, not for insects, you know, you know too many insects, uh, but in vertebrates, it kind of looks like all adaptive radiations, things that eventually start that make really a lot of changes later on, they're very generalized and not terribly specialized to start out with. So you have a thing that's, that's the earliest groups of so many different critters that are closely related look really a lot alike. Jackson uh, was just mentioning about if you look at the very earliest Serenians, the manatees, uh, sea cows, and uh, the earliest elephants, proboscideans, and that they, they're they not that far apart. And, and if you were to look at either one of those together, would you be able to go, well, that one's going to eventually turn out to be a sea critter, and that one's going to breed a group of really big terrestrial herbivores? Could you anticipate that? I do. I couldn't. And and uh, the idea that that uh, another factor that comes in there's a oh I think his name is Vermeige. Yeah, I guess you could tell. I guess you couldn't tell it by the 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 shape. Maybe you could tell it by the location. If they are maybe if they are ne near the near to the coast and the ocean, they might you might can assume they yeah, maybe the man. That, the, um, uh, the one thing that, that that Jackson was pointing out their teeth is that the ancestors of the Serenians were really good and for eating plants that would be on the shore and in the water, the way hippos and others can do today. Whereas um, the critters that eventually moved off into elephants are more explicitly land animals. And so those can make an effect. One of the reasons why cetaceans developed as they did out of the artiodactyls is artiodactyls can breathe through their nose easily. And that ultimately is an enormous advantage if you eventually reposition your nose pointing upward where all you have to do is to breach the water and go <gasps> and then take a breath and dive back down again because you don't have to breathe through your mouth. So tiny, tiny variations in that are not specializations to start with can eventually lead to very great niches that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise, depending upon the circumstances of things. And none of those things ever take like, like a week. Uh, you know, they're, they're involving millions and millions of years. And, and we always need to, uh, uh, some of the creationists would talk about, well, boy, whale evolution seems to be really happening pretty fast. It's only like four or five million years. Do you realize how long that is? That's from the Australopithecines to Philip Johnson and Donald Trump. That's that's four million years. <laughs> that's a lot of change. That's still that's longer than the four thousand years they give us. Yeah. Well, yes, and that that's a different matter in in terms of they're never going to make their little uh, uh, bit uh, um, uh, compress. So the reptile mammal transition for me is what made me into an evolutionist. For there was no way I could get around it because. Uh, if um, uh, I, the way I put it snarkily in Slam Dunk, and I said, if God didn't want me to believe in evolution, he shouldn't have created therapsids. Now, that was just a big mistake because it was just a dead giveaway. Uh, and the fact that, that um, uh, it's so incredibly ignored, one of the reasons why I wrote the book is because when I was thinking back about all the subject matters that hadn't been covered a lot, I realized that all the stuff on the reptile mammal transition was basically scattered in a few little side comments in books, a paragraph or two. And I'm going, shit, this is spectacular. You need to know more about this. You need to know the whole shebang. There's so much going on here. And because uh, mammal mammals uh, are seemingly less sexy and spectacular. I mean, since when do you see the, the, the uh, an equivalent of Jurassic Park for mammals? They just don't tend to do that. So um, it, it's not that an enormous amount of fascinating evolution was taking place uh, involving changes in metabolism and all that. But, but when you looked at them, you would be seeing, oh, this is a new model of mouse. I mean, it's uh, just a little furball. Welcome the Permian Park. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, but in, in terms of what ha would happen later on, given how spectacularly diverse mammals have turned out to be, 
everything from terrestrial organisms to whales, the biggest organisms that have ever lived in the history of like ever, uh, and, and those incredible bats. Most, most mammals are bats and rats. You got, you got 1,200 species of, of just bats. Now that is a successful group, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So we're true. We're true official mammals in the Triassic or Jurassic. Uh, by the by, the late Triassic, you have full blown mammals. That that um, remember, the history of this is always when can you find the earliest? And um, it was the case that when I was growing up, it was thought that you didn't really find full mammals until the Cretaceous period. They were just little teeny mice that were coming up and the little mice were going around and eating the dinosaur eggs. And that's why the dinosaurs died out. You know, oh, that yeah, was the yeah kind I, of I heard that too. It's weird now. When I was, I, I was elementary school in the 80s, in the 80, ladies, I was in elementary school. And, and now, and, and now I, you know, about the asteroid, I, I did not know the asteroid wasn't a thing until, until the early nineties. Yeah, well, it was starting to come into the literature in the 1980s on, and I was uh, steeping in that. What was more interesting is the thing that it's not that the asteroid didn't hit. Chichaloub happened, but let's not forget that wasn't the only thing that was happening, because before the asteroid hit the Deccan Traps of India, there was a mega plume volcanic eruption thing going on. India by that time was parked over, I think, the Reunion Island hotspot in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And we can still find the other half of the stuff down in there. So it had moved northward from, from Antarctica and Australia and was heading across the uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, that was disastrous for the uh, ocean system. Yeah. And so the, the dinosaurs might not have completely died out, uh, even with out without the asteroid impact, but oh, yeah. certainly it wasn't any more help for him. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard by the time the asteroid hit, the, 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 some of the non avian dinosaurs were getting less and less diverse than they were before. Yeah, the um, there was an awful lot of specialization going on. Uh, in, in North America, for example, most all of the predators were tyrannosaurs, and most all of the prey were ceratopsids. That's all your eggs in one basket ecosystem. Another factor was that the, the oceanic system, those plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs and pliosaurs and all of those sores that were knocking around, uh, that had already started to collapse in part because of all the gases that were being thrown out, not only carbon dioxide, but sulfur dioxide and other stuff, ocean acidification. There was stuff going on that was making life unky uh, in the oceans before the, the big stumbling block. And yet, and yet, frogs made it through. Branches of crocodiles made it through. One of the groups of birds. That's another big mystery to me. Because um, we have to remember that the dominant birds, they're, they're, have you heard of the enanternithines? Another cute little complicated word that I've only just figured out how to spell. Let, let, me, I, let me type that I, into I, the I live chat here. Enantiornithine. I think this yeah, is I think, it. I, I've, I've heard that word before. Are they on the true bird it, branch it or means, the side bird? It means the opposite birds. And it has to do, I, I, as if memory serves me, it's the way the shoulder blade attaches. And it's what sockets into what. It's that the enantornithines are the opposite of the way that the, the birds we all know, the ornithines, are laid out. And we still don't know how that occurred. What, what lineage caused that little shift to take place? And what was going on developmentally? We don't have the, the smoking gun on that one. But the take home is, that all through the Cretaceous period, which is a long time, the enantronithines are the dominant birds. They almost all of the, the, the major bird groups are enantronithines. And the, the although apparently the groups that eventually lead to the birds we're familiar with can be traced back into little niches in the Cretaceous. They're not big players. On top of which, we now know that there's a whole bunch of flappy dinosaurs. You've got those micro raptors and the, the Yi Chi thing with the bat wings with feathers. And you've got a whole slew of stuff going on there. Busy, busy. Plus the pterosaurs that have kind of faded away for the small uh, bird sized ones, but the great big monster Cessna sized gliders are still doing quite nicely. Thank you very much. 
All of that changes with the, with the uh, Cretaceous extinction. And all of those other flyers go extinct, except for the birds, the ornithine birds. Tiny little group that somehow or other, was it luck of the draw or something they did a little better? Were they, the, uh, another feature that we have to deal with is that um, the birds hadn't quite finalized all of their evolution either. Some of the fully flow through metabolism of modern birds probably developed after the KT. But certainly one of the things that made the, the birds that were successful is that they were developing powerful sternums for muscle attachment. That allows them to take off from the ground without jumping from something. Uh, Archaeopteryx didn't have that. The earlier birds didn't have those. So that means that um, uh, the, the phrase I love with Archaeopteryx is uh, somebody, I think it was uh, Henry Gee said, uh, Archaeopteryx could fly better than a sack of potatoes. Uh. <laughs> that it was, it, it was a glider, but not a super, superb flyer. So why did those others die out? We don't know. So what's the difference? Like the mammals, like mammals had real fast. Uh, yeah. What's the difference between do we, we know between a mammal, um, a mammal form, and a mammal morph? Oh well, uh, the, the both both of those terms are used. Mammalia formes and mammalia morph. You find the same thing. Dinosaur formes, sauropoda morpha. Uh, that both words mean pretty much the same thing. And I, I, what it would be, it, it would be systematically the almosts. The groups okay. that aren't quite what the diagnostic is, because remember, for a full-blown mammal, it's got to have an articular quadrate uh, uh, um, bone up in the ear. It's got to have the dentary squamosal jaw hinge, uh, and I think there are a couple other diagnostics that go on that, maybe, that make it a firm, maybe, maybe, firm milk mammal. Producing, hmm? milk, milk, milk producing at this point? Uh, yeah, they probably were. Yeah, uh, that's another thing that makes mammals distinctive: glands. Uh, birds have relatively few glands. Uh, they also don't urinate. Mammals urinate. So that's another uh, specialized feature. They poop. Birds will poop, but not, not urinate. And so the waste processing system is clearly very, very different in mammals. And one of the things that's the reason why there's the mammalia formes or mammalia morph, however you want to call them, is because there's indications that so many of those features are not appearing all in one lump, that they're, they're occurring incrementally in varying lineages and to get to the thing where it's now to that point, that's really true of all the major things. The same thing with the dinosaurs. Uh, we're seeing that with, um, uh, look how blurry Australopithecines are as to which ones uh, might be the group that mammal, uh, humans develop from. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's true in pretty much everything. Get used to it. This is because you're seeing what, even though you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg on the fossils, what we can see is a lot of iceberg tips. Yeah, I heard that. Ooh, hi, brain bug. Uh, like, like only one percent of the species ever survived, and ninety-nine percent of the species in the history of the world have died out. At least. Yeah, and and uh, although this doesn't mean they have bad runs, I think the kind of average for a vertebrate is something on the order of like twenty million years, which means we're really new kids on the block. Um, and even in the uh, things that we can see, uh, Neanderthals uh, were on Earth way longer than our species has been, and uh, yet you know they fizzle out. And the and the issue is why is it luck of the draw? Or is it you finally run out of steam and you and you you make one bad mutation too many and that finally does you in, and this is still an uncertain thing that that connects up with modern environmental policy because we don't necessarily know what screws what up to cause mass extinctions, and the fear yeah, of many ecologists is that we might be triggering such a thing now with our gumming up the environment. Yeah, I, I still want to know which be, if we will survive or if we survive between Homo Earthians and, and Homo Martians. Yeah, <laughs> and that's another that that's one of the things that, in some respects, though, we change the parameters. You and I are both short circuiting evolution. We wear glasses. Yeah. So we've now disconnected the selection pressure for bad eyesight. Yeah. We wear clothes. We yeah. heat our houses. 
So yeah, we've disconnected more, that connection. I think I think we're going more of artificial selection than natural selection. <laughs> yeah. Now, given how enormously long that would take, uh, it's possible that, you know, if we ever develop faster, and there's another factor, geographic isolation. If you have the case that in order to get to like space colonies, you have to build gigantic arc ships where you go, bye, we're never ever going to see you again. Go away, make a colony, send us a message by light speed because it's going to be really hard to talk to you. Uh, then those circumstances are probably will be that the the colonists will develop in different ways over time that make make them a new species relative to us. If we have Star Trek super fast warp drive to where you can visit them all the time and communicate rapidly, then that may not occur. And so you would be just like us um, that we would be constantly gene flowing in such a way that you don't really have an evolutionary dynamic. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so we've got the with the different jawbones separating the the walking and the ears. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, well, we do know we have a, a um, specialized heart. We have uh, there's a vertebrate immune system that mammals have hitchhiked on to make the kind of antibody based system that we use an awful lot of, and that pops up when we're trying to talk about how to make viruses and vaccines and all that stuff. Um, that's another dynamic that's going on. Um, and then eventually we get the thing about how distinctive is our mammal brains in terms of uh, cortex size and other factors, because they're finding out more and more about how smart non-mammals can be how a, a bird brain? Well, crows are remarkably smart. And so we have to think through what it means to be intelligent. But still, we have a very, very distinctive uh, structure. Now, um, when we get down to us human beings, now you and I are doing something that's really special, is we're communicating with grammatical language. Yeah. And that really puts it other. The roots of language, they're just starting to lay out the parameters of a lot of these things <laughs> the genes are involved and what this the stuff that's happening in the brain to create the sense of word order and nouns versus verbs and all of this stuff and and now uh, it's they're just tiptoeing into it because we couldn't model or scan what was going inside the brain easily and still it's hard to do in certain contexts but that yeah. that's something that's very very distinctive as far as we can tell uh, even when we include cetaceans making songs like humpback whale songs and the like, that they're still mammals. And so we can't think of anything that's quite the same structure that's going on in anybody in other than the mammal side. So we've got some specialization features. here. We seem to be uh, able to make use of fire in interesting ways. Uh, that other organisms tend to run from them. There are chimpanzees that actually will start fires in order to knowing that it's going to drive out competitors and other stuff so that there's some really dynamics that can go on in there. Uh, and that's again, more mammal stuff. So um, uh, yeah, eat it, eat your heart out. You bugs, you got your 500,000 species, but we're the only ones that make hamburgers with onions. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Uh. <coughs> anyway, I hope that's clearer about how the jaw developed. And why that's something that is is so extraordinarily spectacular and a prediction of evolution and the thing that allows it's the reason why I didn't have to do a PowerPoint. Because cool. everybody's got a jaw, everybody's got a zygomatic arch, everybody's got ears. You now have the tools to explain to anybody anywhere about the evolution of the synapsids into mammals and thumb your nose at them when they try to say there's no macroevolution evidence. We literally carry it around with it in our body. We got a question. Hmm. Oh boy, brain bug, you want to just break our brains. Ever wonder why insular gigantism leads to neoteny and archosaurs, but not lepidosaurs? I do not have a clue. <laughs> the one you might want to ask that of is Dapper Dino, and he may not have an answer either but he's much more in that dinosaur field than I am yeah. even. 
uh, uh, I know the terminology. The neoteny thing, for those of you who don't understand that, that's the retention of juvenile characteristics into adulthood. And so what we're saying is that archosaurs, which would be including crocodiles and um, uh, groups that outside of the standard reptile line, but that uh, a crocodilian group, and you would be including pterosaurs and that kind of thing. Lepidosaurs, if memory serves me as an extinct or limited group of ones more in the reptile blob, but I would have to look them up because uh, I think even Jackson knows more about lepidosaurs than I do. So now the question is that when an organism gets bigger, why is it that archosaurs are not are are like baby expanded versions of babies, whereas lepidosaurs are different from that? And I would postulate that something's going on in the genes, that there's a whole dynamic of what happens when you scale up an organism and what um, regulatory agents are in play. And I would suspect that um, uh, if lepidosaurs have any uh, uh, living uh, descendants, theoretically, you should be able to pick out what kind of regulatory gene systems are involved. If, yeah. um, if not, if they're extinct, then screw it. You probably won't be able to do that easily without being able to retro engineer the genetics. And that's not for, probably for the 21st century to figure out. Yeah. No, if, sorry, if time travel over a minute and I can go back. I, I would, I would rename some of the stuff that we, we name now. It's, it's, it doesn't make any sense now. Like one, like wisdom teeth, the teeth that really get on your jaw and it's not, it's not very smart. <laughs> Yeah. Well, they, they come about by, a variety. I think probably the term came about from referring to a word that didn't mean wisdom. It probably has an entomology that's screwball and that, that led to that. But just in the discussion that uh, Dapper Dino and, uh, oh gosh, who else was involved? Jackson and, and a few others um, uh, were uh, chit-chatting with a creationist and uh, Dan McRae brought up, or Steve McRae brought up something that I hadn't known about, but boy, it's going to be in rocks too that there's a portion of our human population that is developing another vein in their arm. Uh, and I, gradually this is spreading through where eventually all human beings will possess that extra vein. And it's yeah, it's I, literally evolution in action. Yeah, and I, I, I would also go back and rename dinosaurs like terrible birds instead of terrible lizards. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, the uh, uh, you have to remember back in the 1850s, they had no precedent for anything else. They knew it was like a reptile thing. And remember, they didn't have any synapsids or anything like that. You could tell right off the bat it was no mammal because no zygomatic arch. Nah, 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 nah. It would be easy to tell apart from that point of view. Um, but where did it fall into it? They knew it was sort of reptile-y. And, and they, that, for a long time, they were conceiving of those in that term. So Iguanodon was depicted. Uh, there were the famous sculptures. I think some went through and some idiot... Uh, um, um, hit him with sledgehammers or something, which is terrible. Uh, that's in the um, park where the old uh, uh, 1850s exhibition was. And uh, they were basing their depictions of Iguanodon and these other critters uh, on what reptiles look like. So Iguanodon is depicted as this big quadrupedal lizardy like thing yeah. um, that's very different from what it actually looked like. But given what they had available at the time, um, you know, cut them some slack, gang. You know, <laughs> it just had pieces. Yeah, the Crystal Palace. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I oh, let me let uh, me jump in. Brainbug says I kept my cool very well with the frustrating Mister Batman. Yeah, I debated him a little. Uh, uh, if you've seen me on that, there was one moment when I wanted to like strangle him because he was interrupting so much, but by and large, yeah, I kind of kept my cool and that I went to pantomime mode where I was putting the, the, the uh, uh, cell phone timer up to remind people of him going on and 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 on with the same. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I listened to some of that thing. It was just uh, like this same old catchphrase that I've heard before. Yeah. We were discussing whether dinosaurs and humans coexisted, which the short answer is no. Well, <laughs> well, technically, yes. Well, with birds, but I mean, they, uh, you know what I mean. Yeah, I made a joke about that. Like, the dinosaurs say to a man, like, yes, and they are delicious. 
Yes, yeah, just absolutely the Kentucky Fried Dinosaur. Oh, and the other thing that's that's of interest in relation to our little mammal bunch is the as yet unconfirmed issue of exactly when bats developed, because um, the all the genetic phylogenies tend to suggest that bats were developing sometime in the late Cretaceous, which means they're entering in the biz of flapping at the same time that there were the late pterosaurs and a bunch of different competing birds, even though we only have the earliest fossils of bats um, about uh, 10 million years after the KT. And they're already pretty bat-like uh, with rudimentary echolocation and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, so speaking of evolution and the guy that hated Dar the guy that hated Darwin, the guy who the guy who found the dinosaurs and stuff, he, he wasn't even a YC. He, he, uh, he was like, I think he was an OEC, Order of Creationists, I think. Oh, uh, well, I can't think. Of, I, I can't think of it. Uh, oh, well, R Richard Owen um, yeah. named them. He wasn't. He didn't do a huge amount of work in the field. He just kind of gave him a name. Uh, he definitely what he he falls in an awful lot of the non-evolutionists of that period yeah. are kind of squishy because oh. they don't necessarily disallow a lot of interrelationships. They just didn't think it through very much. But I think, but I think and, he was an, uh, I think he was, a, he was definitely an OEC, not a YEC. Oh yeah, well there weren't there functionally weren't any young Earth creationists in the scientific community by then. Uh, um, that uh, pretty much everybody in the geological community uh, knew that the Earth was old, and that's when they start. You have to give some sympathy to the to the gear shift that was taking place at that time, and there have been several science gear shifts like that uh, since. But um, in the period from the late 18th century into the mid 19th century, they went from a world in which species must be fixed and there were a relatively few of them and they were kind of mentioned in the Bible. And so it was nice and neat and tidy. And maybe the earth was only a few thousand years old, but they didn't really matter because it didn't affect anything to where by the 1850s, they knew the earth must be millions of years old and that there had been extinction events, that animals had gone extinct. This scared the shit out of a lot of religious people because they thought, what? Wasn't the creation perfect? How can we have extinct animals? And even Thomas Jefferson was thinking maybe somewhere out there, there was a, a population of woolly mammoths that they could find. And he was actually instructing the uh, uh, Lewis and Clark expedition, you know, keep your eye out for them. You, if you see any, let us know. Well, technically uh, the woolly mammoths were, were still, like, were very recent... Which well, Andrew were. Snelling, the young earth creationist Andrew Snelling actually does argue in this modern time that all of the mammoths and mastodons evolved from the ark kind after the flood yeah. and then went extinct. Like, like wasn't there like an island of mammoths only about 2,000 years ago? Oh, well, that, yo, there, one, I don't think quite that young. I think it's like 15 or 20,000, something like that. Um, or maybe 2,500 anyway, but it was, it, it was a ways back. Uh, up off of uh, Wrangell Island or something like that, off of Russia or up in the Arctic, something like that. That's a case of miniaturization where the little tiny little, little cute little mammoths running around uh, that um, uh, lived on a relatively tight land, uh, landscape. And they can survive quite a long time if they don't have any predators to knock around. But then um, Darwin's evolution came along that completely upset that. And then... In the 20th century, then we get more gear shifts because, of course, relativity theory and quantum theory came along in the 20th century. And suddenly, like, what do you mean space is curved and atoms aren't make like little billiard balls with little electrons running around them like planets? I mean, what what, what are you, crazy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so all of that threw everybody off uh, again. Uh, we're probably going to be facing some of the same kinds of gear shifts uh, with working out what dark matter is in the universe and um, uh, some of the things about uh, whether string theory and multiverses are true or not and whether we can never make detectors to find out. Um, but, you know, so so don't, don't get pushed out of shape. You know, the, the science improves. But the one things that never change are the facts. So all the observations stay the same, even if one expands the perspective to understand more about what they do. So we understand a falling hammer differently than Aristotle would, but Hammer still fell in his time. He just didn't understand what it was going on gravitationally. So science-wise, what's one thing that you wish we could do that we can't do, that we, 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 we could do? do? 
Oh, wow, just the one. Yipes. Uh, probably for me, the thing that would be most useful for the civilization and the future is we need to be able to travel faster than light. That's true. Too. For me, well, I, I just going to answer, but I always wanted to get uh, we get, get find uh, DNA, actual actual DNA from fossils or, or older than we can now. I, I think it'd be awesome. Mm. Could, like really narrow down. In a way, that's one that we can end run because once you, we don't, we're not at that stage yet. But but paleo genomics ultimately can retro engineer ancient organisms in principle. Cool. Yeah. The more you understand for what things do, the more you can work out experimentally what had to have happened in order to do the thing you do. And probably the test case that would be the most interesting are those Ediacara biota, the stuff that's before the Cambrian explosion like 600 million yeah. years ago, the weird little palm fronds and floor mats and weird shit that when we can figure out what the genes needed to have been to produce those, yeah, that'll tell us an awful lot about stuff. So in some respects, we won't necessarily need to do that. But that's if we don't get faster than light drive, wow, the universe yeah. is really big. We're screwed. Well, that was, like I said, that, that would really speak, the specialized drive, that, that really, we will be able to speciate a different plants then. But, yeah. But, but yeah. like I was about the DNA things, like it's weird. Because cause I remember, I remember I bring about this, I remember about this, like before we had that, we had specific branches of animals. But once we got the DNA, on the gene stuff, some of them shift, some of the things that we, they shift around a little bit. Well, yes, yeah, because we were looking at the morphology rather than the genes. Is that things, well, one of the big shocks that took place in the 1980s um, and 90s was the recognition uh, that of the underlying um, structural genes of organisms. You look at a cockroach and us, you think, well, that's different. So there must be radically different genetic systems involved in all of that. And so the biologists really were expecting the genes of your bug and a vertebrate to be so completely discordant that there would be some dim and distant thing that could have ever been the, the common ancestor to it. Then they discovered homeobox genes, where it turns out that the variations on and permutations and mixes of those homeobox genes is what makes a cockroach and us, not a completely different, different toolkit. And that means that the common ancestral systems can be much closer in time in the Cambrian than we would have thought back in the 1960s or 50s when we didn't know about those common architectural genes. Yeah, like like, la like last year when Jackson was on my last, me and Jackson were talking about how before the genetics, the bats were bats were thought to be more more closely on the primate side, and now they're all, all, over over on the. Some of that was to do with teeth. Some of that was to do with some of the other anatomical fa factors. And what what has really changed all the field is the application of cladistics, where they start paying attention and and quantifying things, and then you work backwards and also to connect up as many more factors involved. Uh, but it's understandable why they would have made those sort of choices because you would have been looking at things that look kind of similar. And if you don't know the genes that are producing them, the, this is a revolution that has only happened recently to where within my lifetime, it's gone from where we didn't even know what DNA did to working out homeobox genes and cis regulatory cascades and uh, uh, alternative splicing. That was another big revolution because the assumption was we've got 100,000 proteins in our body. There must be one gene for each protein. That makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that there's only 25,000 genes and one gene can make this protein A by reading it forwards and protein B by reading only a portion of it or protein C by reading backwards from the other direction. And holy moly, and this one's different when you unplug the introns and they're all the spicers. Wow. That was another revolution. And that also indicated how much diversity and variation can occur in this shuffleboard of gene duplications and introns and retrotransposons and epigenetic markers and all of that. And part of the problem that 
people defending evolution need to have, and it's definitely a problem for creationists, is you have to think of all of these layers of biology happening simultaneously. So you've got cells replicating and mutations occurring and regulatory systems operating in which mutations can occur and structural genes and duplications can occur there. And that's in an organism and the organism is in a population and the population lives in an environment and there are parasites and there are predators and there's ecology and all of that's shifting because there's land masses moving around and plate tectonics and subduction and asteroid impacts. All of that's going on at the same time. Now your brain can that, easily before, go to the and point- that's before, you, And that's before even we got came, came along to mess things up. Yeah. And, and it's very difficult. In, in a way, as a historian, I hit that in a baby level. Because what happens, um, uh, I'll give an example from a, a thing that I finally was able to visit uh, Chaco Canyon in uh, New Mexico. I have been wanting to go there for years. It's out in the middle of shit ass nowhere. It is an effort to get to it. The nearest motel is 50 miles away. That that it's not a place that, it, that you do casually. And you're driving over arguably the worst road in the universe to get there. It's just terrible. But it's a magical, wonderful place. And there was one wall, when I visited the various kivas and things, there was one wall that was, I was walking along the trails on the back side. And there was one wall that's just a razor perfect squared off beauty that sticks up about 10, 15 feet, just perfect red stonework that's just intact. Most of the places, their sections falling apart and the things have separated, but this was just beautifully preserved. And I looked at that and I'm saying, who made that wall? We don't know their names. We don't know if they were men or women, if there was a team uh, 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 were they admired? Were they hated? Did they have ulcers? Uh, um, uh, wh how long did they go? How did they pass things on? But human beings of some sort connecting up there constructed that wall all those 800 years ago. And, and it frustrates me as a historian to not know anything about them. And yet the existence of the wall presupposes a whole social network that produced that wall. And it's the job of the historian to try to either work out what you can about it or recognize that there's a whole layer of that reality that would have occurred that you don't know because you can't get at the information. Now just multiply that by a billion and you're talking about the issues of working out evolution. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so I'll tell the question. So when are your two books, Evolution Slam Dunk and Rocks they are going to be available for audio book and on Audible. Oh, I don't know when. Um, uh, I would. The problem with doing an audio book is on a science topic. Is what the hell do you do with the references? So theoretically, we'd have to pull out all of those and then just rework the text to be audio book friendly. Uh, okay. Anybody out there that wants to assist in that, um, um, I'm open to it. Because I don't, it's, I don't know it's, about it's, the, the technical sure. part, but if you, if you need a voice actor, I'm good, I'm good at voice acting. I, I can do the reading in that easily enough. I've already uh, written a source, a started work with me yeah. on the, the Paralogs of Fog thing, but he's gotten oh. sidetracked on other projects, and so that's kind of gotten into hiatus, that's so it's that. an incomplete uh, project. I, I love there. That. I love and that's that. fiction, where all you're doing is reading the text and the dialogue. Science works in audio book format, unless they're generalized ones that aren't really information heavy. But sorry, uh, Slam Dunk and uh, Rocks are really information heavy. Man, and I was so, I, could do, I hope I could be a an a, a audiobook voice actor like the Rocks <laughs> were there. Chapter two. Yeah, yeah, each one, each one doing their own little chapters on there. Yeah, it's it's an interesting format in some respects. Um, the ideal way of doing it in the future, because it's information, is that it can be done. Uh, for electronic formatting and and smartphones and the like, rather than rather than just the uh, and then have the thing read the, read the text. But yeah, uh, I, I, we're still we're still just kind of plowing through all of that. Uh, Joel yeah, Wise says uh, yes. The description of Chaco Canyon's location. Uh, yeah, the, um, the there's a, a wonderful number of preserved sites all through the Southwest in Arizona and uh, in Colorado, and there's both 
uh, pueblos that are cliff houses types, and there are other ones out uh, in northern Arizona, just uh, not that far from um, uh, the Grand Canyon uh, that are available. And every one of them is just an absolute delight to watch It's uh, and to see. You have a, a lost culture that existed. There was a climate change that took place around 1200 that basically knocked a lot of the places around the world for a cocked hat, and that included the, the, uh, the Southwest. And uh, I'll uh, I'll um, give you a little cover on that until you get back uh, onto the uh, the microphone. Here he comes. Ta-da! Uh, yeah. There's so much shit to learn, Lamont. That's the thing. The universe is just amazing, and we we have so much out there. And that's what really pisses me off with people who are willfully ignorant. How dare people be stupid? in the 21st century. We have no excuse for that. Yeah. It's not like you live in a cave. This stuff is accessible. We can get at it. Yeah, I, I got the audio. I got the paper, the, the of your book. Yeah, both of them are, uh, both of the books are available in, in uh, um, uh, oh, Amazon's um, uh, Kindle reader. And the, they're got, based got, on the, um, uh, the, uh, the doc file, whereas the uh, print version is based on PDF. Yeah, I'm amazed that we can do all this stuff as well. It, it takes a lot um, to assemble the material. Just the physical writing of it takes a while. And of yeah. course, uh, we we really want to make it as accurate and useful as possible. And it's all a learning curve on things. That's true. You know? I think I, I, true. I, I think Jackson said your paperback version had more stuff than the than the the electronic version, or is that not true anymore? Oh, oh, the um uh um. I'm not sure whether or not the, the index shows up. Is, is the index available on the book? The 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 the, the one you have on your e-reader? Let me see. Because someone was saying that it couldn't get the index for the rocks were there in the ebook, and that felt I uh, struck me as odd because I had one. Where would the index be at the end or something? Be right at the, at the tail end. Okay, let's see. Be right after all of the charts and stuff. Yeah, after the bibliography, in fact. So chapter seven. Chart, 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 chart. A lot of stuff in there. <laughs> Which we have probably about 4,000 sources in it. Mm. So the bibliography is quite extensive. But some somebody reviewed it on on Amazon and said they couldn't find the index in it. It, it was missing that in the ebook, and that kind of annoyed me because is this I the definitely is this, yeah, see, thing. Let me index. Uh, no, that's bibliography. Okay, so that's after that. Yeah, it'd be right at the tail end, which would tell you what page number everything is on. Uh, it was all cross referenced, but slight ebook. Uh, yeah, that sure looks like the index. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, so the guy doesn't know how to access his reader. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, anyway, uh, Slam Dunk had like 2,300 sources. I actually uh, constructed a bibliography master index for that. So I knew how, how many were in that. And uh, of, of, it's on a highly specialized topic. Um, when Jackson uh, suggested that we do the book, um, I, I jumped at it. It took me all of like a quarter of a second to say, well, sure. And then finally it reached the point when we had assembled so much material that I dropped the bomb and said, you know, this is so big, we're going to have to split this in two volumes. <laughs> you got yeah, you got like a, a Lord of the Ring trilogy and not just one big book. Yeah. Well, but it, it and it'll be fun with the second volume because we'll be adding in material that's happened since uh, newer, newer technical literature and all the rest and some of the wacky controversies that have popped up. Uh, and uh, um, standing for truth and Nephilim and all that, some of their little little yeah. oddballs and and uh, more geology material and that. So it, it will be um, uh, as up to date as the previous one was. We're we're, so we're very you, proud of the thing. Yeah. Do you do you do you make a do you make I can't talk. Do you need to make a sequel for your for your evolution slam dunk book too, or just is that still? Oh well, what what slam I slam would slam. like someday is if a regular publisher hint hint if enough people buy it and so forth, that people start paying attention to it, where we would do a, a second edition that would be illustrated 
and would be uh, updated. I have a whole stack of stuff downstairs that I keep track of for material that I would be adding in because I didn't put any illustrations in that in it and, and I didn't have the, the uh, rights to them. So I just said, which uh, yeah. I was in the situation where I needed the money. I needed to generate a book in a hurry and get some revenue going. And so I went ahead with what I could do and what I didn't have to get rights for. And um, away we go. But Christine Janis uh, said, the paleontologist, um, and said uh, that uh, all it needs is illustrations and this would be college level. And I go, duh. And that's why I would love to have um, a, a regular publisher who could do um, get the rights to all that stuff and make sure that and print it up in a nice uh, official way that you that, that you, people you that are above my pay grade can do. Hmm? You need retro illustrations? Oh, I know the, I know all the illustrations I wanted in it. They were things I alluded to actually oh. in the text for a lot. There were wonderful charts and things that oh. listed off gene cascade sequences and the well, stuff. I know, that, I know you need that, permission that, to get for that kind of stuff. Yeah, so it, it was a thing where I didn't have the uh, uh, the time to be able to slow down to to hunt it up and to oh, get okay. uh, pictures. And then okay, there like also maybe... also a regular publisher would have an editor that they would go through and uh, uh, say, well, maybe you should tighten this section up and this section here probably should be improved and all that. Stuff. So, anyway, so one way, your, one your, way. Your two books were were self edited and self published. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, uh, the reason why they don't seem too clumsy is because I'm a careful writer, and so is Jackson. And so we we make sure they were vetted. We had people who would be reading through the sections. We know the material very well. Uh, even though technically a Slam Dunk was written by me solo, um, I when um, uh, Christine Janis uh, wrote her review on it, there were no errors or anything in it uh, because I'm really careful. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, there were some occasional typographical glitches that I've caught. But other than that, the content, uh, unlike some that just run off amok, um, sources mean things, content means stuff. And it's possible to write stuff in a rigorous, careful way. That's the way it does. I read a book once where the index was thicker than the text. <laughs> that, well, that that's another thing that... Um, uh, that's a curious part, though, too. Um, uh, people will have noticed that I put in lots of source material, and I try to be as careful as I can. The index for Slam Dunk is fairly basic, whereas I really pulled out the stops for uh, the rocks were there to make sure that every taxa name, every subtopic, and everything was broken down in as accurate a way as possible to help you find information on it. So that's another and thing you're gonna, you do if you ever re re republish that. Slam dunk, you're gonna do all that stuff too. More index, yeah, yeah. I'd be, I'd be a more thorough index. I forgot to put speciation as an index topic in slam dunk. I well, I looked at that and I go, Holy shit, I missed that. <laughs> you know, you can get into um, I, I spit it out in about nine months. That's how long it took me to write slam dunk. When, when was that? That when was that? That 80s, 90s. Oh no no no! I I did the uh, slam dunk in um, 2016. Ah, yeah, yeah, and I, it it had been right after um, I had done the paralogs of Phileas Fogg, and I I was able to um, realize oh people were telling me about publication things, and I was able to discover Amazon's um, Create Space, and then I'm like a kid in a candy shop. I go hey. I could do a science book knowing how to do this now. And so that's when I gear shifted over and wrote Slam Dunk and the, the rest of it. <coughs> so, so now, you, now you can you can compare my book with Standing for Truth and Raw Matt's books. <laughs> yeah. So you said you, you said the you said the mammal the we're talking the mammal translation is, is what convinced you evolution was true what yeah. did, what do you think before well before that oh well I, I was skeptical of darwinian evolution i came okay. up in an environment where there were an awful lot of evolution critics i bumped into uh arthur kessler uh and uh oh, um, mortimer adler and uh, uh several others that that were dumping on evolution from a lot of different directions and I didn't know a great deal about biology or paleontology at that time. This would have been in the 1970s. And only later on, what kind of knocked me off the fence 
was the creation science movement. Thank you, creation science. Uh, you could, I wouldn't have become an evolutionist if it weren't for you. Um, the creation scientists were trying to get their equal time rules in at the time, early 1980s. And I recognized that that was really dumb. No, there were not dinosaurs on Noah's Ark. So I started researching that. And one of the books that I'd read, I think the Zetterberg uh, anthology, um, had a chapter in it on the reptile mammal transition, which I had not known about. And I start looking through all of this stuff and the, and the transitional animals and all of this. And I'm going, whoa. And then I kicked myself because I knew about so many of those critters because they were in my little dinosaur set from a kid. But I'd never connected the dots. Yeah. And so I could have known about more of that information. Although in retrospect, I was actually happy that I didn't get into it earlier because the biology has advanced so much more. Uh, that the kinds of stuff, the endosymbiosis and uh, uh, the homeobox genes, that those were only discovered in the 1990s, that, that doing so much of my research in the late 1990s was an advantage because I didn't have to unlearn stuff that I would have been carried as baggage if I had studied it more in the 1970s. Yeah, yeah. for me, it was it was less of science and more of history that got me to start dying it because I, I was thinking like, like I'm thinking, like my brain, like wait a minute, how could the flood happen four thousand years ago if Native Americans were crossing the land bridge ten thousand years ago? I'm like, oh yeah, that's I'm a like, that's a like persistent Canada. problem, and it's not just the American Indians; it's all the people in Oceania, it's people in China and Africa. That when you look at the creationist literature themselves, it's like pulling teeth to get them to pay attention to the rest of the world, and when they do they really have to ignore most of the data. So that's true of Nathaniel Jensen. There, there's a bunch of stuff that's been popping with him and Tompkins and others that are trying to somehow show that the haplotypes can make sense from their flood model, but they're still not dealing with the archeology span that yeah. we have just way too much information and, and crop domestication. Yeah. Where did corn come from? Maize. Yeah. Basically. I mean, it's only known in the new world, but. Mustn't it have been on the ark if everything was on the ark? Basically, we must have spread it from the ark to, to the we spread it from the ark in, in the Middle East all the way over to Alaska land. We, we spread it. <laughs> and then everybody lost track of it. So there's no rice in the in the new world. There's no potato or no uh, uh, cattle. There's no wheat. But there are potatoes, which are unknown in the old world. There's, uh, there is uh, maize and all of these other fruit crops, tomatoes and, and all these other things and that are unknown <laughs> and chocolate and all the rest. And somehow or other, they get segregated. How? But what, what did the kids divvy up the stuff and no one has any references to sh chocolate in, in the Bible? So well, I, 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 guess the, I guess I guess the certain language, I guess I forgot when the languages happen. Like, OK, the, these certain languages took the chocolate. These certain language, this language group took the, the, the corn. Yeah. <laughs> Which brings up also that Tower of Babel story. That's another problem uh, that uh, gets into a difficulty. It's just and and yeah. and all of that's without even the heat problem, because that's that's the, 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 trying to compress. Just as when you rub your hands together real hard, you start getting them warmer, that things that are sped up too fast generate heat. And if all of that heat tries to take place in too short of a time, it like melts the earth. <laughs> I think of Tower of Babel, I thought I realized this to thought about this today. The tower, the tower is so-called it wasn't that far from the, fl the actual flood. So how many people even were around and built that tower anyways? Because there, if people, if people still lived a like, long time before they even had kids, like hundreds of years before that time. They, they, they're, they're facing a bottleneck because although theoretically you can have uh, Noah and the kids breeding like rabbits at an exponential rate to produce the current population things, you can do that mathematically. It doesn't make sense dynamically, but they can pretend. But then their rates are such that if you think about how many people there were right after the flood and like for the first 500 or a thousand years, there aren't enough to be able to do much of anything. So who the hell built the pyramids and all that other Egyptian stuff? They were, they're trying they to really, squeeze too really much good. together. They were, they were excellent. Build, like they were strong and excellent builders. Yeah. Lifted, yeah. Lifted the and so it's one, uh, the reason why this hasn't come up much 
in creationist apologetics is because none of them are Egyptologists. And so they literally didn't think about it. But I've been waiting like a ticking time bomb for this to start being a problem. And it's starting to happen now as a small number. I think this guy Dons or something like that. And a, a, a small group uh, answers in Genesis that are trying to argue. Basically, they stick rollers underneath the entire Egyptian culture and roll it all down post-flood because there's, they have to. But that just doesn't, won't make sense. It, it's never going to work. <laughs> But hey, this is this is great. So, for hey, we, we've almost been two hour two hours, and and you have and you have not cut off at all. So <laughs> yes, that's a, I think it's because there's just the two of us. Uh, Streamyard gets more of a problem the more people there are, and so ones where like when there's five or six people and too many little boxes in there, so it's like uh, the um, uh, the Brady Bunch. Uh, uh, opening, uh, then that's when it's most likely that I start getting the little spinning circles and get knocked out. So, I think last, <laughs> last time we had only two or three, like we had only like three people and you, you, you count a little bit, but now they still, oh, still small, but yeah, you, you're lasting a lot longer. The gods like therapsids, Lamont. That's why I've been able to talk. They adore therapsids. They really wanted to make sure that Robert Broom's prediction was perfectly done. And not only, not only Robert Broom, that there's issues about the cartilage that forms between one bone and another, and that, that gradually you've got to disconnect those systems so that the little bones can move up into the ear. And we've got the transitional forms for those stages too. It's just yeah. an amazing amount of material. If God did not want me to believe in therapsids, he shouldn't have created all of that. That was a blunder. Yeah. Back to Synapse, oh, back to our original topic, Synapses. When did we when did we get our start getting our like we call it our our milk teeth milk teeth? Oh, those are quite a ways down the road. I think that would be um, uh, um, probably post KT. That um, uh, a lot of that has to do with the particular dentition pattern of uh, the more modern mammals. In fact, um, you could argue that if you were to be looking at any of the mammals that would have been around at the time when there were the earliest mammals, you would be hard pressed to say, well, now that one's going to go off in a direction that's going to have the little milk teeth there in the primates. And that one's going to go off in this direction with that. You wouldn't be able to anticipate that. And yet increment by increment by increment, it gets there. But yeah, in terms of exactly when that popped up in the thing, uh, that's one that you got me on, Lamont. Okay. So cause I, I know, I know, because I, I know, uh, see, the, the, the monitoring part, this, I think they lick. They they're, they're more lickers than they are of the milk than they are suckers. Oh, and they and they and there's a reason for that as well. Platypuses, and I described that in Slam Dunk, uh, that the platypus, the the wiring, they've developed a sensory thing in that little bill. It's not like a duck bill at all. It's like a leathery flap. It's like a piece of skin. It's not the same structure. It just resembles vaguely like a duck. But the point is, it's a sensory thing, and they live in very murky environment, and they are able to sense their potential prey uh, uh, by um, um, uh, what the electrosensing sensing is. Well, that wiring that comes up from the bill has to go right through where the roots of the teeth are. And it turns out that you don't have space there for more than just the one. You either got the wiring or you got the teeth roots. Yeah. So it's basically crowded out all of those. And the early monotremes, the early platypuses have teeth. But gradually that disappears and you end up with that all specialized toothless model that we have now because they're wholly specialized for that uh, electrosensing. Yeah, but by the time we got to yeah, the time we got to the placentals and the and the marsupials, we we, we started su sucking. Oh, but that oh, by the way, yes, that whole bit of the milk teeth thing is the notion about the replacement teeth. And a lot of organisms do that. You get, you get um, uh, uh, virtually every vertebrate is replacing teeth in one form or another. And the issue is whether or not like the, the mammals and our group have specialized in having an initial set of teeth, which are then abandoned and the new ones grow up above it or push the other ones out and, and fill in. Well, that same process occurs in, in dinosaurs even. Often a conveyor belt where there's a new tooth is starting to come up and eventually it pushes the other one out. But they're growing teeth continuously. What's kind of gotten boring for us is we produce an initial set and then one replacement set. Yeah, as I was talking about earlier, how I think, I think 
like at least the mammal sides, we have we have two, we only have one backup, and other other vertebrates like sharks and stuff, and alligators have, have a little bit more backups. Yeah, I, as I, if memory serves me on it, that that there's enough variation in the history of mammals that that didn't all happen all at once. That you had variations as to tooth eruption patterns and replacement patterns, and it can vary from one species to another. And there, well, there is a price you pay about being able to generate fresh teeth because that takes energy. And there's also genetic switches that may have just gotten arbitrarily shut off and to where, you know, the animal only lives a couple years. Uh, um, you know, why bother with another set of teeth it's never going to get to? Well, you mean it all, it all happened in one generation? <laughs> yes, all happened at once. All, all after the arc. All the little animals scampered off of the ark and then then rapidly proliferated and then many of them dropped dead. There's the they, story. They, the they bred, for a while they bred like bunnies and guppies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or or the or the platypus or the the koalas that are hurled by volcanic eruption to Australia. That's another one of the hypotheses no, that no, was presented. No, they didn't do that. They the two kangaroos put put all the all the animals in their pouches, like all the males in the one pouch, all the females in one pouch, and they and they hop. And in and fact, the whole hop. the whole bunch, because of the of the specialized nature of the Australian fauna, they all went on a on a, a tour junket to make sure they all yeah. stayed together. And they're and they're, and, and they're like, hey, why don't we take the monotremes too with, with us? <laughs> yeah, yeah, th that's the one area that. Although there is a fossil record for the monotremes, uh, we can't say that we have a really clear picture of just how diverse they might have been. They would have been relatively small critters, and uh, uh, relatively small critters are hard to preserve. So most of the things that we have, most mammal species in the fossil record are known by just teeth. Yeah. And I also, apparently, a live birth happens in other, other vertebrates, too. Oh yeah, and in and in a quite a different range of, of even I think there are some live bearing sharks and um, uh, live bearing um, uh, reptiles, and that it, it pops up, um, and even the dynamics that lead to the placenta have genetic substrates that are showing up in other kinds of organisms in different contexts. Again, we alluded to a lot of that in both the, of the of the books because all of the boundary layers that you try to do to arbitrarily pigeonhole things, which is what baromenology would have to do for creationists, um, really starts falling apart if you look too closely, because you still, you just find almost this is and nearly that's, and because the genes are doing all sorts of things in various lineages, and it just can't be reduced to the tidy little cartoon version that you get in the anti-evolution literature. Yeah, I heard the placental might have been from a, a e ERV. Yes, yes. It well, it it definitely plays a role, and that's the other issue about all these little cute retro transposons popping around. We know that occurred in another area. Is that the uh, ALU uh, retro transposon, which is like ten percent of us, one point four million of them, and proliferating. Most of them don't do a damn thing. Some of them are dangerous if they kick in. There's a bunch of diseases that are triggered by ALUs uh, um, becoming active inside of a protein when they shouldn't. But Somewhere along the line in the primate lineage, there's some ALUs that got stuck in the brain systems, and they've been useful. So there's a whole network of things that make use of ALU in uh, primate brain physiology and is human brain that, physiology. Is that the one that makes us have to eat oranges for vitamin C and stuff? Uh, no, I, uh, that's a different one from the from the uh, um, the 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 shutting down of the whatever the GULO gene or something. That's uh, that pro normally processes vitamin C. We do have an I hate broccoli gene. Uh, <laughs> it's I can never remember the name of the damn thing, but it's uh, the bitter taste receptor. And oh. in primates, when you eat rotten fruit, you go bleh. Unless and it this will also occur if you eat like broccoli and green vegetables. Well, well in about half of the human species, that's been disabled. And so those who have that mutant gene can munch on green veggies all the time, no problem. Yeah, and, and you can predict with great accuracy how how many alleles they have as to whether they like broccoli as a kid, uh, but or and and as an adult versus not liking it as a kid but liking it as an adult. And they can predict what kind of alleles you have just on that basis. I'm yeah, a broccoli. I, I was the 
broccoli. I, I was in the broccoli's fine as long as it's covered in cheese gene. <laughs> yeah, but normally that when you have a, a President George Bush number one uh, couldn't stand broccoli and he's not making it up. I'm sure he has the normal receptor, which gives a bitter taste if you try to eat green fruit. Uh, there's another thing that uh, um, uh, about a quarter to a half of Europeans have an allele that if you eat beans, you could drop dead. They have a terrible allergic reaction to them. And that's and then, why and Plato the would say, don't eat beans. Well, that's because some people have a, a problem. Same thing with people who can't have shellfish or people who are uh, allergic to uh, peanuts and the like. And, and mel the, the, milk, the milk allergic. Yeah. Lactose intolerant. Yeah, it's all, uh, it, it, there's no malicious gods involved. It's just mutations, you know, and you figure out what they are and you work your way around them and develop technologies to assist you. Yeah, apparently and, and, as a kid, I as a baby kid, I, I, hated, I hated peas and I still hate peas now. I'm not a great pea person, although if they're fresh peas under the right circumstances, but most of them are kind of little squishy things. Uh, yeah. that I can do without beans. If, I'm not I can... terribly fond of, but in fresh and cooked in the right kind of olive oil and the like, uh, I've had a, a, a recipe of that done at a restaurant in S Seattle some years back that was like heaven on earth. It was the most amazingly good thing. But you know, that, that if it's done that way, wow. But yeah. other than that, I can I take, think, I think now I can peas. kind of eat peas if they're, if I don't, if I don't, if I don't if, if they're like small, if they're covered up, if they're like uh, one, if they're like surrounded by other stuff, and two, I don't actually bite into them, like to swallow them whole. My rule on on um um, I think Jer uh, Jeffrey Pollan or whatever his name is that that said the rules of thing is eat what you like, um, eat more plants, uh, like don't eat anything to extinction. That pretty much covers it. You said we said we said did that we said that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait. Anyway, wait I hope that. we didn't bore everybody for the last two hours. No. Uh, well, like, thanks for being on here again. Uh, could you like PM me your email, your sources? I can put in the description. Oh, uh, yes, I can put in. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, on Twitter. I'll give you the uh, the linkages for uh, the direct ones for the books and the website, and that'll cover everything. Cool. Well, yeah, I, I, I'll I, even I, throw I in Paralog to Phileas Fog. If you like fiction, yeah. You know, if you like Jules Verne, you should buy the fiction book too. Yeah, I just I just I try to start doing that more, having having sources in my description. And uh, anything I I restrict myself to anything that I can get full text, so I don't worry about putting in the stuff for just the abstracts. But if okay. I can get access to the full PDF of the paper or the full HTML, uh, then I put that in because that means that they can read the whole thing. And any of those kind of sources, it, it just is a springboard because if you're listening to somebody and go, oh, I'm interested in that. What about that? Well, you know, we stick it in there and, and people can deal with it. So I do that in the show. I've, I've, now that I've figured out how to access my correct channel on my laptop version of the videos for Evolution Hour, I'm going to kind of do um, a retread of the two episodes that got shunted onto the wrong one. And uh, for the next couple of weeks, and then I'll pick up where I left off and uh, and resume uh, the world that way. <laughs> yeah, so check out uh, the uh, two. Check out his channel tomorrow night about about 12, 24 hours from now. You be doing Evolution Hour series again. Yeah, yeah, and and so what? Are, now that we've killed off synapses, what are you going to be dealing with next? Depends on who, depends on whatever guests I get next, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the topic, whatever, to, topic, whatever they want to talk about. Yeah. Remember, everybody, that there are ancestors. This little cute little guy is one of our closer relatives. We're more closely related to this than we are to any dinosaur or bird. Oh, before we go, do we know if that shell that cell was was for more for? Visual purposes like sexual selection or oh, good question. I think because sales pop up several times in a lot of different organisms, it's probably a bit of both. That there's probably a thermal regulatory element to it and sexual display because whatever you end up with ends up a sexual display in organisms that pay attention to that. 
And so uh, not everybody will do that. Uh, some of the, the, the features are so over the top that you wonder why. And the same way I have this, I can't prove this, but my pet theory about Tyrannosaur arms, first of all, they're really well muscled. They're like bodybuilder arms. They're not flimsy. And yet they're really ridiculously short. I think they may have been sexual displays. Oh, cool. I can imagine the ones, you know, kind of flexing. Oh, baby. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, get me going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's my that's my pet hypothesis. Yeah, I saw a thing about about uh, kind of some kind of fist or guppy things where the the, the, the things on experiment. I think I forget where I read it at, but it's like the gu the guppies, or whatever that had no predators in that in that little pond or stream were more colorful and stuff. But the ones that had predators were more camouflage. More camouflage. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the, the how that's the other factor of how you have to think about everything in an ecological context, is that it's not merely what you look like, but how others perceive you. Even down to what things look like. Um, it, when we discovered that birds could see in the ultraviolet, it turned out that there were a lot of bird species that seem rather bland when you look at their plumage until you look at them in ultraviolet and there are spots on their plumage that look the same color as what's next door, except they're really bright in ultraviolet that the bird sees and you don't. Yeah. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to find that balance between natural selection and sexual selection where you gotta survive. You also gotta look good for your, your mate. <laughs> you got it. You got it. You got to get turned on and result in boinking. And, and my, my favorite in the weird department of the lesbian fish that uh, that have no males at all, but they require a male to get them ovulating, and and but they self-fertilize. And so they've gone and they played teases with the neighboring species of males that are closely related to them, getting themselves excited. And the poor males get nothing whatsoever out of it because they're not actually procreating with the, with the lesbian fish. <laughs> Hey, one more thing before we get go. Uh, your opinion on this? <clears throat> you know, we have we have a virus going around right now, right? Hmm. We have a virus going around right now. Oh yes, you know, yes, and a, and a dangerous one. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah, I I've heard all this stuff about we should let the, it run its course and and have herd immune like we should let, let the virus go and stuff and let the, you know get our bodies and stuff. And that, not to worry about vaccines and stuff. Like, well, like, well, yeah, we did that before. And the plague, <laughs> called the plague. Yeah, it yeah. The, uh, that, and it, it's looking like herd immunity isn't very herdish. It all depends as well about whether or not the virus, uh, once you get an immunity to it, it's immune. It's looking like that may not be the case, that it's going to be like a recurring virus. Uh, uh, the general rule should be politicians who can't pay attention to the science and are scientifically illiterates should not be listened to and preferably should be voted out of office. Hint, hint. I I I voted. I did the early voting today. Yeah, I dropped mine off at the um, drop box. Uh, we've been voting for mail in Washington State for years. Uh, and so uh, uh, it was easy peasy on that. I schlepped up to the snow and uh, stuck it in the little drop box next to the library. And that was all done. And then I'll be checking later to see that it's been received because there's websites so we can find out whether or not the vote's been counted and all that. Uh, this seems just reasonable to do. You know, we really needed it. And, and all, one thing, all of the, the reactions that we've been doing to the virus are not things that we need to forget because these things are going to happen again, that there are many, many viruses knocking around in there that can jump into the human environment at a, a moment's notice the, with yeah. international travel and all that the way we do. Uh, and it's yeah. nothing paranoia about, oh, the China virus. Ooh, boogie, boogie, yeah. boogie. Uh, these things can pop up from any place in the world. Yeah. And so the procedures that we do for being careful and instituting uh, masks and social distancing and other operations are ones that are and Zooming instead of uh, uh, live uh, operations. These things are things that we won't be uh, not using in the future. These things are skill yeah. sets that we should retain. Yeah, we, we and we don't know. So right, we still don't know right now if COVID's more like, uh, like the a measles or measles or polio virus, where you, if the vaccine is is like pretty much one and done, or if it's like the flu, you, you get an update every so often. Yeah, and we don't know enough about it yet. We also don't know how it's it's going to be interacting as we get into the flu season 
whether people that might be okay if they just get COVID, but if they get COVID and the flu simultaneously, whether or not that impact will be different. Um, the one yeah. upside is that it doesn't affect kids as seriously as older people, which was the opposite of the 1918 flu. It was dropping dead young people more so than older ones. Yeah, I got my flu shots as soon as I can because I I I have I have asthma, so I don't want to take any chances. Yeah, I yeah, I was, uh, and and there are there are even people who have gotten over COVID are not necessarily now happy as clams again because there are apparently effects on the lungs, respiratory system, and that that are, can be lingering. So um, it's it, the the cavalier attitude the president has been taking on this is absolutely disgusting. Yeah, plain yeah, as I, that. I, I, yeah, if I, I saw a. a so, so it says, it says they, they, <laughs> I don't usually like it, I, I, I don't try to get too political on this on this channel if I can, but it's funny. I read this thing where, like, somebody was saying, How come it's all the only Republicans and stuff getting the virus, not the Democrats? I'm like, Well, maybe because we're following the rules and, and they're really and careful. Things. Yeah, there's been a few people in the Harris campaign that had some um, issues and they had to social distance, and that you know, it, it, it's a virus, it gets around. But you can see by the the way people are behaving, you know the these uh, it, it, when people do really stupid things in public, politics steps into the public realm because it, it, no one should feel ashamed about this. Mr. Trump is my employee. If you're a taxpayer, he's your employee. You're a voter, so he's your our employee. We have a right to be able to ask. Excuse me, but are you doing stupid? Don't do that. <laughs> you know, it's not the other way around. He's not a king. He's not an emperor. He, he's our employee, and I'd like him to act like it. Uh, okay, well, thanks for being on again. Uh, yeah. Check out the show tomorrow. Links will be in the description below once I get them. As I always say at the end of my show, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. I'll see you next time. Bye. Facebook. Looks like we're live. People. Shut. Okay, everyone. Talking time with caffeine. The only podcast where we drink caffeine and hopefully try to get smarter. Excellent. Both of my guests have been here before, so but a little introduction never hurts anybody. So re re reintroduce yourselves and tell me what y'all do. What do you want, Jackson? You want to go first? You can go first, or I can. Doesn't matter to me. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'm Erica. I go by uh, Gutsick Gibbon on YouTube. I am sort of a primatologist in training. I'm getting my master's of research um, in primate behavior, biology, and conservation. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in animal science uh, and a minor in anthropology as well as a minor in biology. So I really like monkeys. That's that's my whole deal. <laughs> monkeys and, and human evolution. So that's that's my my field, so to speak. If I can be so generous to myself, <laughs> that's it. That's my introduction. That's well, much cooler <laughs> than me. I promise it's not. <laughs> oh no, I have well, I have no accreditation as of yet. I won't get my bachelor's until December, so that's Fun close, time. though. You're really close. Uh, yeah, <laughs> allegedly. Uh, oh, come on. Give I'm Jackson. Hi. <laughs> uh, I've got my YouTube channel. That's primarily what I do. Uh, talking about evolutionary biology and uh, whacking creationists. And um, I yeah, do school at bachelor's in field and organismal once I finally get it. So that's really about it. It's all like, I like fish. A fish. Yeah. You do like fish. You like tetrapods. You like uh, amphibious tetrapods, right? I've got yeah, one. We got on got Jack Darwin the axolotl. Back. That's who I'm. Yeah, I know. I knew you had one in there. I was like, I know he's got an axolotl. I know he likes some tetrapods. Before we got on, Jackson said he wanted to be your, your two. Padawan learner. Right. Yeah. Because you're the master of the of the trip. And that would make me the the lowly Padawan. <laughs> mm. 
At least you've got tetrapods in your house. I've got no pets right now, which sucks. Hey, you, hey, hey, hey well, you, you got at least one tetrapod in your house. I got my, I got myself. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am the tetrapod. I got a, in. I got a new fish uh, just yesterday. Uh, I got a, a blue ram cichlid, and he's <sighs> he's just a little guy right now. They're very oh, pretty. Go with and he's small. So you got oh, it's what's what, 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 an, an O. It's actually an O. I can't, can't, can't pronounce it. Oh, I can't pronounce it. Oh, oh, something. The 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 bony clade. <laughs> oh, oh, stick these. Yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah. You have a uh, you have fish or um. Or your vertebrata, which is breaks down into um, uh, what is it? Agnatha, which is the lampreys and hagfish, the jawless, the living jawless fish, and you have chondrichthys, which is the cartilaginous fish, shark skates and chimeras, and those guys. And then you have all the other fish are concentrated in ostichthys, which then breaks into sarcopterygii, which is the lobe fin fish on the one side, and actinopterygii on the other side, which is the ray fin fish, which the ray fin fish then breaks down again into uh. Polypteriformes, oh. which is the bichers and rope fish and gars and uh, was it gars and paddlefish and uh, bow fins and sturgeons, and then you have all the rest of the fish, which are in the teleosti. So can we can we pour one out for the Chinese paddlefish? Is that okay? Sure. Right. Oh man, that was sad. That's so sad. That bummed me out for like at least a week. I every time I thought about fish, I was like. Fucking Chinese paddlefish. Sorry, Paul. The freaking Chinese paddlefish. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they, before they we, still have. The, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I'm gonna say before we get to the main our main topic, Eric has been uh, active in the in the debate scene again. You debated STF twice now. Yeah, yeah. Me and Standing have been been going toe to toe. We're supposed to have another one, but I, you know, I need it. I need it to be before the 18th, or it can't happen until June. Um, yeah. So, so we'll, we'll see. So is he uh, the uh, comparing? Is he the same, better, or worse than when you're, you're bait with uh, KH? Yeah, I think standing's better than Kent in a lot of ways. And in other ways, I, I would say sort of, sort of worse. I guess. I mean, the, the things that standing is better in is at least he kind of knows what he's talking about. Um, but that's also a double-edged sword because the things he, he's. He, it kind of seems like he's going off of the replacing Darwin script almost exclusively. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So whenever whenever the script starts to kind of veer off, he tends to have some some lines. Kent Hoven in there. Once the once you get him off Jensen, he goes straight to Kent. He does, but but at least he's got Jensen until that point, which at least has the guise of being empirical. So um, so yes, so, so, I guess yes, so. So different talking points or the same talking points that you've you've seen? It's it's like Jackson says. I mean, it depends okay. on it depends on if you can get him to leave replacing Darwin or not. Or Tompkins. To be fair, he also uses Tompkins. Or Stanford. Or yeah, he or used to, he used to be wedded to Stanford. And so uh, when I did my debate with him, uh, I actually wrote my rebuttal in advance because yes. I knew all of his talk <laughs> or we, my my team and I, we knew all of his talking points. And he hasn't he hasn't asked for a debate since, so I count that as a win. So yeah, Eric, I think have, that is a win. You have, do you have a team that too, or you you, you a solo act? I'm a, I'm a one woman show at this point. I well, that's not true. I I absolutely have like when I knew I was going to be discussing genetics, which wasn't initially what it was supposed to be about. If that makes sense, because I'm not a geneticist, so I would never intentionally be like, hey, let's talk genetics. Um, what I wanted to talk about was sort of limited versus universal ancestry, I guess. Um, I was open to the idea of talking genetic entropy just because that doesn't necessarily lend itself just to genetics. But then I saw that the title of the debate was creationist genetics, like the day of, and I was like, oh, <laughs> I should probably get my terms a little bit more straight. Um, so so I, you know, I'm, I took genetics in undergrad, but other than that, genetics, and, and I guess we, I've had some lectures on like population genetics this, this semester and conservation genetics, but outside of that limited scope, you know, it's it's basically been like, well, you know, I I got the basics, but but that's kind of that's kind of the point, isn't it? Like, you don't have to be a geneticist to debunk genetic entropy. It's it's that's kind of no, the you really don't. Yeah, like you don't have to know the stuff. It helps because when he throws out random terminology, like obviously I don't 
I'm I'm not well versed in orphan genes. Like I knew the term, but I oh didn't. Oh my god, they're so stupid. They're yeah. They um they they just they don't understand anything. Uh, fun fact: when the book comes out, which it's only a few days away from coming out, uh, we RJ and I wrote an entire section about the orphan genes because creationists royally screw up all across the board on that. Like they do everything else. So and, and the weird. Uh, first of all, I. I believe that but second of all it was weird because it's like i've heard creationists like talk themselves raw about pseudogenes and about ervs so i was like i'm ready for both of those and then he comes out with with orphan genes of all things and i was like well i don't i don't know orphan genes well enough to like speak on them i guess um like i wouldn't even consider my knowledge cursory and so when he it was explaining like his definition of them i was like okay so it sounds like it's the almost the exact same logic as as any other sort of inherited genetic phenomena right i mean they, they emerge there there are emergent genes that's, that's just pretty much it happened. that's the whole yeah. thing yeah, yeah. And so, but but then he didn't like when i was like it sounds to me like you can follow the same logic as, as pseudogenes or ervs even though i don't know enough about it, it it's like i don't know sandy's got this weird thing where it's like if you don't use what the terminology he wants to use um, and the reason that i feel like he does that is so he can kind of, he's attempting to force you to say what he wants you to say you know what I mean? And and uh, I don't know. I'm just not, I don't, every, you can always tell when he's about to try to lead you into it too. So then you're almost like, all right, <laughs> like, how dumb do you think I am? <laughs> Come well, on. Give me a little I mean, time. I would love to say I have um, as much experience with him as you, but um, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that, unfortunately. Oh, well, I had like two conversations with him, which went reasonably well because Things were going okay until he dropped genetic entropy on me. And at that point, I'd never heard of it before. I didn't know about his H1N1 talking points, which are just so backwards. And and his misrepresentation of James Crow and Moja yeah. Kimura and all that. I wasn't familiar with any of that. And so when he first dropped it on me, I was just kind of like, I, as far as I'm aware, from what I've read of genetics or population genetics, there's no talk about genomic degradation. So I'm not, but then when we, when I got my team and I started looking into this, we're like, oh no, this is all bull crap. <laughs> yeah. And the thing that kills me about that too, is like um, the, just like the, the whole idea of genetic entropy is that it's straight up a creationist, like, like straight up thievery of error catastrophe, which also doesn't happen. <laughs> so it's like, uh. in one paper, it's like, I'm not, an epidemiologist, right? Like I don't understand or, or anything to do with viruses or pathogens or anything like that. But even I'm capable of reading that H1N1 paper by I think Tompkins, right? And being like, this is a bad paper, you know? And, I, and I'm a master student. I'm not a professor. That's when you know it's bad. The, um, the it's, it's a doctrinal position. Uh, as I, I did, uh, we did a video on genetic entropy on my channel. It's a doctrinal position. I have a book from 1967. It's a creationist book. And it talks about genetic entropy. The 60s were before the the DNA sequencing revolution. So we didn't have population genetic data yet. So they couldn't have made this, this declaration. So it's unbelievable. What you have is this is this is direct word for word evidence of here's a position we want. And we're never going to give it up and we're going to scramble for data to, you know, to, to affirm it. And so that's, I mean, that's really all creationism has ever been, but right. the fact that, that, you know, standing acts like, Oh, we reasoned to this position. No, you didn't. No. And, no, and the, didn't. the thing that kills me too, is that it's like, I spent the afternoon prior, like watching standing's talks with, <sighs> with geneticists with, with CRISPR. And I don't, that's just the name that, that he goes by. I'm not sure. Oh, I I'm an oncologist, yeah, right? Or, or he does oncology. He deals with cancer. And um, and I was floored when I was listening, when Standing was like talking about the ENCODE project and when CRISPR was, and I, I actually went back and looked and I think the debate is actually from like two or three years ago, debate. Yeah. Uh, anyways, whatever. CRISPR was like, so you're telling me you think that there's a trend for, for function based off of the ENCODE poor definition of function even though that's not what we're seeing. And he's like, yes. So then here we are late. And I couldn't believe that he kept harping that point. And I was like, all right, he can't, at least he can't do that now because we have recent literature that puts a cap on that. So he can't say that. And then he straight up just like agree to disagree. And I'm like, that's not what this oh, is. He's not the only one. Uh, Fazal Rana, 
did it too. I because I brought up the pay, um that's what's his name? It's the yeah he's written. It's the guy who wrote it. It's written a couple of papers. Uh, um, evaluating in codes, retweeted a couple of them. Mm. Oh crap! But anyways, yeah he um yeah uh, one's like on the immortality of TV sets or something like that. That's the name of one of the papers right, 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 he's right. written. And so yeah no they're well. The theory versus the empirical data, and just basically, yeah, agree to disagree. That's all I did, and so it's like, okay. And and the Whatever. thing is, that it's one thing to look at it from a logical standpoint and be like, yeah, genetic entropy is bad because select the way that selection works just doesn't jive with genetic entropy, right? I mean, like you can't have something that is simultaneously bad for fitness that isn't selected against. It just doesn't happen. That's not the definition of fitness. Um, at least as long as, and, and, but the problem again comes with, is it function, right? Does it, does it display in phenotype in some way? Um, and, and they, they straight up just disagree with empirical results. That's like reached in a mathematic sense, like disagreeing with theory. Okay. That's dumb, but whatever. Disagreeing with the mathematic results that have been reached via actual experimentation that can be replicated sorry you, you gotta you gotta show it like follow the same steps reach the same conclusion and come back and tell me that, that you disagree but you can't just say no i don't like the results right. I, yeah. I um i think well i mean to be fair that's what creationism is founded upon but, but, fair uh, enough, fair enough. but uh, i think i don't think he's ever been given the onion test uh standing <laughs> you ever given standing the onion test i have not no i haven't but i think it would be well like i said I haven't talked to him in like a year. No, like over a year now. So, uh, yeah. so I, I mean, uh, I think it'd be fun to see him. Well, first not know what it is. Then second squirm once he figures out what it is and try to <laughs> rationalize his way around it. I wonder if he'll do the, the, I love that thing Kent does where Kent doesn't know the definition for something. So he says, let's call the audience. You know? Oh, oh my God. Or um, what is it? When I did my debate with him, and I wrote my so I wrote my script first, and I sent it off to my guys so they would look it over. They were like, "Oh, this is too technical, Jackson. You're gonna have to dumb this. Remove like all of the periods of time that you're that you're referencing. Remove the fossil names. Just you're gonna have to get rid." Of this. And so it was um yeah because I was like, "Oh crap, you're right. He wouldn't know any of this. Yeah. I'd be talking at him, you know." Yeah. So. Hundred percent, yeah, and and you know, and that's I think ultimately that's where like the it's just bones in the dirt thing came from in the first place was Ken just didn't want to learn the names, so he, it it had nothing to do with the theology or or the actual theory behind it. He was just like I'm not, I can't be bothered. He couldn't be bothered to learn the names. So whatever, it, it, far be it from me. I mean, what he's doing is working for for him. So uh, unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> Oh, we got a bunch of people watching. Hello, everyone. Excellent. I'm glad everyone's here. Sorry for my loud crunching. I, I have an affinity for raw pasta in case I tweeted about it the other day, but I just, I don't know. I like no. it. You got a crunch on that launch. I, I do. This long, this long guy right here. It's, I don't know. I like him. Hello, first yeah. Lala. Layla? Lala? Morons everywhere. Fair it's enough. true. It's like the the uh, um, Buzz Lightyear morons, morons, morons everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> You're a sad, yeah. strange little man, me at Kent <laughs> I um hope is that in the near future I'll be talking to Long Story Short for the second time. He's actually he's not a younger. Mm. Well, I say that he's technically not a young Earth creationist. I don't know if he really isn't because I don't think he really thinks mm. about it. Um, but I should be talking to him again in the near future. That would be uh, exciting. Uh, it'll be something, all right. Mm. I'm going with exciting. I, I found a basic chart. <laughs> no okay. pictures, though. No, no, no. This this absolutely works. This I'm pretty sure this is fairly contemporary. Um, I think the only thing I can think is that... No, 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 that works. Yeah, that works. Mobos, Gibbons, Rangs. We were well I Well no, that's that's good. Enough. I was wondering Yeah, I was I was thinking of 
I do like to eat raw ramen noodles, unfortunately. <laughs> it's, I, again, I have an affinity for raw pasta. I'm not sure what the deal is, but raw noodles, I find them very satisfying to crunch on, so so I, I do so. The only thing here is that I'm not 100% sure that L Langer's and Colobin's are more, like, I, I almost might, I almost might flop the old world monkeys because I, I think macaques, at least I know rhesus macaques, it's like 90, 92 of, of full genome comparison to humans. I don't know that they've actually sequenced langers or colobins or verbits for that matter. Um, but the new world, absolutely, for simians are all great. Um, uh, this is better than uh, try. I found uh, another chart where it had, had Tarsiers and lemurs on the same on the same branch. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, tarsiers, the the Omamyid and the uh, adapted split is where we would see that original split between the the prosimians and and our, our sort of tarsier forms. And I think that was around 30, 35 million years ago, if I remember correctly. Um, but the interesting thing is is that we're not one hundred percent sure if the Omamyids are are stem or not. So whether or not tertiaries should actually be considered omomyids or whether or not they're sort of, a, a sort of omomyids and, and are sort of a, a stem group of what would become the tertiary forms. Right. Um, so, it's it's almost weird. like they're transitional. Almost like. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> that would be so, weird, but you know, we all know transition. Come on. Yeah, I, I found no, of course not. Yeah, going back, the thing, apparently there's a, before primate, there's this group called primate, primate primitive forms. Yes. So, so interestingly enough, with, with the primates, generally what we look at when we're looking at early sort of whether or not they're considered a, a, a primate or not, like Purgatorius has been switching back and forth. Uh, Purgatorius was originally, was originally considered the first primate. And I think that's kind of on the fence now, whether or not that's in vogue. Because the thing is, is that its ankle bones and its dentition are starting to be very primate-like. Not necessarily its formula, but actually the sort of how the molars look, if I remember correctly. So ankle bones, teeth. And that's because the ankle bones are really key for, for arboreality, right? Because the mammals that originally, Jackson, correct me if I'm wrong, but the mammals that originally survived sort of the, the, the end Cretaceous extinction event partially survived because of their their burrowing ability yes that sounds about right yeah and so, think so. Have, yeah it, it sounds right and so if from what i remember when i was sort of looking into this for my first human evolution video of, of sort of our proto primates is that we see this this sort of timing this perfect timing with the North American mega flora, right? So the, the emergence of these big fruiting bodies in North America and sort of these tree shrew like ancestors taking to the trees. So becoming from regular shrews to, to arboreal tree shrews. And that transition can be seen in their ankles. Now, whether or not Purgatorius is, is, is a sister group to the proto primates, what actually would be our, our first primate or whether it is in and of itself a primate, it's up for debate. Um, because we don't really have very much of Purgatorius. Again, we have its ankle bones, we have a lot of its teeth, we have some of its jaw, but I don't know that we have the whole thing. Um, and even if we did, it's still kind of up for debate. Uh, that said, it's super interesting. I, I, I think that sort of the, the first, the argument of the first primate, it, it kind of comes down to, as, as wow. usual, it kind of comes down to uh, nitpicky details, right? Because what makes a species, right? It's, it's all a gradient. Oh no, no. <laughs> We're not going to get into the the arbitrariness of of taxonomy, are we? <laughs> Should we define them? <laughs> no, no. There are no there are no uh, taxon there are no taxonomic rungs. Everything is just a clade. Okay, cut cut me some slack though, because finding the the origin of an order, like the first member of an order, right? It's it's not even for sure. Even if we could find a member that's like for sure a primate. And it's the first one in the fossil record, like with with no ambiguity. Then you're like, all right, well, we still don't know if it's the first primate because we could have a representative that doesn't exist in the fossil record. That sucks. Let me <laughs> let me blow your mind. Orders aren't real. There we go. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> Wait a second. Yeah, I don't know. I was um as I've been, I'm I'm finally done writing about the Cambrian for mm. the Secret Project. Um, the Cambrian and Pre-Cambrian, I'm so ready to be to read something else now that I've read uh, Wonderful Life and 
like dozens of papers on the Cambrian. I'm finally done with it. And uh, having to read about what is a phylum, at what point is something in a phylum, what is the difference between stem members and crown members, and did you know, and this just drove me insane, arthropoda has been used both as the crown arthropods and the stem plus the crown arthropods. The only reason I know about that is because I took entomology on a whim. I loved it. It was one of my favorite classes. Um, but interestingly enough, that pissed our professor off so much when he was teaching us it. He was like, because what what are we even talking about here? Words mean nothing. <laughs> I, you know what? He's absolutely right. Um, yeah. It's just, it's it when I realized, because I was like, okay, they're calling Anomalocaris an arthropod. It's not a crown arthropod. What is happening? And then I, I was reading, a, I think it was a Bud and Jensen paper, and they're like, or you could say, you arthropod. And I was like, everything is, is dead. And you're like, are you kidding? I had so much so, so this this is kind of a, a neat segue, but my project, my, my actual study is, is based off of uh, uh spiteful intervention in, in pig-tailed macaques in Malaysia. So I'm looking to see if there's there's uh, dimorphic behavior in the males and females uh, when they intervene in one another's behaviors. And whether or not that could be considered spiteful or selfish or altruistic or you know reciprocal, whatever, the, the four fundamental social behaviors, so to speak. And when I was doing my literature review, which by the way, I'm sure you know, literature reviews suck because you have to find like a, a hundred papers on the subject you're looking at all of which and all of which are one app that also have enough holes in them that you can justify your own research <laughs> anyway so i'm looking into this and i'm like wait a second all of these papers i can find are saying spite is not a real thing spite cannot be selected for because it's a negative negative it's it's uh when an individual uh let's say we're talking about monkeys so an individual monkey incurs a cost on themselves in order to impose a cost on on another so logically, right, evolutionarily speaking, that shouldn't be selected for. And yet there's hundreds of paper on spiteful behavior in animals. So I'm like, what is going on? And it took me five hours of literature searching to find finally a paper by, uh, I think his name is Keith Jensen in 2010, where he's basically like, yeah, the problem is no one's using the same definition. And I was like. You mean you have to do research? <laughs> I was like, wait a second. You guys could have come up with this the same definition. Like we're all using different definitions. And he was like, well, it depends on if you're talking about evolutionarily. So like the, one of the four fundamental behaviors or like functional, which most functional spiteful, functionally spiteful behaviors are inherently selfish in nature. So it's a it's a plus for the con for the uh, the actor and a negative for for the target. And I was like, that really would have been good to know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I didn't. I didn't know you had to do research to do to study stuff. That's just... I know. I oh, know. Yeah. You believe it. <laughs> it's um. What is, we're doing like a project for my marine biology class, and so we're doing it on Gracilaria, which is this red algae, and there's all the literature is from like the 80s oh, because God. they basically said, "Hey, look, this algae," and then they kind of resolve some of the taxonomy, but not a whole lot, and it's it's um. It's a the Gresselaria is a big component of agar, and so it has an economic importance. But that was kind of it, really. They were like, okay, well, yeah. Then no one touches it for twenty years, and you're like, I'm using papers from the '80s, like back when you know the the, the definitions were completely different. <laughs> I mean, we're, you know, we're Pluto's still a planet. That's the kind of science we're doing. Science hey, wait changes. a minute. <laughs> That's science never changes. You know, it's always. Hey, Darwin saith, and so it goes. Wait a second. You're telling me science changes when when the, the data sort of suggests that maybe it should? That's not right. Impossible. If it doesn't fit into the shoehorn, it doesn't exist. No way. I don't if, believe it. If the if the data doesn't support your facts, or wait, no, the, what is it? If the facts don't support the theory, it changes the facts. Yeah, yep, right. yeah exactly. So. So yeah, that, that was a that was a hard lesson that when we were when we were first coming up with our projects last sem last term last semester whatever, um, and they were like, "Here's the thing." They were like, "If you're doing your project and and the data sort of starts to suggest that maybe your hypothesis was wrong, that's okay." And I was like, "What do you mean it's okay? I'm wrong. <laughs> that doesn't fit into this." 
that doesn't fit here. <laughs> it, 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 you know, it would really be funny if you're doing a report uh, up on up on stage or whatever, or in front of your class, and, and all of a sudden, so in the middle of your report, you're like, oh, everything, uh, like, oh, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, this this is wrong in the middle of your report. Like, oh, sorry, Pff, like, you tear it up in the middle of your report. Like, okay, okay. Like, I, I think I said, never mind. The the thing is, is the, interestingly enough, that it's interesting that you say that because some of the best presentations I've seen, because uh, we have like seminars where where individuals who have been previously who are PhD students, whatever, they come in and they they present their their research, and then everybody can go and watch for free, which is really cool. There have been a lot of excellent seminars this year. But some of my favorites are when they get up there and they're like, my hypothesis was blah 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 after they've introduced their methodology and the field side and the study species. And then they're like, it turns out my hypothesis is completely wrong. And what we actually found out was this, this, and this. And then you're like, all right, this is gonna be good. Like this is gonna be a great presentation. Yeah. So sure. Always fascinating. So you have, have you ever been proven wrong in your in your researches? I mean, my my research is incredibly limited. That my undergraduate Same. research was on the yeah, it, it, the, my undergraduate research was on the diet habits of civets, which are you know they're they're vivorids, so they're Ooh. small carnivorous or omnivorous rather mammals um, that that live in in Southeast Asia. Mongoose so we, cats. Yeah, mongoose cats. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, I wanted to study the binturong, but they were like, "You're not going to see a bear cat. <laughs> You're not yeah. going to see. Them. You might smell them. They smell like popcorn, but you won't see them." Um, Very interesting. And I thought I smelled one at one point, but then I was like, I was like, do am I smelling a ventron or do I just want to smell a ventron? <laughs> Anyways, um, my hypothesis was proven correct, but it was also like a dumb hypo it was an easy hypothesis, right? Um I we, we predicted that civets, which are omnivorous and, and can readily find fruit during during most periods of the year in, in Thailand would would probably favor um meat when we would bait our traps because we would bait camera traps with meat and with fruit and then we would wait until they would come across their their game cam so they snap a picture when we when an individual walks in front or feeds upon the bait trap or whatever um and the reason was because well if they've got access to fruit year round then then meat is of course a luxury item so to speak it's it's less easy to come by etc cetera, etc cetera. so they should probably favor the meat and they did but our sample size was so small we couldn't really get anything out of it um because it was like a, it was just a couple of months of a study, and civets are also really, really hard to hard to get on camera. It turns out, so we should have picked a different a different study species. Our our other group who went with us were, were working on uh, temperature preferences of tokay geckos, um, and tokay geckos are like literally you can't throw a rock and not hit a tokay gecko. Um, like when you're in Southeast Asia, they're everywhere. So that, I, I don't know if they actually ended up publishing, but they definitely had a healthy amount of data. Um, so yeah, my, I mean, if we're talking hypotheses and research, no, I haven't been wrong, but I also had a really easy topic and I'm, I'm definitely open to the idea that I'm gonna be wrong about my upcoming project because it hasn't been studied very much in, in the macaque genus. So we'll, we'll see, we'll see well, what happens. Well, that's a good thing is, is you can admit that you, you can be wrong or could be wrong or are wrong. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. It's like, you almost kind of hope that you get surprised, right? Because that's usually when the novelties come out. That's when you've got a publishable paper, when you go out there and you're like, oh, wow. Uh, Vanta Blue here says the best deceveries don't start with Eureka, but that's funny. And that's pretty dead on from from the, the people that I've at least watched present their their own their own studies. When when you're wrong, you're that's when the excitement starts, I think. Yeah. So let's start, let's start with the basics. What it makes a primate a primate? I think the most general definition that I've heard, at least this year so far, is that primates, they're mammals that tend to be dexterous in both their hands and their feet, at least when compared to other mammals, uh, even with an arboreal lifestyle. But most importantly, they have a larger brain size to body mass than other mammals of their size. Um, which, which the argument kind of comes in at that point because it's like, all right, well, which came first, social group living or a large brain? And that's where, where you get this really big academic debate that's been going on in the primatology community right now, that's been going on since the 80s with Robin Dunbar and the social brain hypothesis. So why do primates have such big brains? What's the reason? Some people suggest that it's, it's social group living and that living in large groups requires keeping track of numerous individuals and maintaining these vast networks. So you know who's your kin, who's not your kin, who's your friend, who's not your friend, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
Others have suggested it's diet based and that because we find at least a, a correlation, although it's it's quite weak between frugivory, heavy frugivory, so eating fruits and large brains in primates, that that's the link, switching from bolivory and nuts and things like that to heavy fruit, heavy, heavy fruit, and that's the reason. Some have suggested that it's a mishap in gestation and developmental period. So that the longer that you have, the longer of a gestational period you have, uh, the larger brain you tend to have, and therefore the longer developmental period you have. And that that requires uh, a, a higher sort of paternal investment by, by the mother usually. And sort of this, this sort of trade-off goes back and forth until eventually you're selecting for larger brains because you're, you're hoping sort of naturally speaking, to, to reap the cost of that development. It's called the developmental cost hypothesis. And lastly, and I think this is definitely should be a part of any of the three previous hypotheses that you're proposing, is the uh, cognitive buffer hypothesis. So this is the idea that having a large brain allows you to react with, with behavioral plasticity to changes in your environment. So that if something radical happens, you're intelligent enough to be like, all right, let's see, hold on. You'll see your troop of baboons. And you're like, we've got a really bad drought this year. Wait a second. I remember two years back when the troop had a different alpha, male and female. Uh, we, we went to this specific watering hole and, and it had these sort of tubers in the ground that we could feed off of and it, and it sustained us. So let's go there. It could have to do with memory. It could have to do with, with sort of predator alarm calls, being able to have this vast verbal repertoire of, of calls that you and your, your con specifics can understand. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I think no matter what, you gotta inc incorporate the cognitive buffer hypothesis because primates are ridiculously good at reacting to their surroundings, um, more so than most mammals, I would say, um, of similar size. To be clear, I mean obviously a marmoset isn't going to be as good as like like a bottlenose dolphin at reacting to their surroundings, but um, um, a marmoset's going to be better than anything else of their of their same size because going to be better than a sack of potatoes. Will he be? <laughs> Well, he'll be better at the <laughs> Well, if, what if they were both on land? The, the normal set would probably be better at reacting. Fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Anyways, that's your answer. Primates have big brains and dexterous hands and feet. So did they have first appear before or after the K KT boundary thing? That's a really, really good question. And there's actually not a solid answer in the literature. Um, what I've seen generally suggests that because mammals had such an explosive radiation after the Cretaceous, it's probably going to be after. Um, yeah. Because obviously arboreality, there weren't very many arboreal mammals during the Cretaceous because there were lots and lots and lots of arboreal predators in the form of dinosaurs and, and sort of dinosaurian form. Yeah, plus I, plus I think before, we probably before, we probably looked a little bit similar to each other. Yeah, but I mean, more so than we do now, certainly. I mean, there, we've, we're talking of enormous radiation. Jackson can speak a lot about this since he just studied the Cambrian, but it's like when you've got all those open niches all of a sudden, that's like, that's evolution on speed, you know, because everything is just seizing opportunities. I mean, obviously it, it seems fast in geologic time. It actually occurs quite slowly. I mean, obviously, you know, we, we, we don't see evolution in real time in sort of enormous animals. We see them in smaller animals because we, we don't have huge lifespans. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I would say, I would say after the, the end Cretaceous extinction, that's, that's what I'm getting. That's what I feel to take from standing for truths, uh, 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 sort of toolkit. That's where the trajectory is going. Gross. Well, well, no. you, when you breed and live for, for two weeks compared to 20 to 40 years, you know, things, things happen a little bit faster. Fair, fair enough. I agree. Uh, so, besides the wet nose, dry nose thing, I think the other differences between the the two the two subspecies or not subspecies, but the, the, the prime of it. Yeah. So, so when you're dealing with, I, I, I'm guessing you mean like the difference between like strepsirines and and our uh, our sort of haplorines. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the main difference, interestingly enough, like it used to be. Um, social living. So, but we also have animals like ring-tailed lemurs, which maintain incredible social groups. But and the, and the then for a while, people were like, well, maybe maybe it's like vocalization complexity because we see you know weird vocalizations pop up in the in the ground monkeys, uh, baboons, geladas, macaques, langurs, colobins, etc., etc. Sorry, but <clears throat> I think 
I think really and truly you're looking at a morphology difference. So a lot of, a lot, I, I don't want to say all because I, I, I'm not 100% sure. Prosimians aren't necessarily my, my sort of hone in. I know mostly about the sort of the haplorines and the old world monkeys um, and the hominids, I guess, hominoids and hominids. Uh, but tooth combs, interestingly enough, most lemurs will have a tooth comb. So it's essentially like three on three incisors on the bottom like that. And they use so to kind of comb through their fur and in, in sort of affiliative behaviors and things like that. Um, and a lot of lemurs still have what's called a toilet claw, <laughs> which is a terrible name, but it's it's essentially sort of a hooked nail on, on their thumb, uh, which is used again for mostly grooming. Um, so little morphologic differences. Also biggie, Prosimians are, they have a much higher uh, ratio of nocturnal to diurnal individuals. So there are very few members of, of the haplorines who, who are nocturnal in comparison to the prosimians. And do we know when the speciation happened between the two? Or are you still not sure? Mm, I think, so again, you're looking at that adapted omamyid split. At least most people would would suggest that that's sort of the case because tarsiers are technically haplorines, but they're also kind of barely haplorines, if that makes sense. Like they just, they, they just made the they just made the cut. <laughs> yeah, they make the cut. They make the cut. So again, it's it's probably if I remember correctly, I said earlier thirty to thirty five, but it actually might be thirty to forty for the adapted omamyid split, um, just because again, it really depends on what you define as sort of a primate, because with those guys, we're dealing with sort of three subgroups, right? We're dealing with, um, or no, wait, that's that's actually that's actually the new world monkey, scratch that. It, it depends, I would say 30 to 40 million years. Ago. Let me double check. While, while, we're, while we're here, might as well. Oh, my, spoil it. Please let me be right. Mm -mm -mm. I'll distract him with my juggling abilities. <laughs> yeah, Jackson, talk for a minute. Ah, yep. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so yeah, 40 million years ago. Um, some say early representatives of each of the clades begin around 60 million years ago, but that they're, they're actual... So like, again, there's this difference between like a speciation time and a divergence time. So divergence is when they sort of start to split with no interbreeding, or with interbreeding rather, and then speciation would be like you can't oh. reproductively... You can't do the do anymore. Let's probably... Exactly. I mean, you can do the do, but you just well, want nothing. It is not work. <laughs> well, that's probably that's probably where ring species come in. You know, the, the ring is slowly. I guess the uh, uh, ring is be very careful on how you use that term. Um, rings, in the classical sense, there are no known ring species, and there probably won't ever be, um, because in the classical sense, and Jerry Coyne has railed endlessly about this. Um, okay. The idea of the ring species, as, as I'm sure you know, but if, if anyone's watching, they don't know. Um, you have basically a species on one end, and they go around some barrier. It's all backwards. I can see on my camera. They go around a barrier, and they, by the time they've, re they've reconnected with the parental species, at the, you know, they've reached the starting point again, um, they can no longer interbreed because they've, they've taken so long and so many genetic differences have built up that they can no longer interbreed. Well, as it stands currently, there are no known perfect examples of that. There are ring species in sort of a, in so, sort of a loose sense. Um, the Incitina salamander is one of the most common mm -hmm. examples in California because they go around the, um, is that the Death Valley? I think, I think that's correct, but I'm not 100% positive. Um, yeah, I live in Louisiana, so, you know, I, I don't know about them. Um, <laughs> I'm they not go, in a away, so. Uh, but they they go they circle so they start at the top near Oregon and they go around but they form clusters in essence there's a cluster up top a cluster kind of on the side by Nevada and then a cluster kind of the bottom to the bottom to kind of midway up California because the ones from Oregon kind of went down both ways and they stopped about midway down California on one side which towards the Pacific on the other side they went all the way around and so there's limited interbreeding in these, or there's interbreeding in these different spaces, but they cluster together. So it's not a perfect ring species, but you can still sort of call it a loose ring species. Um, I think the, the Laris gulls, there's been some talk about that one. I think that one is kind of the same deal. It's like clusters of interbreeding or of, of in, yeah, of interbreeding. So 
Yeah, I mean, they're, they're neat. Conceptual boxes, right? Do what? They check some of the conceptual boxes, just they're not considered an ideal. Right, yeah. I mean, it's the same with um, uh, species aggregates and complexes, things like Heliconius, which is a butterfly from South America. Basically, you have lots and lots of little groups of, like, incipient Heliconia species who are all kind of living near each other and they have slight differences. And so if you were to totally separate them, they'd probably form a bunch of different little species, but there's probably still some limited interbreeding going on mm -hmm. there. But you're right. It does, it does. It's, it kind of gets back to the heart of, well, what the heck is a species? <laughs> because we have these different groups who can interbreed. The thing that I really like, um, which uh, kind of puts a hole in uh, Kent Hovind's, well, farmers rely on evolution not happening. Mm -hmm. um, mm. What I like to think about is, uh, well, I thought they did. I, well, I thought they required uh, uh, happening so they could get bigger crops. Well, yeah, exactly. They they artificially select in particular directions. Um, what is it, Brassica <laughs> oleracea, which is like the broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower and all that, because they're selecting for different parts of the plant. Um, but with uh, well, with dogs, for instance. You know, if you look at like a Great Dane or a St. Bernard and a Chihuahua, well, naturally, I mean, you know, unless the Chihuahua ended up as lunch immediately, they're not going to interbreed. <laughs> right? there's, a, there's a mechanical uh, barrier. Yeah. Yeah, there's a mechanical barrier to that, that whole uh, interaction. So you're um, going to need some creative dogs if you're if you're trying yeah. to cross food. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I heard if they tried to, the, uh, the baby would be bigger than the I don't know if it's true or not, but the baby would be bigger than the Chihuahua. If they tried to do that. Well, it well, probably would be. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you're talking. Uh, this is terrible, but you know, if, if you're looking, if, if you're looking at a, if you're looking at a male Great Dane and the female Chihuahua, <laughs> I mean, you're talking about a lot more than just the babies being being too large. You know, <laughs> there's a lot that's too large in that situation. Right, right. Right. The only way that this could happen is with what Jackson said earlier. If you've got if you've got a very creative Chihuahua male that immediately is consumed afterwards, let's right. do, a, let's the, do um, a, a test tube baby or artificial. Well, exactly. Or artificial. You sure, sure. But at that point, is it a species? Is it the same species though? Because yes, there. If you do, if you were to go with like just a pure molecular genetic perspective, where you're just looking at how close the genes are to each other, you'd probably say, yeah, they're the same species. But it's like, okay, you take a step back from that, and you look at the phenotypes. These things can't interbreed. So do we classify them as separate species? You know, and I mean, if we were to just leave them and they go off, you know, in nature and their own separate ways, uh, it's kind of the same with um, with different species where they can interbreed. I would bet the house we can interbreed with a chimp. Oh, Jackson, interestingly enough. So Kent likes to bring up the, the, the Russian scientists with that. Um, and and sort of this this failed experiments with with sort of chimp impregnation, but two two main issues with that, which this is horrifying. But <laughs> as far as I can tell, when I looked into it, there is no real reason outside of a singular sort of mechanistic slash chemical reason, which is that out around the egg of um, of humans, you have what's or, sorry of chimpanzees, you have a, a zona pellucida, mm -hmm. which sort of gate like gate checks the right, sperm. Yeah. Protein, and then, right. oh yeah, you, you are or you aren't of yeah. the same species. But the thing is, is that if you bypass the zona pellucida, which which stops sort of the in, in humans and in are you going to the hamsters, do what is that where you're going with the hamsters? No, 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 god, no, <laughs> oh, because you no. can do that. Oh man, I'm going, uh, I'm going with the fact that if you were to sort of uh, a la IVF take, take a chimpanzee egg and a human sperm, or unfortunately, vice versa. And you were to artificially inseminate to get past the zona pellucida, uh -huh. it's it's likely that you would get some kind of offspring uh, that would be viable yeah. at the point of birth. Um, were that similar genetically? Um, it's it's just that little little like, gate, like, gatekeeping like, thing. Thank God. <laughs> well, that's um, there's actually what what I was uh, referencing is actually um, and Georgia Purdom actually pointed me in this direction by accident. Um, oh, God. With uh, what is it? Fertility tests. One of the fertility tests is you remove the zona pellucida from the uh, egg of I think it's the Assyrian hamster. Really? And we can we can fertilize it and make it go like. What is it like? It divides for like, I think it does two divisions or something like that, and then well, before it 
terminates it's, it. Yeah, and so it's, it, oh, yeah. is it one, two? Okay, maybe three divisions, but yeah, it's that's a that's part of the fertility test. So it's it's um, yeah, but I mean the the experiments back in with the '60s with um, DNA DNA hybridization, because before we could just sequence it, they would you know take the sequences and they would hybridize them, and that would give a rough a very rough um, <laughs> phylogeny, and with that, the gorilla chimp human and gorilla DNA hybridized so easily. You can't actually tell them apart using DNA DNA hybridization. You can't tell who's more closely related to who, and so you get these these uh, polytomies where they're just all equally related to each other. Oh, well, God, there it's the, well, there is the thing about how our pubic lice is closer to gorilla pubic lice than this to chimp hair lice. Yeah, there, there is that, which which is something I actually read a fascinating paper the other day that was talking about. Sort of, it was actually where I was like, oh, right, like speciation and divergence time are really different because molecular, the molecular clock date that you get for the human chimp split is is a divergence time, and of course the paleontological date that you get is is a speciation time. Interestingly, weirdly enough, for for whatever reason, um, you that's like the where we get that seven six to seven. Because like they're, they're factoring in like um, what do you call it um. Uh, incomplete lineage sorting and that kind of stuff. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Thank you. Um, but they they were they were talking about how long the lineages of both humans and genus Pan would have been able to kind of hybridize, and <laughs> the it actually goes all the way up to like Australopithecus anamensis, which is sure. insane. That's we're talking like we're talking like three ish million years ago. Yeah, and and yeah. that that's both our ancestors being able to hybridize and produce some kind of offspring so have, have you ever heard of um is it eugene mccartney mm, I think is his I name okay so he's this guy he's this this dude i think he's an anthropologist but i don't remember he's either an anthropologist or geneticist either way it won't matter in a second when i tell you mm. who he is <laughs> he um he believes and he's argued this a number of times that humans are the offspring of a chimp and pig hybrid. <laughs> How I know. <laughs> I know, but it's it's, and Donald Prothero has done rebuttals of his stuff. PC Myers. It's just it's oh, hilarious. Were they even yeah. in the same area? Well, I mean, there are boars in in Africa, but I, I, it doesn't matter. They're separated by like eighty million years. So I I've seen I have seen videos too of of wild boars in like Sumatra just absolutely wrecking a tiger's day. You know, I mean, we're, we're talking animals with enormous tusks and that are ridiculously aggressive when they need to be. Um, so I would I would very much not like to be the chimpanzee that's attempting to make that work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just think about a chimpanzee and he's just in the tree like. Oh. Wait a second, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> What's that he's, down there? Um, that, boar, that boar down there is looking thick. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I actually um, I was in a, a hangout with um, Amanda Glaze and PZ, and I mentioned his name, and she was like, "We don't have to talk about him. We don't even need to go there." Yeah. Oh god! I didn't know the name, but I have heard of of the guy who suggested that, and I remember thinking, "Is this a meme?" Like at first, I was like, "Surely not." Surely, surely not. It's his website is kind of like um, the guy, who, the reptile heresy or dinosaur heresy guy, or no, pterosaur heresy. That's what he is. The pterosaur. Mm. It's like the pterosaur heresy guy. It's you might bump into his website be, just by accident because he like does. He's so he does so much stuff. You know, he writes articles and draws pictures and stuff. And so just by accident, you bump into. Is it David Peters? Is that his name? The pterosaur heresy, I, something like that. Anyways, but. It's just, and then like, you know, you're reading this stuff and you're like, oh, this guy seems to know what he's talking about. And you have no idea. He's just a total crank. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's the most dangerous thing. So it's like, I think it, th this is like a weird area to go into too, but it's like, there are a lot of anthropologists out there. Compared to what we've been talking about. I, I mean, I mean, it's similar, weirdly enough, but it's like, I almost can't, I almost can't comment because I haven't looked into it enough, which is strange because I love like cryptids and things like that. But like Grover Krantz, excellent anthropologist. He's, he did a lot of work with Neanderthals and things like that. 
um, his, you can actually find his skeleton and that of his Irish wolfhound. Um, mm. I think that was in the Smithsonian or maybe it's a museum in Germany, whatever. He's, he's a renowned anthropologist, really, really good guy. Also big, big foot proponent. Like, <laughs> and so you, you see, wait, I have heard of this guy. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. And, I think you told me about him actually. I, I very well might have because the thing is is like the, the the Bigfoot problem in anthropology is like kind of kind of more common than you think. Because oh if, if you're in if you're in anthropology, inevitably someone is gonna ask you about it at some point. Oh, and yeah. so inevitably they go deep diving and then they either come out with this is absolutely ridiculous, or you get Grover Krantz who's like, you know what? Maybe. <laughs> I remember uh Oh, I remember a few years ago, no, how long ago it was, when people thought that Bigfoot and the Yeti were speciation things. That has, I mean, well, they would have to be real for them to be yeah, different species. People, people have suggested that, though. You're right. They absolutely have. And, you know, it, um, it's just, it's so interesting because you get these guys out there, you know, who, who really do know what they're talking about when they're working in their own field. But... At least from the very cursory knowledge that I have, when they when you see the work that they their, their commentaries on like Bigfoot, there's some very serious leaps that are made that aren't being made in, in their conventional work. Creationists, uh, intelligent designers. Tompkins is a geneticist. Uh, Jensen is a cell biologist. Um, Andrew Snelling is a geologist. Purdom is a geneticist. They do perfectly fine work when they're working in a lab with you know normal people. And yep. they're just like, you know, we're going to do the data. We're going to get it out there. It's all going to be fine. No, then they turn, then they, they flip the switch and they become a creationist. And yep. suddenly I don't care about the data. It doesn't matter. I've got a narrative. I'm going to push it. And so, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think it's gotta, it's gotta come down to this idea of like, you've got your, you've got your work box and then you got your, your religion box. And as long as those boxes stay as far from each other as possible, they can function. And when they're operating in one box, the other box cannot functionally exist. You know what I mean? Like you, you can't dabble in both simultaneously. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's a weird situation. I mean, you know. I mean, yeah. They uh, when they do try to just go full, like research research creationist, like you know Woods, or, or, you know Todd Wood or Kurt Wise. Actually, I got to give them some props though. I I kind of they're the closest to being uh, evolutionists that are on the creationist side. I they mean, are. they're like, they'll be like, yeah, horses evolved from Hyracotherium. Yeah, Archaeopteryx is a dinosaur. Yeah, you know, and they'll just, mm -hmm. which is so funny because you know, listen to Bodie Hodge who will say like, Archaeopteryx was just a perching bird. It's like, oh my God. Or, or oh. uh, what's his name? Um, you know, the guy I'm talking about. He's a, uh, Oh, Alan, what is Alan his name? No, it starts with an M, though. Hold on. Menton. Menton. Daniel Menton. Oh, we've written. We actually, funny enough, actually, this is a good time. The book is published. Official. The rocks are there. Is published now by uh, R.J. Downard and myself, and you can buy it on Amazon. Very, very nice. Plugged. Plugged. And we uh, wrote uh, a couple of different sections on Menton, and we'll have more in the next volume. Because he shoots his mouth off on a lot of stuff. He and Minton is not qualified to be speaking on any of the things he talks about. He's a, he is he is actually a cell biologist, and I believe he's got a couple of technical papers to his name. But yeah, no, he's talking about at, like anthropology, paleontology, uh, all this all this stuff. And it's like, bro, what are you doing? Yeah, we're we're nothing there are very few things in this world that makes me angrier than the fact or than specifically the 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 lucy reconstruction that they have oh at, at the creation museum slash the arc park but mm. in conjunction with that the fact that there are no zip zilch zero biological anthropologists who are creationists and so as a result they've got people like georgia on, on anthropology i oh, mean yeah. That's how you know, because you won't find a conventional science scientist dare step out of their field with authority. It doesn't happen. Mm -mm. No, top, yeah, you're right. Off, off topic real fast, uh, forget back to the main topic, uh, uh, do, back to dogs real fast. Did you, 
and, Ru and, and Russia. I tried to, trying to get this yes, in, 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 a, in a while while ago, but trying to find an opening. But did you hear? I think this is convergence evolution. Like I, I, names are still fuzzy, but sure, did, sure. You, did you hear about the the Russian experiments the to make foxes more, more like dogs? Uh, the silver yeah. fox experiment by Believ. I actually did a so video cute. on that. So cute. Uh, they um, yes, they they basically. Um, in selecting the silver foxes with uh, with uh, who were more docile, it turns out they had lower ad adrenic what is it adrenic adrenocorticoid hormone or whatever. They had lower stress hormones in essence, uh, is associated with the the fight or flight response. And as a result, and this is very interesting, as a result of selecting more docile ones, their ears became floppy, their tails wagged, and you know they they just became they became like dogs, and it's. Uh, they also developed the um, the the coat pattern, which is in domestic animals. Um, the brindle, double color, things like that. Is it piebald? How are you piebald? Pronounce it? Yeah, it's piebald. Yeah, yeah. There, there is one that is called piebald that was certainly developed. They also had a higher amount of like retained neonatic features, so it's like. They had baby little puppy faces more than than sort of the the angular adults. So, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, Nyatni. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. next so, will be next will be Great Dane foxes and Chihuahua foxes. Of course. Well, I mean, they started with foxes, and you know, they're just bred foxes. But yeah, I did a video on that, and this actually um, going to go for it was the one who. Um, who asked me to do that video way back and I didn't, it's actually one of the top viewed ones on my channel. Oh my God. I, that experiment is, is one of my favorites. I, I really like the, the, the sort of the fact that you've got this relationship between morphology and, and docility. Right. So, it, and, and it really makes a lot of sense when you think about sort of the, whether it be intentional at first or not, uh, the, you know, the domestication of wolves and whether they did it themselves. Um, it's adorable. I love it. Well, cats probably did it to themselves because they take nothing from no one. Cats, so. listen, cats are playing the long con. They know exactly what they're doing. Dogs, I can only speak for my own dogs who are absolutely incredible blessings upon my life. One of the reasons why I get up in the morning. Two adorable golden retrievers that are, of course, hundreds of miles away in the United States, but they are total victims of circumstance. But on Teddy, she wakes up and she has no idea what's happening to her at any given moment. My cat is cold and calculated. <laughs> he knows absolutely everything about everyone. The, he's got he's got a long con going. What can I say? I mean, you can see the difference in their eyes almost. Teddy, there's not much going on upstairs. She She's cooperative. She's very, very sweet. Did you hear the ever hear the joke about dogs, cats, and humans? And, and, no, but please, please tell. I do want to hear it. I love jokes. And, and what, what it, uh, it says: dogs look at dogs look at humans and say, "Hey, this guy takes care of me. He he, he feeds me. He does stuff. He must be a god." Cats are like, "This this human takes care of me, feeds me, and takes care of the. I must be a god." <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah, that's that's is uh, true. Yeah. The number of times that I've woken up in my bed, but this was back when I was when I was at home. But when I would wake up in the morning, and and the first thing I would see when I would open my eyes is is the green eyes of my cat staring at me face to face, and it would activate my inner my my primate brain at its deepest core. That like this is a dinophilus about to consume me. I must feed it. <laughs> I'm a poor little Australopithecus afarensis. Yep. And this, this is, you know, and every once in a while, just to really let him know, I'm like, look, the tables have turned. Okay. Like I'm in charge here, <laughs> but I'm, I'm actually not. Cause I, I, you know, I live to serve. <laughs> well, that's yeah. why I, that's, I believe that's why we eat, eat birds and stuff and, and chickens and turkeys to, for events against, against the dinosaurs used to eat our ancestors. It, it's, ah. it's, it's all a game of of evolutionary tit for tat, is it not? <laughs> yeah, uh, chickens are, are kind of interesting because they're actually hybrids. Oh, they're hybr jungle jungle fowl and I think the gray is it the gray rooster and the jungle fowl or something like that. I, I don't I know the jungle fowl is one, but I didn't know the other half. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, they're kind of interesting, neat little guys. I've actually seen. I went to a, a zoo and I saw uh, they had a jungle fowl, and I was like, ooh, very pretty birds. They're they're. Gorgeous. Looks delicious. Yeah. <laughs> I I saw um so when I was in France, 
I was in a little city in the north called Stroudsburg with uh, a colleague of mine and, and with Luke. And um, she was like, hey, there's there's this sort of zoo nearby. They've got Tonkin macaques. I love macaques, obviously, that's, that's the genus I'm studying. Um, and Tonkin macaques are, are unique in that they're super, they're the most egalitarian of any of the macaque species. We're, we're talking their aggression rate is so low and they're not like bonobos where they work things out like sexually. Um, they, they straight up work things out with affiliative behavior. So, so they're just mega groomers. And they're also super lazy and they live on like isolated patches of island um, in Indonesia. So they don't really have to worry about about predators or anything. So their, their sexual dimorphism is also much reduced. So we go to see the Tonkin macaques and we're looking at them and they're doing cute things. And a couple of the males start getting in like this little showy argument where they're puffing up at each other and you know, they're posturing. And it was a blast to watch. And this one little female, she was trying to, co to, to collect straw. And so she would collect all the straw and every time a piece would drop and she was of course handling the straw very poorly because she's a juvenile. So the straw would drop and then she'd stop and pick up all the pieces. And then she'd take like three steps and then more straw would fall and she'd stop and try to pick up all the pieces. Then this male comes along and she she realizes like she's lower in the hierarchy, she's a juvenile. And so she's like, oh man, I better I better get rid of this straw fast. So she starts shoving it in her mouth and it was just very you know anthropomorphic behavior, so to speak. So after a little while we were like, all right, let's go look at some of the other animals. So we go to look at the flamingos and they house the flamingos and the geese in the same area. And you would think that the flamingos would run the show, but the geese were constantly trying to start a fight. Like they were okay. trying to brawl with every flamingo that was in that entire enclosure. And when the flamingos would go and start, you know, filter feeding kind of, they turn their heads upside down and filter feed the, um, the water. The geese would think that they had something valuable and would start charging like with their wings out to the side. The, hyper aggressive, super mean. And I was like, you know what? I am so glad they're small because if we lived in a period where, where, where dinosaurs are still quite large and they were like pulling this, this, this aggressive macho stuff with each other and I'm in the way, because I run when I see a goose. Like I, I don't need to be dealing with, you know, a Parasaurolophus like coming my way. And I'm like, oh my God, get away from me. <laughs> It was funny. It was just a fun anecdote because I was like, oh my God, geese are so every kind of goose. I thought it was just Canadian geese. These were like sweet European geese. You know, they look cute and they're gray and they seem really nice. And they're not. They're so aggressive. Yeah. Um, geese are trying to terraform the planet. Don't you know? I, I believe it. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're going to do it too. Yeah. <laughs> If any species should succeed us, if it's going to be a, it's going to be an all-out brawl between the geese, probably the Canadian geese, but maybe they'll settle things out with the gray European. The diapsis will the diapsis will the rolled back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> possibly. And then the cats, geese, cats. One of them is is taking over. Uh, so, what's it back to that? Back to I love to go all 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 day. My doubt. So, you can't be a, you know, as you can see here all night. You might need some sleep, but fair enough. Yeah. Sleep is for the the dead. Yeah, it's, fair enough as well. What's the difference between a, a tarsier and a semiform? Tarsiers, um, more. I mean, so you can get into you can get into some of like the nitty gritty morphologic stuff, which tends to be orbits and and sort of the nature of the ankle bones as usual. Uh, there's usually a lot of like dentition difference. Like if I remember correctly, I think tarsiers still have three incisors. They either have three incisors or three premolars. And I want to say it's incisors. Whereas uh, anthropoid primates have the same dental formula as, as we do. So anthropoid primates and semiforms, they're, they're the same thing. Um, and that your, your semiform or, semiforms or your anthropoid primates is going to include the, include the catarines, which are the old world monkeys, and the platyrines, which are the new world monkeys. And they're differentiated by like their nostrils primarily. Yeah. But tarsiers, I think more specifically, again, if I remember correctly, it has to do with whether or not the orbit is entirely closed in the back. Because I believe tarsiers still have a little bit of an opening. Um, I'm not 100% positive. Uh, but, but interestingly enough, their brain size to body ratio is still less than what we see in the anth in the anthropoids. Um, then once you get to the anthropoids, it stays relatively consistent until you get to the hominoids, which are like your apes. Yeah. And then of course it stays relatively consistent, excluding humans as you move up the sort of the hominin tree. Um, so you can kind of make these, it's, it's almost weirdly enough, like you've got these little hops 
and then plateaus, and then hops, and then plateaus. And then what we're seeing now is, is sort of the result of that initial radiation. Um, but but it, it, I believe it's the orbits. And then, of course, obviously, if you want to talk behaviorally, tarsiers are mostly solitary. Um, they, they've kind of abandoned the group living thing. But that's not to say that they didn't have it in the past. It, it could be, it's kind of like we consider orangutans, right, modern orangutans, uh, to be semi-solitary. But it's a recent adaption because orangutans probably, I think the estimate is like 20,000 years ago, used to lead a much more social lifestyle. And they still retain remnants of that because females will tolerate other females to a degree and males won't. So it kind of suggests that they used to lead a lifestyle that was more uh, uh, one male group in polygynous society, right? Something we would see in like gorillas. Uh -huh. um, but then you've got, of course, the vastly different lifestyles of pretty much every single old world monkey, most new world monkeys, um, and of course the the um, the genus Pan. And then you've got the outliers and like the the um, the gibbons and some of the new world monkeys, which are are pair bonded. And so the question is, where does pair bonding come into this? Because um, you can make these different categorizations. We tend to do it morphologically and phylogenetically, but of course there's there's behavioral uniqueness that exists. God, within within species, let alone within yeah. genera or or sort of across across families. Um, as for the, okay. oh, I, I I will ramble. You got to stop me. Yeah. As, 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 for the, as, for the, as for the next split, I used to make a joke for that some semiforms were bending other semiforms. Hey, I bet you can't tip over that to the other limits over there over the South America. Like, oh, want to bet on that? Sure. So they, and they go jumping over there and. <laughs> The speciation between paddle between carter lines and paddle lines. <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, it's it's interesting. Um, the, the sort of rafting event occurred when we still had our we still have these. I, I say three, but it turns out when I was actually researching, there is a fourth that existed when I was learning this back in 2016, but to a lesser degree. Um, and we don't cover nearly as much fossil stuff, um, sort of in in the course that I'm taking now as as I did in human evolution, but. The, the new world primates, you kind of have these four groups, right? You've got the, the oligopithecids, the pliopithecids, or sorry, parapithecids, the propliopithecids, and the proteopithecids. So one of these four groups in this initial radiation that occurred um, before your kind of uh, Saudi Arabia and African combined plate smashes into Europe, you've got this, this massive radiation in, in what is now Egypt, which is why we find most of these fossils in the Fayum which used to be this lush, beautiful tropical jungle along what would become the Nile. Um, so so this, this rafting event was kind of strange, right? It, it, because what we essentially see is far less radiation um, and, and species differences among the platyrines than we do among the catarines. And one of the reasons I've seen proposed for that is twofold. One has to do with, with the pressures that have to, with like, Habit, habitat pressures, because obviously if you're rafting over um, where we see the primates that exist today in, in North America, it's all jungle. You don't have a single primate, to my knowledge, <laughs> that lives in South America that, that is a ground, a ground monkey, which is vastly different than what we see in Asia and in Africa, where we see this enormous radiation, uh, uh, both in the trees with your, your colobins and, and sort of your langurs, uh, but especially on the ground with, with um, uh, the baboons and macaques, and to a, a lesser extent now, but the, the therapithecids. So what we see now, the gelata baboons. They're not actually baboons, <laughs> but they behave enough like them that, that we re refer to them as such. But your main difference between your catarine and your platyrine, we're catarines because our nostrils open down, and a platyrine's nostrils open to the side. Also, interestingly enough, catarines tend to score much better on most of our sort of cognitive tests, for whatever reason. They don't necessarily have that much larger of a brain to to body mass ratio they do in some cases but but certainly not as much as you would expect given how recent their split was but re then again rhesus macaques and all the macaques that we've tested pass the mirror test but baboons don't yeah so it, it it all depends on where the pressures lie um yeah. it, even here in here um even over in the old world right quote unquote there are differences amongst species that are even geographically adjacent it it for all intents and purposes doesn't make any sense but we also didn't witness the same pressures or witness the pressures that that were impacting each of these each of these yeah. groups 
and plus, besides the nose thing, plus they 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 get the cool, useful tails. I mean, if we did have tails, our ours is pretty much like. I know Bye. it's it's so it's so sad. But to be fair, um, some of your New World monkeys, like for instance, the spider monkeys, lost their their opposable thumbs uh, in favor of that super super prehensile tail. Um, they've they've got these itty bitty little nubbins left for thumbs that are, are essentially nubbins. functional. Which is so sad for them, but at the same time, spider monkeys are really cute, so they make they they want it in a different category. Spider monkeys it's like it makes you think of of of, of, of eight legged monkeys. I know that would be even cooler, but unfortunately, they that would they, be absolutely terrifying. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, no, no. We're that's the only monkey trait or the only spider trait they have. The rest is all monkey. They don't get the they don't get the chalicera. Oh, I oof. So, so, old neural monkeys. Is there is there a theory now that they all came? Uh, one one or two came and speciated there. Or was, was there several speciation? I mean, several migrations. As far as the literature that I read this year goes, I think according to the genetic kind of look look see that we've had, we're looking at a single rafting event um, because all of those platyrines are close enough to one another that even if it was two rafting events, they would have to be in very quick succession. And those populations like Lou would have interbred. So um, so theoretically, it could be two, but it doesn't really matter. Oh. Functionally, there's one major event, oh. so to speak. Uh -huh. So they, so that yeah. was the true Noah's Ark then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's, it's not even the only, uh, or the Platyrines aren't the only ones who are hypothesized to have rafted. Um, you also have the, the Histricognath rodents, uh, the group that... It, it's like uh, guinea pigs and those guys. They also uh, yeah, have an ancestor who grafted. What is their, um, oh, they're called something else. It's on, it starts with a P. You know what I'm talking oh, about? Uh, other bush pig, sort of? Yes. Uh, you know what I'm yeah, yeah. Caviamorphs is yeah. the other, well, that's the other a big name for their group. Hold on. Pigs in South America. How I'm Are you talking about peccaries? Peccaries. That's what I'm talking about. Peccaries. Oh, well, peccaries are suids. Okay, so I'm wrong on that then. I mean, pe guinea pigs are rodents. Peccaries oh, thought... are... Oh, no, 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 I didn't hear the guinea part. I thought you were talking about pigs in general. Oh, and no. You... Uh... I don't know the taxonomy of rodents. No, I'm sorry. My bad. My my internet <laughs> it's is... On me. It's totally on me. I, I know... I know primate taxonomy very well and i know every other taxonomy poorly <laughs> well peccaries actually have a very interesting uh evolutionary history they separated from uh pigs also in the old world but they probably came to north america through the bering strait oh yeah by um, land i thought it was interesting that you were like yeah they rafted over and i had this image of these <laughs> you're like what <laughs> large no. pigs and i was like okay no. damn all right no, the history, yeah, history cognath rodents a little um, because the New World porcupines are convergent; they're not part of the porcupine group of the African porcupines. That actually makes quite a bit of sense because they got well, the tail. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the caviamorphs, but they also have like the the world's largest rodents, like um, capybara. Joseph. Well, yeah, and also. In the fossil record, you have like a uh, Joseph Oberomis, which are like the size of a smart car, and so yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. they're they're like um oh what's the, the what's the one? It's like a wombat. Uh, like they're similar in size. I think like Diprotodon, right? The the big marsupial they from Australia. Probably were. Yeah, I mean they they probably were about that. I don't know what the exact size for Diprotodon. Uh, it's it, it's big. It's like uh, you said, smart car, and the first thing that came to mind. They've got this excellent specimen at the Natural History Museum here in London, and every time I see it, I'm like, man, that thing's the size of a car. <laughs> so how? Yeah, the protodon was actually a migrational marsupial, interestingly enough. So I, that I believe. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, marsupial. Yeah, we could get a whole different. We could get a whole different, like like a whole series of this uh, at this point. But how close? How do you know how? How close South America and Africa were during this thing, or like, like close they are now, or a lot closer. I couldn't tell you the exact numbers. I mean, oh. as it happens, the the estimates for how long it would have taken for them about what is it, uh, 
30, what is it, 30 million years ago or so, the estimates are would have taken like eight to 15 days. So not too bad. Yeah, so like two weeks at, at very max. I, and, imagine, yeah. I imagine the currents were at least slightly different then as well. And they were. Yep. The yeah. wind, uh, you know, the wind, the water currents, how that was affected because they were closer together. Yep. Mm. There's a there's a paper from I think the eighties which kind of outlines the whole which what is the most um reasonable hypothesis for how platyrines got to South America. The probable route, yeah. It's oh. it's interesting as well because it, it would it would dip, uh, <laughs> It's very unlikely that there was a single rafting event that was successful and very likely that there were several due to local conditions um, and that a lot weren't successful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, if, uh, yeah, they take to, take to the sea. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, a, poor, poor Aegypticus and, and company, all these little small early looking guys, so sad. Yeah. So, what, what was the next the next thing? The next thing besides the the, the the new monkeys pushing was the old world and and the apes doing their doing saying goodbye to each other. Well, interestingly enough, you you've also got to deal with uh, two other small splits. You have to deal with the, the split between your Asian monkeys and your African monkeys. So it's kind of a perfect situation because the 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 ground monkeys that lived in ancient Africa, in north northern Africa, so Egypt, the Fayum. Um, they, they kind of had this perfect opportunity to radiate up north, um, sort of northeast out into Asia, as well as down south. And that's where you get that that split between um, your 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 macaques and your genus Papio. So macaca and Papio, the, the, the baboons and the macaques. And then kind of related to Papio, you have these enormous baboons, the therapithecids. Um, only living relative today, again, are the geladas, but they would have been incredibly large like we're, we're we're talking not quite a smart car but but you're getting there you've got some some very large monkeys largest monkeys that ever lived uh, as far as i know so smaller than like gigantopithecus blackii which was the largest he's, ape. A, he's a big one yeah. yeah huge enormous um but but still very big and because we're dealing too with with an animal that that is likely uh sexually dimorphic the males that were the male therapithecus or therapithecids would have had canines like like daggers. I mean, we're talking huge, huge canines. If you've seen a mandrel's canines today, I mean, you wouldn't want to mess with them. I wouldn't. Um, and then you've also got the split between uh, both the, the 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 radiation that spreads north and the radiation that spreads south, sort of out into Africa, into your your arboreal monkeys, the ones like your your sort of uh, colobids and things like that. Uh, as well as the ones that kind of hang out in both, more so than than the baboons do, so like vervets, vervet monkeys and things like that. They actually have bright blue genitals, if you're interested. It's very weird. Um, and, then, and then the macaques do something similar. And then, at last, we see the split, this, this in the Miocene, actually, a true planet of the apes, because the Miocene is absolutely littered with apes. If today is the age of the monkeys, that's when we're dealing with with the most different kinds of, of apes. And they were so, some of them were really quite strange. You've got some very large gibbon forms. Um, you've got uh, weird, almost like apes that had feet that would be almost more similar to to us than they would have been to, to say, modern chimpanzees and like Oreopithecus, which it's it's still the jury's kind of out, but, but their feet are certainly more adapted for a terrestrial lifestyle. Um, which is very, very strange. You've got, of course, a radiation of apes that ends up also going to Asia where you get uh, Gigantopithecus blackii, which is like, or Gigantopithecus, depending on what you say, which is basically a gigantic orangutan. Yeah. I mean, enormous orangutan. Yeah, this chart's kind of simplified. It's probably sort of the, the, the branches, that the filled branches on here too, most likely. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is, is that it's like, obviously there's way less known about, unfortunately, about our radiation of the apes uh, than, than the hominids because people inherently want to know more about us, not so much about the other apes that, that ran the show during the Miocene. Um, and, and then of course, once we see the hominoids, that's when we get some of the cool guys, right? The, the modern hominoids are gorillas, orangs, uh, gibbons, uh, and ourselves and genus pan. So and we all represent wildly different social lifestyles, which is really interesting. So, so, so what makes a great ape better than a, a smaller gibbon ape? <laughs> what, why, 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 why so great? Nothing. 
<laughs> in my opinion, nothing. I I think that calling the Gibbons the lesser apes is very mean, and that we should we should switch it to like the the Mimi apes <laughs> or something like that. Because by and large, Gibbons are incredibly successful. I mean, if we're talking about just the sheer diversity of of all members of, of hominoid of our of the hominoids, um, they kind of got us beat. I mean, the Gibbons are excellent they've got incredibly complex vocal duets some of them are pair bonded which is really interesting um the, the brachiation unmatched uh in the animal kingdom and then of course you've got my personal favorite of the gibbons which is the siamang which has those big frog-like throat pouches so they just make so, noise. i love them so what's gibbon gave you gave you your name <laughs> my gibbon is based off of, uh, of it's an imaginary kind of gibbon, of course. It's a gut sick gibbon, so it's perpetually got a stomach ache. That's why I drink so much tea. Um, but but my gibbon is based off of the the, the classic lar lar gibbon, um, except it's blue. So yeah. I, I love lar gibbons; they're very cute as well, though. There could be blue fossil gibbons. Think about that. We don't know. <laughs> that incomplete fossil record gives we me the gibbon of. <laughs> So when I was reading the uh, Ancestor's Tale, there's like, through so Gibbons and everything, there's two, th uh, talking about two theories. One, they left they left Africa, the species on their own. The other one is we all left Africa and then we came back to Africa. Yeah, I think, I, honestly, I think that we see a great radiation of, of babes, of course, in the Miocene that ends up in, in Europe and, and areas like this. But I think that, that your sort of multi-regional out of Africa hypothesis is, is probably what we're, what we're leaning towards, with the exception of maybe the, the orangs leaving sort of at the tail end of the Miocene. Uh, but it really depends because you don't exactly find a trail, <laughs> like a trail of fossils leading you out that way. Uh, unfortunately, just because of of, of how things change. Um, but what but, if they were on the ark? Oh, shit. what if they were? <laughs> what if they were on the ark? We can't prove that that wasn't what happened. Plus, <laughs> well, also, I mean, plus, well, the, except for all the ways we could. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't for you know. Too bad that all the natural was was always nice to fossilize and that no predators ate the bones and stuff. So. Yeah, I know. Yeah, the world of taphonomy can be uh, can be a fool's game well, sometimes. Of course, there's a there's a line. One of my favorite lines from all the Dawkins books is in the Greatest Show on Earth, where he says, "If anyone has a right to complain about the lack of missing links, it's the chimpanzees." <laughs> I know, and instead we're left we're left in the position where we're like, eh, chimps, they just they didn't just didn't change that much, you know, and yet they're still grossly unique from when compared to like say Helanthropus with their own unique, I mean, really and truly, you want to talk about the 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 what makes chimpanzees, what makes genus pan so unique is the fact that you've got a Congo split of the chimps and the bonobos like 2 million years ago, 1.5, and how impeccably different they are. And the reason they're so different is because they're so intelligent and they've managed, intelligent, I know is a relative term, but uh, they're so cognitively capable that they've managed to come up with unique solutions to the sim to similar problems. See, I mean, we're talking about convergent evolution on like a social scale, which is really, really cool. Or rather, sorry, not convergent evolution on a social scale. Yeah. Um, completely unique means of means of, of structuring themselves. You've got chimpanzees, which are like masters of tool use and, and bonobos fail ra rather miserably, at least out in the wild with that, but they completely outperform chimps when it comes to cooperation. So it's like you've got, you've got these totally unique animals that are so similar morphologically, barely split from each other. We're talking infancy here. Um, it, it's incredible. And you've got the, you know, you've got patriarch, patriarchal tendencies in the chimps and matriarchal tendencies as, um, as a, uh, <laughs> Franz de Waal, who's a famous primatologist put it, the bonobos are a gynocracy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's just how they roll. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's very strange. You've got, of course, heavily sex based versus heavily violence based, although it has been, uh, challenged mm -hmm. that the bonobos are actually frequently as violent as the chimps, they just also like to have a lot of sex. So who knows how it, how it goes, unfortunately. The bonobos are the dominatrix of the... Oh, 
Yes, actually, there there was a there was reading this uh, this oh what is her name? She's a really good primatologist. Oh, I think her name's I think it's Mary something, but she's been studying bonobos for for her entire career, and she brought to my attention some uh, quite disturbing uh, kind of reverse of what we see in chimps, where coercion occasionally occurs. So basically, male chimps can heckle females until they're like, all right, fine, let's, and then they copulate. Um, and female bonobos will do the same thing to male chimps, uh, where where they will actually all occasionally get their sisters and their nieces and their, their their female relatives to come in and gang up on this poor male, and and they're hitting on him and biting on him until finally he's like, fine, fine, whatever. And so it's just it's it's horrifying. I mean, you yeah. you, see, you see the two sides of the same coin, and it's terrible either way. But you, I mean. On the other hand, it's very interesting to see these totally unique social behaviors, and they're just one river away from each other. It's wild. Yeah, that's it's like when um, when you know people say like, "Oh, dolphins are so cute, otters are so cute." Yeah. These guys have rape gangs. They, they just... are they are total rapers, and the thing is, is that the more intelligent an animal gets you start to see some rapey tendency, except with elephants. I mean, ele but elephants are also a matriarchy that isn't sexist. So it's like with bonobos, there's that rapey aspect, but it's focused in the favor of the female. So, you know, I intelligence doesn't really lend itself to consent very well in <laughs> our intelligent well, if you if, you've, if you have ever seen like a Stefan Molyneux's tweets, then yeah. I think we're still working on it. <laughs> oh, believe me, I have. And and the thing that gets me more than anything is when when people try to uh, use use primates to to kind of justify that kind of uh, drive, so to speak. Because and and usually they do so by being like, oh, you know, males are are much stronger than females are on average. Um, and and so they can't help but that they use their, their strength, oh, so manly to to take what they want. Um, and then I simply point to to the old world monkeys of which the vast majority are highly sexually dimorphic and of which the vast majority of the males will get severely injured if they try to coerce a female because they also happen to be female philopatric, which means the females stay in their natal group and form tight knit bonds and will gang up on males that they dislike. Um, and that includes res rescuing quote unquote uh, conspecifics if they feel like they're being heckled. So there's a specific paper that I was reading about how Coercion happens in chimps and coercion of the opposite kind happens in bonobos, but it doesn't happen in macaques because macaques will gang up on each other. And I thought that was really interesting. It was just kind of like, you know, they don't tolerate that. Um, so it, it really comes down to unique primate societies tackle reproduction and interspecific uh, or intersexual rather relationships in totally different ways. Um, and there's quite a bit to suggest, at least in in the case of humans, that it, our most recent ancestors were quite egalitarian and how they how they sort of organized themselves. And that as monogamy was on the rise, that, that perhaps those two things had something to do with one another. Um, yeah. But it's speculative at yeah. this point. This is behavior based. Yeah, I'm not sure what this, this the, the branch we have now, but there's this evidence now of a European branch of apes. I'm not sure where that would branch off here. Yeah, yeah, um, th that would be in the Miocene. So we actually have a ton of apes in the Miocene that are hanging around in Europe, um, which is really, really cool. And it sucks because the farthest north ape, other than uh, humans, um, is, is going to be your um, Barbary ape, Barbary ape, uh, Barbary macaque, uh, Macaca sylvestrina, or sylvestris rather. Um, and they live in the Strait of Gibraltar. So they're so close to being in Europe, like technically. <laughs> I love them. Is that a cat on you, Jackson? Yes, yes, it is. This is Enzo. He just he's on everything. Is that the, is that the one that's in your thumbnail? Yeah, uh, who I am, uh, who I have around my neck, like a like a, a prize. Yep, here he is. Oh, he's so handsome. Look, I oh, know. Is he oh, like? It's like it's like. Why are you ignoring me? Feed me now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is exactly what he's like. My cat is somewhere having in the states having a psychotic episode. He, I think he was traumatized when he was young, so he's he's a quite an odd bird, so to speak. Um, <laughs> he's an odd. A cat is an odd bird. Ha. Huh. He, he ha. would be offended, but he's not here. No one tell. <laughs> yeah, he likes to. Enzo likes to 
come in here when I'm doing streams because he's a nosy cat. Yes, he is. He doesn't like, like giving attention to things that aren't him. And he's, mm. he's like, like, hey, I'm the star of this channel. Show me more. Yep, that's him for sure. That's You're like, you should, you should just have the camera on him and you talk off screen. <laughs> Well, they're so. I I read this very very funny uh post. I think it was it was either on Twitter or on Tumblr. If, if it was on Tumblr, it was reposted on Twitter, um, which is where I saw it. I forgot it, Tumblr existed. Oh my god. Yeah, <laughs> Tumblr has not had a great time since they did that uh not safe for work ban on content some time ago. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> they they forget that like most of their base was there for that kind of content. <laughs> There are other places for that. Yeah. Other places that specialize in that, by the way. There are. I've heard of them. I would never, I would never indulge. Of course not. No one would ever. No one would ever. Um, it was this tweet that was like, my cat won't drink any water. And so to keep him hydrated, what I do is I fill up a cup of water and I leave and I drink from it. And then I leave it on the table so that he thinks it's mine and knows that it's safe to drink. So he'll get up and drink from it uh, because he thinks he's being naughty. Um, and, and it was like, that's the only way I can keep him hydrated is by making him think he can't have it. And then someone was like, God at people in the garden of Eden. And then someone was like, what the fuck are the implications for this? I'm sorry. I swore again. My bad. That's pretty funny. And I thought that was funny. I was like, that's, you know, perhaps I'm just spitballing here, but perhaps that's what ancient, some of the ancient people groups who perpetuated the story we're going for. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. I think it's uh, what is well. Part of it is, um, and again, I think uh, I believe it was in uh, the Greatest Show on Earth where he talks where Dawkins mentions like we have an inherent tendency to categorize things, and so what does Adam do? He names everything. Yep. That's you know that's an inherent tendency of human of people. Yeah. yeah, and so it's uh, it's kind of neat. But how, but how do you, but how do you know all those Latin names? Name them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like uh, he's a big thousand leader. years before. Before Latin came out, well, you have to you have to remember all the people came from him. So, oh, true. Fair enough. Fair enough. That that is that is. Well, the I, wait, no, I just remembered because it was God who came up with all the languages when he scattered the people at, at Babel. So, you know, maybe maybe it's just me, but honestly, as 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 someone who you know is outside looking in on on creationism, of course. For some reason, I always find it so much more jarring when the Tower of Babel is referred to as like an actual event than like Noah's Ark or creation. It catches me off guard because I never talk about it. And then they'll be like, oh, well, that happened after Babel. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. Like, I feel it like knocks me out of my body because it's it's just such a strange thing to lump in with with the history. Mm -hmm. What could happen at any time? Because like any speciation event, you probably differently like like. Speci like birds, they could probably speciate their languages too. That's why they don't tweet to each other anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that idea. <laughs> oh God, I, I I can't even imagine that 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 would probably be quite awkward um, amongst the the poor bird species. I actually read somewhere that the, the idea of the Tower of Bait. Where did I read this? Maybe it was like I don't think it actually was John Walton. I think I read it somewhere else, but. Um, that the uh, the Tower of, of Babel is sort of rooted in in the uh, um, the fall of the Babylonian Empire, sort of after the captivity, um, because what was originally like a very academically based society, where there were of course tutors and you know they taught cuneiform in certain in certain uh, halls of scholars or whatever it is that they called them back then. Um, as the empire began to fall, they could no longer afford to keep these places up, and of course there was a great loss of knowledge. Um, and at that same time. I think is when the, the the Hebrews were sort of freed from the Babylonian captivity, yeah. um, so they would have borne witness to that. I believe. Yeah, um, yeah it's, uh, the the Noachian flood, I believe, is based on. Well, they lived the place where they lived was the Iraqi floodplain. So shocking. Yeah, off off topic about the history of fast. Um, I, I always wonder what would happen if, if the two quote quote dark ages, the fall of the bronze, the fall of the bronze age, and the fall of the Roman Empire, never happened. How regress science science or history progress we we be right now? The, those two dark periods never happened. I think I think it's a wonder that we're even where we are, considering like I I can't help but think that since humans, anatomically modern humans, and of course Neanderthals have been around for quite a bit longer, if you're including Neanderthals, than, than three hundred thousand years. That there have got to be some periods 
that due to due to circumstance, the fall of an empire, the, the burning of Alexandria type, you know, events where there's a great loss of knowledge for whatever reason, um, that that had to there had to have been a couple of events like that that kind of pushed back that agricultural revolution. Um, but obviously, that's totally speculation. There's there's no way of knowing that. I just think well, that yeah. I don't know. I, I like to wonder. I like to think that um, the the uh, Adamic story is the uh, is an allegory of the transition from hunter gatherer lifestyle to a sedentary city based lifestyle. It, and it it very well could be. I read in. I remember reading in. I think it was Sapiens that the agricultural revolution is like secretly one of the worst things to happen to like human well being. Um, because you, you go to this lifestyle that was spent socializing and an affiliative behavior and, and very, very little actual hunting and gathering in order to make, to maintain, um, uh, sort of a, a, a yeah, but like before, you, yeah, before you need others to survive now, not like, okay, you take this job, I'll take this job and never. Yeah. And, and you're working constantly to cultivate the crop for the next year instead of moving around where the food goes kind of. Um, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Like hunt, hunter gatherers kind of had a good gig. That's why they did it for so long. One might propose. Uh, I mean, th you know, like, you think it happened yeah. about ten thousand years ago. Is the the agricultural revolution? When do creationists say the world the world started? It's it's possible. I'm I'm just saying it could be could happen. I like that. Thing, like 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 people are like you know what? instead of following these animals, we just try to trap them here and and, and keep them here. <laughs> well, there are some there. Uh, Interestingly, um, th it appears that there are different sites where uh, other hominins would leave tools on their, their migratory routes. So whenever they got back to that same spot next year, hey, the spears are already there. Yeah. It, and and I believe if if I remember correctly, you can actually trace you know the the three sort of stages of of uh, tool advancement. And you can kind of trace it out in such a way from from sort of the the original basic Neanderthal or not Neanderthal, sorry, um, uh, Neolithic toolkit, and you can kind of spread it out in such a way that you can almost see like information transfer going on and like teaching and and the tr the the sharing of knowledge and things like that with neighboring groups, where then all of a sudden you find these tools where you didn't previously, um, which is so interesting that 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 humans that early on were like, you can imagine, you can kind of put yourself in their shoes and they're like, oh, wow, like that's that's a lot of game you guys have. And they're like, well, we're using this new kind of sling. And they're like, oh, sick. Well, we'll trade you, you know, a hundred spears if you'll teach us how to do it. And then they're like, oh yeah, why not? What's the harm in that? <laughs> that kind of reminds me of the, uh, of on Family Guy, the, these fish come up to, come out of the water and they see their friend, the fish is on land and they're like, hey, where have you been? And he says, oh, I went for a run. They're yeah. like, is that anything like a swim? <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> there's there's another one on like the demands the, med, the uh, family guys get on like the domestication of dogs, and he's like he's like hey like like two wolves and he's like I'm gonna see I'm gonna go over there and like be friends with this guy and he's like oh why and he's like I'm gonna see if I can get him to pick up my poop. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> you yeah, know <laughs> they got us. <laughs> they got us all right. And that's how it happened. That's how it happened. That's there was um the episode the cosmos the neil degrasse tyson episode of cosmos it's like the second or third episode something like that is is evolution and he uses um the domestication of dogs as kind of the segue into it and he's like neil degrasse tyson's like at a campfire and these wolves are circling and it's like the funniest thing because he grabs one of the like the logs in the fire and like swings it to scare them off and then later kind of a dog comes along but I was just like, God, there's, what is going on here? <laughs> there's a new theory that, or hypothesis. I, I was just confused, but that hypothesis that that maybe dogs domesticated themselves first before we we even, we even did a thing. That they started eating our trash and stuff, coming closer to human things. Yeah, that 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 actually is a, at least what I found to be the when I was researching from for my video on it was like the sort of the dominant idea right now is that it was kind of like. Dogs started hanging out close to camps, and because because the docile ones would not get killed by the humans, because obviously they wouldn't attack, and humans, you know, you know how we are. We like cute things, and I I can't imagine it was too much different back in the day. I mean, if if a, if a canid comes up to you, like, like, he's not bothering us, so it's not bothering it, him. Yeah, it's it's not bothering you. You're you're like whatever. But then they realize the utility in keeping a dog around the camp. Uh, early warning for predators. 
um, just an extra set of eyes almost. And then that was kind of like, well, okay, now instead of tolerating, we'll, we'll sort of, they enter into this period of like appreciation, uh, which is a huge step The the tolerance versus, versus sort of intention, appreciating them. And then eventually, uh, intentionally keeping them around. Um, I mean, I, it's, it's certainly nothing like what you see in, in like the movie Alpha, which came out a couple of years ago, but I did. Love I did it. not. <laughs> you didn't like it. I didn't see it. I think oh. the last dog movie I saw was the one where it got reincarnated every every year until oh, the dog's for, purpose. For, for I screen. knew that was going to be sad. I the thing is, I can tolerate dog movies as long as I feel like I can anticipate whether or not whether or not dog the dog's going to kick it at the end. Um, because ever since I made that mistake with Marley and Me as a child, uh, which was by the way advertised as a cute, happy go lucky dog film, I refused to make it again. Except when I did flying <laughs> flying home to the United States for Christmas, and I saw the part of racing in the rain, which is also a very sad movie and almost exactly like Marlene. And, and I had to be consoled by my by my seatmate who was like, "They're there." Let me introduce you to this film. It's called Old Yeller. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Old Yeller, I'll one up you. Where the red fern grows, both of the dogs die. <laughs> Spoiler for anybody who hasn't read. <laughs> the red fern grows, by the way. So, <laughs> by, you know. back to our family. Uh, so, I guess next year was designed to leave us and, and get a lot buffer. <laughs> they do. And, and mostly, interestingly enough, anytime you see like jacked primates, you can usually find the culprit, usually, not always, uh, the culprit in, in male competition. So anytime you have sexual dimorphism, which of course you see in gorillas and in orangutans to relatively extreme degrees, it's because the males are competing with one another to maintain control uh, over a harem of females. Now, don't misconstrue when I say maintain control, um, and of course this is less so in, in orangutans now uh, because they, they lead mostly solitary lives, but like I said earlier, very recent. So that's the sexual selection thing? Yeah, yeah mm, kind of. It's actually more of a habitat fragmentation thing, if I remember correctly. Um, but but yeah, in gorillas, it's 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 actually some very sad but funny videos on YouTube about, you know, males that essentially fight one another to maintain control of this group of females. And if the females just decide they like the new male better, they'll just leave. And there's nothing that the old male can do about it other than try to like you know, appear very fit and appear very powerful. Um, but if that doesn't work, they'll just go with the new male. Um, so, so it's as much sort of maintaining the peace with your females as it is fending off other males. And he, he joins Twitter and becomes an incel. E so. Exactly. Listen, let me tell you about the most incel, <laughs> the most incel primates out there are Hamadryas baboons. First, bonobos and Tonkin macaques are like an incel's nightmare because it's like the reverse of what they want. It's like total, as uh, DeWall put it, gynocracies. But then you've got like the Hamadryas baboons, which are just like straight up incels. Like we're, we're talking like, <laughs> and, and you know, I see things like Hamadryas baboons and I think to myself, because what you've got is you've got very tight knit groups of males that maintain control over groups of females uh, by not allowing them to stay with their relatives. So they, they discourage um, um, like female philopatry and they actually will trade females between harems and nip and bite at them and, and physically threaten them if they don't kind of uh, uh, sort of fall into line. And the females don't really have a defense for this because for whatever reason, when, when uh, coalition formation amongst the females and those tight knit bonds was prevented whenever it was millions of years back, uh, or probably, yeah, probably millions, maybe a million years back. Um, it, it allowed, it get, it essentially stopped them from having a response to this, like a sort of a retaliation. And I always see this and I'm like, instance point to him and dry as baboons as like this excellent <laughs> pinnacle of society, not knowing that like one out of every 100 males gets to have a harem and the rest spend their entire lives on the outskirts, never breeding, never passing on their genetics and dying alone, just like real life. <laughs> 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 we, 
you just yes. switch animals. It's the same situation. If you can't be a buff Chad Hamadryas baboon, you're not going to breed. That's just how it works. And and the ironic part is, is you'd much you'd be much better off if 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 sex is what you're after. You'd be much better off being a bonobo because they they're constantly doing it, um, right. and everyone gets to join in. So it's it, <laughs> incels are a weird a weird situation and hamadryas baboons incidentally are some of my least favorite primates uh because there's no there's there's not a real even in bonobos like males aren't like it's not a situation like in hamadryas baboons where like the lowest male is still higher than the highest female in a harem it's like let's say you're a high up female and you have a son he's gonna rank pretty high in the troop overall yeah. Like he's still not going to get to feed first or anything like that, but like his mom and all her sisters are going to like come and back him up if he gets in a fight, you know? So it's like, it's not the worst place to be. It could be worse. <laughs> like mm -hmm. you'd rather be, it, it'd be better to be a male bonobo than a female hemodryas baboon. Let's put it that way. Uh, I'm, unlike, hy unlike hyenas. <laughs> unlike hyenas. You don't want to be a male hyena, period. <laughs> you don't want to be a hyena, period. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair enough all that power comes at a price and that price is called giving birth near or through a pseudo penis like it's just not <laughs> i was gonna say their face but yeah that works too yeah I, <laughs> oh, I think some hyenas are kind of cute i like the um uh, hard wolves they're adorable oh my god <laughs> you went for the worst one no they're sweet they're sweet in like an that's like saying pugs are cute they're just mm -hmm. ugly and the thing about pugs is that, so I, I do think some ugly dogs are cute, but pugs, I can't get over the not breathing thing. It's like, I don't, just, like the, you, uh, you know, they just kind of look up and they're like, hey, like, hey. let's I, see, these I, noses are on their way. Let's make their noses flatter. <laughs> I swear to God, I, I'm one of the heaviest sleepers in the world. Like once, first of all, I can fall asleep incredibly easily. Like I would have been. I would have been the member of the tribe that like gets eaten by a predator because everyone else wakes up when the predator shows up. And I'm just like, I, I, I'm out. I'm done. Yeah, me too. I, 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 one time at, 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 when I was still at, at church camp, uh, that really happened. We were sleeping. We had, we had such an alarm system set up. And this girl, these, some of these girls snuck in and set the alarm off. And I was in my cabin, got up and sprayed her with, with shaving cream. And I slept through the whole thing. Yeah, you were like, I'm not, I'm not dealing with it. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, I, I used to, so I used to dog sit as a, as a side gig when I was in my undergraduate. So I would like, I, I worked through Rover, which was like an app where you could like dog sit. And I had this regular client. Um, He, he was this really overweight pug. Um, <laughs> I'll protect his identity instead of calling him his real name. We'll call him Clarence. The dog was the, the client. I like it. Yeah, he, he, but we'll protect both. Yeah, he was so sweet. I swear to God, I woke up 20 times in one night because this dog would start getting sleep apnea in the middle of the night and, and like snorting. And I'd be like, oh, my God, the dog's dying. And then he'd start breathing again, you know, after, and with this very, very pitiful sounding snort. Um, he he was an absolute mess. He was a sweet, sweet dog with those brachycephalic skulls are just an abomination. Like someone needs to legislate that because it is not fair. I used to, I worked under a veterinarian and she said, uh, um, so I don't know if you guys probably know this, but like you intubate animals, like when you're putting them under so that they don't stop breathing and die. Um, and when you, yeah. yeah, and when you intubate brachycephalic dogs, right? Like when an animal is coming to, you leave the intubation tube in until they start like kind of coughing on it so that you know that they're awake enough to breathe on their own. And then you pull the intubation tube out and they hack a couple of times at once. Pugs, pugs and French bulldogs will actively resist you pulling the, the, the intubation tube out. They're like, air. <laughs> and it is sad. I, I was like, are you, I, I thought it was a joke. And she was like, no, I'm, I'm not joking. I'm, I'm serious. Like, like air, let me breathe. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, for the first time ever. <laughs> That's, uh, that reminds me of, you pay this woman to sit on babies? I do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> I'd do it for free. I'll do it for free now. <laughs> that was that was from Jim Carrey, the cat in the hat. Oh, my God. Uh, for, uh, speaking, of, speaking of things that need legislation against them. <laughs> but, yeah. Oh, see, um, well, see, um, maybe it be a thing that we everyone did because of the eggs. So now we're like, we don't do that anymore. Now, now. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, you don't want to sit on any babies. That's, that's 
you know, especially human babies are particularly it's socially fun. frowned upon or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's against our it's a it's a it's a taboo, so to so speak. So there are two princes of gorillas or I mean, so the th so the thing with gorillas, it's a little bit similar to bonobos. I, I believe that branches. I mean, it's it depends on if you're talking about species versus genera, because I believe there's yeah. only one genera um, that's extant. Um, in fact, I'm like 99 percent sure, but I believe that there are separate species. Like you've got the lowland gorilla and the western gorilla. They're not mountain gorillas, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Gorilla species. We have gorilla, gorilla, and gorilla, gorilla, gorilla. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Eastern and Western. Okay, so they're they're base. They're very very similar. Um, but I think they're more actually more similar than chimps and bonobos were or are. I think they're more closely more closely of a split off. You have to forgive me, you guys. My I've got I've got macaques on my brain more than I no, do. Right you should know everything. Why do you not know everything? <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm you're, you're my person. only primate yeah. expert. <laughs> yeah. TD Lane, I can only half agree with you on that one. Do what? I said TD Lane says babies do not make good seating. I can only half agree with you on that one. <laughs> they, they make good pillows. But they're soft. <laughs> if they're chunky, yeah, they can. <laughs> Some of them are really chunky, though. Some that's they don't grab your hair. That's, that's why I used to cut my hair short. My, my, my mom used to be a my mom used to be a foster parent, mm. so I I kept, always cut my hair short so the babies couldn't grab it. That's no, that's that's a smart play. I the, the the thing is is I love I love baby monkeys. I love baby chimps. I love pretty much every baby primate. Human primates kind of scare me a little bit. It's it's an uncanny valley kind of thing. I've seen cute babies. There are some babies out there where they, they are genuinely adorable. But I would say 80% of babies are hideous for, like, most of their baby time. You think yours would be hideous if you ever had any? When I was a baby, I was absolutely hideous, yes. I mean, I mean have you ever had a baby? And, <laughs> I mean, I would probably think it's cute because I wouldn't be able to fight my maternal. My my evolution would force me to think my own child was cute so that I would right. actually really. You're evolutionarily predisposed. Oh, you like that? Um, this thing's ugly. Put it back. I, if, if genetics have anything to say about it, though, I would know in the back of my head. I would be like, "Yo, this baby is ugly." <laughs> I think it's cute, but no one else thinks it's cute. When I came out, I looked like I, 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 I set a record at the hospital I was born at for being the longest baby, and my body fat was like two percent. I can't. I looked like a little old man skeleton, Benjamin Button coming out. It was horrifying. My, and you want to know how I know that? Because... Me... Oh, go ahead. How do you know that? No, no, you go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. I I'll pleasure... hear it first. I had the pleasure of watching uh, this past Christmas when I was home. My mom was like, let's watch home videos. That sounds great. I had the pleasure of watching my own birth video, um, which was oh. very traumatic. So, it, you know, yeah. what are you going to do? It's, yeah. it's... yeah, here's my, here's my, me as a baby. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's cute. That's not baby. That's like, I mean, it's baby, it's like toddler baby. I only have, I only have a baby picture since I was, I was adopted, so I don't have a really baby pictures. Oh, like a super <laughs> picture. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Oh my god. Yeah, I'm not showing any baby. I, I was also perpetually uh, um, angry. So weird deal. My my mom tells me that the other nurse just thought I was a girl. And you're yeah. like, wait a second. <laughs> Mom, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Wait a minute. <laughs> mm. yeah. Hold up. Oh, man. Ooh. So, so, but for bonobos and chips, is the only reason they speciated because they don't like swimming or? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking about a, a geographic isolation that, that basically spurred behavioral differences and, like, slight morphology differences. Um, they're really, really closely related. I, I don't know if anybody's actually checked, but I would imagine almost certainly that they could produce viable, like, fertile offspring. Um, that's how close we're talking. But I don't know if any... It'd be, it'd be a weird deal. I think they'd probably tear each other apart before anything romantic would happen. <laughs> Be, be like, like Great Danes and Chihuahuas. They'd be, yeah. they'd be like, they'd be like, 
like the like divorce court like the women the, the women were like women women were always like hey I'm in charge the military was like no I'm in charge. <laughs> I imagine I imagine you would have both if you had a female bonobo and a male chimp you would have the two of them trying to both coerce each other, um and it would get dicey fast. <laughs> that would be yeah that'd be that'd be pretty rough. Yeah, or, things would be lost and or, and the bonobo got the upper hand. Probably testicles would as well because as I'm sure you can, they, they do that. They I wonder do. If it what happened like the, like a male bonobo and a and a fe, and a female chimp. They're both like docile or whatever. They're, like, yeah, they're, that, that would probably be better for everyone involved. Like you go first, no you, no you, no you. Like who's in charge now? Yeah, exactly. I'm, so, I'm, be- I'm not totally convinced that human males and females are the same species. Oh God, yeah. I mean, well, <laughs> it depends entirely. It depends entirely on which male and which female. Because I have met I have met girls way more boyish than some of the, the males that I've met, and vice versa. And then I've also met the complete opposite end of the spectrum. I think the secret is humans are just really, really weird because we are I like what that. we're doing. Yeah. We have yeah, we have no idea what we're doing. We're just trying to work it out. Yeah, we're 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 like the uh, we're like the accidental self-aware AI gone rogue. We got this whole language thing we're working on. It's not that great, but it's it's going. It's it's fine. It's fine. We all picked different ones, but but we're really getting a handle on it. Yeah, I've heard two hypotheses, but but when we split from the pan thing, one Mm. was we were bipedal before we split. Other ones we we were bipedal after we split. Yeah, it depends on if you want to put Sahelanthropus as the last common ancestor. Um, the thing is, is that we have Sahelanthropus sort of remains dated to around seven to ten, I think, million years ago. But again, speciation and divergence times are very different. So say, that doesn't preclude Sahelanthropus from being the last common ancestor. And Sahelanthropus definitely was capable of, of bipedal walking to a greater extent than modern chimps and bonobos are today, just based off of the shape of the pelvis and the femoral head. Um and or rather, how they would would kind of go together. So they so they kind of so that theory they kind of lost the bipedality. It, it it wouldn't yeah it it would be more probably of an inclination of like you had a Sahelanthropus species living in like sort of a sort of a woodland type area, and then once you have the the sort of situation with the East African Rift doing its sinking deal, and then you get this dry savanna where a population you know comes to rely more heavily on bipedality. And then, of course, the, the the other half, right, ends up in what would become uh, the lush areas of Kenya and Tanzania uh, and the Congo, et cetera, where they can then take advantage of the the arboreality that they that they had. Um, at least, I, I, that's what I imagine would 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 probably go down. I think jury's still out. Sahelanthropus is still tentatively pointed to as the last common ancestor between the two of us. But another interesting thing about that is Sahelanthropus has smaller canines than both modern chimps it- and bonobos it also has a a form in magnum that is intermediate between that of chimps and humans it does I, well actually i think it might be intermediate between us and afarensis but but it's definitely more close to humans than it is to chimps you're, you're absolutely right mm. um and, and so and that's one of the reasons why they're like well um maybe it was similar to like the artipiths the artipithecus ramidus and Kadaba, which which were fully capable of walking on two feet for quite for for dis- periods of time but they still Set, set substantial periods up in the trees wow. for, for sleep. Artipithecus is just weird. I love the artipus. I think they're charming. They're they're so weird, um, but 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 they're they're weird in a good way. I don't know. I like them in the same way that I like um, like proboscis monkeys. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, we were we were. I guess we decided like, okay, you guys can have the trees and stuff. We'll take this grassland. Yeah, I, I I feel like it was almost more like, well, <laughs> this is where we normally meet Group B, and then they're like, well, that's a pretty big hill to climb. What happened to the continent? And then they were like, mm, well, let's just not go meet them this time. I'm I'm sure it'll I'm sure this problem will fix itself. And then here we are, you know, <coughs> a million years later, um, very different animals. Uh, hey, yeah, I, I would imagine. I mean. I I feel comfortable saying if Sahelanthropus is in our ance- our last common ancestor with chimps, it was probably something very similar. Okay. Speaking of the art of uh, artists, I can't, uh, you get, yeah 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 I get I got you I got you the 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 A the A ones um, yeah yes. we, do we know which of the are we uh, 
or if any of the of the A branches that we're, we're that we're closest related to, or it's tentative, but I believe as of right now, or at least when I learned in 2016, I haven't looked as of late. Um, but Artipithecus ramidus is typically thought to be in our lineage um, between, along with Sahelanthropus or perhaps Auroran tugenensis. It's one of the two, um, or perhaps both, or like a la hybridization sort of. Um, and then once we get into the Australopiths, I believe as of now, it's Anamensis and Afri Africanus, uh, or rather Afarensis, but not Africanus, because Africanus is essentially an Anamensis branch that ends up in South Africa. Africanus, is that the Lucy one or the... Afarensis is the Lucy one. The easy way of thinking of it is this, this is actually how I remembered it, <laughs> learning it, but... Um, uh, the, the camp, when they discovered Lucy was playing Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds by the Beatles, mm -hmm. uh, Afarensis, far out. It's like the Beatles, hippie, Farensis, far Lucy. That's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah so, I believe Africanus is on the way to the Paranthropines, isn't it? it? It depends on who you talk to, um, because I believe, if I remember correctly, there are contemporary Paranthropines um, hanging out with not necessarily with, but at least overlapping in habitat with, with some members of the Australopiths. Well, sure. But, but it could be like, it just sort of like a, like a delay. You know what I mean? Like sort of how we see uh, Eustonopteron existing at the same time as perhaps some tetrapod. Well, field. sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a you know, late surviving. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. With the yeah. they could be a little bit older, so we could actually, than what it is now, so we can actually more verify these branches here. Yeah, the, the interesting thing is with paranth with the paranthropines is that their brain case was actually substantially larger than than the australopiths, um, and they also lasted quite a lot longer than the australopiths did, or lasted longer into the future than the australopiths did, presumably because the australopiths sort of sort of beget what would become genus Homo. Um, kind, of, kind of like the how the erectus branches last a little bit longer. And Listen, erectus is an absolute pro. Okay, erectus dominates. The hominids. Erectus was so fruitful. And there's some because some people are like, look, Erectus is so <laughs> variable that we maybe shouldn't be calling all of these skulls Erectus, like all these crania, because there's yeah. so much variability in brow ridge and brain case size. And, and there's constantly in primates, especially, there's this battle between sex or species. So for a long time, especially with like the old world monkey fossils, they would be like, all right, do we have two different species of, uh, of age of Dipithecus? Or is this a male and a female of the same species? And they're just sexually dimorphic. Well, I believe that even happened with some of the Australopithecines. Yes. It, yeah, absolutely. But strangely, not with the Artipiths. Like the Artipiths, we have a decent fossil record for, and they have like zero sexual dimorphism. It's yeah. very weird. Yeah, I... I I remember watching the documentary, and I think it was History Channel, or I think where it was at, or it was YouTube or something, but where they, they found, this was back, they, this guy found this skull in South Africa, he thought, he thought it was a thing, but because of that, because of the tilt down man thing, thing they, didn't, they didn't accept it or something, because they, we, we, we had our, our own theories about how brains got bigger and smaller. Oh, yeah, the the, the Brits had, had um, tilt down man, well, it's well, it was a hoax, which not even all of them believed. Mm. Uh, only, only some of them. But, um, but yeah, it was a hoax put on them, possibly by the writer of Sherlock Holmes. He's <laughs> one of the people implicated in that. Um, but the idea was, well, part of the problem was the. You're right. The, the. It seemed like okay. Why are the the fossils of human ancestors coming out of Asia? Because they had they didn't have yet um, the Australopithecines, but they had uh, like Erectus. They're like, why are they coming out of Asia? What's up with that? Um, and so when they found this, they're like, oh, well, clearly, here's our here's our British, our our nice British transitional fossil. And then as they were finding the Australopithecines and the others, it started to look more and more like, uh, what? <laughs> but my racism. <laughs> but my race, yeah. But and and what's funny enough is one thing creationists never ever bring up is actually the Piltdown man was um refuted within like 10 years of its discovery oh it, not only yeah every single hoax that has ever been a hoax in anthropology has been refuted by other anthropologists yep. yeah not by creationists yeah and the other one was even a hoax it was a, it was a mistake like the 
the uh, Nebraska right. man was a mistake. Yeah, um, yeah, that was a um, ne yeah Nebraska man. Uh, what do they call it? A uh, Hesperopithecus. Uh, yeah. And yeah, the the thing you're right. It wasn't it wasn't by the definition of a hoax a hoax. And again, even even uh, Osborne was like, yeah, well, we should probably wait a little bit uh, for the for more data to come in, which is why he commissioned more expeditions to the locality. Mm -hmm. um, but the only thing that came out of it, which which Kent Hovind has trumpeted for years, is but the the drawing in the magazine, the drawing, the lines on. You know what Kent said that really pissed me off uh, in the debate. I think it was actually with with. It was with, just one thing. No, no, more <laughs> than the other thing. Okay. What was it? I think it was in his debate with Bill Ludlow. Anyways, he's Bill is showing all of the all of the incredible uh, sort of recreations that we have of the hominids, and Bill is of course very clear that these are recreations with what we have, and obviously this is not a one to one. This is more for the sake of education mm. uh, and sort of uh, assisting in in like forensic anthropology and things like that. And Kent, one of the first things he says is he's like, "Well, I I appreciate that you went ahead and uh, noted that they are uh, are recreations, but uh." I'm not sure how I feel about. It. I, I think you got a question why why all of them are so dark, so dark skinned. But anyways, I, I anyway, at least he kind of moves on. And I was like, wait, did Ken just call anthropology racist because things that live at the equator tend to have dark skin? It, he's so beyond moronic. It would not surprise me. And I was like, oh my god, are you? I've never heard that one before. I have never heard someone point to a replication of Australopithecus afarensis and be like, it's racist because it's dark skinned. And I was like, it lives at the equator, Kent. <laughs> what is wrong with you? What is, well, that a lot of things to be frank, um, so, but, fair, you ever, fact, but I was ever, it's weird get, to focus on. Did you ever get a chance to meet, meet, meet Bill before you passed? I didn't. I was, it's so sad. And, and the thing is, is I, uh, I was scheduled. I was on the calendar to be on his uh, leaving creationism um, about a month after he passed. I was scheduled for like late September. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I was lucky enough to have him on my podcast before he passed away. That's yeah, cool. what's the the saddest thing? Um, the last one of the last messages that he and I had. I went to a gem and mineral show, and one of the tables had these rocks from the Ludlow mine. And so I took a picture of it and I sent it to him. And that was one of our last conversations. Well, I bet he loved that though. Yeah, he was, um, he was, he was sharp all the way to the end. Mm. You know, you never, no one ever knew. No one knew. And then just all of a sudden that was it. We got that, yep. tweet, that, we got that tweet or Facebook message that says, Hey, he, he, he's in the hospital right now. He's passing away. And then, yep. That was, that was just the only thing. And it was, it was like, dang. Like what? <laughs> Yeah, it it th that really is that sums it up. It was just kind of well, like the other. Really I mean, it does. Yeah. The, to be fair, the other thing that uh, Hoven focused on, you said it was such a weird thing to focus on, was the eye. Uh, he is always he always talks about the eyes. Oh, um, the brow ridges that grow, uh, continue to grow. Oh well, no. I mean, there is that, but I was thinking of the um of the white in the eye because he's like there are some. What? Go ahead. Go ahead. I know what you're gonna say, but I oh. agree. agree. No, yeah, he talks. He's like, "Why does this the Australopithecus have whites in its eyes? They're apes, you know. Only humans have whites in their eyes. It's like so wrong, just nope. wrong, just blatantly. Like all you have to do is like just Google gorillas, chimpanzees, whatever you want. Scroll down for like two seconds, you'll see like four. Right. It, yeah. it that drives me crazy. And Genesis Apologetics does that too, you know, and. Like the effort, it's the bar is on the floor, you guys. It's in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just look, Google it. Like, in the age of information, we're still having this conversation. I have no idea how. Yeah. Back to the debate of us. I, I one thing that took it out to me in that debate was Kate was always talking about individuals and Bill's like populations, not individuals. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, because yeah. Bill understands how evolution works, and Kent doesn't. So, because well, you know, because because I guess individuals, I guess you have Noah and his kids are individuals. I think happened, but yeah, Kent has come out since and and openly been like, 
well, yeah, that's what they say now. They say, you know, populations are not individuals because I called them out. And I'm like, Kent, do you think you invented population? Kent, how old are you? It's like, yeah. I guarantee there were people before you were born who were in population like, genetics. Saying this. Like, yeah. oh, he kills me with that. He kills me with that. And and what kills me even more is that it's like, if you're wrong, you're wrong. I'm wrong all the time. But when someone is like, hey, you're wrong, that's when you're like, oh, shoot, I'm wrong. And then you change the script a little bit. Just a little. Make an effort. Pretend right. to make an effort, please. Oh, he can't be wrong because... You know that would that would mean that everything he's ever stood for is wrong, and that that just can't happen. Mm -hmm. Even though it is it is it is all wrong. So yeah. <laughs> it has yeah. always been wrong. <laughs> we are both shocked and appalled. <laughs> what's the what's the phrase? It's like I'm not surprised, just disappointed. Um, yeah, uh, I asked for nothing, and I was still disappointed. Yeah. That's one or uh, from was it Casablanca? I'm shocked, shocked to find that gambling is happening in this establishment. Here are your winnings. Thank you. <laughs> or the arrest development uh, dead dove inside. He looks and he's like, I don't know what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um you may not regret this, but maybe the day maybe tomorrow, but seeing this for the rest of your life. <laughs> uh, the uh, what's funny is he has actually changed what's funny is he's extremely selective about the arguments he's been called out on and has changed because he actually has a few. Um the whole is it the the shrinking sun, I think. Is one of them? Uh, he, was it the frozen mammoths? Was the was no? The, no, I think he still touts that. He oh. still touts the the stupid um, in, fre like freeze frozen mammoths in Siberia or whatever. Well, because that's that's Walt Brown's. Walt is Brown it, had is that the is that the uh, two million years to give birth thing? Wait, mm. which wait, wait, specify? Two million years to give birth. Well, I don't know if it was a mammoth or mm. something else or. Like, uh, it's like, are you talking about the ophthalmosaurus or the ichthyosaurus, the oh, fossil yeah. of that birth? <laughs> it's oh, like, oh, yeah, it, yeah. Or it looks like it's giving birth, yeah, yeah. I remember pregnant that one. and it's uh, it expelled the, the baby. So, yeah, there's actually, um, there's that one, and there's another, there's another picture kind of like that with, with like a fish swallowing another fish, and they use those two pictures, yeah, as like, look, it was instantaneous, okay. Fish are stupid. Try to swallow and it will get stuck in their throat and they will die. That this is you can find this yeah. like a picture it takes. You're right. It's just Google it. Just Google fish with another fish in its mouth. It's not yeah, hard. Yeah, it's so idiot. So easy. And, 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 and it's not even the idiocy. It's the laziness. It like, is. It, you yeah. know. You can't. You cannot claim to be. You know. To, you cannot complain that the scientific community isn't taking you seriously when you don't even perform a Google search about uh, what you're looking for. And again, it goes back to what we started at the beginning of the thing: is admitting that you're you, you can be wrong. Yeah, it, absolutely. You're dead right. That's to, That's completely true. That's yeah, that's. The, the, um... Oh boy. Yeah, the uh, as as RJ and I show in our book, which everyone should get, they're dead wrong on everything. <laughs> Let me just plug it right. <laughs> well, hey, I have something to plug now, so there we go. Because I, I I can't plug my own channel. <laughs> like, yeah. fair enough, fair enough. You, have, you have a book you can show yet, or you have your own copy yet to show? Oh no, it's on Amazon though. But uh, I mean, it's, I'm like Tony Reed. It's like you know, oh, I got this channel. I'll, I never talk about. It. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I never tell people about it. Like, oh yeah, and, you know, someone says like, I watch YouTube. It's like, yeah, You're like you, 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 you don't have your own DVD series for nineteen eighty five. I have a twelve part DVD series, which I made in nineteen eighty five. You can watch it's available for uh, three installments of thirty nine ninety nine. You can buy it, watch it, and send it back, and give your money back, uh, except for the shipping, because the thing costs like fifty pounds to ship anywhere. And drink wa lots of water while you're watching. <laughs> lots of water. Whales, whales belong, okay, in the water. <laughs> but, okay. Uh, you, you, this is the dumbest theory I have ever heard. And it's dangerous. All right, and it's dangerous. <laughs> The dumbest and most dangerous religion. Idea. Dangerous religion. 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 Yeah. That's what he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
<laughs> oh my god. It's just such a meme. It, uh. it is it is such a meme, honestly. Yeah, just you know, Kent. Kent is an enigma. I'll never truly understand. And I'm you know what? I can I I have come to terms with that. Oh, I, I think I understand. It's green. It rhymes <laughs> with funny. <laughs> I think I understand it quite well. <laughs> uh, but I, I've heard a uh, hypothesis, you know, that was true or not. I feel, maybe my, maybe my uh, out, information is outdated at this point. That there is things about but Habilis, if he appears, if he's on the homeless side or the upper Thurston side. Yeah, um, mostly it has to do with with brain case and with, as usual, um, like the shoulders and the proportions of the body. Um, because Habilis, so Habilis has this really nice 900, 700, 900-ish uh, centimeters squared brain case size, which is much larger than the Australopithecines, which is why most people are like, no, it's it's a member of genus Homo. Um, alongside the, the the equally as important presence of tools with with uh, Australopithecus or, or Australopithecus uh, with Habilis, uh, as well as potentially uh, like, like group living in in sort of a settlement type fashion, the the home base so to speak, and that's just because we find um, sort of conglomerations of bones, and a lot of the bones have hash marks on them, which suggests using tools to kind of strip the meat from them. Uh, and, and the fact that they brought kills back to a singular location, which no primate other than humans does today, which is really cool and unique. Um, so I, I would say firmly, based off of at least what I know, that, that based on those two facts alone, Habilis belongs uh, with genus Homo, or at the very least uh, in its own genera that, that bridges the gap. Because the thing is, is that you also have Rudolfensis, um, which... Can't use that word here. Yeah, I was going to say, which mm, it depends on who you talk to, because I was always I was taught that Rudolf Fensis is, is Havilah, that they're one and the same. But some mm -hmm. would agree with you. Um, and, and I always try to give them a shout out as well, because they well, they... anthropologists or paleoanthropologists are like frighteningly um, like uh, obsessed with names. <laughs> They are, and the thing is, they are hmm. they're savage to each other. They oh, yeah. they will rip. I mean, as as many scientists are, but it's like primatology too. Like I have several professors that like if a paper comes out that's kind of dissing either them or what their supervisors have kind of touted. Like let's say, for instance, the social brain hypothesis, um, because my my supervisor now her supervisor was Robin Dunbar, who invented the social brain hypothesis. <laughs> So anytime anybody is like dissing the social brain, my supervisor's like, hold up, hold up, hold up. To the point, oh no, my camera. I'm all blurry now. Uh, to the point- It looks that, like my sight without my glasses. <laughs> same. <laughs> to the point that when in when uh, Decassian, mm -hmm. another primatologist came out and was like, well, maybe diet has something to do with it. My supervisor wrote this enormous- comments on Decassian's work, you know, that was in and of itself its own publication. And and the it was so like absolutely savage. Like we all had to read it for for our course. And of we course. Like, we came out of it and we were like, she like roasted him. Like she like spent the whole <laughs> paper just ro like and it's so like in academic language. It's like we appreciate the work that Decassian has added to, you know, to But he's dumb. But he's <laughs> but, but you're stupid and I hate you. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're there. So the Habilis Rudolf Fensis debate is one that I don't intend to be a part of. I'm just going with with what my uh, my professor said. Oh. Habilis is oh. TD Lane says it's borderline heresy, not quite nano tyrannous levels of heresy. Actually, that one got settled, I believe. So thank God. Yeah, yeah it's it, it, but and yet we still find Rudolf Fensis. I have like two books on human evolution over on my shelf over there that have Rudolf Fensis like as its own thing. And every time I see it, I'm like, hmm. hmm. <laughs> so but, yeah, I I would say that you you'll be hard pressed to find an anthropologist today that thinks Habilis belongs with the Australopithecines, uh, especially with the more the, the more specimens we find. Uh, awesome. So no. I don't know if there's more, but I mean, uh, uh, yeah, there other like, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, you we can keep talking. I'm trying to find this picture. Uh, I'm trying to find a picture or something. Oh, okay, I've I've even heard like um, 
There are that, that a couple of other genera have been proposed within the hominins, like uh, Kenyanthropus. What are your thoughts on on that? So, so Kenyanthropus is really interesting because it, the, where it's dated, it's it's either this super enigmatic primate that has this ridiculously long um, sort of sort of success period, and we're talking overlapping with the artipeds, overlapping with the australopeds, and overlapping all the way up to essentially abelis. Um, hmm. Because the problem is. We find evidence with Kenyanthropus that it was a tool user. And Kenyanthropus is an old, an older primate, an older hominid. I believe, I want to say contemporary with Artipithecus, but let me check. Kenyanthropus platyops. Yeah, 3.5 to 3.2 million years ago. So so contemporary, not with Artipithecus ramidus, but certainly with with. Uh, Afarensis, who was not a tool user, by the way. Um, he was just a tool. Was a tool, yeah, depending on who you talk to. I'm sure Lucy's uh, kin would say that since she fell out of a tree. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's, it's Kenyanthropus is honestly very weird, also because its brain case is somewhat primitive. Um, obviously, having a small brain case doesn't necessarily mean that you can't be a tool user because Floresiensis was an avid tool user um, and also had, um, I believe, some forms of symbolism or, or art, um, at least mm. the, like decoration uh, of bodies and things like this. So, so the Kenyanthropus situation is honestly, and I've looked into it, kind of an enigma. Um, it's it's mm. sort of in the same way that, like, I, I'm sure you know about, like, Rising Star Cave with Naledi. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're not really, have they, have they dated that conclusively yet? I don't believe they've dated Rising Star yet. I know Naledi is contemporary with uh, Heidelbergensis, Erectus, Neanderthalensis, Denisovans, and Floresiensis. Um, it overlaps with all five. I mean, we're, we're talking about an organism that, that did very well because it was kind of by itself down there sure. um, yeah. in South Africa. Uh, and and that's why, even though it has uh, this this relatively large population, we presume based off of the dead found in Rising Star Cave, um, it has a small brain case and really primitive, so really basal shoulders, so to speak. Like we're talking, like it's still got that rotation. It's much more similar to a chimps than it is to ours, uh, which is more locked um, in place for stability of of the pel or of the uh, um, shoulder girdle. Mm. But the yeah. weird thing about Rising Star Cave is how these bodies are positioned inside of it. It is ridiculously difficult to getting into to get into Rising Star Cave. Yeah, they have a person like crawl in and all that. Yeah. Yeah. It, you, I when I was a um, when I was uh, taking human evolution in 2016, Lee Berger sent out a big uh, call for 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 female PhD anthropology students because who were under a certain height or male right. could get under a certain height, but you had to be very small and petite because he physically couldn't fit in there you know, Lee Berger's a big guy. Like he's, he's not small. Um, and, and there's all these weird contortions and there's a shoot involved. Um, and some of the questions uh, to do with Rising Star Cave in general, isn't just how did they manage to get in, but how did they see anything? Because we don't have evidence to suggest that Naledi was capable of using fire, um, which is very odd considering. Night vision. Yeah, but it's it's weird, right? And and the thing is, is that also none of the predators that we typically su like suspect of Naledi kind of kind of sort of housed themselves in such a deep dark cave. And there's also no geologic activity that can, that currently suggests that there was some shift. Where yeah, that would have been my next question. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's what what I thought too, because I was like, well, maybe it used to be easier, but now it's not. Um, but we don't have any evidence of that yet. It's it's possible, I think, what they're investigating is that maybe there used to be sort of a vertical shaft at some mm. point that by some means has been plugged or or is no longer accessible, whatever. Um, mm. But as of now, it's a total mystery as to why all these bodies are in there um, and what put them there. And I would put Kenny Anthropus in the same sort of, we straight up have no idea right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to think real fast. As far as I know, at least that might be a thing, there was a, at least three uh, speciations from Africa, the Homo erectus ones, then the Heidelbergenes that came, the, the Neanderthals and the other sense, and then the, we came out of Africa ourselves. Yes, I think that is what is current with the literature is that it's sort of like a multi-regional 
uh, or at least mm -hmm. out of Africa. <laughs> I was like, watch that word. Yeah. I, was like, mm. I was like, the thing is, is you say it because it's kind of similar. It's like a weird hybrid of the two. Yeah. So you're like, I say it and then I'm like, I'm going to make someone angry. I better. You're going to be like your, uh, your professor. <laughs> so he, he at the time too he was a big out of africa guy so he was like not a big I, fan I, I heard the fourth one might be i, I was sure not by a, a hypothesis or a theory or something that that the that the hobbit one is more closely related to the habilis and then erectus i don't know if that's true i don't yeah. know i don't know about that i the only thing with that is that the the it, it, I would find it at least a little bit surprising that sort of the tool use uh, that that Floresiensis is found equipped with is so similar to Denisovans, uh, okay. which is geographically similar um, or geographically sorry uh, uh, close by. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But at the same time, we just don't know that much about Denisovans. Like we have way more stuff that Denisovans used than we do Denisovans. <laughs> like yeah, there's like a, a tooth before um, I. I think before uh, like this year or last year or something like that, there was yeah. only a tooth known and that's where they got you know, like some DNA from. I think they might've had a, a thing, a, a finger bone as well. Yeah. Um, like like a tooth and finger bone, but, but for a long time, I mean, the reason Dennis Ovens doesn't have like it's, it's binomial nomenclature is because we don't know enough about it. Um, we don't have, we barely have anything from it, but that's also kind of weird because we also don't have like a, a formal, we have like, uh, Giganticus or Giganticus, sorry, uh, black eye. We also only have teeth and knuckles from that, so I'm not really sure what they're waiting for, but I don't know. It, yeah. They're afraid they'll start fist fighting again with the paleoanthropologists. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how accurate this, they will. I don't know how accurate this, this chart was, but I, rem I remember it from a long time ago. It might be outdated by now, but that the agaster split in the rectus and hyperbarcanus and hyperbarcanus is split again. The, yeah, depends on whether or not our gaster is its own that's, one. That's what I was going to say too. Because the thing is, is some people lump air gaster in with erectus and some don't. Um, yeah. Some say erectus is just super enigmatic. And, yeah, and like, very... like gaster is just a homo erectus from Africa. Yeah, right. it, it, it just depends on who you talk to. Uh, same thing with Australopithecus gari. Um, I've heard mm -hmm. that gari is is very similar to, to um, Afarensis or Africanus. I, I can't remember one of the two. Um, is Sediba on there? I don't know. Is Sediba on here? I'll show you Sediba. I can't really. It, they're very some letters are so small. No, no Sediba. Yeah. Oh, it's interesting though because next to uh, Homo rudolfensis, they also have or Kenianthropus, like <laughs> Kenianth uh, Homo uh, or Kenianthropus rudolfensis is going to be <laughs> a name. Uh -huh. I don't think so. <laughs> oh man. And besides the interbreeding thing, they think the end, uh, the, 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 my pronunciations, the, the Novins are more closely related to the Neanderthals. Besides, or, yeah, uh, that's yeah. what it seems like based on genetic data. And the thing is, too, is that they, I, I believe, if I'm remembering this correctly, they, they frequently interbred. Um, they were just geographically together, more closely together for longer. Um, it seems we, like intuitive. We, we were down in Africa catching some sun. They were up north. Yeah. And then I, we all interbred. Yeah, then, then it was a big party. That's that's where the bonobo uh <laughs> <laughs> and then we went chimp on everybody. <laughs> yikes. I, I'm like, yikes. I'm like I'm like then we, we I'm like then we, we just had to cross we just had to cross the river to, <laughs> Yeah, the train C to get, get across, on. The, across the Rubicon more than once, once yeah. in a metaphorical sense. <laughs> oh, it's so sad that we don't. I, I wonder. I, I I think another excellent question to ask is is what happened to the Paranthropians? Like why they were so unsuccessful in comparison to to their contemporaries mm. um, in the Australians? Didn't, didn't they feed? They fed on on a different on like they were C four grasses as opposed to C three, weren't they? Wasn't yeah, they, they had heat. I mean, we're talking megadont molars, like molars that were like for the for the skull size, like enormous. Mm -hmm. Um, and as you can see in the picture, uh, kind of over to the side, a lot of them have sagittal crests, which none of us, none of our relatives have. Um, is, is that when we decided that that eating softer food and cooking it made it made our mouth smaller? 
Or at least, at the very least, it's when we decided, hey, maybe we should occasionally like scavenge instead of eating really hard nuts um, and and stripping grasses and bark. Um, because they 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 find a lot of pitting with with a lot of the paranthropines, which is basically just like eating super hard nuts to crack them essentially with their teeth. Um, and so, and then you're right, we also find a lot of like weird weird plant choices like sedges it's i don't know they're weird the parenthropines or the parenthropines are uh are, are an odd bunch and not just because they have those like they almost if you see the paleo art for them they've got like <laughs> fringes almost they're very very odd looking all i know is i had to get oral surgery get my wisdom teeth removed because of our diet change <laughs> i know isn't that i'm so gonna have to get all of all four of mine i already got mine out it, it's I, there's really no other way. It's kind of, it's kind. I've never had a surgery before outside of wisdom teeth. It was kind of a, a fun surgery in that, like, I, I was sitting there, they put the IV in, and they're like, all right, like, count backwards. And I was like, oh, that's not going to be like the movies. And then I blinked and I was waking up and I was like, oh my God. Really? I, I was, I was semi awake for mine. I wasn't. Really? Oh, they knocked me out. I, was I, I, I asked for oh, gas. Oh, well, they give you the choice. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they gave me gas, but then gave me then gave me an IV. I, I, I only had the ga gas nope. option. Really? I've had, yeah, I've had two surgical, so I've had two I, surgical I, I, I procedures before. I'm going under. Yeah, yeah. I, I was. I'm going I, under. I, yeah, I paid extra for the gas, but I didn't, uh, where I was at, they didn't have IVs. Just oh, my sleep. God. Yeah, they, they were like, you might want to do the gas. And I was, because the thing is, I made the mistake before actually getting the surgery of um, <laughs> watching like a procedure. Oh my God. Yeah. And I was like, I want to know what they're going to do. And then I was like. Nope. I'm afraid that if, if they put me on gas, I'll say, I'll, I'll say one of my secrets and then everyone will know. I know. So, <laughs> my, I'll just my, be like, put me under. <laughs> my, my, I actually, yeah, my, my post gas or my post um uh, IV experience was my parents recorded it. They, they picked me up. Um, I don't remember any of it, but I've seen the videos. They're not flattering. <laughs> it's yeah. just me crying because they're like pruning trees. And I was feeling very empathetic towards the trees. Hey, those trees, have you ever seen Fern Gully? It's, oh, yeah. The trees can feel pain. It's, so, you know, think about that. So what is, there was, I Second swear time. I read something that said, or it might have been you told me, what was it like the trees are screaming or whatever? Uh. Oh, for the for the wisdom teeth? No, well, like the trees when they get, they give off like some sort of grass or, yeah, grass. or is it grass? Okay, yeah, they're the the pheromone. Oh, no. That's that sorry. good grass smell. That's because they're like they're in pain or whatever. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're straight up warning other grass, like they're like we're being attacked. We need to like I don't know what the plan is though. Like I run. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know exactly why. You know, I've always, I always, I always wondered if they're not going anywhere. I know. I, if, it's if, a good thing. Yeah, I always wonder if we, if we couldn't interbreed with each other. You know, the interfalls and stuff, and and the, the, them and the erectus were still around. If they, they'd be like their own little civilizations community there, or we have a, like a, a zoo or something. Oh yeah, I, like a multi-species community. That'd be cool. I, it would be amazing, and I, I can almost guarantee erectus. I'm. I would imagine Erectus would be fine. Neanderthals would be fine. They, I, they would almost certainly be fine. I think we have, so we have a hyoid bone from, uh, from an, from a Neanderthal, um, and I think current lit suggests that they at least had rudimentary speech capabilities, and they probably had the capacity to understand, uh, similar to a level that we can, um, but obviously not, by and large, as cognitively sort of uh, intuitive as 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 we are i don't think they ever actually develop like long long range weapons um which is why a lot of them have terrible injuries <laughs> upon their death because they get up and like brawl with their with their prey um it, it's it's interesting too because males and females both have these injuries so it's actually thought that they didn't do really the division of labor either yeah. that sapiens eventually did because yeah. they were just like well <laughs> We're all pretty big. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard the differences sometimes that, that, that we learn the, the, the throw stuff from a closer from a they're, they're close and we were, we were more of a distance spear thrower. Yeah. Well, humans, humans are actually one of, we are the, as far as I know, best throwers in the animal kingdom. And one, of course, one of the best persistence runners. Um, yeah. And, and we, we've got, we're weird, weirdly talented in weird ways.
they're, they're like, huh, we plus this rhino or mammoth, they attack us. Maybe we should deal from it a little bit a little further away. Just let's take just, your your Adelaide and just, you know, throw it at them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Big, big. They're, they're like, all right, we can throw these rocks, but what if the rock was sharp? <laughs> then they're oh like, my gosh. instead of rocks, let's, let's take this metal stuff. <laughs> Met, Metallurgy. Uh, yeah, let's, let us take a moment and remember no, Noachian metallurgy and Canaanite <laughs> genetics. The, these are the things that we need to stop and appreciate. I just, I think like, when you, you think of guns, you're like, what if we could throw metal, but fast? <laughs> <laughs> I, I learned <love> that. <laughs> oh, then the, the think of guns, it was, it was like, huh. instead of wasting time stuffing this with, with gunpowder and stuffing this bullet down all the time, what if we made it spin and uh, put lots of them in there. You, you you really think about it, and a lot of human history has just been exploding things in different ways. <laughs> like, explode, explode a ball of metal, make it go fast. Explode lots of fuel, drive a car. Like it's it's. Uh, or um, what is this white thing that came out of the chicken's butt? I'm gonna eat it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And 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 pour one out for all of the all of the relatives that we have in the long distant path distant past who have tried things and found out the hard way that you can't eat them <laughs> this mushroom looks a lot like the one that you know grog ate last week and it worked out just fine for him uh-oh that was a mimic <laughs> whoops it was death cap yikes yep, yep. Bad trial, trial on error <laughs> yeah that's it really is a lot trial of and error with people <laughs> it's, yeah. I, I think louis ck said it he was like um People and then I gotta go, guys, because it's two two thirty seven for me. But I have a blast. Um, no. made this quote where he was like, uh, "He's like people look at the pyramids, uh, and they're like, wow, like that's yeah. incredible." Like, yeah, how did can, and he's like, 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 he's like throw enough human life at anything, and anything is possible. <laughs> like, I hope I can do this again when, when you get back from your trip. Yes, absolutely. Well, and hopefully, I mean. I, again, I, the, the reason I'm not scheduling anything is because I don't know what my Wi-Fi is going to be like. Allegedly, yeah. I guess say if we, if we have Wi-Fi, we, we, we could do a live stream right from your dick site. Okay, this is yeah. from, from Erica live. I know. Yeah. Well, it's 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 dependent. I know I have wi access to Wi-Fi in the village. You have to do the Attenborough voice though. Like over there are two geladas, like, and look, they're fighting right now. What? Oh, they see me, right? <laughs> Like, why can they have good internet in the middle of the jungle? <laughs> yeah, it's it, yeah. If, if I'm if I'm capable, it'll definitely be from my fields for my camp. Um, Probably could do video, like little short little videos, like edited videos or recordings. Um, yeah, oh kinda. yeah, I'm 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 stocking up videos now. It's or like just have a have a have a GoPro to your ch chest while you're doing your your thing. Oh, there you go. The funny thing is, is I I really would like to take a GoPro out there because these these macaques are habituated and habituated macaques habituated any monkeys. The adults pretty much ignore you, but the juveniles are really really interested. And so you have to stay you know decently still because you're observing, and then you're sitting, and the juveniles just come up and they're just like <laughs> messing yeah. with you, and you know they want to see what's up. They're curious, and and you got to be yeah. like little man, step back. <laughs> yeah, if, if we I'm observing. Time, yeah, if we, had, if we had more time, I I love to talk about the the uh, ERVs in our, our in our group ancestry. How they oh, absolutely, yeah. I I hope I I you know you mostly I mean you pretty much have a, a good handle on what the current lid is saying on a lot of the stuff. I mean, things things are getting more and more solid in human evolution as as we find you know more specimens and the genetics yeah. get tighter and all that stuff. Like. Like, 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 like about how oh, it happened twice. The same brand says, you know, like the same exact spot. The virus decided the same that, that that one kills me. That one, that one, and the gulo breakage both kill me. Oh, the, they don't even. It's they just don't think about it. Yeah, they don't. In the same way that our our <laughs> our lovely synapsids are left off the arc almost every time. Right. The fun thing, the really fun thing about gulo is it can't even be um, it it cannot be transcripted. Or transcribe, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's it, the the promoter region is broken. So the funny thing, the, so I love when they're like, there are one hundred percent of the DNA is functional. Okay, then tell me why can't Gulo? Why why is it that it can't even be transcribed? It's not that it's not like it's a negative argument. Like we don't know what it does. We know what it does. 
We know where it is. And it can't be transcribed. It can't work. It literally cannot work. And they're just like, oh, oh, oh. Wait a oh. second. Yeah, I think I think it was RJ actually who who said this to Stanford. He was like, "You cannot use an exception to make the rule." Where he's like, "Well, some ERVs do something. Look at this one that has to do with embryonic development." And he's like, "Okay, well, look at this other enormous pile that do nothing, and we know them. We know where they are, and we know they didn't do anything." Uh, okay, before you both go, do you have any yeah. uh, future videos that you you want to talk about coming up in your channels? Oh, I got a lot of stuff coming over the next three months because I'm preparing it in advance. So it should it should release uh, in in relatively quick succession. Again, Monkey Mondays is coming, <laughs> just very slowly. Okay. What about you, Jackson? Any, any future videos coming up? Um, technically, yes. We have a um, we have a re uh, um, a rebuttal video which I'm slowly piecing together. Um, because it's going to be quite long. It's, Good. This is going to, this is going to be my final or our final response to uh, long story short, until he reads another intelligent design book and decides to make a video again, then we'll, then we'll get him again. I have to say all of my videos on his stuff have gotten more views than his stuff has. And so, that's always a good sign. Except to be, well, okay. Well, uh, he only referred to that on his channel. Because when he posted, or the Discovery Institute hosted his homology video, and it's got like 10,000 or so, or probably more than that now. But the stuff on his own channel, because I can't do anything about the Discovery Institute, all of my videos on his stuff have more views than, than his own stuff. And so, yeah, I, um, I think when they use the big boys to plug their videos, they that, that kills me. And, and uh, Genesis Paul Jeff says that too. Well, to be fair, that to be fair, um, I had uh, Aaron Raw, um, posted one of my videos on his channel or well we did kind of a, a collab sort of thing um well we did a collab and we he also posted one of my videos uh on which was on long no it wasn't wasn't a long story short it was on when steve meyer was on prager you and oh um God, that was so I, bad it's i love that these guys Actually, you know what was, video wasn't that bad erica it was pretty good it was a pretty good video it wasn't that bad <laughs> <laughs> well I, I don't think we should be surprised this is a group that has Bad history, it is bad history, bad economics, and uh, bad climate change. Oh, they became creationists. Is anyone surprised by this? No, <laughs> well, calling them the university is like calling the, the crazy museum a museum. Yeah, Dennis yeah. Crater, who is like directly funded by the Koch brothers, like has bad climate change takes. I'm shocked. Shocked, God. shocked. Oh, you, oh my god, that's just like a completely different animal, you know, just because yeah. it's negative. Yeah. Oh, but um, other than the long story short video, um, sort of, uh, I've got like the genetic series that I keep meaning to get back to and I keep putting off. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, real fast. Well, before we go, as for me, besides my Kingdom Hearts series, I'm finally uploading after a year of recording, a year later, I recorded. Next next Saturday, I'm going to have the, the Dapper Dino on the podcast. Oh. So. So if you're available to check it out, be sure to check it out in the audience. In the meantime, as I, as I always say, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see you next time. Bye. Work and screw everyone else in the house. <laughs> like, okay. Mine has pretty My, savvy, so that's good. That's that's nice. Mine is mine is not. <laughs> he's he's <laughs> not a tech savvy. He's like the which as a radiologist is absolutely insane to me because he relies on tech a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, my, my dad was kind of tech savvy only, only because I, when I got my first computer, an old Apple computer, it was like I had instructions, I, I had disk instructions how to use a computer. So I gave him the you know, test run and, he, knew, and he, he learned the basics at least. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. But speaking of well, tech and humans and stuff, welcome to Talking <laughs> Times with Caffeine, the only podcast where we talk about stuff and we discuss stuff. Stuff and things. We turn the it only for one. the first time since October because of her busy, busy schedule. It's Erica. Hmm. It's all right. Oh my gosh, it has been that long. Um, me here. We're we're talking about uh, uh, Australopithecines and um, basically like the, the late Miocene, early uh, Pliocene hominins today, I believe. Um, yes, is that the plan? 
Yeah, anything, yeah, anything, everything, anything we, since we branched off from the pan, genius. Yeah, yep, that's it, yep, absolutely, yeah, I, well, I wasn't sure if you wanted to, because I know you're doing this kind of stepwise, and I, I wasn't sure if you wanted to, like, the paranthropines, because they're, they're robust australopithecines, or if you wanted Anything, to really, we, there's so many topics, primates that we can talk about, the, in, in the hominids, and uh, all the primates, we, we could do, we could do, like, seven, it's like 20 episodes of, of primates alone, of each branch. That's a good point, you know how to suck up to me, Vandalia, because I love... <laughs> Go ahead, Walker. You're about to say something, and I oh, I was just gonna say that I'd say pranthropines probably fit in just as much as any other lineage. Yeah, it's hominid. That's that's probably true. I'm I'm gonna leave. I mean, I don't know how like how we want to do that. How much time we have, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, I I kind of beefed up my old human evolution PowerPoint, so I've got that. If we, if we awesome. want to reference anything, I've got awesome. all my visuals ready if we need to. Visuals um, are always good. Talk, you know. Uh, 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 pictures to go with our words, always nice. Before yeah. We start, well, oh, go ahead. We start, start real fast. I was wondering, so are you? An, are you? Is it official? Are you approved? Are you an official master of the universe now? <laughs> oh my God! I wish. No, I'm still waiting on my external examiners, but hopefully within this next week or two, um, depending on how my external advisors feel about hopping on the good foot on that. We'll, we'll get that master's approved, a especially because I start, I start my PhD in the fall. So I really need that master's hurry up and be approved. <laughs> um, and I'm already to your master first. Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah. I, that's kind of how I feel. I mean, and plus I don't know, you know, I, I submitted that master's, or I submitted my thesis like a month and a half ago. So it's like, I'm, I'm thinking about it and I'm like, so I, I refuse to revisit it. Like, I will not open that document because I know I'm going to find like a million things I should have changed, a million things I should have said better, all that kind of stuff. So I've, I'm not going to look at my marks. And you just but. hope and just pray and hope that your your your, your reviewer isn't it, as thrilled as you are. <laughs> yeah, my that's the thing, though. I, I got my I think I've told you guys this before, but or maybe not. But the I, I sent my thesis off to my advisor. Um, a month before my thesis was due. And the day before, less than 24 hours, I get it back from him with all of the critiques that he has. So I got like two hours of sleep that night while I was like frantically editing my manuscript. Everyone else had got it back to me, but my advisor was like, he was somewhere with no Wi-Fi. So when he like literally got back and was like, uh-oh. <laughs> Do you mind if he, he wants to join you? you mind? Oh yeah, of course. Right, I'm fine with it. That's looks cool. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah. You know, cool. I'll I'll, get, I'll send the tw I'll send the link on Twitter. But, but yeah, you, when you, when you do officially do that, I want somebody to I want somebody to have an art like an art an art, uh, a drawing of of, of Eric in her, in her Gibbon form doing the He-Man pose. The yeah, that's, that's what I need to. Yeah, I need to doodle that or something because I I'm just so ready to get it back. And I've I've talked to all my other colleagues who because you know we we were staggered out in submitting because we all had to redo our projects. So I'm kind of middle of the road. There are some people who submitted before me. Some people I'm sure have submitted now, but submitted after me. Um, and we we were all like, who's got like how long does it take before you get your marks? And I've got some people who got it like within a month, and I've got some who are still waiting, just like me. So I have no idea when I'm finally going to get my grid. Um, but I'm hoping it's a passing one. <laughs> That's all I care about at this point. If it could be like the the one point to not passing, I don't care. As so long as I pass now. As long as you, long as you get that, as long as you're not your D and non F, you're fine. Yeah. yeah exactly. I don't know how uh, master's grading systems work, but C's get degrees, so. It's master's grading. It's UK master's grading. So like they've got all this weird stuff where like a 70 and up is like a high pass, like you pass with honors. And then an eight, uh, and then a 60 and up is like medium pass and then a 50 and up is like you just did pass and you don't want to get below a 50. So it's like, it, it's almost, it's really weird. I don't know. It, don't ask me about it. I, I was there for nine months. I still don't fully understand. <laughs> <laughs> that is fair. Eh. Academic, yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. They totally do. Um, Man, most of is hard. <laughs> yeah, it's the thing is too is that it's like you write something and you're like, this is really good, and then you get some other eyes on it and they're like, steaming pile. Here's all the things you need to change, and you're like, it was so obvious. Why didn't I see it? <laughs> uh, so I guess we just start at the beginning. 
what what was the cause for, for our to say goodbye to our chimp and bonobo pan cousins? Oh wow, yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, it it kind of depends on who you ask. I mean, ultimately, that split occurred because of geology. It, it was a tectonic shift. The the Eastern African Rift uh, Valley formation is is ultimately what split that population. Um, and as Walker, I'm sure, and Neslig will both sympathize that that next part coming out of the trees, um, and whether we're coming out of the trees as a suspensory adapted primate or or an arboreal quadruped. Um, or even if we depend, descended as an arboreal quadruped and then move around as a, as a knuckle walking quadruped before moving into that bipedality, that's the big question right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I've heard theory, uh, hypotheses or theories that we, that, we, that our ancestors were always bipedal, and then the other ones became more quadruped. Oh yeah, I was I was just thinking about the same uh, uh, hypothesis, alternative hypothesis where like the ancestral. Uh, of the common ancestor of all uh, uh, great apes, the uh, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and us, were all like arboreal, but we stood up, stood upright in the trees with our hands mm. up above us. So we we had a we had we had a upright posture, not necessarily bipedalism on the ground, but then from 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 going to from going bipedal in the trees to bipedal in the grounds is an alternative way to the uh, knuckle walking uh, stage. Yeah, yes. Walker, Walker's professor, one of the folks at his uni, actually, um, I released, I do. I do. <laughs> yeah, released a paper somewhat recently about suspensory adaption and evolution, human evolution. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, 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 the question, though, is, is very important. It has a lot of bearing on, like, the not just the evolution of humans, but also the evolution of, of gorillas and panins, because these guys are both knuckle walkers to this day. They both have that ability to, to lock their knuckles when they're moving about on the ground. Um, and if it is the case that we, we descend from a, a suspensory adapted primate, right, because we're close, more closely related to the panins than they are to the yeah. gorillas, then what we're looking at here is two separate emergences of, of knuckle walking, two yeah. different states, two panins after our split and one for, for gorillas uh, and, and their kin. Um, at, it's, at it's, the, uh, it's the phylogenetic uh, bracket uh, hypothesis. Like if you look yeah. at two, uh, if you look at two uh, basal uh, derived lineages and if they share some traits, traits that you can Presume that they are pl uh, probably uh, plesiomorphic, right? Present in the ancestor, then. Uh, but, but of course, that, uh, there are some caveats with that. With uh, perhaps convergence evolution, maybe <laughs> as an alternative uh, uh, explanation for this. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's also interesting to note that there are some distinct differences in the way a chimpanzees knuckle walk as opposed to gorillas. Mm -hmm. But of course, the all the like the defense of the knuckle walking ancestrally is then oh right, but maybe the, the, the difference occurred later on, but the ancestor was still knuckle walking by itself. So yeah, it's also weird. It's a uh, the only way we could, could have, uh, really say one or the other is where we, with just more fossils of the uh, of the early beginnings of uh, the hominid. Which uh, is hard because yeah. the Miocene hates apes. <laughs> right. Well, the Miocene loved apes, but. <laughs> the fossil preservation of apes is a different story. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one, too, because when you look at the climate of the Miocene uh, up in Europe, this area where the apes were just really thriving, um, it really could lend itself to this this suspensory, adap uh, suspensory adaption versus um, as a knuckle walker, uh, because the adaption would have allowed these animals to come down similar to how gibbons do it and meander across these kind of dry woodlands on two feet. Uh, albeit somewhat awkwardly, but they could have done it. I mean, Gibbons, again, they do it today, and they've got that really divergent toe in the back. Um, but, but you know, we start, this, we start this journey kind of as far as what is conventionally accepted right now with the classic Sahelanthropus chidensis. Um, is, that where, is, that, is that where you started off in your game? You're, you're playing occasionally? Ah, yeah, yeah, the, the Atomai. <laughs> Actually, that game starts off with, a, with an ambiguous pre pre split um, who we don't have yet i mean the the, the record for the panins for you know example the fossil record with panins horrible compared to the hominins because the area that they're living in in this heavily forested uh kind of jungle um uh, on the other side of the eastern african rift 
it doesn't lend itself to preserving fossils very well. We, we run into the same problem once uh, Southeast Asia starts you know, get past Shiva Pithecus. You start getting into these areas um, with Gigantopithecus and early Gibbon relatives where you're barely finding anything out there. Nothing would fossilize. The soil's too acidic. Um, on top of the fact that you know you're you're dealing with a jungle environment where taponomically speaking stuff is just getting carried all over the place um and and compare that to these these nice savannas where where for whatever reason we get a decent preservation i mean the hominin fossil record is surprisingly good and i don't think people appreciate that enough like yes it's spotty all fossil records are spotty mm -hmm. but the hominins do pretty well as far as what we've got in this in this line um yeah, that's their Marin life. This, this, yeah, this is an image that I've seen uh, so, uh, regarding the uh, alternative hypothesis, like with the ancestor were, were up in the trees with their uh, hands in the air, just like they don't care. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and then the other, all the other apes just went their own way. Like we, went, we, we stayed upright on the ground, and the, uh, the orangutans just stayed more or less in the trees. Of, of course, they Occasionally they come on the ground, but the orangutans really love staying in the trees. So mm -hmm. please, don't, please don't destroy their homes, please. <laughs> right. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's this alternative hypothesis is kind of. I mean, I I would. You, you've almost got decent support for it now. Like it's almost a a, a nice com competitor to this idea of of coming yeah. to the ground and knuckle walker first. So, so do we know if this this is a time of the where the Sahara was actually green stuff or is this? It alternated back and forth quite a bit, actually. Mm -hmm. it, it was going back and forth. I think it, the period for it was like what a hundred thousand years or so. For for the swap, I, today is it not? Is it not twenty thousand? Is it twenty thousand? It might be a hundred thousand. I don't know. You would well, know more than me, Walker. Oh, well, probably not. But it, it's I, either way. It's on the scale of you know thousands of years, and we're talking about a process that occurred right. over you know, yeah. eight to 10 million years. So it was definitely yeah. going back and forth. And that may have been a cause for speciations and adaptive radiations and stuff like that. Yeah, that especially too the 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 um, oscillation of the Sahara from this arid, uncrossable desert to something that is could be considered lush in comparison is is facilitated or limited the ability of hominins to leave Africa. Right, crossing crossing that area and getting up and out into into Europe after the Miocene kind of starts to to wind down and you lose the apes up in in Europe, um, th this is what's going to allow them to either leave or not. You know, you're and crossing the Sahara is hard enough as as a big brain, extant member of genus Homo. It's it's not going to happen very easily if you're you know sporting 500 cc's as a as a grass cell australopith, right? Um, and yet. And yet, early Homo somehow managed to do it. We, we know they yeah, did at least three at least three times. <laughs> yeah, we, we know they managed to do it. So you know whether they waited until this was a, a, a kind of a lush period for for you know, moving up and outwards or not. Maybe maybe they braved the the desert. Um, we don't we don't really know yet. And that's the cool part about about uh. Somebody, should go, with it. somebody, somebody should go ask them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. nice. Thank That'd be nice. One of the reasons why the human line fossils are more common is because, like, like most of the apes stayed in forests, right? Like the more mm -hmm. acidic ground that's really bad at preserving fossils. But could there also be another reason, why, like perhaps uh, we we just tend to look for for human fossils as so, opposed to the ape fossils, or the other ape fossils? Yeah. <laughs> so that's actually a really interesting question. That's the topic of my research. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm researching essentially biases in the fossil record and you know, the causes and how they affect inference, essentially. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the answer is I don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> Keyword yet. I'll be able to get back to you in a few months. I, th <laughs> I, think, it's a, I think it's both because, mm -hmm. like, we, we also have the same thing with dinosaurs. Like, every few weeks or every week, actually, we have a new species of dinosaur, but we wait for a long time for a non-dinosaur to appear. Uh, suddenly, oh, oh, wow, something new that is not a dinosaur. <laughs> yep. right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, we yeah we uh, we are a narcissistic species, I think, and we like big lizards. So we see <laughs> Dapper would be so upset if I called that if you hear me call that big lizard. Hey, so, but, so, so, so what, what were we on the on this thing? Grave. Do we know? I know you did you did videos on this like a few months like a, almost a year ago now, a few months ago. But do, do we? I know genetics is hard to trace in 
fossils, but do, do we have any idea idea where in that six million Spain that the diffusion two chromosome happened? Yeah, your guess would be as good as mine. Mm. Um, I mean, we know it had to happen after the after the pan and split. Right. Oh, oh, it, it could actually have, have happened before because when, like in the ancestral population, you can have the fused chromosome like lingering al around in the population. But when the population split, the fused chromosome got fixed in one lineage and lost in yeah. the other lineage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's incomplete that's lineage shorting is also enough. possible. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, it's um, I, okay. Then I'll rephrase. Somewhere around that split. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well. The problem with a lot of genetic mutations is we can count up the number of differences between two different species, right? And use that as an estimate to estimate divergences. But we can't look at a specific mutation and estimate when that mutation happened. It's more about the quantity of differences rather than the, well, obviously it is the specificity of differences when you're building phylogenetic trees. But it, it, it's impossible to just estimate when specific differences occurred. You know, um, there's a but, substitution... Yeah. Uh, I, I was just going to say, for instance, there could be a substitution on some gene that happened, you know, 300,000 years ago before the last common ancestry of humans, or it could have happened, you know, 6 million years ago. And there's yeah. no way we could know when that nucleotide swapped around. Yeah, I, I, I can, perhaps you could uh, use the, uh, like the telomeric sequence and see how much it has, like, deviated from the original. That's true. Yeah, it could be dated. But, although, although, although I... But I, I'm, perhaps it is a bad idea because uh, the telomeric sequences could have been stop telomeric sequences from the start because, of course, you have you don't have an end-to-end -end fusion. You have your ribosomal translocation, and most of the telomere, telomeres were lost, but then the only the ends of the uh, sub telomeric regions, which were already deviating from the normal uh, TTA GTG uh, pattern yeah. from the beginning. So you, you yeah. might, so from that, you might overestimate the age, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. We, we we we've we've got the DNA for Neanderthals and Devonians. Do we know if that combination was is in them too? Yeah, I, th yes, I think it was. Yeah. yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So we know what happened before them, then pretty mm -hmm. much. Yeah, right. So some, some somewhere between either bef just before the split or before the split between us and the 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 Neanderthals and Denisovans. Yeah. Also, Denisovans were, I, I, I don't think we have direct evidence of Denisovans, the chromosome 2, but they were closer to the Neanderthals, so they would have probably ha have them too. So, right, so we've well, we have actually, oh, so sorry. we've narrowed down a little bit. Oh, really? Do, do, we have, do we have chromosome 2 from Denisovans too? Oh, I, I mean, I haven't looked at that specifically, but we do have full genome sequences. Oh, so yeah, I would yeah. assume that would include chromosome 2. All right. So, 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 so we narrowed down just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, now, we, now, next we need uh, Homo uh, erectus. Yeah. And then, 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That would be, that'd be incredible. It would be, it would be really nice to have some of those. I think they're, they're attempting, they have attempted um, pulling DNA from Homo floresiensis. They've, they've tried yeah, that. It didn't work. Um, yeah. yeah, it did not work. They, they went for a molar, I believe. They drilled into yeah. a molar but they were also thinking that maybe you know this was several years ago so maybe we can try with with better tech the problem is you really don't want to destroy too many of those molars you know yeah. <laughs> you don't have any of them yeah. um yeah I, I mean this this story goes the story begins a long time ago and there's so many details that we don't that we don't have narrowed down that's that's the cool part of it yeah. um you know I, I i think we can at the very least say that once that when we're starting with say Holanthropus and moving forward, we're dealing with something that is at least sometimes spending time upright. Um, we've got that nice uh, frame and magnum at the base of the skull that's oriented in such a way um, that that really is something that's that's probably moving about with its head held at the top of the vertebral column. And there's been some recent work coming that has come out recently, uh, Machiavelli et al. Um, versus kind of Guy et al. with with dealing with that potentially say philanthropist chinensis femur um medial femur and uh i don't know that i buy it i i this is my personal opinion but i think that i don't think that we can attribute that femur with any confidence to say um particularly because it, it's found from it's found quite quite a ways away and it definitely looks more like some kind of some of the other miocene apes that are lurking around at that time and it's it's all fine and dandy, you know, if you want to look at the this this cross section of this kind of middle of the femur 
and say, oh, well, you know, like this, this looks a lot like something that we would see with the, with the chimpanzee. Uh, therefore, this is not, a, a, you know, even a habitual biped. But that doesn't do anything to kind of attribute it. It, it, it's not even that. It's it's it doesn't deal with the frame and magnum at all. Like if you read Machiavelli at all, they don't talk about the position and angle of the frame and magnum in, at the base of the skull, which we have. Uh, so I don't think that you can, with any confidence, say that this is that this femur belongs to whoever the skull belongs to 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 mm -hmm. mine. But that's my opinion, and I've talked to some anthropologists about it, some some uh, biological anthropologists, and the sentiment set tends to be the same, at least with the ones that I've talked to, where they're like, look. Whoever whoever owns the skull, we be moving around upright a lot. Uh, whether it's in the trees or on the ground, we can't say. But this isn't going to be something that's that's you know an obligate quadruped like what we see a lot with with extant uh, extant apes. Mm. The well, deal with I, that femur just gets hmm, that femur is just it's it's kind of throwing a monkey wrench, if you will, into, into the whole. <laughs> We can't even for sure say who it belongs to. Yeah, but I, I thought that uh, like the evolutionists were like uh, accepting everything blindly from uh, the sci from from the scientist. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, I um, know, I know. Yeah, I, I do love to see. I also love that some of our mutual friends like to say that my my me personally my favorite hominin is actually a quadruped, and it's like it's like no one's been paying attention. My favorite hominin is Artipithecus ramidus. Not say <laughs> So and even then, I you know we're waiting on that acceptance because uh, a guy at all it's it's a pre, it's a pre-release right uh, being reviewed in Nature his response where he's like, hey, let's consider the femur alongside other attributed um, specimens. We we can't take it in a vacuum, which is what Machiavelli at all did. They took that cross section. They did an excellent comparison to a bunch of other um, hominins and hominids and hominids, but they didn't consider it with all of the other material. Which, why they did that, I don't know. I don't know that why they didn't consider them all together. I don't think that it belongs to Salamanthropus, but I'm also not an anthropologist. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we joke. Me and Walker joked about this before you get got on, but so what's the what's those species were on the ark? What's the those? Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a question. I, uh, I I do love the 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 argument about who is who is an ape and who is a hominin. It's like asking. You know, this is the classic. It's like asking who is the canid and who is the dog. Um, it's silly and it's a dumb. It's, it's, the be it's the best way to determine how transitional a transitional species yeah. is. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I love the yeah. phrases are still around in a, a million years or so. I love to say, this is this is the Chihuahua kind. This is the poodle kind. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, we got we got Sahelanthropus, and and we've got the questions about whether or not this guy is moving around um, bipedally or even upright. And then you got a Roran. You got a Roran tugenensis, whose name means original man. And a Roran is the next guy, kind of on the list, six-ish million years ago. And uh, this guy, I think we can say with, with decent confidence is, is a biped, right? An, albeit an awkward one, but you look at the, the, the femoral head because we've got some great femur material from Aurora. And, um, and this guy's probably moving around on two. Um, whether it's in the trees or on the ground, again, is the question because the, therein lies the problem. Up, upright doesn't necessarily mean terrestrial biped. So we're, we're, were we still like, were we an omnivore at this point, herbivore still, or are we, are we going the carnivore route yet? Well, we go back and forth, but but as far as obligate omnivory, you know, we generally speaking, Artipithecus ramidus, who is in between auroran and your Australopithecines, is, is pegged as an omnivore. But then the Australopithecines, um, both gracile and robust, you're seeing some heavy, heavy herbivory in from these guys. Um, a lot of the microware of these teeth, especially for Paranthropus, I mean, these guys just have these megadont molars in the back. And they're sitting around all day grinding up their food to the degree that they've actually got um, a, a mandible adaption where they grind from side to side instead of up and down like we do. Uh, I, 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 would, I would like to think that they are the pandas of the uh, hominins. <laughs> because yeah. they, are, they are like, they, are like they, they don't eat bamboo, at least I think, but they eat they eat mostly vegetation. Yeah. Tubers, sedges, yeah. grasses. I mean, they're sitting around all, likely, in all likelihood, they're sitting around all day long and eating like nothing but the facile Australopithecines 
who, who take this a different direction and are in all likelihood um, primarily frugivorous, but with opportunistic omnivory. I mean, that's we're, we're pegging them as something more similar to our extant panins. Yeah, that was my next question. Up, uh, you mentioned it earlier. What's the difference in the split between the, the robust and the grass Yeah, yeah. Basically, I mean, the, the jaw robustness, the size of their molars, just how heavy set their skulls were, um, mm -hmm. stuff like that. You've got a nice sagittal crest on these, yeah. on a lot of these paranthropines. And that sagittal crest is for the anchoring of the temporalis, right? So you've got these really massive jaw muscles. And they're not for doing anything but chewing grasses, sedges, and tubers, <laughs> which, again, you can tell by looking at the micro on their teeth. They've got these nice slicings and pitting patterns, uh, very similar to what we see with gorillas. But like gorillas, the thinking is that they probably preferred the delicious sweet fruits when they could have them, but were, were fallback species. So when, when times were rough, they could indeed process these uh, grosser, drier, uh, but very, very robust um, and uh, consistently around foods. Mm -hmm. I think you're humming with me. Um, and, uh, is, is, is there like a, maybe an, uh, an explanation of why we have to split between the, the grassile and the uh, robust assortibitacines? Maybe, maybe is there like a mm -hmm. sort of niche partitioning happening there? It's probably climatic change. And it, I mean, it's probably going to be we, we get this massive change in the paranthropines who are consistently later than the assortibitacines. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, paranthropus, all of the paranthropus species were contemporaneous with members of genus Homo. Uh, yep. Which is incredible. So, so some people propose uh, the big question, of course, is from who did Paranthropus split off? Right? Was it the like of likes of Australopithecus anamensis? Uh, was it something earlier, uh, or was it as late as Australopithecus afarensis and uh, Africanus? Uh, we don't know. That's again the the cool part. But the the grassal Australopithecines go extinct, at least according to current current. Because that's the um, one sad part about this big game, this hunger, big big Hunger Games we had in Africa. I know. Sorry, Walker. Uh, oh, I was just going to say um, that the idea of niche partitioning being a primary driver in the evolution of, you know, paranthropines and early genus Homo. Yeah, that, that's a that's a very well um, established idea in paleoanthropology. My yeah, he keeps coming up, Professor Strait, my my minor advisor. He's mm. one of the ones that was doing the work on paranthropus teeth and their diet and he was the one figuring all that stuff out and that's basically his position so yeah. you know it's a it's a pretty well supported position for sure yeah it's it's an interesting deal i mean we tend to forget that a lot of the hominins were living contemporaneous with one another uh, and exploiting different resources that's the name of the game um and and it used to be a much more crowded place in africa yeah. on, on these plains and, the, um, and depending on how far apart they were, that they, they might be interbreeding, interbreeding with each other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's another good question. How much hybridization is going on? Mm -hmm. um, it, you you get you run into some interesting issues with the remains, particularly of the grassile australopiths, because you know we we've got such a variable um, uh, species going on here, or, or a genus, I suppose you would say. Um, the, the, the big question, of course, and, and what I care about is, is are they sexually dimorphic? We don't know. Um, recently, some of the most recent work in 2015 has come out. My advisor is of the opinion that they were sexually dimorphic, but some 2015 research came out and was essentially like, all right, if we're comparing Lucy, one of the smallest uh, Australopithecus specimens that we've got with uh, Katamunu man, uh, one of the largest Australopithecus species that we've got, uh, specimens that we've got, we see what has to be this massive, massive sexual dimorphism, but that's not considering all the intermediate specimens. So what we might actually be seeing is is variability um, uh, temporally, because we we can't actually place as it living at the same time literally, right? So you might have these um, uh, kind of comings and goings of larger body sizes and smaller body sizes across a hundred thousand years. But they might have been very sexually dimorphic. I mean, they, they, it, depending on how you measure it, you can have them falling in line with humans as, as slight to moderate dimorphism in body size, or they could fall in line with gorillas at, at 50%. Males 50% are greater um, than, than females, uh, which is pretty intense. But what we do know is that their canines are not sexually dimorphic. That we can say with certainty, which it's not very common that you've got no dimorphism in the teeth, 
and a lot of dimorphism in the body size. Usually these two are, are linked, but we're also dealing with the hominins, which lost to our heavy canines very early. So maybe if there is dimorphism, it would have lent itself more to, to this body size um, and large scale intimidation rather than, than the teeth. Uh, which you know, I just love that. I love that. I love the teeth. So I'm I'm biased. But so uh, have we have we started getting getting less coarse hair fur at this point, or are we still are we still a little big coarse hair bunch? We don't know. That's a really good question. I mean, I I'm from what I understand, the the most recent like thinking on the matter is that the Australopithecines were still pretty hairy. Um, I mean, we. Need, I, I think the way that they kind of gauge that is in accordance with efficiency on bipedality, because once you get very efficient bipedal locomotion, you start to lend itself. Let the organism starts to lend itself more to uh, persistence hunting, um, which would require efficient and numerous eccrine glands for sweating. So I don't know. I I tend to think. I mean, they tend. To, it's pretty hairy, but until we can get. I mean, the hair doesn't preserve, right? So yeah. until we can get some good genetics. Good question. So, I heard, at least in the videos, old, old, at least the old history videos, that, that we st eventually we started getting, eating bone marrow. That's going to be later, probably. Okay. Um, I mean, the the thing is, is that you know your your Australopithecus members, and I'm speaking about the grass isle ones. I know I, I tend to. I don't know how you guys feel, but I tend to be like, if I'm talking about robust australopithecines, I'm like, it's paranthropus. Yeah, so, for sure. I, we're on the, we're not the robust ones. We're the others. Yeah, we're grass. grass yeah, we're we're grass isle. I keep on um, trying to say, I keep I keep on to say gentle. <laughs> well, that's pretty much what it yeah. means. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's you. You've got like these much lankier organisms with you know very kind of uh, slender jaws, at least in comparison. Yeah. And you see them, you think they're slender, but-, but you It's, just, it's something you wouldn't expect. Like the stereotype is that the, the vegan is like really, uh, really uh, like meek and uh, small. And they even like the, the, the meat eater, like really buff and uh, strong, but it's the other way around. With these, with these yeah, in reality, uh, the yeah. pranthropines are basically Expectation, vegan expectation, reality. They were really <laughs> yeah, vegan. Right. I wouldn't- I wouldn't want to run into a paranthropine. No. Like it, if yeah. you're seeing these guys out in, I mean, these are these are guys that the males probably could have clocked you and, and killed you. I mean, they they are heavy set beefy animals. And that, yeah, beefy boys, large absolute units of of hominids. And then you've got these our poor little piddly uh, grass isle australopithecines uh, are mm. are wandering around, you know, scavenging. Dip, you know, and I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I think it's pretty. I think we've got pretty solid support that these guys are using at least tools on the level of of panins, um, yeah. associated scrape marks on some bones and things like that. Um, so you know, they're 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 the kind of guys that are, are walking around eating fruit when they feel like it. Ticks hair loss, yeah, novel tick, but yeah, yeah. But the hair loss is an interesting one. What do you guys think about the? Uh, what do you guys think about the reason for hair loss? Uh, I, I found I found this paper uh, a few uh, days ago. I think it's me, me interesting. Like uh, there is a hypothesis that uh, the ancestors like were, they were like they had really uh, bad uh, parasites like ticks, for example. Mm -hmm. And then the chimpanzee yeah. solved the problem by excessive grooming, but we solved it by uh, losing our hair, or most of our hair at least. Hey, that reminds me. Speaking of ticks, what's that thing about where? Our head lysis so similar to chimps, but our pubic lysis similar to gorillas. That's a fun one. Yeah. Erica? The impl the implica go. Implications is a bit uh, embarrassing. Although perhaps, <laughs> not, perhaps not, hopefully not. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's it's necessarily embarrassing, mm, but. Yeah. It, it's, it's an, it, that's an interesting one. I, yeah, I don't really know what to make of that. I, that, that tale is a bit, it's a bit grotesque. In, in the sense that how how we're requiring these different types of, of body lice, um, if, me, if you want you want to my memory is look my memory is poor on this one Walker do you want to take it? Well, it, so <laughs> the the idea is essentially that there are two species of lice that inhabit human hair, right? You have the head lice or crab lice, and then you have like pubic lice, mm -hmm. um, and phylogenetically. You know, oh, you, I, you thought, I thought the, the uh, pubic lies were the crab lies because they are called. Oh, wait, crabs, yes, you're right. right. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but 
you know, so you would expect that, like, you know, either these colonization events happened after, um, after these different lineages diverged, so there wouldn't necessarily be correlation between, you know, hominid phylogeny and these hair lice phylogeny. Or the opposite hypothesis would be, you know, these mat like they, they were ancestral, right? We inherited the lice essentially from our ancestors, and then you would see a matching of the different species of lice with uh, the same pattern of uh, humans. Well, not necessarily humans, all hominids. And interestingly, um, well, so it does match the phylogeny, essentially. You can overlay the lice phylogeny with hominid phylogeny. It matches quite well. But there's yeah. one anachronism there, and it's that the human head lice matches the chimpanzee. But the pubic lice is actually a sister lineage to gorillas. Um, so it, it sort of opens the question as to how we got pubic lice from gorillas. <laughs> like, 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 were we always, was it, they both always there and it separated, we lost our hair, or was it there later? Come yeah, later. It, it could be something like incomplete lineage sorting, but, well, actually, no, I don't think it can, because I think the, the divergence estimate between yeah. uh, the pubic lice and gorilla lice is like two million years or something like that. Well, so it was something around the time of Homo habilis or, well, you know, Paranthropines. Do, 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 gorilla, do gorilla lice also uh, just uh, go o all over the body or just in the same area as in us? Like the, uh, well, the so originally, the before we, we did a phylogenetic analysis of these different species of lice, we had assumed that, you know, the pubic lice and the head lice share common ancestry that's relatively recently, and they split off whenever humans started losing our hair, right? Because, you know, it, it almost creates two islands of hair for them to inhabit two like separate ecosystems that are relatively difficult to traverse just because you know they're not super close they don't interact too terribly often like a uh, con con continental drift or a <laughs> yeah yeah sort yeah. of yeah it's a sort of an isolating event yeah. um whereas you know other hominids don't have that divide because they have more hair than us I mean, do do do, do it, the the lives of gorillas, like the, the, the lives that they have, do they only uh, prefer one spot, or do they occur all over the body in them, all over the body? I I don't know. I would assume it's more or less all over the body, yeah. but I'm not totally sure. I can't say with any certainty there. Yeah. I, I, well, I think also, unlike also, oh, sorry. I think unlike us, they they have more they have they have more places to roam, and are less hairy. Are yeah. Less hairy body. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's it's exactly. it's interesting. It's not even that we're less hairy. I mean, we have the same amount of hair follicles, more or less, than than the likes yeah. of panans. Uh, gorillas, I believe, are a little bit, are are quite a bit hairier than than us and the panans. Um, but our hair is vellus hair. We have very fine hair all over. Yeah, we, can, we, we, we see a, a bug coming out. We can we can see it more than they probably could. Yeah, I and some people propose that this this ability to assess potential mates for parasites is is what caused the hair loss i tend to lean more mm. toward the, we, we're living on an open savanna and we're in a lot of resistance hunting it's hot we need to sweat we've got to come up with some way to cope with this intense heat uh because there aren't any uh really consistently savanna dwelling primates today that are um that are hominoids right i mean we've, we've got yeah. you know circopithecoids that are hanging out but they they kind of deal with it in a different way. A lot of them <laughs> shade. Yeah, yeah. Very that, very very one, funny. One, one could make the argument we already have uh, compared to the other primates. Humans are yeah, the, the, the yeah. sexy. Yeah, that you just did a video. Yeah. Uh, you just did a video on our sweat sweat loss like last week. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, water efficiency and sweating. I mean, these two things are, are irreparably tied. Um, because of, of the environment that we're living in. Humans yeah. are hominins. We're supremely adapted for, for this, for our climate, as is typical. Right. You know, we, instead uh, of seeking shade, though, we tended to just say, you know, screw it. We'll deal with the heat. We'll, well just sweat. I, 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 it, it, it maybe has also to do with the fact that we, like, uh, tend to, like, uh, or at least the, the ancestors tend to, uh, like, uh, did long-distance running, pursuing prey over, uh, like, a, a basically just... Uh, an endurance contest. Like uh, eventually, they will tire out, but we, with our sweat, we will stay active for a longer time, and then we can go for the kill, basically. Yeah, and, yeah. and 
to that to that point, we also are better at and you know than any of the other hominoids at bring water. So even though we sweat our water, we're still more efficient with it. We don't have to to consume or rather uh, imbibe as, in as much water as as our um, as our cousins do. So we even though we're losing it all over our body pretty much all the time, but especially in heat, we're still better at managing our water. Water efficiency right. and water management was a huge hominin. Uh, um, specialty, especially once you get into genus homo. I mean, the australopithecines, we're looking at organisms that are probably still pretty hairy. They're not that good at sweating. Any meat that they're eating, they're probably scavenging or, or getting quite lucky. Um, and they're still likely spending some time in the trees. I mean, we, we look at kind of our, our why do feathers preserve, but it seems like fur doesn't, or am I wrong? I'm wrong, aren't I? I, I don't know. I mean, I think most of our feather preservation is just really good luck. And uh, you've got 170 million years to preserve some feathers. Like you've got I, seven I, million years to preserve fur on yeah, the Yeah, there, there, there are some birds that have like a uh, few naked sp spots. Like for example, the, the the vultures have their entire head and neck basically naked, and that's probably mm -hmm. because they they get very dirty when they are eating the carcasses. So oh yeah, right. And also and also ostriches. Like ostriches have like their head and neck are, are naked, but only their their wing feathers. They still have wing feathers. Perhaps maybe for a type of sexual selection, but I also have heard that they, they can cool down using the feathers basically too. Like they can like generate air currents to cool themselves down with their uh, wings. So it's maybe also I, yeah, a reason. I, yeah, I I think that I think it's I don't think there's a bias towards feather preservation over hair preservation. I think it's it's a nice sampling bias due to yeah. the period of time that we've got. To, because we've actually got preserved fur on some of our our mammal fossils, you know, we've got yeah. Darwinius nasale is a great example. Um, we've we've got that nice ring of fur on this whole animal, uh, but Darwinius nasale Ida fell into a, a highly eutrophic lake and was preserved at the bottom. Right. Whereas the hominins, most of the hominins are, you know, falling into pits or being carried into caves or you oh, know. Maybe not. <laughs> oh, maybe they yeah, not. <laughs> It's just not conducive to to fossilizing any of the fur. We're not, you know, we're not seeing that kind of taphonomy in the areas that that the hominins are or, or being carried uh, in giant nests. About the 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 sweating, uh, like uh, uh, we we probably lost our hair because of more efficient uh, heat regulation. Like we we with the less hair you. You evaporate uh, more uh, of your sweat, uh, and you can cool yourself down more easily than with the th thicker fur. But uh, like, uh, if if the parentopines uh, were not really that, that active, would, would that mean that they were more furrier than the gray, the gray soul or the gray? We have no idea. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting yeah. question for sure. It could yeah. be. It could be. I mean, these guys these guys are sitting around probably uh, and and browsing all day. Uh, it, an interesting thing too is that these their their postcrania is pretty robust, which doesn't really, I mean that that kind of clocks well with what we expect from uh, organisms that require these these really complicated hind guts for for absorbing right. nutrients from a lot of grass. Like your your obligate herbivores um, or even habitual herbivores, they tend to have more complicated guts than us monogastrics that that consume quite a bit of meat uh, and mostly rely on easy to digest or uh, uh, vegetation like fruits. Uh, so, you know, the, the, uh, okay, uh, sorry. Uh, we, we, sorry uh, would the, uh, the grass all, uh, also the pitocines, uh, like uh, do active uh, pursuit hunting, like uh, like running mm -hmm. on after play or, or? Yeah, we, we have no idea. I'm inclined yeah. to believe no, because we're not, australopithecines, while they're fine um, on two feet, and they certainly were, bipedal on the ground they, these guys weren't knuckle walking we know that for sure um right. the big bull-shaped pelvis for a really nice uh, pelvic floor for holding those organs when you're moving around upright a mostly inline halix or great toe uh we're, we're seeing a, a femoral head that is much more in line with later homo than than anything we see in the panin valgus knee they wrote they wrote Oh, we, totally put the, Erica, we, put, we totally put that together ourselves. That wasn't a real thing. Uh, yeah, I, I love that. I really do. I really do love the answers in Genesis. Mm. Also, Lucas Afarensis as a, as a knuckle walker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, I mean, golly, that that's just such a stretch. I, I, I honestly hate that 
reconstruction with a burning passion, <laughs> even though it's quite well done. And you know, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, I, I'm sorry, he keeps coming up, but that the the paper that they based that on was once again by my professor. I asked him, and he said, no, that's not correct at all. That's yeah. very dumb because his paper. He wasn't. He's never suggested that Australopithecines were knuckle walkers. He suggested that humans evolved from some sort of knuckle walking ancestor, and Australopithecines retain some plesiomorphic characteristics, like a uh, right. there's a distal ridge essentially that is for when you lock your knuckles when you're knuckle walking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. and that's that's what they based it off of this ability to to lock the knuckles. And I mean, yeah. it, this this would be. I, I don't even know what how you would compare that one plesiomorphic trait versus the suite of, of apomorphies for this standing upright blows my mind. I, I can't even imagine thinking that that <laughs> Australopithecines were knuckle walkers. No one proposes that. Um, okay, I have two I have two questions real fast. One, do we know if any of them left Africa before the, the Homo genius? Um, it it depends. It depends. Homo floresiensis and Homo lusinensis are, by some accounts, more Australopithecine-like than Homo-like. Um, there have been buzz in the paleoanthropological community that maybe they should be defined as Australopithecines. And if that's the case, then some Australopithecus must have left Africa at some point. Um, but it could be that they've just got these, these that they're kind of relic hominins, you know, that they've kind of got these, these basal traits that were conducive to the area that they live. Um, we don't know. Uh, it's it's a really good question, but I I, 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 I have heard like a few years ago. Uh, I've heard like there was one European hominin, at, at least. But I, I, don't, I don't remember specifically what species it was. It, it wasn't Homo, I think. And th I think Arne Ra also mentioned it in one of his videos on the uh, Nobel's flood, if I remember correctly. Uh, maybe. I mean, I, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking like when, when you're looking at dispersal out of Africa, um, the out of Africa hypothesis, and Walker can correct me if I'm wrong on this, because I know he knows more about kind of the, the later genus Homo and those those dispersal events, but it applies mostly to Homo sapiens. Like Homo sapiens is is coming out of Africa as sort of a single, as a single group, but there yeah. are dispersals prior uh, yeah. from other hominins. Because, yes, I, cause I, know, I know, I know of the, uh, we split, we split, I, th I think we split from the Neanderthals and the Ophicians when they came out of Africa before us, and then the, the Homo erectus came out of Africa even earlier, and they, they lots of splits there. Yeah, they, they, they went all crazy. They, uh, so, out. Yeah, the, the story is a bit, it, it's a bit more convoluted just because there was so much hybridization and interbreeding back and forth between African populations, Middle Eastern populations, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yes, that is generally considered to be like yeah. The primary cause of speciation between humans, Neanderthals, and Denisovans. Um, yeah. yeah, and then and also if if uh, the the hobbits were came from the habilis, and that's even another this came out thing. Depends. Well, yeah, and then you've you've got some people who even think Homo habilis and and associated species like uh, Homo gatineensis and Homo uh, rudolfensis that they've got more Australopithecine like traits too. I mean, you've got to, the, the problem is the line's got to be drawn somewhere. And because we've got such a gradient, it's very difficult to decide where that is. Um, generally speaking, you can be a hominin if you've got a, a hints at bipedality um, and you've got a reduced dentition, especially those canines and a more parabolic trending palate, which is why we started at, at Salanthropus as a hominin. Now, what the difference between Australopithecus and genus Homo is becomes even muddier because you've got Australopithecines that have decently large brains, sort of as we're moving moving more recently um, on on the timeline, and you've got uh, Havilins, quote unquote, uh, that have really small brains. So, and then you've got the whole issue of of regional variation and potential for sexual dimorphism, and it becomes a, a huge muddle with regard to who comes when right and you can't really draw this linear this linear pathway as far as so and so beget so and so beget so and so beget so and so instead what we're looking at is this one gigantic transition right as traits are moving from from the basal suite to the derived suite and this includes efficient bipedality large brain case size the dental arcade 
uh, and and things of that nature. You you, you, know, you look at these family trees. You know, we we go at the at the split. Like lots of them are totally different. They never hardly any of them agree. Sometimes, like, are we connected to this branch or that branch? Or do we bluff the yeah. Other? One one really confident stepwise move that at least my human evolution textbook will make is they feel confident enough to say Australopithecus anamensis probably is in direct lineage with Australopithecus afarensis. And then they will very tentatively link, and I don't know about this one, Artopithecus ramidus as prior to Australopithecus anamensis, but as eventually moving it down the line. And if that isn't the case, then I am of the opinion personally that the Australopithecines are probably not as dimorphic as we think they were. I think that we know with, with relative certainty, at least this is what I get from the, uh, the, the main, the big head honcho on canine sexual dimorphism in primates, uh, Michael J. Plavkin, Arapithecus ramidus is not dimorphic in its canines. The males and females are, have decently large canines that project beyond the tooth row, but unlike chimps, which are moderately dimorphic, slightly to moderately in their canines, um, the Oshul, or the Artipithecine, or Artipithecus ramidus not. Neither is Artipithecus cadaba. And if that's the case, it has huge implications for how we're assessing um, the Australopithecines, in my opinion. But that being said, sexual dimorphism can come and go relatively quickly. Uh, it, it's not necessarily once it's there, it's there forever, or once it leaves, it's gone forever. It, it, it's dependent a lot on sexual selection. And preferences change. And those preferences might change depending on the climate. If you're a female and you're living in an area that that is, you know, super arid, you might find there's a merit in picking a mate that that has is good enough at securing resources to be as big as he is. So it's much like oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's much like oh, sorry, sorry. I was gonna say so. Sexual selection was a thing back then to, in our ancestry too. Maybe. It's always the thing. <laughs> yeah, what Walker said. It's sexual selection is always, always, always at play. And when we're talking about social species, this is even more so the case. Um, female choosiness and males comp males competing. That level will switch around. Um, what the level to which males are competing for for access to females and females are actively choosing their their males is heavily dependent on environment, it's dependent on group size, it's dependent on just a, a myriad of different um, of different factors. And we tend to impose social systems based off of levels of sexual dimorphism. And I don't think that we can do that. I don't know that we can necessarily make that move. Gibbons, for instance, are, are monomorphic. They, the males and females look identical, except sometimes they've got pelage difference, the, the colors of the fur are different. Um, they're super aggressive. They're, these are not peaceful animals. So, so the idea of imposing on Artipithecus ramidus that these are the peaceful monogamous uh, apes is is let's see. I want to make stupid jokes. I'm appearing disappearance of the male genitalia, coming and going. Womp womp. Good one, Nestle. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and you compare that with like um your your calatricans, right? Your your modern marmosets and tamarins, who are also monomorphic, and uh, they they mate for life. I mean, they're not even socially monogamous. They're like like true true monogamous truly parabondic um and they're really chill so 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 we, so we didn't ma so we didn't make the like the walrus journey where we, we, have, we have a big harem of one big male and like all the all the females go to him well maybe i mean it, it depends because some people propose that the australopithecines yeah. were super super dimorphic and they might have been i am just of the opinion that if you're going to make the link with artipithecus ramidus you're almost making that move that at least with anamensis, we're, we, you know, you have, typically speaking, acquiring sexual, dim sexual dimorphism takes longer than losing it. At least uh, that's... But there's also been a, a cultural element, like, for example, today with humans, there are also cultures that are, like, uh, uh, they have uh, polygamy, and some other cultures are, like, a mo monogamous, or mostly monogamous. Well, and, like there's a, and, there's a, and there's a recent push for uh, polyamory for acceptance of polyamory too. So, well, yeah. polygamy, polygamy is also supremely different than one sex polygamy, polygyny or polyandry. The, yeah. the, the social conditions to get a polyandrous primate 
are very unique. That's one female with access to multiple males. And uh, species that twin a lot, like marmosets, one female will, she, she'll, she'll do paternal confusion, right? So she'll mate with two males and then both males think that the offspring is theirs. So she's got two males kind of working to keep her happy. And, and neither male knows if the offspring is his. Then on the other side, you've got polygyny with gorillas um, where you've got a harem situation, one male, multiple females. But interestingly enough, in some groups, you've got both. So in gelatas, for example, these circopithecoid primates that they're Ethiopian baboons, essentially, they live on these vast highland plains, um, you've got multi-level organization. So they live in groups with multiple males and multiple females, but the small groups, you've got one male, multiple females, small harems that compose a larger group. Primates are, con primates are confusing. They're, they're super social and they creating these arbitrary groups and then losing them when the climate changes. Yeah, with brain bug here, I was gonna make that thing. I'm just glad we don't have it like the arthropods, where as soon as the, the as soon as the male mates with the female, it becomes the female's lunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm you, also you, quite glad about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you don't mm -hmm. you don't want to be uh you don't want to be an arthropod because you know when you don't want to be an arthropod male. Usually, if they're especially not, them, especially not a prey mantis or a uh, spider. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of a lot of the sexual dimorphism that we see in arthropods favors females. In fact, mammals are unique in that the sexual dimorphism is male biased. So males are typically larger than females in mammals. In the majority of the animal kingdom, this is reversed. You, you've got and, and it has to do with um with your your strategy for reproduction. So if you're a female and you have to lay a lot of eggs, which is the case with a lot of organisms that aren't mammals, yeah. um, you want to be big. Right. You, you've got to be big in order to to produce a lot of those eggs. And if you're a male and there's big females, it, it's usually conducive or it's usually um, uh, conducive to your success to be a bit smaller and a bit sneakier. Um, but that's not always the case. So, yeah, sexual. I love sexual dimorphism. I think it's really interesting um, mm -hmm. in, in both ways. Uh, there's a question in, in the chat. Oh, out of Africa, too. I, did, I have not heard of it. Maybe. Can you clarify, I mean, Lisa? I mean, is this idea, is this the idea of like a humans leaving Africa two separate times? So you've got Homo sapiens leaving at one point and then leaving again at a, kind of in a punctuated fashion. Um, could happen. I mean, I, I don't know nearly as much about late genus Homo as I early like, genus Homo. Like, uh, maybe she's like, uh, maybe she may, I think, that, I think in a long time ago, there was this theory about we left Africa after maybe we, we left Africa once, and we went on the East Coast around, you know, Australia, and then maybe after the uh, the big Toba explosion, we left Africa again and went up around again. Well, but, there were. The, the, okay. Oh, go ahead, Walker. You go ahead. Well, I was just going to say there are anatomically modern humans that lived outside of Africa that actually I don't, I don't know if they necessarily count as anatomically modern humans because you know they lived before the last common ancestor of living modern humans, right? But morphologically they pretty much had all of the uh, synapomorphies and autapomorphies that characterize modern humans. Um, there, there's And there's some skulls from the Middle East and stuff that have these early modern humans, I guess. I think that's probably the best way to describe them, early modern humans. Although, although like, uh, uh, the out of Africa, I, I think it's not really conducive to, uh, like, view it as one single event. Like, for example, like, yeah, uh, for like, sure. we, like, we, like uh, uh, I, I helped uh, Jack Sweet about a... Uh, a video i think it's called the ancestors tale where we mm -hmm. talked about like where we talked about uh, the uh, how different humans are related to geneal genealogically speaking like uh, there's, there's video, actually, yeah yeah that's actually a good a good like with, with uh, just simple or, or complex models of population interbreeding between continental groups there's actually a really good chance that, that everybody is descended from one person living in asia like a few thousand years ago so th th yeah. there, was, there was also humans going back to Africa too. So it's not it's just it's like one uh, one thing going from Africa to Eurasia and you're done. There's always a, 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 a back and forth between different populations oh, as well. Back migration. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's you know obviously we know that humans interbred with Neanderthals. We still have you know introgressive elements in our genome from Neanderthals. Um, and recently in the past two or three years, the, the traditional story is like, oh, all humans outside of Africa have introgressive elements from Neanderthals. Um, within the past few years, we sort of found that 
even sub-Saharan African populations that you wouldn't expect to have Neanderthal DNA have Neanderthal DNA. And one of the most likely explanations for this is actually back migration, right? So humans would go to the Middle East, interbreed with Neanderthals, and then go back to Africa yeah. and, you know, have kids with the people in Africa. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like the, uh, the, the terminology that Concordance uses, the, the, uh, the, the genetic bucket chain, basically passing all the genes from one neighbor to the next to the next and such, and then they will eventually make their way in Africa. I heard that not many of the African ge people genomes don't have very less of, of hardly any of the Neanderthal DNA. Yeah, they ha so they have very little Neanderthal yeah. DNA. Uh, you know, traditionally, all non-African populations have about one to four percent Neanderthal DNA. Sub-Saharan African populations have about zero point three, right? Yeah. And, and that also is it's possible that that's statistical noise. Yeah, they, um, they, they are less ooga booga. <laughs> yeah, but um, <laughs> interestingly, though, also the the areas that are hypothesized to be intergressive are typically non-coding, which suggests that one of the reasons that most non-African populations carry Neanderthal and Genesovan DNA is because we were sort of just stealing their genes because they were already adapted to Europe and Asia, you know? Yeah. So that's kind of cool. Is that a term for it? Like where you, where you basically steal, quote unquote, steal genes that are It's adaptive just called adaptive. Your... Yeah, it's called adaptive introgression. I also heard that. I also heard that we have, uh, it, was, it was more, I think this is right. It was more. I, I remember when it was a wisp. It was it was either more Neanderthal males and and female Homo sapiens, or male Homo sapiens and female Neanderthals. Past genetics, I forget which one it was. We had more. Um. Of. Yeah. Oh crap! I. All right, I, I will have to get back to you on that one because I actually I do know the answer. I just can't remember. <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, boot, boot, boot that walker's way. I want to make a quick correction though from something kind of we were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, as far as I'm aware, the current literature does not associate the Toba super eruption with the oh, bottom yeah. of the human population. Um, that was an idea that was tossed around for a while. But when you actually go and you 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 look at the tufts from the from the volcanic eruption in Indonesia and you associate with populations uh, that were that were milling about in Africa you can't make that you can't make that connection we, we can't make it at this point um, it could be that it had an impact but but as far as what caused the bottleneck it's not generally assumed that the Toba eruption is responsible if, if memory serves the current idea for what caused the bottleneck is just the founder effect it's just people leaving Africa finding finding founding new locations and um and and kind of inbreeding for a while prior to mixing and that's why we have more genetic diversity in africa than we do the rest of the world yep yeah right for exactly sure. so they, you know that's and that's an interesting one because they uh the yeah speaking of the creationists yeah they do they do love to talk about the bottleneck they love this idea never mind the fact like this is hilarious to me speaking of things about creations that are hilarious they love they're about, they're about <laughs> Well, yeah, they, they love to take conventional ideas and be like, see, see, this matches what we think, you know, like uh, the Carney and Pluvial episode and assigning that to like, it, it rained for two million years. Look, there was a global flood. It's, okay, it's, but, it's the, uh, no, the Nostradamus yeah, but, uh, effect, yeah, basically. Yeah, but even, <laughs> even, even if it was true, that bottleneck happened 7,000 years ago, like 7,000 years ago compared to the, to the 4,000 years ago bottleneck, totally, totally different. That yes. is, that's exactly the problem. Like with the bottleneck or with the Carnian pluvial episode, we're talking about a period of two million years of the global moist climate, and we're talking about a bottleneck that is significantly older than what they need. So you know, it's significantly to, older than they think the world is. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So alluding to some event and then being like, "See, see, this works for us," and then uh, you know, applying it to what they think that doesn't work. That, like temporally, it's not possible. So. And that's why they have to do the whole, well, radiometric dating doesn't work unless it's carbon dating less than 5,000 years and used to like validate the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, where's the line? Where does it stop working? And why does it stop working there? That it, it blows my mind that these people, you know, I, I mean, listen, this is, a, this is about hominins. Let's talk about hominins, not the creation. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Much so, more fun topic. So, Let's so yeah. So, 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 you, so since you put all that, all that time making your your presentation why don't you share it yeah maybe we, 
Yeah, yeah, we can see it. I mean, it's just yeah, a. Yeah, I, 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 I want to make the, all the work, all that work go for nothing. Well, it, it's it's a PowerPoint I've had for a while. I just I edited it a little bit for for this presentation, but I actually made this years ago for for a conversation with my IRL creationist colleague. Um, and but I can show it. Yeah, I mean, it's just I like the visuals right. in it. Right. Yeah. I'm so sorry for sure, presenting. Uh, like I, I was presenting like the uh, uh, interesting paper yeah. or review of it that I found, it. and that doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so Black can you, you guys see all this? Yeah, yeah, looks great. All yeah. right. Um, yeah, so living hominoids. Uh, yeah, the key traits to focus on when we're looking at human evolution. You know, we're looking at um, bipedal locomotion and the the different kinds of traits that go with that. This is a great picture for, for looking at the traits that must change, head being, head being held vertically, our large bulbous crania, a reduced prognathism, a shortening of the lower back, our wide bowl-like pelvis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then this is a real comparison of the differences between um, a human skull and the skull of a modern chimpanzee, which they share a lot, but they are different in a lot of ways as well. Um, for one, you've got this really nice, heavy superorbital um, ridge for, or brow ridge for, for your chimps. We could go on to, to that for a long time, but I mostly just want to show um, some of our, our fossils that we've been talking about. So this is the skull of Sahelanthropus chidensis, um, brain case size, what we see in chimps. It's got a lot of very classic hominin um, traits, but it's mostly just a Miocene ape. But the big key is that foramen magnum, as you can see here in the chimpanzee, the uh, angle of the foramen magnum and the location is is much more um, intermediate when we're looking at Sahelanthropus chibensis in comparison to what we see in Homo sapiens. We're going from this acute angle down in chimps to something that is approaching a right angle, still obtuse. Um, and then once we reach Australopithecus africanus or africanus, depending on who you talk to, we're seeing it finally get acute um, or finally grow. Oh, yeah. What is the angle about? Like you said, just brain size, or does it, like, uh, what does it correlate to? The, the angle. What does the foramen magnum correlate to? Oh, for, oh, for uh, is this for the foramen magnum? Is this uh, the angle? Yeah. So the foramen magnum angle and location is oh. related to bipedality. So it's related to how you hold your head when you walk. Um, right. a, a frame and magnum that is nice and underneath the skull is supporting um, this this classic upright, um, right on the top of the vertebral column, the skull, like almost like a lollipop, right? Uh, and being able to move efficiently with that head um, being held high on top and bearing the weight directly underneath the skull. Um, and this is kind of a nice way of looking at it. Sahelanthropus has a foramen magnum that is intermediate of chimps and modern humans. Chimps being something that is obligately quadrupedal, uh, and knuckle walking and modern humans being obligate bipeds. Uh, or in Tugenensis, we mostly just have the femoral head, this animal. Uh, we, we definitely just associate, approximate the brain case size based off of associated species. Uh, there's some really great work on the bipedal nature of Aurora and Tugenensis, and you just have to do look at the femoral head, and you can see that this animal is is trending towards bipedality. Uh, Archipithecus cadaba and member of Artipithecus. I love Artipithecus. I think it's a great genera, <laughs> a great genus rather. Um, and this guy is also going to be a biped. But the interesting thing about these guys and about Artipithecus rambidus as well is they're still holding, let's see if I can find a good picture of it. Um, yeah, so F down here at the bottom right. These guys are still yeah. holding their, their helix to the side. They've got a super divergent helix. In fact, it's more divergent than what we see in Pantroglodytes. And yet, it's really? still got this frame and magnum that's more bait or that's more ventral, more held underneath the skull, and its hips are more similar to Homo sapiens or to Pentroglodytes. So what that suggests is that potentially this organism was capable of moving about bipedally in the trees really, really well, and then was somewhat awkward when it was moving bipedally yeah. on the ground. Or uh, was a biped. I have, I have a question. I have a question. Like, uh, given that the, uh, that the Arapithecus has, has so many uh, plesiomorphic uh, features. Is it also possible that Arapithecus is actually more closely related to chimpanzees? Maybe a possibility, or, or is it more parsimonious to suggest that it's more closely related to our line? I think Arapithecus rhamnitus is definitely a hominin. Now, whether or not oh. it's within our lineage is is going to be up for debate. Oh, I, 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 I mean, not, not I mean, not directly ancestral. I mean, just more closely related to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I am of the opinion, and it's it's 
current conventional thinking that Ardipithecus rhamnus is closer to humans than it is to chimps. And the reason is because although it's got this very odd specialized toe, is not necessarily um, chimp-like. It's, it's unique to both humans and chimps. It's got a very unique way of moving about that we don't really see in any extant organism. So, you know, in my opinion, I mean, the hand is, the hand is more precision grip, more similar to, to a human. The bowl-shaped pelvis is more human-like. Um, the, the way it holds its skull, again, more human-like. And you've also got this reduction in uh, the canine tooth. So, I'm of the opinion that Artipithecus rhamnus is, is a hominin and is more closely related to humans than it is to chimps. Um, but there are people who push back on that. There are definitely people who push back on that. Um, okay. okay, I... I Okay, this, maybe this goes back to the uh, image I shared uh, earlier, like with the uh, the common ancestor living the trees with the hands up uh, above the head. Could the uh, Arapicus maybe uh, live like that, with the, uh, like the, the opposing helix on the feet, grabbing branches, the and thinking. then, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the thinking, is that this guy was definitely girl, actually. So Artie is, the, Artie is, is thought to be female, the, the flagship specimen. Um, but she, you know, she's moving around in the trees for sure, that that back foot, that orthograde posture when it's in the trees, is definitely going to to find itself in that that divergent helix. That's great for gripping the le gripping the uh, the limbs of the tree while you're moving around. Yeah. Uh, but that's okay. So, so, okay. Sorry. sorry. So this time we we were we were going on we were we were on the ground, but we were occasionally going back to the trees for like maybe. I would I would argue that right. we're in the trees and occasionally coming to the ground. I would okay. argue it's the opposite. That that yeah. Arpithecus rhamnus. Is there any the sign of? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, I so there's a delay. Sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. Go ahead. Oh, uh, is there any sign that Arpithecus was knuckle walking too? Like I mean, perhaps on the on the ground when it was on the ground, it was knuckle walking or? Um, no, I, I believe that I believe it has the same locking mechanism that we see in the Australopithecines, but it's likely that that's a relic. Um, because this organism, again, it's everything about its setup, it biomechanically speaks to something that holds its weight upright. From from the shape of the pelvis, even if it's in the trees, it's moving about upright in the trees. So, right. so there is nothing with Artipithecus rhamnus that supports, in my opinion, a knuckle walker in particular. So, so Artipithecus it looks it looks a lot like the uh, like a, the, in the in the image that I shared earlier with the uh, like a uh, of course with the ancestor with the hands above the uh, above the head. It, it's it's yeah, more, more like that. More like that. Yeah, we're talking the bipedal clamorer. Yeah, you know, some, something that's moving upright through the trees, very similar to what we see in gibbons and orangs today. Right. Um, yeah. But not suspensory, so we're not seeing something that's hanging around, like using its arms to actually yeah. hang. We're talking about this something that is is clamoring with all four yeah. limbs. So, um, do we have the ability? Uh, were we tool using at this point? Potentially, um, but usually the the earliest tools are attributed to the Australopithecines and. Depending on how you group Kenyanthropus platyops, Kenyanthropus platyops, which is uh, I don't know, that's that's a real weird one. Um, this is an organism that is very very old, potentially contemporaneous with some members of Artipithecus rhamnus. Is probably using tools. Has this ortho uh, orthognathic face that's very flat, um, and and isn't classified as strictly as an Australopithecine. It's it's a very weird one. And we were definitely probably still prey at this point. No, yeah, sure. probably. Probably. Well, I mean, also, we pray now. <laughs> yeah, well, the Turkana boy is um, Australopithecine, right? Australopithecus africanus? Uh, Turkana? Yeah, Turkana boy is Australopithecus africanus. Yeah, yeah and he died from a, a, some sort of bird of prey, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, uh, yeah. So there was, we were definitely still getting preyed on at this point. We were not the apex predators of the savannah. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, would, I would even argue that being a meso predator, like, Pretty much once you get into the Australopithecines, yeah. you're looking at something that is a, a predator, like much like a fox, right? Like a yeah. fox preys on other animals and is also preyed upon. Uh, you, you remember the uh, the a uh, very old and faked uh, uh, YouTube video where, where there was like a baby being carried by an eagle, right? Do you um, re remember that? Uh, that, 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 yeah. that was faked, but for uh, Australopithecus of Francis, that was real, real life. Apparently. Well, yeah, I mean, you, yeah. For much yeah, they're they're smaller than we are. Most of the Australopithecines are. Humans are kind of big. I mean, we're kind of a, a big animal um, when compared to some of the other some of the other apes. Uh, we're by no means the biggest, but are, are we technically uh, a megafauna? Technically yep. speaking, right? Yeah. Well, 
Actually, wait, no. The the definition for megafauna is um, anything over a hundred kilograms. So I think. Oh, so some, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think generally humans are not megafauna. Yeah. In our ideal in our ideal form, quote unquote, probably not. Speaking of Takana Boy, I was watching a documentary a, a few years ago <laughs> about 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 him and about the early archaeology of archaeology. I, technology of, of that time and right at least a documentary i don't know if it was true or not because it might have been elaborate but they said that first the guy who discovered it was wasn't like uh a knowledge for it because that's the time around the time they had that one find in england and people thought people were more towards that than they were to the africa thing yeah they're oh sorry go ahead Walker. Oh, no, I was just screaming. Go for it. <laughs> oh, no, no. I was just going to say, yeah, coming, the, the origins of humanity being in Africa was a tooth and nail fight, um, mostly because people were really racist back in the day. Uh, it was really hard to, to finally get everyone to see that, yes, the cradle of humanity is East Africa. We're, 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 we are an ape species that arose um, in, in the African continent and very specifically um, likely in the east, as far as when when the hominins are first beginning, um, or in central of Chad, uh, seeing Salem Christians over there. But climatically speaking, it's it's very conducive to to hominins in East Africa seven ish million years ago, um, you know, and then we see this 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 migration down to the south, and in South Africa. Yeah, there's actually a really funny story about that. Um, the guy who discovered Java Man, I don't remember his name. I think he was some Dutch dude. Um, but basically, he discovered yeah. Java Man in like, yeah, he, he discovered Java Man in like 1908 or something like that. And this was the height of, well, this was around the time of, um, what's his name? Piltdown Man. Uh, uh, and, stuff. and so just nobody cared about Java Man at all. Like, just no one cared. And he personally thought that it was a, a super important find, and he was a huge fan of his finds and all that kind of stuff. And so out of spite, basically, he buried the bones, the original bones of Java Man, under his front porch. He's like, okay, if no one cares about it, I'm just going to, you know, put it in concrete. And after Piltdown Man was uh, sort of confirmed as a hoax, people had to go to his house and dig up the bones of Java Man. <laughs> Yeah, they, so they, find, you finally came back, huh? <laughs> well, yeah. And that's, yeah, that's that's the classic because Piltdown Man was hoaxed partially because there was this big fight in the paleoanthropological community of inhuman evolution. What came first? Were we a big-brained ape or a small-brained biped first, um, or quadrupedal ape, I should say, or or small-brained biped first? Um, and, and the answer with Piltdown Man seemed to point to this very prognathic, apish face with this big, big old brain, right? Because it's a it's a human skull, human maxilla, uh, back of the skull too. Big, and big then, uh, yeah, and an orangutan jaw that was then filed um, to, to match the proportions needed. Um, and, and with the likes of, of Java Man and indeed some of the uh, Australopithecines, what we start to see is, no, we've got this yeah. small yeah. diminutive itty bitty brained prognathic biped yeah. that's wandering around East Africa first. This is, um, also, this is also something that uh, the creationists often overlook is like uh, they, they say like oh uh, men just fooled the entire uh, evolutionist community and they were just blindly accepted but when when more evidence came in we saw more more fossils in Africa and also a different picture in the evolution of, of humans so so, and and that is how, and then slowly, slowly, even before it was finally determined to be fake, mm -hmm. the scientists were still questioning the how relevant Piltdown Man was to the human uh, evolutionary story. So it's not yeah. like they were, it's not, it's not like they were all just awing over the Piltdown Man, mm -hmm. <laughs> over the altar, like they were worshiping over the altar of uh, the museum, like, <laughs> but still, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the Piltdown Man thing definitely did play into biases. And I've heard yeah, right. people say that it, it set um, the study of human evolution back like 20 years or something. Right. It, it definitely prevented us from actually doing good science for a while. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As well, as well, the bias was mostly on the, uh, the I think, the British, right? The British, uh, uh, yeah. they, they, they were like all, 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 they, they were mostly all proud of their... Uh, 
the British ape man, right? Like, oh, well, yeah. wow, you human, humans came from uh, the island of uh, yeah, Great Britain. They, they love that. And, and yeah. the thing is, any, you know, most of the anthropologists worth their salt too were like, okay, this is really weird. Why is it that, why is it that someone is proposing the origin of humanity in the UK, yeah. climatically speaking, the opposite of conducive to any kind of ape? Um, it's not a good place to live if you don't have the, the big brain for uh, accommodating yeah. these, you know, these sort of, It's also a bit ironic, like, like the, the, uh, the falsification or the, the, the eventual realization that Pilta Man was a fraud actually proved Darwin right, because Darwin originally proposed that the humans mm -hmm. came from Africa. Yep. yep. So, yeah. yeah. And, and Wallace thought that uh, humans were a sister species to Gibbons, actually. So oh, really? Wallace was a bit wrong, but Huxley and Darwin were huge proponents of. Uh, the, they were they were really into the idea that we were African great apes, which is correct. Yeah, obviously. and yeah, you, I, can't, you can't blame Wallace either because the the posture of the gibbon really does lend itself to uh, some the, the the bipedality of humans. I mean, right. these little critters they got really long arms, but when they come down from the trees, they hold their up like this and they walk around on two feet. Um, <laughs> really, it's really funny to see them walking. <laughs> Yeah, they're yeah. very cute. Yeah, I just hate that they're still using the, that that thing against us. Like, oh, that was a that was a fraud. So all of it's a fraud. Well, well you obviously, can... in real science, no one cares. No one cares. <laughs> Literally, no well, one it's cares. a it's a it's a historical lesson, right? Like, it's something yeah. that's taught about. But at the same time, like, it's not. It, no one's including like Piltdown Man in any studies, you know? No. Oh my God, no! <laughs> and and the thing is that, like, oh boy. If you want to talk about uh, hoaxes of antiquity, like biblical antiquity that <laughs> that have existed through the years, I really don't think we want to play the hoaxes invalidate the entire field game um, because well, antiquity is chock full of them. Um, the, the the point is too like it's almost a blessing. Pilgrimage was almost a blessing in disguise because allowing for this this hoax that went kind of under the radar of some paleoanthropologists forced everyone to look at every subsequent hominin with incredible scrutiny. Mm -hmm. So now we know every fossil that comes through, everyone looks at it with a, you know, combs through the morphology with a fine tooth comb. Make sure, you know, give us the in situ pictures, give us, yeah. you know, the, the process of pulling it up out of the ground. Um, and, and, that's and, why, and that's probably why that one that North America was like immediately like struck down. No anthropologist thought Nebraska man was a, a, was anything but a a, um, a peccary tooth. The peccary, right, Walker? Yeah, that's what it turned out to be. I don't think right. they had a, any specific identification of it initially, but it was sort of taken and run with by like um, you know popular si or popular media and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. anthropologist this up and being like, ah, yes, a, a, a hominin tooth. You know, th this was this was randos who kind of picked up the molar and were like, oh, this looks kind of human-like, which, yeah, peccaries are omnivores. So a lot of omnivores have these same low-crowned crushing molars combined with slicing um, yeah. uh, uh, carnassals or yeah. um, premolars. Yeah, the question is how they, how they, the, the question was, uh, I, I mean, pretty, but how they, get, how, they, how they get to America in the first place right now, I, I, that time only, only primates in America were the New World monkeys that wrapped it over over that point <laughs> yeah and and you've got some really 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 old cretaceous primates as well um and um once you get kind of into uh the the, the cenozoic you see some of the early early primates popping up uh in north america um usually like the mostly adapids and uh, omamyids that that are popping up uh, and then they go extinct which sucks oh, did, did the primates first originate in uh, in, no in north america yeah um, okay. Although yeah. it, it so so it's iffy. It's yeah, iffy. We, we, yeah, we talked about that on our on our primate migration. That they they were yeah. you, said that, you said they were more primomorphs, the pre primate primates. Right. It's it's very difficult to pick the first primate. Right. Like Purgatorius was considered for a long time to be the first primate. Some people still think it is. Some people think it's a it's a Pleistocene form. Um, and uh, some people propose that like I think it's Ruanguea is in in Texas, definitive Omomayad. This is definitely a primate, and we've also got some adapids popping up here and there. Yeah. Uh, but as far as actual primate, things were still kind of crushed together at that point. So it might have popped up in China. It might have popped up in North America. You can't definitively say either way because primatomorphs are, are so similar to primates. Um, and what we consider a primate 
occupies that gradient kind of so it's yeah, it's, I get it's like, I, are you yeah, saying I, they I, are transitional yeah mm. <laughs> again, like with that line between primate morphs and primates like like with the line between humans and apes what's that usually it's just defined <laughs> phylogenetically yeah, yeah. but it's a and it's also interesting to note, like, uh, like uh, when you look at the uh, the, the, the complete uh, group of placental mammals, it it divides into like three major groups, like you have the the Afrotheres, which mm -hmm. are uh, which originated originated in Africa. They are the uh, the, the elephants, the, the uh, manatees, and tenrex. You have the Xenarthrans. They are in in South America, like the sloths, the armadillos, and such, and, and, and some some ant eaters, not all of them, <laughs> and. Uh, then you've got another group, the, the big group, the Boreo Eutheria, which splits mm -hmm. into the Laurasia theria, where, where you have like the uh, uh, the, ung the ungulates and the carniv carnivorans and such. And, mm -hmm. and our group is the uh, Uarcantogliers, which are, which like if I remember correctly, the Uarcantogliers originated in Europe. And so it perhaps the perhaps the common ancestor of like rodents, uh, rabbits. And primates originate in Europe, but then some of them some of them migrated to North America and then became pr the primates, perhaps. So maybe one possibility for the mm -hmm. primate ancestors. Yeah, I yeah. mean primates primates are very close with with rodents, uh, ligomorphs, and I, I think chiropterans too. I mean, genetically speaking, I, I don't know if it's as close uh, uh, as uh, uh, vegetarians. Yeah, the chiroptorums are now, like, they were previously considered close to primates, but genetics, mm -hmm. like, really, yeah, yeah. like, we, like, like, like yeah, I, I also They're very helped, basal, though. Yeah. 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 They're very basal bore mm -hmm. I, I, I helped uh, Jackson Beat with a, uh, uh, a video on, on uh, bat evolution, too. Like, uh, it's also, like, a, we, sh we showed how the uh, genetics really changed the position of bats really, was that the, really Was that the co-op he didn't read? Sorry? The battle was that the co-op when he did co-op with Tony Reid? Oh yeah, yes. Exactly. This is another one, yeah. Uh, and that was also an interesting idea about the bat evolution. Like one like the bats uh, basically divided into two groups, traditionally speaking, now not anymore, but they were they were used to be divided into two just the small tiny micro bats and the big mega bats, and the big mega bats were once considered to be flying primates, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, so is that not like are, are microbats not monophyletic anymore? Uh, no, no, not not anymore. Not anymore. No, that, like the the, the right. megabats, oh. the megabats uh, nest nests within the microbats now. That's interesting. Yeah, that's new to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, back to, yeah. yeah, back to the brain size and jaws. I I heard I heard that some some uh, part of the thing that our brain got bigger is because we we got the ability to chew our food more easily. We had more room for our brain to grow. Yeah, so some people think that the the shrinking of the dental arcade had to do with um, allowing for that brain to, brain case bro growth rather. Um, so you know, shrink the jaw and make room for this big globular skull on the back. Um, a recent paper, though, in that to be the case when we're looking at the paleontology, that we don't actually see the shrinking of the dental arcade correspond so strongly with this growth of the brain case size. Uh, which begs the question, okay, well, then why did the dental arcade shrink? Like, why did we get a smaller parabolic palate, smaller teeth, the shrinking of the canine mm -hmm. tooth row? Um, and that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not yeah. sure. This is, a, this is an interesting pattern in our overall morphology. Like, if you look at the, the juvenile chimpanzees, they are really, really human-like. When you look at the, at the profile, right? Like, uh, you have, like, a very big... A head and a small jaw, but when they grow up and become adults, then you have really, really these, uh, the, the jaw, like really, uh, how do you call it? They pro prognate, uh, prognate for, uh, forward. Yeah, right? they they, yeah. they get prognath they get more prognathic. Yeah. The yeah. orbital ridge gets more intense. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. We stay we stay younger in some sense. We like uh, the technical term is I think uh, neoteny, right? Okay, it's yeah. yeah, it's retained neoteny. At humans, yeah. absolutely. Our, our adult skull, our adult face is much more similar to our infant face than, than an infant chimp is to, to an adult chimp. Yeah. Um, and, and this is even more extreme in the likes of the, the circopithecoids. I mean, like a, a baby baboon has yeah. much more orthognathic face. And then you look at adult males and they've got a full muzzle. I mean, their muzzle is enormous. Yeah. And a huge superorbital ridge. 
Uh, have you seen like these uh, these realistic depictions of anime characters, like like with the really big he- big eyes and such? These are really no, but that's uh, well, it's really, 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 really creepy. But th- that's, that's basically well. that's, that's, basically, that's basically how we look from the chimpanzee's perspective. We are like really oh. like ba- baby uh, baby uh, apes of baby uh, like uh, like the, adult, adult yeah. babies. Yeah, yeah. Let's say off topic. Got a spammer on my on the Twitch stream of this broadcast. Oh Twitch no! Stream. Oh my! Yeah, Twitch. We, we, yeah, yeah. We can we can become famous by buying buying views. Nice. Oh no! <laughs> but, anyway. but, but, but might be might the uh, uh, smaller job be called just a consequence of neoteny, or is it maybe a more more uh, deeper reason for why we have smaller jobs? Or might, well, might, it, yeah. it could be. I mean, it, it might be too just just a metabolic consequence of of eventually growing to cook our food. I mean, we yeah. we do we do experience that that reduction in canine tooth size, but our teeth stay pretty megadont until we, you start getting into homo. I mean, megadonty is like one of the defining characteristics of australopithecines. Um, mm-hmm. Big, I, you lose the canines, but you keep the big teeth, or you don't lose them. You you reduce the canines, but you have got these big old honking teeth, big incisors, big molars, um, big. <laughs> And molars, yeah, and so it, it could be that it's big chunkers. It's, yeah, yeah, big, big. It could just be that it's it's a result of of eventually um, uh, get, getting into kind of genus homo, right? Um, and and just being able to cook our food and being able to to consume meat that doesn't actually involve biting organisms with our teeth right. or pulling them apart. Uh, it's also, yeah, it's also interesting to see like. Uh, I, I've seen like the, the evolution of uh, uh, herbivorous mammals. They, of, they often have, they often divide their mouth into two parts: like a crop, and like a, a space between with no teeth, like a, 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 a toothless space, and then you have the molars behind it. Mm. And the reason why the, the division is that like, like herbivores first grab the food with the, with the crop, the crop front teeth part, and then they chew with the, the back teeth part. But the primates. They basically manipulate the food with, with their hands, and mm-hmm. that's why they have this, this the same division in their mouth, basically. Well, and and the thing is too is primates are almost universally <clears throat> opportunistic omnivores. So even when we're like, yeah, you know, herbivorous primates, it's like yes until it sees a bird egg or a lizard <laughs> or an right. insect that it can come mm, in and eat. protein. But, or yeah, the case, of, the case of chimpanzees hunting down a monkey. Uh, or or um, uh, diker too. Um, yeah. Bonobos are they love diker. They'll go after little antelopes all day long. Um, <laughs> I thought you said a biker, and I was like, dang. <laughs> yeah, bikers. Yeah, they go after. They love the bikers. They, yeah, I, 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 I remember when I first saw a video of like a, a chimpanzee, a chimpanzee chasing down a. Uh, I don't know which species of monkey it was, but it was a monkey with a, with a, with a oh, tail. And it, it's, yeah, it's probably. And, and, and they, they just snap the, the limbs of the monkey. Like, I was like, oh no. Well, that's, oh. that's an interesting thing. Yeah. Um, they don't, they don't, even the, the primates that are, you know, go into carnivory intentionally, like your, your panin, so bonobos and chimps, yeah. when they capture prey, they don't use their teeth. They physically rip it apart. Yeah. So the, the the canines, that's partially why, like Panin, so chimps and bonobos, while they've got these really big, and you can see in the back here, they've got these really big, impressive canines compared to us, but they have actually already had a reduction compared to some of the other hominoids. So so chimps have smaller canines than some of our Miocene apes, for example, yeah. um, which is very interesting. They they don't need them. They use them mostly for intimidation, but even then, male canines aren't that much bigger than female canines in in um. In chimpanzees, mostly fight with their with their arms and their strength, um, and that's how. Don't go, go don't go in a fist fight with a chimpanzee. You will always lose. Yeah, all, unless, it's a, unless it's a baby, but then of course that's not a fair fight if you fight a baby. I, I mean, I I honestly <laughs> might even lose to a baby chimp. Like those yeah. things are pretty. Those things are pretty lanky. They're pretty strong. Unless you're a gorilla. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, you really don't want to go. A, a oh. silverback would just rip you to pieces. They, those guys are. They are big boys. There's a reason they don't have any natural predators. Yeah. Um, not really. Anyway. It's, it's, also, it's also an interesting question. Like, why, why are we so weak compared to the other apes? Because we don't need to be strong. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Big muscles are very 
like they have a very high energy cost, right? Why why grow big muscles when we can just throw an atlatl or something? Yeah. I, well, I, I, and 20 percent of what we eat goes to our brains. Like our caloric I, caloric intake is uh, the brain is an energy like suck. It it right. it requires so much to be going. Suck. And the other big part that we can't forget here is that we're a cooperative species. Males and females and males and males and females and females, all of us get together in these big groups and we use these big groups to beat other or kill them or hunt them or, right. you know, protect yeah. ourselves. So it's it's kind of an it's, interesting it's, 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 for, it's the same form like uh, the, 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 the remake uh, of the reboot of the Plant of the Apes where Caesar was like, oh, one twig, we are weak, but we're a bundle of twigs together, it's we are together strong. strong. Is, that the, for, yeah. is that the 60s version, the, not, the, the last version or the new version? No, it's the James Franco yeah. Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Yeah, well, it, it's cooperation and big brains. If yeah. you have those two things, strength is an absolute waste of time. Yeah. You don't need it. It's also yeah, imagine, also, if we, oh, okay, so imagine if we branched off from the robust hominids instead of the grace style hominids. Mm -hmm. Well, then, you know, I mean, if we'd probably be, we'd probably actually have flatter faces than we do now. They've, they've got these really orthognathic faces, some of those paranthropines. It's, right. it's really weird to see some of the depictions of them. They've almost got flanges, um, like like a like a, a orangutan would. Right. Um, but yeah, you, you want the perfect recipe for losing muscle mass. Um, and in fact, you can add a third one to it because, again, we're persistence hunters. We're runners. We can run better than almost every animal on the planet. Um, so, so you've got between fast twitch muscles and slow twitch muscles, right? Like the slow yeah, you, twitch, you've got yeah. persistence. You've got a persistence hunter that lives in groups that uses tools, and it, it is a recipe for a an, a weak upper body short of coordinated ability to throw. Are you okay? Because I think we have also like more fine muscle control. Like when when a chimp uh, manipulates things, they are really they, they they use a lot of more strength to handle things. But we use more fine uh, manipulative movements with our hands, right? Maybe. Well, and that's and that's why we we can like even though we're three times weaker than a chimpanzee, we can deadly throw a, a spear or even a baseball more, yeah, more, um, with more power than a chimp can. A chimp can only lob. They can't coordinate all that strength into an actual precision throw yeah. uh, we can and so we, you you know you put a, a sharp rock or a pointy stick into the hands of an ancient hominin and it may not be able to beat a chimp in arm wrestling but as far as killing we're, we're deadly with that i mean yeah. that's that's right. our specialty yes yeah, so it's like you know, so speaking of running, do, do we get that way running towards our prey or running away from our predators? Uh, as as far as persistence hunting, it's definitely chasing something down. Okay. Um, we, any predator that's coming after a human or an ancient hominin is is going to be fast in the short run. And if we're not near a tree or near our friends, dead. You cannot yeah. outpace any of the predators yeah. on the Savannah. They will. Like we, we, are, we, are, we are among the even though we can uh, run for a very far distance for a very long time without stopping, we are very slow too. <laughs> like we are the, one of the slowest animals on the planet. Yeah, well, our, at, at, at least at least the ones that can walk. Of course, I, I'm uh, I'm a bit of generalizing. Of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. God, Walker, sorry, you were going to say something. <laughs> You're good. Uh, well, I was just going to say it's kind of funny. Humans actually consistently beat horses in marathons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, we we lose know. the only animal that consistently outpaces humans, or there's a handful. So we'll only talk about the natural ones. Is like ostriches, pretty much. Ostriches and camels. They're really really good, and you know they're of course interestingly enough also involved evolved in these arid climates, uh, where it's very important to be able to manage your water intake and and continue for long periods of time. Um, no, I'll but now dogs come close too, right? Some dogs. Uh, uh, well, yeah. things like gray wolves. Yeah, things like gray wolves as well as uh, African painted dogs are also persistent hunters. So persistence hunters, sorry. Yeah. So they have a very similar yeah. adaptive strategy. I mean, maybe 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 the reason why time. maybe the reason why we really liked the dogs and the horses is because they could keep up with us. Or perhaps. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, yeah I mean our lifestyle our lifestyle demands being able to go kind of slowly forever. I mean we're 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 a terminator species. Like it, it, <laughs> We pick something it that we want to kill. Keeps and then... <laughs> well, I, I yeah, also... <laughs> we pick something we want to kill and we chase it for three days. That's how we roll. And I also, I also heard we, 
or we destroy its forests. I, I forget where it was at, but we heard, I heard that we, we had the hardest time domesticating or, or taming African animals because we grew up with them. Literally, they're used to us. I mean, that, that I don't know. That that could be the case. It, it's certainly interesting that we didn't domesticate anything until dogs, and and that was what 40, 40 fifty thousand years ago, depending on on who you talk to. Um, it, it's recent, not just in like the grand scheme of things, but oh, even the, in, in our evolution as did, a three hundred. Did, did we domesticate, did we domesticate uh, dogs before we went to ag agriculture? I think we did, right? Before, like dogs were yeah. older. Yeah. yeah, we we domesticated dogs before, and that was like yeah. the first thing, yeah. pretty much. And and it wasn't even intentional. Of course, I, I heard they didn't. They, I heard I heard they domesticated themselves first a little bit before we we, we went and did the rest of the way. Yeah. We accidentally selected each other. Is how that went. I mean, yeah. it, it's really nice when you're when you're living in the you know on the steppes, and there are all of these critters that are bigger than you that can kill you, you know, in an instant. To have a built-in alarm system and they gained our refuse piles and we gained early warning system for meaner predators yeah. um also i, it, I have the, the, oh, oh go ahead I, I i have seen like a video i think it's uh, the youtube called ccp gray who has like mm -hmm. a, a video explaining why we domesticated horses and not the zebras because zebras in the oh, yeah, well, well, well while they are in africa they their social group they are, they are they aren't really nice to each other no not even to you of course not even to humans but with horses they have like a specific social group like with one leader and uh, the rest are followers so if you if a human domesticates the leader and all the other ones just, just follow along with the leader so you can more easily domesticate the horse compared to the zebra it's it's also no coincidence that we domesticated another omnivore um you know, it, it, the, the domestication of the wolf, which are omnivores, people tend to think of them just as carnivorous, but they actually require um, the, the, the plant matter and the guts of the creatures that they eat in order to be healthy. A pure carnivorous diet for, for a dog, for instance, is, is horrible. Yeah. Um, cats, on the but other when hand, you, when you eat, when you see your dog eating grass, take a hint. <laughs> Give, right. give them more veggies. I, <laughs> yeah, but, but interestingly enough, the, the next animal to domesticate was cats. Um, it was dogs first, and then it was cats, and they were both incidental. Humans didn't intentionally domesticate either of our companion animals. Uh, they, we, we domesticated one another. It was, a, it was a mutual decision where we tolerated their presence right. and they tolerated ours, and we found this nice symbiosis with one another. Um, it, Pests away in dogs. It was helping each other hunt and and yeah. feed and and warn each other. And it's yeah, been, it's been, but it's also it's been initially to, like a, like a, we are planning like Jackson Newton and, and I and also a few others are planning to do another video on the uh, the farmers tale where we go into mm -hmm. the origins of uh, agriculture and, and the yeah, same thing might that be true. Last yeah, he uploaded that video last night. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, I I have I have I have seen it seen yet. But, uh, of, uh, like, I can I can explain. There was also a. Uh, like uh, the same thing might be true with uh, us and our uh, the, the crop that we uh, cultivate because the initial the initial pressure of uh, humans and the plants that we cultivate might have been also accidental, not not deliberate domestication. Like the plants, in the in the absence of the big megafauna that uh, that uh, uh, basically disperse their seeds, the plants now well, uh, now are uh, in an environment dominated by humans, and then and then the it's more beneficial for the plants to attract the humans for seed dispersal. Uh, is it is it true? I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I heard before we before we knew that Neanderthals and them were, were our sister group that we thought they were our ancestors. We went through. There was a, a lot of controversy about where Neanderthals fit, um, because so the first Neanderthals were discovered in the early 1700s, right? And this was in a time before we even knew about like extinction. Um, and so they just thought that these were like arthritic humans, essentially. Uh, so the very first two Neanderthals that we found were just misidentified as, you know, modern Homo sapiens. Um, it wasn't until the early, or not or the mid 1800s. It was in 1850, no, 1840 something. I don't know. I just did a video about this, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, Been so, there. Yeah. The video um, comes out and it's out the other ear for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was in the uh, the early, you know, or not the early, I keep saying early, it was in the mid-1800s. Um, it was discovered by this dude who worked at a, a quarry site, like a, you know, they were an industrial mining site, and they found these bones, they handed them off to a school teacher, and the school teacher was like, oh, well, that's weird. And so the school teacher presented them, and then like two years later, 
Darwin's Only Origin of Species came out. And, you know, there had already been evolutionary ideas like Lamarckianism and all that kind of stuff going around. So they were already sort of considered a, a, a species of human in some respect. But for the first 50 years of their existence, they were either characterized as a, a direct ancestor of humans, or they were not humans at all, and they were just some weird ape, right? And unsurprisingly, it was mostly creationists saying that, no, they're just an ape. They're too stupid to be humans. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas... Yeah, be, whereas be a lot of special. early evolutionists were the ones that were saying, oh, this is actually a direct ancestor of humans. Obviously, both are wrong. What's more wrong? We, we, we be special. We be special. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I heard that actually Neanderthals might have a bigger, might have a bigger brain than, uh, than we'd have. They did. On average, they did. Yeah. They did. Yeah. But it's, it's more, it's more like they, they were bigger in the back end of the brain, right? Like, like they, it's they didn't have really, yeah. It's yeah. an occipital lobe uh, a pressure. Um, and, and they paid the price dearly for having those large brains. They required a lot more calorically um, to maintain these large brains, metabolically speaking, than, than we did. Uh, and it forced them to be specialists on the organs of the org of the animals that they killed. Oh, really? Um, on, on, yeah, they, they actually, we find butchering sites and they leave a lot of the meat behind. The muscle attachments are still intact from, you know, they don't, it doesn't look like they are actually carving the meat off of the bones. Uh, the hash marks are all around organ hotspots. And that's because the organs uh, are really, really high calorically, like the, especially the brain. They they did a lot of crushing. But why, why, why didn't they also eat the muscle? Why, why did they just left the muscle? Because they butchered. Because they butchered on site and they butchered often. It wasn't worth it, calorically speaking, to to kill an animal, a single animal, and take everything from it, wow. than it was to kill multiple animals and steal the organs that are that are calorically beneficial to them. I don't know that, and, 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 so, and maybe, maybe that's also why humans, uh, or, or at least at least Homo sapiens. Because they, we, we, we take the whole animal with us, I think, right? Well, not only that, but we're generalists. So yeah. we were we were able to eat. We, we had a lower caloric. And humans can survive on a lot lower calories than, than we thrive on, right? And, um, and so like, we, we, could eat, we, we could eat a lot more stuff. We're, we're garbage cans as far as what we can eat. We can eat almost anything. The definition of a generalist. It's yeah. just humans, you know? We're great at it. And we, probably, we can we can, we can eat more things than our dogs even, and our, yeah, especially cats. So the cats are really hyper carnivores that, that they, they don't. Uh, yeah. Well, and and we're great at eating plants that are supposed to be poisonous. I mean, right. we eat we eat a lot of plants that are you know deadly to a lot of other animals, and we do it for fun. Like we eat caffeine, for instance. Like yeah. with, that's also right, uh, with maybe maybe our, it's also maybe the leftover of our primate ancestors where we eat a lot of like leaves and uh, we we we. we yeah. Like develop a high tolerance to like uh, uh, natural pesticide that plants produce to uh, chase well, away. Even, oh. even compared to them, our stomachs, even compared to other primates, our stomachs are just incredibly robust. Oh, really? It's actually quite hard to poison a human compared to other organisms. We oh. are highly tolerant. Um, and it's because we're, we're generalists we, we, and we mix with each other. So we spread out to all these different locations and acquired you know, decent resistances uh, to, to certain things certain foods for, you know, and, and gaining certain things like a lactose tolerance, et cetera. And then we come back and we interbreed with each other and everyone wins. So we're just, mm -hmm. you know, it's actually funny. I was just thinking about that the other day. Cause I was like, man, I feed my pets like purified water and like all of these, you know, things that like, I, I, you know, I wouldn't even feed them like my food. Like I eat junk yeah. food all the time that would probably <laughs> kill 99% of animals. Yeah. Well, right. it's, it, it, it's that and it's we eat like random rare stuff. Like if you if you drop a human in the middle of nowhere, right? We're probably gonna be able to survive on whatever we find. Like what's the edible range of things for humans is is huge compared to other animals. Um, now our, our big flaw is that we can't just eat any grass or, or you know, no. plant that we find and have that actually be nutritious for us. Being an opportunistic or not opportunistic, uh, obligate omnivore means that we've got a really nice range of things, but we do have to combine it all. We can't specialize in one or we lose out on the nutrients. Yeah. Um, so, you know, eggs and bugs and plants and fruits and all sorts of different things, meat, uh, we scavenge, we, we actively hunt, we do all sorts of different stuff. Uh, we fish, that's another big one, is that we'll, yeah. we'll just go to the coastline and comb along the beach and, and eat what we find. It's, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah, I heard. I, I also heard that like with, with, it was our fishing skills, the Homo sapiens, that gave us some, some of our brain advances too. 
Well, potentially, I mean, we it, it's I think it's less that and it's yeah. more our, our ability to eat whatever. I mean, ancient Neanderthals, for instance, too, they, they were capable of combing along the beach and, and eating crustaceans and, um, you know, different tidal pool animals when when they felt the need to. Uh, but the, the advantage of humans is that we just didn't need as much calorically and we could run for long periods of time. Um, yeah. and, and there's, also, there's also a possibility that, that our uh, fire, like cooking with fire, is, is also giving give us an even more bigger range of. We, yeah, uh, we, we unlock the extra calories by cooking yeah. things. That's another, yeah, that is another yeah, one. Yeah, and something are in, inedible without cooking, even. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, that's true too. That's true too. Break it breaks down certain dangerous yeah. uh, chemical elements of, of the food. What, 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 what was the, the, the tuber that is toxic without cooking? Like I think it's cassava, right? Without cooking, or what was another uh, tuber? Uh, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know There's remember. a lot of tubers that are like that. There are a yeah. lot of tubers and root systems that that are like that. But yeah, we we eat any and everything, and um, yeah. and it makes us great at withstanding climatic change. Yeah. You know, when with Neanderthals, they have to chase, they have to follow the food. Um, they can't. Right. They can't just sit around and not incorporate meat into their diet. They they have to incorporate these large animals and particularly a lot of these calorie rich organs. Um, and so, you know, when the climate changes and their prey animals move, they have to follow it. Humans can stick around wherever we please, and we'll probably find something to eat there. It's the reason why we were so good at colonizing basically the entire planet. And similarly, one of the most adaptive cercopithecoid monkeys is the rhesus macaque, which has a gut that's very similar to ours. It, they can, they're, they're the raccoons of the East. They eat whatever they want. <laughs> And, and, and they get it whatever they want. If they ask us, uh, uh, like, uh, where they are revered as holy, or, or I don't know, I don't know, uh, they get it, like, they are like they are associated with a, a, a monkey god, right? In uh, some areas of yeah, Hanu, Hanuman yeah. Uh, yeah, is one Hanuman. of them, but yeah, yes. they they get they, yeah they get worshipped a lot. And and coincidentally, right. as a side note, pretty much every culture that has monkeys living around it has some kind of um, mythology that relates to that monkey that has. Yeah. Oh, the monkey comes from humans, or the humans come from the monkey. It's it's. Oh really? Kind of, yeah, it's it usually spiritual elements to it, but they notice the similarities. Yeah, and I think I think it's maybe the reason why, like uh, like a hardcore creationism originated in in uh, the Europe, where there are no probably. primates. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Yeah, probably. I I, I wonder I wonder like uh, about yeah. that. there are also no no stories about like that in uh, the Americas, or because in, or maybe in South America, maybe where there are are uh, like the, uh, the 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 New World monkeys? Maybe there are some legends there. But I don't know. Are there, survive, are, there, are, there, are there surviving legends from like the South American, like a really ancient? Yeah, uh, they've, they've yeah. got they've got monkeys incorporated all into their mythology. Um, yeah. Howlers and spider monkeys and tamarins and all sorts of stuff. They 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 love monkeys down there, but they also right. eat them sometimes. So right. <laughs> There's yeah, that. On most tree, on most trees that I see on, online, there's no, there's no real connection between the orthopithecines and the homos. Do we know where, anywhere that connection might be? Which branch? Uh, like, like, who begets who? I, I mean, Australopithecus afarensis and Australopithecus africanus have a lot of similarities with um, uh, Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis. Those, those guys. That's a very uh, fine line between those guys. It's also. More particularly, Australopithecus sediba uh, and Homo habilis rudolfensis and gatungensis. That line is very thin, and there's a reason people are like, "Oh, some Australopithecines should be in genus Homo," and then some people are like, "Well, some members of genus Homo should actually be Australopithecines." Um, that to me, a, to me, that doesn't really matter. Like, it's, it's, wrong, yeah. it's, an arbitrary, it's an arbitrary distinction uh, at this point. Yeah. Always yeah. has been, always will be. Yeah. I, I, I'm I'm waiting for the anthropologist to, to, to just say, all right, give uh, we give up on taxonomy. Let, let's uh, go with the phylogenetic uh, a phylo phylogenetic code system. <laughs> right. Yeah, the, the the biological species concept. You know, yeah. it's time to stop. It's time to stop. I know, so I was, I was confused. She's like, since we, since, since we never, since we're always, what our answers were like, are we still like the author? I, I still can't say that. I still can't say that word. Yeah, that's that's an that's an interesting one. I, I I think it's more for convenience than anything else. Like people name the Austral business, but you're right. I mean, if if we, it, that's why the the hominini is like a whole thing, right? It's it's kind of like um, a way to umbrella us in, but we'll never know. I don't think you know who we well maybe we will i don't know if our if our dna retrieving tech gets even better like 
maybe we will, or we find some really well-preserved australopithecines. But I very much doubt that we'll be able to actually draw a direct lineage uh, back well, through the australopithecines to say we directly came from this one. Yeah, well, the, the thing is, pretty much any you know phylogenetic comparison that you do with australopithecines and genus Homo will show that like australopithecus is paraphyletic, right? It, almost every you know study you do will show that like you know australopithecus africanus is more closely related to us than afarensis, uh, yeah. than it even is that australopithecus africanus is to afarensis, just because afarensis is more basal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess so, that's also why uh, most most family tree uh, phylogenetic tree species. The, most things are cousin species instead of direct ancestors. Like, oh, this is a yeah. cousin species. Well, it would, and that's and that's why when someone's like, okay, it's humans probably came from an Australopithecus like ancestor, something that probably was very similar to you know Australopithecus afarensis or our family tree. Was it actually Australopithecus afarensis that then migrated south and and begets Australopithecus africanus and and then even we see genus Homo emerge. Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. The, the point of these transitional species is to show how this transition can occur, not how it did occur. Um, you know, it's it's very similar to the, uh, in that way, it's very similar to the work on abiogenesis, where it's like we can show can come about, but we will likely never be able to show how it did come about. Yeah. Um, Until we get that time machine uh, mm -hmm. of, of our station to, to go back and absorb it ourselves. Oh, really? Fingers yeah. crossed. It's, it's, uh... Uh, it's, it's really interesting. Like, uh, like uh, if you look up the, uh, the the concept of taxonomic boundary paradox, where I like, can you screen share uh, me for a moment from that here. I guess okay, it's like the concept where we talk, we've talk, talked about, like uh, here, with, uh, if you if you have uh, the whole the whole fossil record complete, then a taxonomic system of classification becomes impossible. Yeah, because uh, then uh, then you will, then you will have a situation where oh, one mother. Is a, is a different species, a different genus, a different, even a different family than the than the daughter uh, at some point. It's yeah, really, life, yeah. Life, yeah, life does not care about the arbitrary boundaries that humans want to create, and it's always been about it's always been a gradient, and it always will right. be. Um, and that's you know always. I don't know that's what makes it so fun. <laughs> so yeah, so, it's, it's like like when when you when you were talking about. Uh, the difference between oh is this an australopithecine is this another homo or what is it then you are you are getting to the point where the false record becomes so complete the boundaries become meaningless anymore mm -hmm. yeah right yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's, that's, how, that's how you know you have really you need a really good fossil record there yeah, yeah. yeah. that that's the point that's the that's the problem right is that we the fossil record is getting too good um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a good they, problem to have. Yeah, they say we only have a few. They, they say we only have a few uh, bones here and there, but we have like a lot more than that. <laughs> yeah, they say. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, Walker. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say one of their favorite things is like, oh, we could fit all hominins into the back of a pickup truck or something. Why? It's like, yeah. dude, do you know how many bones you could fit into the back of a pickup truck? First of all, like. <laughs> And a you, lot. You, you, you can stack them pretty high, <laughs> too. Yeah, you know, if you're if you're doing Tetris stacking, or even like if you crush them up or something, like you could part, put a lot of, of people into the back of a pickup truck. Right. Well, you you could have like the complete you could have like the complete uh uh phylo or phylogenetic uh, paleontologic history of like all beetles, and you could probably fit them in a back of a pickup truck because they're so small. Um, I mean, oh, it's it's a mean yeah. it's a totally meaningless or well beetles. Yeah, there are a lot of beetles. I should have picked another. <laughs> Brain well, to get yeah, but also yeah. arthropods don't fossilize very well, so I think also, that right. also sh sh shouldn't <coughs> like if creationism is true, shouldn't there be none, like nothing at all? Yeah. Like it's, it's like That's it's true. like oh you oh sure you have evidence, but no, look at how small it is. Like <laughs> the problem with creationists is they don't care. That's yeah. the problem. Like I I've grown more jaded as yeah. the more time I spend talking to creationists, and a lot of I should, I should them. yeah, a lot of them don't care. Um, I, so I've I, I've seen I've seen the arguments uh, going from oh there are no transitionals to oh we should expect millions of them to oh well we there oh there, we there, there might have, God God just created transitional fossils they don't know okay. what they think they don't right. they, because they don't have a model they they don't yeah. have any way to cope with this which is why Jensen oh God I I hate that we're talking about this on a, a science show but that being said. <laughs> 
Um, it's important to note that like they've been dragged kicking and screaming into the concept of nested hierarchies and now they're pretending they predicted it all along as if none of us have been paying attention for the past 150 years when they've been saying there are no transitionals, there is no nested hierarchy, cool. Show me a single source that was creationist in origin that was even okay with the idea, let alone one that predicted it prior to 2012. You won't find it. Yeah, before we go back to our main topic, yeah. I was going to say, I, I watched your, you were on the, uh, uh, Dan's uh, Thousand Prescriber Marathon thing, mm. and, and you back your Reddit post. You, you said the Reddit, you, Reddit creationists were smarter than the YouTube creationists. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. They they one hundred percent are. Um, the the thing is, is that at least the ones on Reddit come up with original arguments. The ones on YouTube just regurgitate what they find elsewhere. The ones on Reddit, you know, I mean, we we had some regulars that would at, at least they were creative. You know, I mean, I, although I will say we have had a couple of and Walker can Walker knows this, you know, as well. We've had a couple of online YouTube creationists that come up with original ideas. The problem is they're horrible. They're they're awful. <laughs> like they're you know, they don't, they, they're not copacetic with anything else that that same individual says. So, you know, the, the, the fact, like the, the, the lesson learned of dealing with online creationists is that they really can and will just say anything, you know, as long as they can stave off the immediate dunking that they're experiencing, they will contradict everything else they have said in the past. Or, or when they are being dunked, then they will just remove the video. Yeah, I right. mean... It, I think there's a. I can speak of experience. Yeah, no, I, I'm yeah. just saying like there's there's very good reasons that you know if if a professional creationist hasn't touched a topic, there's probably a good reason that they haven't touched the topic. Uh, they have at least somewhat of a reputation to you know like they have to have at least a some sort of pseudo credibility. Right. 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 Yeah. Oh, so, I, I, have to, I have to clarify, they, they did not just remove the video because, of course, if you, if you are being corrected, you can remove the video afterwards. But they said nothing about the correction. Like, they just removed the video and pretend that nothing happened. That, that's that's yeah. the, uh, the problem. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I know it's just me, you know, some people like removing videos, not me. I like coming back in my old videos. I'm like, wow, I was terrible back then. <laughs> it's, yeah. I think it's a learning experience. If you keep them up, oh, yeah. you, you just post, hey, I was wrong about X, Y, Z. That, that's what you got to do, yeah. and and people are gonna make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Um, the yeah, important I, I, I part sometimes, is sometimes, sometimes I come across my one of my older comments of somewhere, and I see like, oh, why was I so stupid back then? <laughs> just a few Story years ago. Life. Just a few years ago, yeah. <laughs> like I have a video, like like six, seven years ago, where, where I where I was saying that I'm an intelligent designer. Of course, at that time I thought intelligent design was the same as theistic evolution. So I'm like, oh, I'm a I'm an intelligent designer. So I made a big thing about yeah, it. You yeah, yeah, you need to for that kind of stuff. Like everybody, you're you're always gonna make mistakes, especially if you're if you're on an online platform like this where every mistake you make is like immoralized. It's like you got to cut yourself a little bit of slack, just correct yourself and move on, um, and and that's all you can do. But yeah, we don't we don't see that a lot from our from our online friends, from some of our online pals here on YouTube on www.youtube.com. Yeah. So <laughs> going back to the Lucy Fossil Google Lucy University. Fossil. Um, where did the, where did we start? I know we have different uh, uh, diversity and stuff, but when did we get get more from the Lucy side chimpanzee people to the more taller Homo sapiens that we Homo that we have now? Oh, like body size wise? Yeah. Um, well, again, it depends on which Australopithecine you're talking about because Katamudu man uh, and Australopithecus afarensis specimen was five foot five inches tall, which is quite big um even for like that's that rivals some of archaic homo sapiens height so mm -hmm. you know you, you got to consider regional variation and um and indeed temporal variation uh different species today come and go almost in in a cyclic nature depending on their climate this right. sometimes you have bigger species and then they grow smaller as you know the the um the trajectory of the planet changes and then they get bigger again and then when times are good um, populations, I should say. Uh, I think they also be became like more or better uh, runners with uh, Homo erectus, right? Like better, like a better waistline. With uh, so you have a more, st more sta a stable gait when you are when you are running, right? Compared yep. to the uh, compared to the all sort of bitter scenes. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and and you've got some real basal looking uh, Homo erectus in in Demonisi. Um, these these guys have these incredible brow ridges. I mean, the 
their super orbital uh, ridge is just, you know, it's say helanthropus like almost. I mean, it's, it's impressive. Um, and so, you know, these sometimes basal traits come back in style, I guess you would say. Um, and again, that's that's the part where they, they, are, they are they are really being a ret retro uh, ret retro hominids. Yes, so, yeah, yeah. Sexual selection throws a huge wrench in town. Mm -hmm. You never know when something will pop up just because the females of the species were like, ah, oh, we're into that now. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> okay. Speaking of uh, Homo erectus, were all those they had a lot of diversity there. Were, were, were all of them subspecies or, or, or actually separate Homo erectus species? Good, good yeah. question. At, 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 at this point, at this point, it doesn't really matter to me. <laughs> like, it's, no. it's, it's, yeah. like you can you can say like, oh, we oh we, we for, for convention we just say that they are separate species or separate species based on a few distinct uh, differences on the bones. But in real life, I wouldn't be surprised that that they were all like into like really interbreeding yeah. different yeah, populations. Is... Like uh, maybe maybe you have a situation where with, like uh, with the uh, brown bears and polar bears. Like uh, oh yeah, they, they are separate uh, on separate continent or, or land masses basically. But when they are when they are together, then they, they just interbreed with no problem. Yeah, right. yeah when Homo naledi first came out, there was a bunch of debate as to whether or not Homo naledi was uh, Homo erectus or its own its own species. And to me, it's just like uh, it's kind of a mute point. Like I don't. Right. <laughs> It's its own distinct population, right? It, I mean, ha it has its own lineage, right? And that's usually where I leave it. Yeah, and, it, and, and that's the species, the species right. name and is just for convention at this point. Yeah. 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 Well, the next generation of the next generation of scientists are. I think there's going to be a big paradigm shift in how we address all this stuff uh, because you're, gonna be you're already. Gonna be, this is awesome. gonna be uh, ideally, uh, I hope there's yeah. a big paradigm shift. I mean, they say what what is the saying? Science changes as as old people die, right? Like the. <laughs> as in your, you know, uh, rolls over into the next generation, but there's this whole idea too of Species like is a construct. Wake up! <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's this whole concept too of like yeah. what, um, what, what caused something to evolve, and they want to find one thing caused something to evolve, one singular pressure. That's asinine, in my opinion. It's never one thing. It's always a bunch of things. You can say, okay, well, maybe the primary. Um, you know, pressure for, I don't know, uh, large brains to evolve. Oh, I think the primary pressure was uh, group size or sociality, or, um, diet or, you know, uh, development or whatever. It could be one of those things, but it's never going to be just one thing. And we'll never be able to, in my opinion, pin down, or rather we will very rarely be able to pin down which of those pressures yeah. came into play first. Yes, a spoiler, well, a spoiler alert. That reminds me, is it like a from yet yeah, next Saturday? You take me and uh, me, Jack and RJ are going to talk about speciation. Ah, Ooh. yeah, you're going to have a great conversation with them. That are, especially Jackson. Jackson is passionate about. Speciation. I'm, I might be also be able to uh, attend. I don't know at what time it will be. Maybe it will be at, uh, at midnight it, for me. It, it depends yeah. on when RJ wakes up and when <laughs> Jackson gets out of work. <laughs> cool. But uh, sp mm -hmm. speaking of speciation, some species. Why it does confirm now they're separate, but what why was it that, that we used to think that that homo the Neanderthals and, and sapiens were the same subspecies of the Homo sapiens back well about like 10 20 years ago? Well, uh, humans and Neanderthals, right? Modern humans and Neanderthals definitely did interbreed, right? Like, that's right. not really controversial. Um, so it's it sort of Brings into like it sort of brings up the question like okay well how do you define a species you know what what metric are you using because you know if you want to use the say the the idea that like okay if two organisms can interbreed and have viable offspring that can themselves go reproduce right then humans and Neanderthals should be the same species um, but there's a lot of different species concepts right so you have people like George Gaylord Simpson who would be like no that's dumb. Um, we should yeah. be by, 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 that def by that definition, the polar bear and the grizzly bear are uh, same species. Yeah, right? and they same with like the, the lion and the tiger, right? Yeah, right. You know, hybridization will never. Yeah, you can't. I I hate that as like the the hard line for speciation. It's and it, <clears> it's not a hard <throat> line either, right? Because you also have things that are like you know you have ring species, and you also have things that are 
that can sometimes hybridize and sometimes produce viable offspring. And you have some where like, well, I guess this is a ring species, but A can hybridize with B, B can hybridize with C, but A and C can't hybridize. Right. You know, mm-hmm. so using that as a same, cutoff same is... Spe- same I mean, species, same species. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So using hybrid, I mean, obviously it's, it's, you know, arbitrary to decide that's what the cutoff is in the first place, but then even then it has problems. It's, it's a very problematic definition. Um, so yeah, really there is no good definition of species. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 best, the best that I've heard is it's, it's species that species is organisms that tend to be reproductively isolated, but may be geographically isolated and may have some novel morphologic or genetic characteristic that separates them. It's like, mm-hmm. it could be a bunch of different things in the end. The, the definition is it's entirely arbitrary. I mean, if we're going with a, uh, a specific definition, right? My favorite one is probably the evolutionary species concept by George Gaylord Simpson, which is just the idea that like a species is a lineage with with its own evolutionary history. Right. I would also like uh, if you look at the different species uh, with the phy- phylogenetic history based on the, not, not, not just the ancestry, but, but also the, the genome within species, you, you see like a very, a very bushy network perhaps, but between mm-hmm. species, you, you can see a uh, and, and uh, more or less a neat bifurcating tree. And if you have that, then you can well, say, oh, these, these, are, these are different species. But of course, there can, there can be exceptions where you have like uh, interpreting events that make Also, like incomplete yeah. lineage sorting. Yeah, right? also, also, also true. Yeah, it, it's a really huge, mess. huge problem. It's a yeah. Really mess. Yeah. You, ne- you never have, any, unless you're talking about really, really anciently diverging lineages like, uh, like arthropods and vertebrates, then you don't. Unless you have that, you don't have a problem. But then you do not talk about species anymore. Then you talk yeah. about yeah. I, it's one of those things. Like everyone agrees that they're different, but how yeah. we, you know, define these differences and how we right. weight these differences is all extremely relative. Yeah, I, th- I think I think maybe we should, should have like a, 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 a different an, an, ar- yeah, an, ar- an ar- ar- arbitrary cutoff point. Like oh, un- unless you have this much uh, admixture with another population, then we will. To treat you separately, perhaps. Like I don't, yeah. I, 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 don't know. <laughs> That's sort of how they do yeah. it with viruses. But we've gone way off topic of human yeah. evolution by right. talking about viruses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like we're doing ERV for humans, but it, but and re- I think the most recent speciation event we know about that we learned about is the different is the Neanderthal split off from the the old. The old mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That, 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 even that speciation event's kind of murky just because neanderthals had modern human well not actually our exact uh dna but you know because of these hybridization events neanderthals mitochondrial dna and their y chromosomes was more closely related to ours yeah. uh, well, right? well, like, did you, didn't you talk about like one individual whose uh, one parent was a uh, denisovan and the other parent was a neanderthal yeah, that's uh, no, there's a yeah. fine there was a fine from 2019 that's been uh, colloquially yeah. called Denny. Yeah, that's Moscow, what they named her. Moscow. But it was a yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a 10 or 11 year old girl um, that was literally half Denisovan, half Neanderthal, like first generation hybrid. One parent mm-hmm. was Denisovan, one parent was right. Neanderthal, which is honestly crazy that we even found that. That's extremely lucky, lucky, in my opinion. Very lucky. But yeah, you know. they tell you, you know, and you've got Hopa Hadobergensis too that throws a, a monkey wrench further because Hadobergensis mm-hmm. likely left Africa in, in small portions as well and probably did hybridize with Neanderthals and Denisovans when they when they interacted with one another. So you've got sapiens, you've got Denisovans, you've got Neanderthalensis, and if memory serves Walker, there's some ghost lineage walking around who we've got no support for either. <laughs> Um, probably multiple ghost lineages. Yeah, and there, um, probably, yeah. And there yeah, was we, that, all we know is that we have archaic admixture. We don't know specifically what that came from. And if we get, you know, there's there's a very very good chance if we find, you know, a tooth from this archaic lineage, and we're like, ah, yes, this is what most of the archaic admixture comes from. There's still going to be like probably another small percentage that comes from something else. Mm-hmm. You know, so that it's it's such a squishy topic. Uh, which is why I think it's cool. That's why I want to research it. But mm. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know if it's still true or not, but I remember a long time ago, they they thought that uh, the Heidelbergensis was the ancestor of both sapiens, Neanderthals, and Dysovians. That's sort of the view I take, um, because I've sort of already given up on species concepts. <laughs> so I think, you know, if the 
ancestor of, if, if we could have a picture of the direct ancestor of Neanderthals, Denisovans, and modern humans, that thing would look and act and, you know, be exactly like Homo heidelbergensis, right? So why not just call it Homo heidelbergensis? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I think, I, I would say, I suspect if, if we could somehow obtain the DNA from all these fossils that we already have, even even, even the Australopithecines, I think it would, would just be one big uh, uh, web, in, not a, not a bifurcating tree, but also like uh, many different vines growing between the branches too. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's over. yeah. Can, I, can like the old banyan tree thing back in the early, or early yeah. life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, um, that's why Gould, he sort of called it like the great bush of life instead of the great tree of life. Of course, yeah. creation, creationists misunderstand that as in, as, as in saying, oh, common ancestry is all wrong. Like, no. I, I, no, common I ancestry, that, it, yeah. in my opinion, is more support for common ancestry. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say, I saw it. Oh, yeah. um, more, more of common ancestry means less common ancestry to the creationist. Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw a post the other day by uh, our, our pal Gunter Beckley where he was like, ah, scientists are saying that human evolution is, is the origin of human evolution is a pushy mess. And then you go and you read the paper and it's like, no, first true hominin was because there's so many apes in the Miocene. It's like, yeah, yes. That, that's a good problem to have. That means we have too many specimens, right? It's just, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't wrap my brain around how, you know, I don't, I think for the most, and I like it directly, but I think for the most part, a lot of these yeah. people like eyeball the paper and then they're like, I see these, I see these adjectives that, that promote mm -hmm. conclusions. Blog post, right? Awesome. Uh, speaking, speaking of the, uh, the bushy uh, tree, I think we all would like from the DNA that we already have. I think we all, all already see a bushy tree with the Denisovans, Neanderthals, and humans. And, and again, all, again, also also in your video, Walker, you also mentioned like there's a ghost lineage of an even more ancient human mm -hmm. that we got we got DNA from, too, right? Which may well, we have been, which, which, which may have been Homo erectus for all we know. So actually, we don't have DNA from this archaic lineage. Yeah. Um, exactly. What we do is we have DNA from modern humans, and right. we can compare the coalescence of that DNA to other populations of modern humans, right? And we can find that, like, okay, you know, all of these, you know, disparate populations have a coalescence time of just say like three hundred thousand years, right? And this could be from the Khoisan people, who are usually considered like the most basal modern human, you know, however you want to define that, right? They they usually have the, they're the oldest the population. Mitochondrial DNA, right? Mitochondrial. Yeah, well, and also white chromosome, I believe. Also white chromosome. But yeah, usually they're considered like the oldest population of modern humans, right? So we could compare, I guess, any other non Khoisan population, right? So let's just say East Asian. We can compare that to a Khoisan individual, and we can say, okay, this gene has a coalescence time of, on average, about three three hundred thousand years. And then we look at this West African population from like Cameroon or something, and we see that it has a section of DNA that coalesces back to like one point five million years ago, or like two million years ago. And so you think, like, hmm, something's a little weird here, right? And so that's generally how we're detecting the super archaic admixture from, you know. Probably yeah, usually software things like Argweaver and stuff like that. Um, mm, yeah. So it we we can sort of detect that these admixture events were occurring very likely, um, but it is also possible that something like incomplete lineage sorting. But the fact that it's happening consistently, right? You know, it's not just one region like this; it's like twenty regions like this, and they also form like linkage disequilibria and stuff like that. It it, it very strongly port, points to some sort of archaic admixture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two, two things real fast, two questions real fast. Uh, one, going back to there's no really line between species, you know, that, that blur is there. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard some people argue that the Homo gaster is his own species, but some thought it was a, a, another branch of Homo erectus. Yep. Yeah, that's a classic. That's a classic. <laughs> generally, I think the ergaster is usually relegated to really, really archaic looking Homo erectus. So like Demonisi, they're like, oh, it's Homo ergaster. It's like, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It, it's it's either a highly variable Homo erectus, or we can draw arbitrary lines at certain levels of variability and give them different names. Yeah. The naming is useful. It, it can be useful because it can help you kind of differentiate, you know, what you're talking about. Um, but you could also just use specimens for that. You know, yeah. and, and effectively get the same effect. And, 
Uh, that, that is something that the Koreans also get uh, a bit uh, iffy about, like uh, the Neanderthals. Are, are they Homo sapiens or are they uh, a different species? Like, I, I, like, I, I, could, it, yeah. it, I it, could throw uh, myself in oncoming traffic about how they deal with Neanderthals. The answer is broadly <laughs> the same. same. Like, yeah, the Neanderthals. <laughs> like, back when I was still going to church, I, I, some people were thinking about that Neanderthals were descendants of were, were Kang's they, first descendants. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, that was a, a, that was a pretty popular view. Um, in the early like you know like 1940s until you know 1970s or 80s um that sort of fell out of favor yeah uh kent hoven's view that neanderthals are some sort of like degenerated man, right that you know they're just really old people that was the consensus quote unquote from 1980 to 1990 <laughs> and now it's sort of turning into uh, it's, they don't want to touch it at all because we have their dna basically that's what's turned into. yeah they can't they, whether, they, whether they are whether, whether they can be considered a separate species or not is not really the point we can yeah, we, no, we, we, we know we know that they are a separate population like humans today everyone alive today is more closely related to each other than they are to neanderthal, neanderthal yeah so separate, separate they, that yeah. speaking of wanting to throw ourselves into oncoming traffic um, there's this one creationist YouTuber. I'm pretty sure uh, Erica calls him Monkey for Banana or something <laughs> oh, like that. Yes, you may have heard about, about him. him. Yeah. yeah, you might have heard about One of his favorite him. talking points is just they're fully human, they're fully human, they're fully, fully human, human without ever defining what fully human means. They would never do that. They can never do that. To, to define literally anything with regard to human evolution is to set themselves up for okay. annihilation. Yeah. They can't do it. It, it, it. Of course he doesn't touch it. Of course monkey oh, doesn't touch it. Oh, and of if, if I define a human, know. if I define oh, human, then there can be a transition of fossil. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. This, yeah. This, this individual is the definition of doubling down. I've never seen anything like it. And, and <laughs> monkey for bananas Neanderthal position is a perfect exemplary uh, uh, example of how doubling down works with creationists mm -hmm. addresses nothing reasserts point a I think, that's, that's how that works i, I think uh, what's the fallacy called when you make a statement that is so vague it uh, it is not it, it has no meaning but uh, but it conveys or it tries to convey a, a significant meaning even though there is none yeah i don't know but whatever know. it is it's certainly uh, ar ar argument <laughs> argument, from, argument from ambiguity yeah. Perhaps. Okay. That sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of interbreeding, I, I also heard that it was it was our, it was their interbreeding with the the Dovisans that let the Tibetans have survival in higher atmosphere, higher altitudes. Yes. Yeah. So there's a, a gene called the EPA EPA something. I think it's EPAS one or something like that. Don't quote me on that. Um, but yeah. So that 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 gene was actually found in Denisovan genomes. And then we looked and sequenced more human populations. And we're like, oh, hey, Tibetans have, I, I could actually pull up a really cool figure on this. Is, like that, the, is, is that the hemoglobin gene or uh, something else? It, it's, yeah, it's related to hemoglobin. Well, oh. so it's a transcription factor, right? Oh, all right. All right. It's a transcription factor that activates in hypoxic environments. Um, and it basically turns on a bunch of hemoglobin proteins and stuff like that. Things that'll just recruit more oxygen. Mm -hmm. Um. So let me pull it, it, that doesn't, it, it doesn't up. change it doesn't change the uh, hemoglobin protein itself no 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 yeah it, it's just a it's a regulatory element why right. um okay i'm gonna get some more coffee i'll be right back uh, yep Not that. <laughs> yeah keep keep those calls in frame <laughs> yeah. yeah oh i i, I like those calls yeah uh, i think, I, think I had it? like 30 minutes left before i had i i start i need to get i, I start need to wrap this up because I, I get to work at five and it's almost four o'clock now. So, so we can talk for that like, 30 minutes, give or take. But then I really, even though I love to stay longer, I got to pay those bills. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Somebody, oh, I found the figure. All right. So, so somebody else in the, in the chat mentions there are two different uh, independent ways of adapting to a high altitude. I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't know. No, it's I don't definitely know possible. That. I think maybe, talk, yeah. maybe talking about. Oh, yes, actually. Maybe the one that Andy, Danny, people from the Andes Mountains did that too. Yep, you're exactly correct. Yeah, so yeah. the I, I remember hearing about this. This isn't something I'm super well informed on. But apparently um, mutations in the EPAS1 gene, that is what it's called, by the way. The mutations in the EPAS1 gene are uh, highly correlated with 
all high altitude environments, including Andes populations. Although the Andes, the people in the Andes probably didn't inherit it from Denisovans. Um, yeah, recent human evolution is also an extremely neat topic. Yeah. Um, if you could share my screen super fast, right? I'll explain this figure. It's really neat, right? So this top bar, they, they basically just color coded all the different substitutions, right? This top bar, you see these two little green bars. Mm -hmm. These are this is the uh, Denisovan haplotype, right? So you know they have all of these substitutions. This purple oh, what, 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 is what, the what, what, what does the uh, li the vertical lines, black lines mean? Each vertical. Those, black those are the substitutions, right? The substitutions. Yeah, so you could say like, okay, you know, here's the ancestral sequence, and this is a T T C F, yeah, not now, oh. but you know what I mean. <laughs> I mean like, like, if you look at a, basically basically for, from left to right, that, that's basically a sequence of the genome of all yeah. sequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, like uh, I said, the uh, white uh, space uh, is uh, ancestral genome, yeah. right. and the black space represents a uh, some sort of substitution. And actually, if you look at it, the Tibetans have the exact same substitutions that the Denisovans have. More or less, right? There's some differences and all this kind of stuff. So it's it's you know almost 100% confirmed that Denisovans inherited I really, this. I really genome. like this diagram because it looks exactly like a barcode. <laughs> yeah, 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 it does. Um, and then if you look at like uh, Han Chinese populations, they probably did get some DNA from uh, the Denisovans for uh, at this specific site, right? But it, it's present in a much lower frequency. And then you get down here, and it's just basically noise. Um, but yeah, it, it's very, very consistent. You have very right. solid linkage blocks between that are shared between Tibetans. And how, how, how big is this, this space of the genome? The, uh, let's the, see. I don't know. Um, well, this specific graph looks like it shows 95 specific sites. I don't know if that's the full size of the genome or just the variable sites. Basically, basically across a, a sequence, they only only look at uh, specific sites that, that are interspersed within that uh, region. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if oh. the let's just say the gene is like four hundred base pairs, right? Um, yeah. They only have the ninety five base pairs that are wow. variable, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. So so, 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 so it's, it's not like like one line is it the neighbor of the other? The uh, not necessarily. The, no, yeah, I yeah. I mean. It, could be. It I could just be, yeah. be misreading this, yeah. but I don't. I don't think so. No. Yeah. So that's. I don't know. I just think that's a really cool graph. <laughs> nice. Oh. All right. That's not even it. I I I had a question like a from from a, a, a few topics back about the uh, like like the human lice of so the, the head lice and the pubic lice. Like uh, our hair is basically divided into different regions, and I, I wonder why we retained. Uh, our hair is like, or, or at least the very thick, uh, uh, dark hair uh, at certain places. Like, of course, the, our eyebrows mm -hmm. give away our emotions. That's probably the reason why we have eyebrows still. But I, I wonder why we have we have our hair on our armpits and also, of course, the the, the genitalia area and such. Yeah, yeah, there there are different reasons for each of those. At yeah. least as far as I am aware. Um, <clears throat> As gross as it is, the underarm hair actually helps facilitate more powerful body odor, which mm. might have to do with the, the very little pheromonal and scent communication that, that hominoids do, which is to say not very much. But occasionally, may, it, it actually might just be a, a male thing, and females just have it due to um, correlated response. Uh, but the, this blast of smells is something that sometimes males tend to uh, exude when they're getting into big fights and then they just happen to be stinky so on all other occasions too. So if, um, if, you, if your opponent runs away for, with, 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 with his, his, mom, his, his hand in front of his nose, then you, you win the fight. Yeah. You stink so bad. Yeah, you, you stank them out. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you stank <laughs> them out. Uh, the eyebrows, it's great for communication. It's also good for keeping uh, water and rain out of, the, uh, oh, yeah. out of the eyes on downpours. Head yeah. hair is an interesting one. I um, have more of that sometimes because when I'm sweating, it's like I came over my eye. When I'm sweating outside, it's like my eyes are sh like sh shield shut sometimes. Yeah, the the um, the head hair is an interesting one. Some people have proposed that head head hair because there's actually no difference in the length to which males grow their head hair. So most of us like keeping close cropped hair is is something of a new deal. But this long hair, like I've got the perfect example of it. It covers my head and it covers my shoulders. The areas that are most exposed to the sun when you're bipedally moving around. 
Um, so it actually might be a, a, a radiation protection or, or direct heat protection um, uh, deal. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know about it. Like, uh, there, are, there are some different hair types among humans. Like, for example, uh, in certain African populations, you have like really, uh, like uh, this really uh, bushy type of hair, like uh, that, that, that curls, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know if it, if it, uh, if it changes the story around it. Maybe, maybe yeah. the curly type hair is new. Maybe Personally, could, I kind yeah. of I kind of worry with with questions like these uh, of yeah. you know attributing these things because you know obviously it could be that like longer hair covers our shoulders and stuff. Yeah. But it also could be complete like maybe some sort it of could be behavioral. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, right. It, it could can be some be sexual selection. It could be some behavioral thing that we have no idea about and will never preserve. Right. I There's think... no, sorry, a theoretically ahead. infinite number of pressures that could have caused it. You know? Yeah, yeah, and and that's why that's why it's important to basically like it, what sorry what I'm trying to do here. Maybe I, I haven't done it well enough, but it's essentially like you can you can offer explanations. That doesn't mean that they're the yeah. case. Uh, no, which no, is why no, it's been no, proposed. We yeah. can't prove it. There's also there's also, there's also a possibility of just genetic drift. Like there's a random uh, mutation that causes that causes our hair to grow long, sure. long, long, and it just yep. got fixed in the population for no uh, no specific selection reason. Basically, yeah. Yeah, as a, I was used to wonder if it was, if it was if it was more or less Neanderthal DNA. Maybe it probably probably not. But that they had some some guys' chest hairs really really hairy. Other ones like more more smooth. <laughs> that the 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 dimorphism in hair is really interesting. Um, my uh my my professor or my advisor Plotkin, he uh he's he's proposed that it could just be a, an androgen consequence so it's just like a consequence of the hormones that that differ between males and females that that happen to act on the hair that we have and because we've changed from from being covered like the, the interesting thing is is like the uh those terminal hairs that males get on their chests when women are exposed to higher levels of androgens they get that too so it's 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 possibly just a difference in in, in my, hormones my, my bd hair loss uh, 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 a byproduct of neoteny, like if you like uh, with neoteny, you often uh, have uh, different levels of hormones where you have like less pronounced uh, adult features. Maybe that's also related to the hair loss. It could be. Yeah, it could be. I mean, a, a lot of the the whole concept of pubic hair, like that's that's been proposed by many people. Again, as Walker, you know, yeah. astutely mentioned, it, it, it you run into some dangerous territory when you're talking about what is effectively evolutionary psychology. Right. Right. Um, but <laughs> it has been proposed that the reason why you know pubic hair is a thing is so that we can properly distinguish between those who are sexually mature and those who are not. Um, yeah. So I, I, th I think also, since, no. I think <laughs> since I probably uh, besides us, it seems like maybe Homo, homo erectus were the mm -hmm. most diverse besides us. You know, I would have insane range. Diverse. What? What? Well, they, they, they maybe spread out more, maybe. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, okay. Geogra I thought you meant like physic morphologically. I was like, I don't know that we even approach this. <laughs> but, but I, I meant, um, did they have, I don't know if it was just us, did they have different, do we know if they had different melatones? Like, we have like, like more, the higher up north we go, the I, more light. I would, I would suspect that it's the same pattern or, or unless unless they have a lot of hair but i suspect that the homo erectus would have the same type of hair pattern that we have i, mean, I guess i, I would so, like yeah. to, we don't have any neander or excuse, yeah i guess where i've got to go with this we don't have any homo erectus genomes right yeah. so we we don't know what their melanin production looked like but since we do have neanderthal genomes we can tell that neanderthals also displayed a, a very wide array of you know skin color diversity implying mm -hmm. at least to me that that's a very human thing um so i would be honestly surprised if homo erectus didn't have a you know a large yeah. amount of skin color diversity oh, so this, is it maybe maybe an interesting to come back with uh erica mentioned about the intels uh, focusing on the organs like when you eat organs you also eat like a lot of vitamin d and you don't mm. need the uh, lighter skin to get uh, enough sunlight for vitamin d production like like for example i think when the, the uh, the Inuits, right? They, they eat a lot of uh, uh, vitamin D from their diet. And that's why they also also have like a more more darker skin tone, even though they are uh, at a very high latitude. Too. Yeah, yeah, it, it could be. I mean, yeah. the, the skin 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 color is just it's it's a response to the environment. That's yeah. it. Yeah, so it, it it depends. Can, can you get you enough vitamin D from the sunlight, or do you or do you need uh, 
or, or, or do you already have uh, vitamin D in your diet? Then you don't need uh, to have a light of the skin tone. Well, I wish I had some of that because I get sunburned so easily. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I was sitting outside for a lunch for like two hours and I came back looking like a lobster. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, yeah, you you, you got it. It doesn't take much. My my dad's uh my dad's half Pakistani, and so I've got one quarter Pakistani going on, and I've got that. I, it's very difficult for me to get sunburned. It's mm. it's it's consider yourself it's lucky. I, I, uh, is your ancestry Irish <laughs> by coincidence, Walker? Uh no, mostly English. Oh, I was but... also also close in the, the yeah, British Isles. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not gonna say it's wrong. Yeah, but... the British Isles. Yeah. <laughs> So if any of you, any of you took that ancestry DNA or other other things? The, uh, I have they, not. No. no. I, I, yeah. I I I'm really suspicious about the uh, the val like validity of the test and also the reason why you should take a test. Like it's it might it might, it might give you the wrong impression. Like it's all it it might even enforce the uh, the race realism idea, of course. Mm -hmm. Oh God. People. So yeah. Oh my yeah. God. yeah. I took one a few years ago. I took it. Actually, I took it on camera. It was, it was hard since, I, since, I, since I'm terrible. I'm a terrible spitter, so since I, I can drink anything for. I spent the whole video spit, trying to spin in a tube. I've done haplotyping typing on myself before, <laughs> but I, I've mm. never done it at, like a, you know, I've never sent it off to a different thing. Yeah. 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 I don't know about all that. I, I mean, obviously the, the technology is great and it works superbly, but like doing it on a, on a mass level like that with the ancestral, like I, I imagine there's probably quite a bit of guesstimation going yeah. on. Um, oh, for it's, sure. it's, it's really, it's really, it's, really da it's, it, it's really, uh, dependent on your data. Like if you, if you have, uh, like they, they will to correlate your, your markers with, uh, other markers that they found in other regions, but if they, Increase the sampling size. Maybe the, the the set of markers that are unique to one region changes if they if they update their uh, system. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's really dependent. Sure. Yeah. Well, and also, uh, yeah. and also, I think your your cultural heritage is very different from your genetic heritage, yeah. right? Like my my girlfriend's family is Native American, and yeah, it, unsurprisingly, her ancestry test came back like thirty percent Native and like seventy percent European. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I like, uh, like historical uh, things. Yeah. There, is, there is an anthropologist, I forgot, forget his name, there's an anthropologist who does, uh, often does talks, and he, he says he gets a lot of uh, questions about whether they are descendant from uh, Vikings. Oh, I might descendant from Vikings, but he explains that if you're European, everyone in Europe is descendant from Vikings. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 <laughs> exactly. and, 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 prob and probably everyone, if you go back far enough, Everyone is descendant from Vikings eventually. Yeah. Go back far enough. Uh, people yeah. say we're, a lot of people are descended from from Genghis Khan too. Yeah. Yeah. But, right. Yeah, that's the thing about uh, off topic kind of off topic. But think about I think about racism. Mm -hmm. we, we can still, we all can still interbreed with each other. We can all, we can all get along. Get yeah. along with each other. Each other. Racism is whack. Yeah. It's it's, it's, it's also it, if you look just at the uh, the mitochondrial. Uh, haplotypes and also the white chromosome haplotypes. Basically, all non-Africans are just a subset of Africans. So you are an African, phylogenetically speaking. So it's not really to say that we are separate when we mm -hmm. are just within the same group. It's really idiotic to me. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Also, the, like diversity and stuff. Like it's the same with languages. Like in America, we have like maybe six or seven di dialects in each the country, but in over England, where it came from, we like there's like 50 million dialects. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great analogy for the founder effect. Actually, that's an excellent analogy. Like we can go like America, we go like uh, ten, 20, they go like 30 miles, where you would take you give different dialect on the south. But I heard in England, you can go like maybe 10 miles that way, and you're different dialect. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. It's also. Um, like uh, the, the the evolution of language is also, I think it pretty much maps the uh, um, or I don't know maybe I'm mistaken. It also correlates with the uh, the genealogy of uh, humans, right? Like yeah. The, so there's yeah. someone at my school who does who does work on that, and I think it's really interesting. Yeah. And yes, it does. It, it extremely strongly correlates. Yeah. Of course, of course, I also like uh, of course French. Probably also have a lot of ancestry with uh, Germans, probably too. So it's not it's not a one to one relationship. I know, it's, it's, yeah. Plus, it's like not like that's just strict lines. Also, like as like like with like prozo and like we have horizontal gene transfer. Like in, like England. Oh yeah. Originally, yeah. it might be might be Germanic at first, but then when the Normans invaded, we have some French in, French in there too. Mm -hmm. right. 
Yeah. And so it's really like, yeah, it, uh, yeah. It, it depends on the con like uh, on the specific contact between groups, and you can have a, a very unique uh, languages uh, uh, appear from that interaction. But uh, I, I also had a question about the of, with the hair. Like, do do, uh, do uh, non-human apes also have like a similar hair pattern? Like they, they have like the hair on the eyebrows are thicker than the rest of the face, and do they also have like th thicker hair on the scalp, and also thicker hair on the on the armpits, like a similar pattern than we have, or not? I don't know. I don't think they do. It, the thing about the thing about the uh, the thing about a lot of apes is that they've got they still have these super over the ridges, right? They got these big old brows, and they can do lots of expression with those brows. So they don't really require the the hair on the brows like we do. Uh, because yeah. we've lost these massive ridges that allow us to express to the same degree. Um, as far as their 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 armpits go and the tops of their heads, I don't think so. I don't think that they've got the same the same pattern as we do. Now, follicles, right? We have the same number, right, as as the panids. So 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 that's, there, that's like there, there is no difference between the hair on the groin com uh, in in amount and type compared to their uh, chest hair, perhaps, or, or like. I don't there think no, so. No, I, I don't no, think so. Yeah. I don't think they have that differentiation that the same that we do. I don't think so. But but the the kind you know hair is one of the big differences between us and uh, some of the other apes. But of course they also differ from one another. I mean you you see the type of hair that male orangutans grow these massive long draping hair on their arms that you know is effectively yeah. all over their body. Um, that that kind of hair that terminates at that length isn't seen in in other primates. Um, except for us on the tops of our heads, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, at least, at least for the guys, we, lo we lose our top ha hair more than we lose our other body hair first. Uh, you can, yeah, is there yeah, a, 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 a similar pattern of balding in, in chimpanzee or in all of all the apes? Really? That's no. pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm asking if, if there uh, is there oh, a similar oh, okay. pattern. Oh, okay. I thought you said that. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Is there like a pattern of balding, maybe? Their their hair thins, but it doesn't like because they don't differentiate between the hairs on the tops of their heads as they do from the rest of their body. Mm. It mostly just thins out and grays all over. Um, do, do, do do also male chimps have like beards? Perhaps like I don't, I don't know if that's also a, a thing. Like a, no, yeah. they they I if memory serves, I I think they I think males and females are are fairly identical. If they actually grow um, hair on their face and on the rest of their bodies. Like you can look too to um uh. Macaca fascicularis, uh, the um, long-tailed macaques, uh, they get these really beautiful mustaches and beards yeah. and things like that, but both sexes have them. Uh, so they don't differentiate in the same way we do. Um, it's it's really interesting when you look at how males and females and humans differ in, in how we grow our hair, um, because that, that, that kind of makes us sexually dimorphic in a unique way. Yeah. I, we're, we're not really that dimorphic, males uh, and females. In terms of like our skeleton, not yeah, no, I mean, there the, are the, the, the distinct differences, like in pelvis size and such. Yeah, but, yeah pelvis yeah. size, and males tend to have denser bones. Um, yeah. uh, but but wasn't that stature the, tends to be pretty similar. Um, wasn't that the I thing mean, of your paper you wrote? Me? Yeah. Yeah, I, I focused on dimorphism of the canine teeth, though, uh, across extant primates. So I looked at not body size or anything like that. I was specifically concerned with the canines. So we're going to attempt to read it. We're going to get a chance to read your paper. <laughs> Uh, it's going to be a long time. <laughs> You're going to have to wait a long time because I, I have to get it approved. It first has to be approved by my MRES, and then I have to actually submit it to a journal. And that's another six month to a process of actually getting published to a journal. And you're not allowed to talk about it until it's uh, published, really. So I can't even really. Legally. Legally. Yeah, legally. But if they find out, they can, like, your publishing. They can take that away. They can be like, oh, if, you, if you're, you know, talking, you know, where anybody can ask what you've done then you know they can just say no we're not publishing you anymore which sucks so sorry i can't wait i can't wait you know when you after, when it's finally published you know, years later people people have you as a source in, in, their, in their future papers i mean that'd be cool if they think my results are good enough i mean i think my results are great but i also wrote the paper so it's like and and it's you know you're putting way too much excitement it is not an exciting paper to read i i i yeah. like it because i like the subject but most people aren't that interested in teeth well, differences. It, I, I, i'm just excited because okay. i i i, 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 finally, I, I, I know someone who's published has a paper published now group well, don't who don't jinx it don't jinx it we'll see. i mean you already know people with published papers right you've talked to dan you before do. oh yeah 
I think yeah, you know people. Of course, he doesn't. He doesn't advertise it very much. So. No. No. Because no, generally, he, scientists don't. It, it's to me, it's sketchy whenever people are like, "Hey, remember, he has a PhD from Harvard." <laughs> you know, most scientists Harvard don't care. PhD, yeah, definitely. yeah. <laughs> My my fiance, uh, he loves King of the Hill. You know that one quote from King of the Hill where Hank's talking about Christian rock, and he's like, "You're not making Christianity better. You're just making rock and roll worse." Yeah, it's like that's how I feel about Nathaniel Jensen's Harvard PhD. It's not making Harvard. It's not making Nathaniel Jensen more. It's making Harvard seem worse of a university. Yeah, like when when they are mentioning the PhD and the institution without the special like what topic it is, that should raise an eyebrow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Gene's what he's developmental biology or something like that, like something uh, developmental. Cellular? Cell. I think it's something cellular. Devel- really? Is it cell bio? Maybe it is. I don't. You, I might maybe be wrong. It is. Yeah, I, I don't know. But it's not. But when they, you, they, they never. They never know. tell. They never tell. So how would we know? It's from Harvard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's from Harvard. yeah, that's all that matters. Yeah. yeah. What it is not yeah. is genetics, though. We know that much. Yeah. But uh, about, yeah, about, about my question about like it, it's it seems like uh, when it comes to the skeleton we aren't that much sexually dimorphic but when it comes to, like our facial features like our like more, more of the superficial aspects we are more sexually dimorphic so perhaps perhaps maybe that's not an interesting aspect of human evolution when we, well, pro- when our sexual yeah. when our sexual dimorphism switched from being uh, skeletal to more uh, facial. Uh, Sexual dimorphism. Yeah. Yeah, and and there's also it's it's proposed too that it, it might have to do a lot with um uh, the androgens for uh, the facial hair and stuff like that, but also for um upper body strength. So males are obviously like males and females track pretty close as far as lower body. Um, mm. they're they're pretty similar. A lot of the um a lot of that the persistence um running and endurance stuff. Those records tend to be really close. Uh, but upper body males tend to outpace females by. I think it's like 30%, something like that, which isn't insignificant, um, not, dimorphi- not dimorphism-wise. So that that proposes, interestingly enough, since male chimpanzees are about 30% larger than females, that kind of is interesting. That almost suggests that the, the sexual dimorphism isn't skeletal, but it's, it's muscular. Um, and it's limited to the upper body, which is strange. It, it almost suggests that, that the competition, it, it matches with the competition type though, right? Males, you know, they fight, um, using their upper bodies so it suggests mm-hmm. maybe the fighting that they're doing over females uh, and that's on average of course i mean it might be also like maybe i'm being sexist about this but maybe it's also because like females tend to carry around the babies and males car- maybe carries around like more of the like the uh, spears or such maybe i'm being Are you talking really, about like as an evolutionary pressure yeah yeah and not necessarily yeah. like a you know yeah. getting the work out in <laughs> right <laughs> Yeah, it, it could be. I mean, the, the interesting thing is, is like, um, at least in archaic humans and in uh, Neanderthalensis, it doesn't look like there's a huge division of flavor until you start appreciating agriculture. Um, a, there are a lot of females that are buried with, with hunting equipment and things like that mm-hmm. um, and have similar, especially Neanderthals, have similar uh, physical um, uh, abnormalities. So so pathology, like they're, they're being harmed in the same way, which suggests that with the yeah. they weren't partitioning that labor very much. They females were getting hurt in a lot of the same ways yeah, as males yeah, I, were. Yeah, I heard that too. That before the agriculture happened, at, before the ice age ended, that both males and females had to survive, to help each other survive. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I've yeah, also, I mean, I, I also seen. I've also seen a recent paper, like a, a last year, was a paper about how it showed that, that even females if, in, in, our, in our own species uh, also harm the regularly. With, yeah, uh, like and, a, and like, like, like a, also like even though uh, m- like males have more uh, on average more upper body strength uh, with, 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 with tools like the atelabel, I think it's called the uh, it uh, it basically it basically equalizes this, this the strength difference between. Yeah. Like, well, it, well, I think matter. it yeah. it sort of asks which begets which, right? Like yeah. of course it, it does seem like there's a general trend in hunter gatherer societies for like you know men to do hunting and women's do gathering, mm-hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean that yeah. it was an evolutionary pressure to be that yeah. way. It could have been the cultural, opposite, maybe. right? Yeah. Well, it could have, it, obviously it is definitionally cultural, yeah. um, but it also could have been the opposite, right? Like it could have been, you know, on average men are slightly stronger. So it was, you know, they could, more they favorable they could, for them to be the hunters. They and could hunter carry the big right? bones back. But, 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 but you are, 
Three really are hunting with like two, like for example, the uh, a spear or the uh, the atlatl. Uh, how, how do you call it again? The like the, the extension of the spear. Atlatl. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's probably, yeah. Yeah. That's uh, what uh, I call uh, it. That's yeah. probably a southern redneck version of saying yeah, it. Right, right. Right. But when you when you're hunting like that, then the, then your upper body arm strength does really become much of a factor. It's it just that's true. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a matter of how, how precise you can. Uh, well, yeah, but it. by the development of that, it could have also been fixed into the population already, right. like the, those cultural it, factors. Yeah, the the thinking too is that you know it's male male competition that that is what differentiates the the strength difference from males and females. It is almost universally accepted that whatever the female body type is is the ideal for the species. That's that's what's going to be most robust with regard to uh, accepting climatic change and things of that nature because they're the ones that actually have to be, you know raise the offspring. Males usually have the competition aspect that comes into play. Um, so potentially males are competing stronger than females because they're competing with one another uh, and then they utilize that in, in mm. hunting um, and that difference isn't appreciated very much because especially early on it's yeah. not that noticeable um particularly because you have to think muscles ver muscles versus just like visually looking at stature males and females are pretty similar yeah. although, um, they tend to although, be uh, oh go ahead sorry uh, although the, 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 there was actually a, a video i've seen by uh fox with the, the, the v and not an f <laughs> Uh, they, they, did a video, they did a video about uh, marriage, like a, a monogamy, first po polygamy. And they mentioned a tribe where the, the males, they, they don't compete for females. They basically treat every child as their own child, no matter whose father it is. They, they don't care. They don't care whose child it is. It's just every, everyone's child is my child, basically, in the tribe. Village, yeah, village living That's and paternal yeah. confusion. Like paternal... It, it, it's got this sexual arms race between males trying to inseminate as many females as possible and females trying to pater confuse paternity, defend against infanticide, and get as many resources from as many mm -hmm. males as possible. And this sexual arms race um, kind of decreases as cognition comes into play, but it doesn't mean that it totally goes out the window. Um, early human ancestors, um, in Australopithecines and, and the like, probably did um, engage in this kind of thing, worry about the infanticide and, and paternal yeah. confusion um, and weird. such. I, I That'd be a thing if, if, if like, I know, I know some, some, in some species, they, they do that in some, like, maybe insect species, other things that, that if, if females could hold different male sperm in them, and, um, and then, like, some yeah. they had babies, they, they don't know who the father is, because it's, yeah, it's sex with lots of people. Well, and, yeah, and that's how they do it. I mean, they confuse paternity in, in promiscuous species. That's the whole point. That's why females get promiscuous, is because they're trying yeah. to defend their offspring and secure resources. Uh, yeah. But going, going back to something we said earlier, um, I, I think that there's this really interesting cultural uh, um, facet, I guess, where like hunting is the cool thing. Like, yeah. you want to mm -hmm. be hunters. Women should be hunters. Awesome. And while women did hunt, females did hunt. We, we, we know that. Yeah. Um, gathering is the sleeper source of, of, of metabolic gain. The gathering, this was something that occurred every now and then. It's an everyday thing, and it's probably why many humans were were um, matrilineal and formed these matrilines because the females, similar to elephants, were the ones that knew where the, where the gathering spots are. It's another aspect of the grandmother hypothesis that kind of do um, uh, humans and and how we do uh, reproduction. How, why women do menopause because old women, the ones who stay in their natal groups, the ones who help raise the offspring. Um, that aren't theirs anymore, also remember the old spots that are reliable for the tribe as they're moving around nomadically. And they've shown this in modern hunter-gatherer tribes. Old women, at certain times of the year, bring in the most calories any member of the society, which yeah. is really, really interesting. What wow. that suggests is that there's a huge benefit to gathering, and, and yeah. gathering is, is cognitively um, going to have a huge payoff. For, for these organisms as they can secure these yeah, species. I, I, I would, yeah, I would suspect, suspect that they hunt together. Were, were, of course, they were hunting too, but I think most of their uh, food comes from gathering because it, like, it, it, you, you can't, like, you can't, you can not really rely all the time on like hunting uh, big game all the time. Like it's not, it's not really a smart thing to do for, to do it every single day to try to hunt. Like you probably would, you would only hunt in the season, in the right season, for example. That's so my, that way, uh, is that what you're going for in, in your game, a matriarchal society in, in your ancestry? 
Oh. No, 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 no. Now, it, you know, I mean, there. The, the whole point of all this stuff is like, it, you know, c traditionally, historically, there's been this, you know, man the hunter I lens that's applied over over human evolution. But the reality is that both sexes played very important roles uh, in in keeping the the society moving, and and they, you know, they they worked together, and the lines were not bimodal. You know, it's not like all oh, females only did hunting, and males only, or females gathering and males only did hunting uh what we see from from paleopathology is injuries cross that line a lot um and what we see from modern hunter gatherers is that everyone does everything and pitches in on raising each other's kids and securing resources it's just it it takes a village is is kind of the the moral of the story and to put it under the uh girl power girls did all the stuff or men did all the stuff it that's silly it's a waste of time it's it, everyone did everything in mm -hmm. many many uh, well, as much as I love to talk talk forever, I, people got to get their Big Macs. I got to get right. Get, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I have one last question in the, in the, ch in the chat. Like, uh, if I remember correctly, gyms also have a menstrual cycle, right? So is there a difference uh, in terms of the length, like the timing? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know about menstruation. I know that the big difference between humans and chimps with regard to female reproduction is estrus. So female chimps, they go in that is just incredibly obvious. Their their hind end swells to you know it, it's like the size of a dinner plate. It's very obvious to everyone which females are in estrus. Humans have. Thank, thank, thank God that doesn't happen to us anymore. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Humans, yeah. humans. It's called concealed ovulation. Um, of course, that implies that it's intentionally hidden. It could just be a consequence. Um, but there is the there is the fact of the matter that it does this paternity further because a female. And the, the, this this is getting into the the evolutionary psych stuff that's really dangerous and not great a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but theoretically, if you're a female, females tend to know when they are ovulating, but males it's not as obvious. So they use paternity and you know maybe sneak off and mate with a with a very robust powerful male that tends to get a lot of females and then settle down pair with a male who is really good at, at raising offspring um that's like the red pilled horrific idea behind concealed <laughs> ovulation. the reality of it is we have no idea why humans do concealed ovulation um it, there could be a million different reasons so that's that's uh, the big like difference. One of the, one of the typical one of the typical just show stories that I have heard is like we have a uh, we have a concealed ovulation because it uh, invites the men to be more caring for like for longer term to be uh, yeah, more he doesn't the, know. Uh, yeah, he, he has yeah. no idea. Yeah, it's well, I mean there are, there are a number of different benefits for females with concealed yeah. ovulation, especially if the female is aware of when she's ovulating, which most women are. Yeah, and well, so, you know, there's Yeah, can I oh, so we kind of hit a lot of stuff once we start wearing clothes, you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's it's an interesting deal, but yeah, chimps, chimps, and bonobos—they both menstruate. It's just not as, to my understanding, it's not as intense as human menstruation. Right. Um, um, so a few shout outs real fast before we go. If you have, see, Ness here, he took a few months ago. He took a video that that we made of nuclear energy and made yes. it more condensed and full of pictures. Cool. Nice. Yes, uh, it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's more like a a, 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 an, a cut version of the uh, hangout, yeah. And the original hangout was like three hours, so I made a one-hour version of it, with, also with annotated uh, uh, visual aids for, for it. Awesome. Yeah, like, like an abridged version. Of course, of course, with Von Dahlia's uh, permission, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Never, never heard to have an abridged version of... Because most of my podcast, like, like today, most of my podcasts are ram rambling by everything at the end of the sun. Mm. <laughs> Not a bad thing. Yeah. True. Also, although I have to say, like when, when I was making this video, my entire laptop was full. Like there was no space left. <laughs> like it's not like I can, can I even finish this video? Like to, would you let me? <laughs> like it's, I just uh, made it barely. I, yeah, I, I it. hate yeah. having to go back. Okay, I, do I need this file in my career anymore? Like delete, delete, delete. Do I still need yeah, this? Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah also, like Erica, I I'd, I'd love to have you back again talking about different like different things. We can talk about. The pan branch, the gorilla branch, you know. 
there wouldn't be much. I mean, we can talk about the extants, but there's really not much to talk about as far as like the leading up to them. Our our fossil record is incredibly poor yeah, for the yeah. canon uh, and for gorillas alike. Uh, we have actually, I think we've got more from orangs yeah. than we do from either of them. But I, oh. you know, me, I can always talk about primates. I've always got something to say about primates. Although, although this, might, this this is probably a fringe view. I, I have seen one individual suggesting that that some of the fossils, like the, the paranthropines, for example, are the ancestors of, of gorillas, not uh, related to you. Yeah, it's a fringe view, I know. Uh, yeah, they're yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, so, no. So basically, basically, they want to explain oh, why, why don't we have fossils of uh, chimpanzee or gorilla ancestors. And then they just say, aha. People, Aha, people, but these, these are the ancestors. Yeah. People don't like taxonomy. People don't like My, the luck aspect of it. Like, I, you right. know what? If you live in a rainforest, we don't know about you. I'm really sorry. You, right. you should have lived on the plains. <laughs> yeah, and I also, I, I, I remember, I remember well, a while back that you talked about how people might have ever thought about breeding humans and chimps. Has anyone ever thought about breeding chimps and gorillas? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they have. Um, they would have a harder time, though. There's th there's a much larger gap to cross than with humans and pandas. I am of the opinion, uh, and the literature, as far as I understand, is of the opinion that the biggest problem with human chimp hybridization is the is the zona pellucida around the egg uh, of both species, which gate keeps gate checks rather the sperm. So if you really wanted to try. The, game, the name of the game would be um, actually direct in vitro fertilization, which to my knowledge, and I hope that this remains true, no one has tried. So, but someone probably <laughs> has, you know. It's really it. uncomfortable to think that it might be possible, but it, it shouldn't be tried. Shouldn't it shouldn't be yeah. tried. I am actually of the opinion that it probably is possible. I, I, with yeah. the level of hybridization that we tend to see amongst other animals, I see no yeah. reason as to why if you could yeah. bypass that. I, 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 actually, I actually hope it is not possible, because if it's not possible, then it would not be yeah. a problem. But if it is possible, then oh god. No, Someone's yeah, probably yeah. tried it somewhere, um, yeah, and the, how far they got, I don't know. Also, the question also would be, if, it's po if it is possible, would they be, would they be infertile hybrids or fertile hybrids? And we don't know. We don't know. Lions and tigers. We, 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 we have. We have. We have. I think we we have made a hybrid between a camel and a uh, a llama, right? Like a. Mm -hmm. I like, have no like idea. A, like an artificial hybrid between the two. I want to say yes. Yeah. yeah I, think I, I think I showed that for it. Uh, so well. So, so yeah. So they, they are. They are. They are more distantly related to, than we are to Jim. So yeah. yeah it's That's as is usually the case. Yeah. So besides possible reappearances on here, which so hopefully is in a six months, a six months, a six months again, what's up coming up on your channel? Me? Yeah. Um, oh man, uh, I'm hoping to have a couple of videos come out next week. I'm hoping to get, uh, I've got my videos scripted and recorded the KPG extinctions. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I'm hoping to get something out about um, the uh, bite size bus for carbon-14 dating, specifically C14 in dinosaurs, coal and diamonds. Um, because that's creation. Oh, are, are, uh, uh, so, are, are you doing a video on the KPG extinction and the, the survivors of the extinction event? Yeah. I just, I have a series on Earth's mass extinction. Yeah, that's the you've done. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, I have some suggestions of like, uh, like uh, often we focus on the surviving mammals of the KPG extinction, but you can do, I know of some very interesting uh, crocodile relatives that also survived the extinction event. Really yeah, yeah, it's a weird deal. It's, yeah. it's I all looking, I look almost. forward to that one, most of all, from you, the last one, because that's the birth, the primates came from that extinction. Yeah, right. it, that's the truth. And um, then I'm hoping to get a, a video on uh, Gaia streaming services for ancient humans in Antarctica, <laughs> which is just, it's absolutely a, a miscarriage of science. It's its horrific. It's, it's as bad, if not worse, than some of the stuff creationists have put out. It's absolutely incredible. Um, no one pays attention to the woo. The ancient aliens people need a smackdown. That's for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, I know um, I mean. um, long term, I want to get intelligent design. I think that'd be a cool long video. History of intelligent design and why it's garbo. Uh, yeah, but other I, than that. Yeah, I know I made a joke about it on your video, but, but your bite size, three, six minute bite size bust. I know. I know. I'm sorry. The elephant video was one of my favorite videos in the recent time. Oh, nice. Well, yes. Walker wrote Walker wrote most of it, so he, that, credit to him on that. 
Yeah, well, I mean, okay, so I wrote the parts about elephant phylogeny because that was sort of a script that I had sitting around a while ago. But then you also modified a lot of it. So I, I, I wouldn't contribute any, I wouldn't say either of us did like all of it or the majority. I, I, was pretty even. I, I got so many comments on that video of people being like, wait, why did you do, why did you do a new species per generation? Why wouldn't it be, you know, this, that, and the other thing? It's like, look, it's just priming Walker's part where he's like, even if we like use population growth rates, you're still not getting enough. It's, <laughs> I, 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 would, I would have liked the, uh, the, the title be, to be changed from bite-sized to chomp-sized. Chomp I size. know, but, but it's bite-sized. I know my video range is yeah. obscene. I, it could be five minutes or it could be three hours. So yeah. <laughs> it's bite-sized compared to the three hours. <laughs> the thing, even, even, even on YouTube, we're, we're peer reviewing each other, not, not just one thing. There you go. Walking yeah, into something is peer reviewed by Erica and vice versa. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we throw ideas around. Not obviously, not just me and Erica, but like, you know, all the YouTube creation busters, quote unquote, throw ideas to each other all the time. We we got the ge the geology guys do so much legwork for me. I mean, <laughs> and they're, they're so hidden. No one knows who they are. It's sad. No one knows who they are, and they do so much of the work. I mean, I from from pair from like checking my scripts to giving me sources. I mean, I don't know what I would. Do. Colton and Denny. Um, yeah, whatever happened? Whatever happened to Anon last year? He's oh, I don't know. Mysterious. <laughs> How mysterious! I don't know. He vanished. I, I, I don't know who it is. A Anon, Corporal Anon. Mm -hmm. He he had a YouTube channel for like thirty seconds. I, I did that. <laughs> that upsets me too much. I, to talk to him, well, well, hold on. That, ex that explains why I don't know about uh, yeah, him. Yeah, he, he made two, two appearances on my channel. He talked about the geology, the geological history, and the, he does all the geology leg work for, cool for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If if I talk about geology, even Corporal Anon has eyeballed it for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. All right. Cool. Well, I, if you guys can. I'll, I'll, in the private chat or tweet me the links that your paper links and stuff I can put in the description so I can get start print some sources in my things if you have any. You got it. Oh yeah, of course. I'll send you that right now. But, uh, and also you guys have cat you guys want to say your catchphrases that, uh, that you end your things with? Oh <laughs> uh thank you for being here, my gentle and very modern apes. Mm -hmm. I don't have a catchphrase, I'm lame. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to think, to think hard of a catchphrase. Uh, stay, stay, uh, stay ape. <laughs> stay ape. Stay there ape. we go. Stay ape. As I always say, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see y'all next time. <laughs>